Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. You gotta put it in block letters because down on the waterfront in San Francisco there's a price tag on everything. You gotta do that or marry a rich widow. I don't like to work that hard. So I rent boats and do anything else that's cash and carry. Oh, it's all right if you don't mind trouble. Because that's one thing you can't duck. It's like trying to dance the minuet and skis. And the best trouble always looks good from the outside. You're all smiles and feel like a kid opening a hand grenade under the Christmas tree. I found that out Tuesday night. It was around 7 o'clock. I was getting ready to close the office when this little guy showed up. He was about the size of a golf bag with arms. If he had a cigar box, he could see over a pool table. He walked up to the desk and started talking in a voice that made you think he was trying to put Lily Pons out of work. Hello, you know that? You're doing all right so far. What's on your mind? I'm Jackie Gregg. You heard of me, huh? You're the shy type, I know. I'm Jackie Gregg, the jockey. You heard of me, huh? All right, now I heard of you. Put the show on the road. I'm looking for a horse. You want to find me a horse? Yeah, I breed him in the back room. What color do you want? You're so tough I got to take that from you? Calm down before you wind up in a boys' choir. If you got anything to sell, put it on the line or beat it. I'm riding a horse tomorrow called Fleet Lady. She's disappeared. She's not here. I'm supposed to ride the sixth race with her tomorrow. The Bonanza handicap, and she's gone. All right, she's gone. Maybe your horse likes to go out at night. I haven't seen her. Get to the point. I'll give you 200 bucks to find that horse. Somebody took her in a van. I uh, trailed her down here at the waterfront. But you lost him up at the ferry building. That's right. Something funny's going on. My mom disappeared, and you gotta find her. This is a big waterfront, and where's the 200 bucks? You'll get that all right. Down by Pier 19, the van turned in. Think you can find Fleet Lady? I don't know. Who owns her? Woman named Sybil Thornton. She's uh, mixed up, I think. Yeah. Why steal your own horse? I don't know. Run a ringer, maybe. That's a tough trick. This woman's got some good ones. You want the two hundred bucks? Yeah. How are the odds? What's the difference? You're gonna open a book? You better take the two hundred bucks now. Yeah, the dough will keep. You sound frightened, Junior. And you sound nosy. Here's the two hundred. I want you to find the horse. You let me know at the Kingston Hotel, huh? Sure. And if you don't find anything around the waterfront, maybe you better try the track. Ask around there. Yeah. By the way, how do you fit in? How come you got $200 interest in that horse? Maybe I love horses. What do you care if maybe I love horses? I don't. The guy like you's got to love something. Oh, yeah. It was a sweet proposition. A jockey in search of a horse. There's something phony about the whole thing. I had the 200 bucks, but I didn't feel good. It was like a guy stealing a murder gun to help out in a scrap metal drive. Well, after the little guy left, I closed the office and started to hit the docks, but it didn't work out. You know, you can buy good whiskey these days, so you feel funny walking up to some guy on the pier and asking, have you seen a racehorse around here, mister? By nine, I was sure the horse wasn't around, so I borrowed a car and drove out to the track. I found out where Sybil Thornton's horses were quartered and headed down that way. It was pretty dark, so... When I bumped into her, all I got was a vague outline. She had a good-looking vague outline. Oh, I'm very sorry. Yeah, I'm full of regrets, too. Should we try it again? But you're a little mixed up in your animals. They keep horses here. You don't seem to mind. No, you lean nicely, but you'd probably feel safer with a platform. Yeah. Well, we try this again when I've had three good meals. That's a horse. Yes, I know. In fact, I own it. I see. That'd make you Sybil Thornton. Yes, what would it make you? A guy named Pat Novak looking for your horse. I was hired in the waterfront to find her. My, they grow big on the waterfront. You must get a lot of sun. By the way, is Fleet Lady missing? Your jockey says she is. That's why I'm snooping around. Didn't know he had any friends. He's got a checkbook. How about Fleet Lady? Is she tucked in bed? Yes. Well, let's take a look, huh? 
find it very dull, Mr. Novak. Yeah, that's what they said to Anthony. Let's see the horse. Suit yourself. She's down this way. Okay. I'm doing this out of the bigness of my heart. I think you're wasting my generosity, Mr. Novak. I don't use it all this trip. It's from the stable. Come on. Down about here. Fleet lady stall. Here. There's a flashlight on the wall. All right. Oh, poor thing. Do horses die broke, too? Who is it? Fleet lady? Yes, are you satisfied? No, I'm going to ring up headquarters. You crazy. Then I'm going to call Jackie Gregg and tell him his hunch paid off. I wouldn't do that, Mr. Novak. Stop kidding me, sweetheart. She didn't get killed in a fight with another horse. Gregg figured somebody was telling the machine. That's why Fleet Lady's dead. That's why I'm going to call headquarters. Suit yourself, but remember what happened to Fleet Lady. Are you getting tough, Angel? No. You just wouldn't look good with a saddle, Mr. Novak. <laughs> Well, I watched her as she turned and walked out of there. It was the kind of a walk that makes you flip the calendar and find out how far away spring is. I looked around a while, but it didn't do any good. The place was full of doors, so whoever killed Fleet Lady got out easy, like a rumor at a church picnic. I closed the door and went down the line to call the headquarters. As I stood in there talking, I saw Sybil Thornton drive away. It was a long convertible with red asbestos seat covers. After I called headquarters, I went back and waited near the stable. About a half hour later, a police car pulled up, and when I saw who got out, I began to get unhappy like a three-legged man in a ballet school. It was Hellman from Homicide, and he had a squad with him. All right, all right, I'll talk to him. Hello, Novak. Where's your trainer? Your boys get paid to laugh at you, Hellman. I don't. Yeah, where's the horse? What are you doing on the case? I came for the ride. You mind, Novak? No, I just wondered if they wised up downtown. Yeah. Because you could find a dead horse, Hellman. If they staked it out in the middle of Market Street, you'd find it before long. I'll try this time. Where is it? Stall 18, over there. Yeah. Keep an eye on them, boys. I'll be back in a minute. In here, Novak? Yeah, the one with the teeth like yours. You better shut up, Novak. Don't get jumpy. I, you haven't seen the horse. Just shut up, huh? It wasn't going to be much of a conversation anyway. What color horse was that, Novak? What do you mean? Take a look at it. Yeah, I did. I just took a look. It's a smart horse, Novak. What? That's right. That dead horse in there is wearing a double-breasted suit. Hellman got the message straight. I walked in and took a look. Jackie Gregg was lying there on the floor as dead as last year's love. The sickness didn't show until we rolled him over on his stomach. Somebody had gone duck hunting in the middle of his back. I began to feel a little sick myself, and I was ready to send out for the same gun when Hellman started to talk. You forgot to mention the guy when you phoned headquarters. He wasn't there. I was in here before, and the guy wasn't around. What was he doing under the horse? I don't know. Hellman maybe crawled out of a crack. I don't know. There were two shots. I came in and found the horse. Yeah? Check the horse. You're trying to tell me the horse shot back? Who is he? A guy by the name of Jackie Gregg. He gave me 200 bucks to find a missing horse. Yeah? A horse called Fleet Lady running into Mara's handicap. This is the end of the line. How do you know it's the same one? I don't. Maybe you've got to be a horse to tell. Why don't you ask one of your boys? <laughs> Yeah, your boy's real tough. Call him off, Hellman. He's nasty. We all hate him, Novak. It's all right. I'll put it on your bill, Hellman. That's good. You can write it up at headquarters. Hellman, you ought to rent an idiot. The heavy thinking's too much for you. I can piece this together. We come out here and find a dead man with you kicking up dust 40 feet away. Look, Hellman, I didn't kill the guy and call up headquarters. I know they're bad in homicide, but I'm not that big-hearted. We got a spare hook for you, Novak. That's where you stay until somebody gets you off. And you can start out with Sybil Thornton. Another horse? She's got the speed for it. Look her up. She owns Fleet Lady, and she was dashing around in the dark here, playing easy to get. I'll look her up. You better leave the boys behind, after all. She's only a woman. When you see her, ask her about that van down on the waterfront and what she was doing before I made that phone call. I'll tag all the bases. Don't worry, Junior. And if things fit together, you'll both be in the jug. I'll see you later. I got work to do. Yeah, it's getting late. You better put the boys back in the cage. I began to worry after Hellman left. There was no murder gun, and he didn't have too much to go on, but there was no one else wanted my job. Oh, I knew the girl was going to have an alibi, and I was the last guy that Jackie Gregg had seen. I had about as much chance as a fat girl at a Princeton prom. Hellman didn't like me, and he was a smart cop with a disposition like a ton of rhubarb. 
Well, I had to start right from scratch. I felt like Adam the first morning he woke up. So I looked up a guy named Jocko Madigan, an ex-doctor and a boozer who will give you a lift if you show him where the stirrups are. He's a good guy, but he thinks all food makes a gurgle. I hit all the bars and finally found him up at Maggie Nielsen's apartment. She's a good-looking voice that lives up on the hill, and Jocko was working his way into her liquor supply. Hello, Patsy. You're just in time to join me for my first drink of the evening, uh, or uh, one of my first at least. Yeah, I see. Maggie's not here, but I found her whiskey. It was in plain sight, locked in the closet under some newspapers. All right, Jocko, when are you going to sober up? Oh, I plan to do it briefly on April 1st, when the rest of the world plays the fool also. Look, I'm in trouble, Jocko. you got to help me. Good. I have a special bottle I use to forget your troubles. Now, look, stop caressing that jug and listen to me. I'm in a jam. Patsy, there's nothing in nature so sad as a half-empty bottle. It's like a broken vow or an unfulfilled promise in the skies. A falling star, almost. All right, Jocko. A falling star, and you shrug it off, never realizing that a whole world has ended at that moment. Yeah. A hundred million dreams, maybe, and you watch it fall and make an asinine wish. That's all the good it does a star to fall. It gives some kid a chance to wish for a bicycle. You all finished now, Jocko? Yes. What kind of trouble? Anything I could aggravate? I'm mixed up out at the track. A guy by the name of Jackie Gregg is dead and I don't look good. Oh, Hellman? Yeah. The guy's a jockey and he hired me to find a horse named Fleet Lady. Did you? The horse and the jockey ran a dead heat, but there's something funny about the whole deal. Did you talk to the jockey? No, not enough. Oh, Patsy, you've got to break yourself of the habit of waiting until people are dead before you think of a question. Jocko, I want you to hit all the horse rooms. Find out what you can about the sixth race tomorrow. It's the Bonanza Handicap. Now hurry up, will you? If it's the sixth race, why can't we wait a while? Start now. Get everything you can and call me. I'll leave a message at your place. Where are you going? I don't know. Maybe up to see the girl. Oh, Patsy, you're going to be waving at the hangman's wife when they spring the trap door. I gotta see her. She owns Fleet Lady. Well, why don't I see her? She's got a stake somewhere, and I got a lot of questions. What could you do up there? Ah, oh, yes. If it weren't an academic question, I'd argue the point. Oh, it looked like a bum deal right from the start. Patsy, you have the instinct for recognizing trouble, but not the intelligence to duck it. Save your breath, will you? You're like a man walking under a scaffold on a building. You realize it may crash down and kill you, but instead of hugging the building where you can't get hurt... Like every other dope, you scurry for the edge of the sidewalk where you're bound to get hit if it falls. Jocko, will you get out to those horse parlors? I need facts, not fables. Now, give me a hand. All right. Give my love to Fleet Lady. Her name's Sybil Thornton. I'll bet I'm not far wrong. Good night, lover. After I left Jocko, I went to the Chronicle Morgan looked up the NBC program director, Paul Stangle. We pulled out the clips on Sybil Thornton. They were nice and fat because she'd been to Reno four times and hadn't broke training for years. She'd been traded around more than a Red Sox pitcher. The clipping said she was 32. There were a lot of pictures. And from her eyes, you got the idea she was around 35. But there were arguments the other way, too. Well, there weren't any stories on her for the last few months, just a few items from the columns. They all said the same thing. She was hitting the night spots with a gambler named Rudy Hauser. There were pictures of him, too. Now, he would look good in a cave with heavy curtains. I asked Paul. He said Hauser had a gambling place out on Geary, so I took a cab out there. For ten bucks, the guy at the door said Sybil Thornton had left the place an hour ago. That made me feel good. When Hauser opened the door to his office, I lost the glow. Yeah? What's with you? I got a problem. You got the wrong door. Well, you can't get any tougher, so I'm coming in. Mm, suit yourself. I never throw anybody out until I'm sure they've lost all their money. What's on your mind? A horse named Fleet Lady. She disappeared at 7 o'clock tonight. Now you check under the rug, I'll try the cabin. She got back just in time to greet somebody's guns. If I say no, will you go out and lose your money like a good boy? Fleet Lady was owned by a gal named Sybil Thornton. The columns say you're number five on her list. Well, they never lie. The whiskey's too good. Also, a little bird says she was in your office an hour ago. That's right. She said your name's Novak. Yeah. Next time you got a bombshell, give it a test run. With Fleet Lady dead, your money's gonna look real good in the six tomorrow. Well, it makes you think the gal would throw a race. For the same reason she goes out with you? Huh? When a gal takes a great dane like you out in public, it generally means the guy's a few bucks ahead of her. <laughs> you wanna fight the team now, Novak? Mm-hmm. And just remember, sometimes you can't be right in a gentleman, too. Yeah. I hope that's the way you feel when they pick you up for Jackie Gregg's murder. Huh? Oh, you do a real nice double take, mister. The jockey checked out with a horse. 
I didn't know that, Novak. Yeah, with no brains, you built this gambling club. I didn't know he was dead. If I told you that, Novak, I'd meant it. He's all right for a little punk. I'm sorry he's dead. So's he. I'll see you later, Hauser. I gotta nose around and find out where you were tonight. Yeah. You seem all right, Novak. So I'll tell you. If you got any dough left when you leave my table, it's better on a horse named Fleet Lady in the sixth race tomorrow. Do you always bet on a dead horse? You got the tip? Use it or bury it, but don't loan it out. Oh, the case was a regular grab bag when I walked out of Hauser's office. I began to tick off the things that didn't add up. First on the list was that van down on the waterfront. If it was Fleet Lady, who got shot in the stable? If it was the ringer, that meant Fleet Lady would run tomorrow. Oh, I couldn't figure out why Hauser was so sure she'd win. An idea kept racing around the back of my mind like an ant in a cookie factory. Jackie Gray lied about that van down on the waterfront, but why? Not to bail me out of the poorhouse with 200 bucks. Oh, I got part of the answer when I stopped by the pay telephone and called Hellman. Yeah, Hellman talking. This is Novak. I got some news. You'll have to put it on the back page. What do you got? Your friend Jackie Gray had some love life. Well, there's a chance for you, Hellman. Who's the girl, Sybil Thornton? Yeah, we found her picture in his wallet. The gooey kind. I bet you stole it for long train rides. What time did he die? The right fit for you between 9 and 10 o'clock. Two shots from a 32 caliber pistol. How about the horse? 45 caliber. Two people. It's getting involved. Maybe, maybe not. You got two hands, Novak. Look up a guy named Rudy Hauser. He's got a joint out on Geary Street. I got enough friends. You look him up. I did. He's still talking about Fleet Lady and tomorrow's race. All right, maybe he's sentimental. Look, Novak, I'll pick out my own work. I don't need free help from you. Jackie Gregg paid 200 bucks and look what he got. That suits yourself, but Rudy Hauser and that gal are close friends. Yeah? Like two-part harmony in a telephone booth. Get off the dime, Hellman. Hauser's got that gal in his hip pocket. She owns Fleet Lady and he's betting her to win. You're trying hard, Novak. It's got to be a slow field to lose to a dead horse. Wake up, Hellman. You couldn't smell a rat in a basement full of cheese. I did all right in your apartment. Huh? That 32 caliber pistol, we found it in your place. See you later. <laughs> I wasn't too worried about that. Hellman's smart enough to know a phony plant. I began to think about that 32 caliber pistol. It's a woman's weapon. Well, that doesn't prove anything. So is a bread knife if she's in a bad mood. Must have been about midnight when I got to Sybil Thornton's place. She was wearing black lounging pajamas tied tight around a slim waist. She looked like a wasp with a nice sting. She had company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah. Mr. Novak, this is Ronnie Stark. Hello, Novak. Yeah. Well, he's not very friendly, Sybil. He's just parting because they're going to arrest him for Jackie's murder. How do you like Hellman? You've known him longer. Yeah. Somebody left the murder gun up at my place. Where you been all night? Please, Mr. Novak. You're embarrassing Ronnie. That's right. I'm blushing, and it's not the whiskey, Novak. I see. You must stay longer, Ronnie. Uh, she's persuasive, huh, Novak? See you tomorrow. You won't forget, Ronnie. No, I won't forget. I'm betting on you, Novak. What won't he forget? Mr. Novak, I hope nobody ever asks you that question. Hmm. You don't want to talk about putting that gun in my apartment? No. Let's talk about Rudy Hauser, then. Hmm? Your meat grinder friend. We just had a good talk, and he opened up a new road. What'd you tell him? Don't break a spring. He's all right. Will you do me a favor, Patsy? Like not talking to Hauser anymore? Huh? That's right. Won't do you any good, Patsy. It'll do me a lot of good. How's he going to know which horse got killed? I bet you lied to him, Angel. It's my apple cart, Patsy. Leave it alone. Sure. But play your hand right, baby. Because I'm going to watch your cards. And if you got one that says Jackie Gregg, I'm going to call you the hard way. Patsy, you nice beast. I really think you would. Sit down. Yeah. A drink? No. Do you good? Not right now. Well... You've read the book. Just a couple of chapters. I bet they're the right ones. You better watch out, baby. I may be a long shot. Well, you care as long as I bet. I don't. That's good. I didn't think you'd mind. Aren't you beginning to crowd the beachhead? Don't be a sissy, Patsy. You can't live forever. All right, Angel. It's time to wire the folks. Mr. Novak, just wait until you know me better. That's for me. I left the number. It's your fault, then. Yeah. Hello, Patsy. What'd you find out, Jocko? Not much. No 
nobody seems to care about the sixth race. I care about it. Oh, that's because you killed one of the jockeys. The rest of the people have a more casual interest. How do the odds run? Oh, no heavy favorites. Vinair and Sleepy Time Gal figure to be the best at around five to one. What about Fleet Lady? Down the line somewhere. I talked to one fellow. He says she's a dog and couldn't beat a paralytic goose over a hundred yards. Yeah, what else? That's all. What do you mean, that's all? Start digging, Jocko. We're not getting any place. Not even at your end? Huh? Well, I counted on you to do better than that. Good night, lover. <laughs> On the way home, I bought the morning papers. There was no story on Jackie Gregg, no details, and most of the story was a statement by Hellman on Hellman. There was no mention of Fleet Lady, and at one o'clock in the morning, there was nothing I could do but roll into bed. I woke up about nine, called Jocko. It was like sending a message out to the Farallones by Indian Runner. He just muttered and said he'd meet me out at the track. Well, I had to have some more dope, so I called Ira Snow... He calls the races and bets on them. The way he does it, a horse is a real beast of burden. He was playing elf when I got him on the wire. Yeah. Ira, this is Novak. What do you know about the Bonanza handicap? It's a horse race. Oh, you're funny. What about the field? Are the horses any good? Uh, for hamburgers, maybe. Nothing else. How about Fleet Lady? Eastern track. Nobody knows. Would she be worth a heavy plunge? Yeah, if you want to be a muck. What's this all about? Ira, I'm in trouble. How about a fix? Could they run a ringer in on Fleet Lady? Yeah, it's been done before, but it ain't easy. That's what I figured. How's Rudy Hauser on horses? He ain't. He got burned a long time ago. He never bets. Well, I think you're wrong. Look, Novak, I know every guy in town that's got the itch. Rudy Hauser, no. You know a guy named Ronnie Stark? Sure, he runs a book. Why? Nothing. May see you at the track. I'm going to make a bet. Yeah, I'll tell the horses. <laughs> That left me in a hole. If Ira was right, Rudy Hauser on Fleet Lady didn't make a bit of sense. I got out to the track about 2.30. Jocko was there, and Hellman was wandering around up in the grandstand where they couldn't push him into a starting gate. Sybil Thornton waved from her box as I walked by to get a better shot at the starting line for the sixth. They were almost at the post when Jocko came back from the betting window. Well, Patsy, I bet two dollars on a horse called Scotch Victory. It seemed like a good omen. Yeah. I saw your friend Rudy Hauser at the window. Huh? He was pouring money down on the favorites to win. Well, that's why the odds are going down on Vin Air and Sleepy Time Gal. Look at that board, will you? Yeah, Fleet Lady's gone all the way up to 12 to 1. Yeah, from 8 to 1, all the way up. Maybe the word got around she's dead. No. That's the funny part. She's down there. See, number three on the rail. Not a peep out of anybody. Stand up! Hot is going to the front by one length. Sleepy time gal by a head. Fleet lady between the horses is running third by one length. On the outside, it's Vinair and Old Soldier. Going into the clubhouse turn, it's hot weather by two lengths. Sleepy time gal by a half length. Fleet Lady is moving up on the outside. It's been air fourth by one length. An old soldier. Down the back stretch, it's hot weather by two lengths. Fleet Lady moving up on the outside is now second by one length. She runs Running well for a ghost. Yeah. Rudy Howes had better hurry up or he won't see much. What? He better hurry. He left the track ten minutes ago. Huh? Are you sure, Jocko? Yes, I heard him tell someone he had to make a phone call just before the betting closed. Well, Jocko, you're a sweetheart. Oh, I like to think Come on, let's go to that stable. Uh, the race is over. It was over five minutes ago. Well, how about my two dollars? Come on, will you? There's only one person who won't try to fix a horse race. That's a horse. Well, I knew there was going to be trouble fast. The horses were just coming under the wire when I waved to Hellman and started for the stable. When we got there, Sybil Thornton was clearing out like a fire sale. I'm in a hurry, Patsy, darling. Let me by. No, you made a bad play, Angel. Stick around. Let me by, Patsy. You heard him, lady. Stick around. Thanks, copper. I'll take charge. That's a big gun, Hauser. I got a big beef. He let me drop a hundred grand, Sybil. It's your idea, Rudy. Not this way. He let me drop a hundred grand because you ran Fleet Lady. The program said Fleet Lady, and that's who ran. I brought those odds into line at the window. My other lady looked bad on Fleet Lady. You didn't stay to watch her trail the field. All right, I didn't stay. You lost your hundred grand. You killed the ringer. 
You were a smart big shot who was going to sew up the race. You ran Fleet Lady and cost me a hundred grand. All right, cop, I'll move away from her. Over this way, Sybil. No. Don't let him do it, Patsy. I want to see how tough you are. Come on, Sybil. Let's you and me move against the stall. Watch out, Hauser. You're backing into the horse. Grab the horse, Novak. He's going to trample it. You grab him. It's your idea. Dan. Yeah. You should have learned the first time you can't beat the horses. That's a bump joke, Novak. I guess it is. Now that we're all here, who do we book for Jackie Gregg's murder? I'll answer that, friend. Who's this guy? It's one you missed, Hellman. Hello, Stark. Hiya, Novak. Well, what are you waiting for, Sybil? Tell the man you killed Jackie Gregg. Had enough trouble today, Ronnie. Well, you got more coming. Well, you figured it out yet, Novak? Hauser dumped his 80 grand on you. That's right, It's a lot of spending money. Wait a minute. Ronnie, I don't like this. You get your half, baby. I'm going to write out an I.O.U. When they book you for murder and the vote's in, you can't use it. You wouldn't do a thing like that, Ronnie. A dead girl can't spend 40 grand. She killed your guy, copper, and tried to palm it off on Novak. I was there, so I'll testify. Ronnie, you're a no good guy. Ah, don't be silly. I love justice. A booker for murder, copper. I want to tear up that I.O.U. Well, Hellman finally worked it out. It started out as a fixed race, and when they were all through, it was up to the horse. Rudy Hauser put the squeeze on Sybil for some dough. She offered to run a fast ringer in place of Fleet Lady, so Hauser could pick up a bag full. Rudy just wanted to make sure, so he sent one of his boys around to knock off Fleet Lady. Only the guy killed the ringer instead. Well, that was a break for Sybil. She made a deal with a bookie named Ronnie Stark to take all of Hauser's bets and guarantee him that Fleet Lady couldn't win because she wasn't that good a horse. It panned out that way. She let Hauser think Fleet Lady was dead. He spent the 20 grand at the window pushing up the odds on Fleet Lady and dumped another 80 on her to win. The moving van? Now, that was a phony story Greg used to get me to scare Sybil. He wanted in on the deal. He went back to the stable that night, got in a beef, and she killed him. She had him out in her car. When I went to make that phone call, she figured it was a good way to pass the buck. Well, Hellman asked only one question. Why would a nice, tame horse go crazy and trample a guy to death? Jocko had the answer. The horse that killed Hauser was a filly. Company has just brought you the fourth of a new series, Pat Novak, for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Rousseau. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. In our cast were Virginia Gregg, Tal Avery, Stacey Harris, Hugh Thomas, and Carlisle Bibbers. This program is being released to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations we will bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. listening reminder. Tonight, don't miss Jane Wyman when she guest stars and explains how she created her unforgettable role as the deaf mute in Johnny Belinda. Hear Jane Wyman tonight on this ABC station. This is ABC, the national broadcasting company.
What you doing, Bill? Yeah, what's it look like? Oh, I don't know. A gun needs cleaning every now and then, Sarah. It doesn't work when you want it to. Hmm. Some husband you are, always carrying a gun. Any complaints you've got, write them out and forget them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this baby's all loaded and ready to use. What do you use a gun for, Bill? Persuasion. What? Yeah, where's that gimmick I had here? I don't know. Oh, here it is. See, fits right on. Hey, that's a silencer, isn't it? Uh, you going to use that gun tonight? Uh-huh. On who? You. Me? Uh-huh. Bill, you crazy. You, you're not I'm going gonna... to kill you, and I'm going to get away with it, too. But... Because the police will say at the same time I kill you, the same gun kills somebody else 20 miles away. <laughs> the same gun, Sarah, at the same time it kills you. You get it? No, no, no. Bill, you're crazy. You're crazy. Oh, you no. don't get it, huh? No, okay. No, 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 no. Well, you got that, didn't you? Now, on to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends. Hello, Mr. Johnson. Oh, Bill King. What are you doing here at this hour? You'll find out. Get back here. Well, it's almost midnight, Bill. Can't you wait till morning, whatever it is? You can wait about 30 seconds, Mr. Johnson, and that's all. What do you want? I told you I paid you all the money I'm going to pay yeah, you. I know that. And you said you're going to the police. Now, well, uh, wait, wait a minute, Bill. Wait a minute. I was only joking about going to the police. It's I too didn't... late for that, Mr. Johnson. This gun's already killed one person, huh? my wife. No. And it's got to kill you to cover up. No, no. Well, it's exactly midnight, Mr. Johnson. Please, please. So... <laughs> exactly midnight, Mr. Johnson. Too late for anyone to be up. So... Pleasant dreams. Sorry I spilled that uh, coffee all over your arm, Jim. Did it burn? No, I just made a mess of my sleeve and trousers. Okay, though, Phil. It's just an accident. Look, here's a towel. <laughs> oh, here's your watch. Thanks. Oh. Let's get back to the game, huh? Yes, yes. Hey, what time is it, anyway? Uh, it's almost four. Almost four? Uh-huh. Huh? Ooh. Oh, you don't realize the time, do you, when you're in a good card game? And what's good about tonight's game? Well, okay, so you're having tough luck for a change. For a change? Nothing. I had a borrow of $50 from my friend Boston Blackie last week, and 35 the week before. Well, that's what friends are for. Yeah. <laughs> well, come on, the other guys are waiting. Right. Personally, I've got everything I've been waiting for. <laughs> According to the newspapers, it's incredible, Faraday. Incredible and fantastic. We've got to do something about it. You're incredible and fantastic, too, Blackie, and I'm going to do something about you. For instance. What do you take to get out of my office? You couldn't afford to pay it. Yeah, name it. Listen, Inspector. Is this case as impossible as the newspapers say? You figure it out. Two people were shot at exactly midnight, yeah. 20 miles apart. But ballistics says both bullets came from the same gun. Now, is that impossible? Or do you have one of your genius explanations for it? I wish I did. Any connection between two people? No, one was a man, one a woman. Do they know each other? Not that we know yet. And both were killed at the same time? Yeah. The time was midnight. I didn't give that information to the papers, but it was exactly 12 o'clock. Neighbors of the man who was killed, Carl Johnson, heard the shot at midnight. And neighbors of the woman heard a shot 20 miles away at the same time. That's right. And those are strange words for me to be saying to you, Blackie, so remember them. You'll never hear them again from me. I can't wait to get home to write them into my diary. Yeah, why not start home? Any suspects, Faraday? Any suspects, Faraday. Yeah, there's suspects. One, a guy named Bill King. We know Johnson was scared to death of him, and a guy answering King's description was seen leaving Johnson's place just after the shot. Apparently, you haven't picked up King. We've got men out for him. Uh, what are you going to do about him? Find him, of course, the hard way. By finding out something about the woman who was killed. What was her name? Sarah Adams is the only name we've got for her. She once was a burlesque queen, from what I hear. What about my suspect? Well, Faraday, maybe a way to find King is to check back on the Queen. What do you have, Mac? A little information, and the name's not Mac, it's Boston Blackie. Okay, Mac, what's with you? How's business? Not good. Well, this place looks as if it should do all right. You must have a theatrical following, haven't you? 
There's pictures of celebrities up on the wall there. Know any of them personally? What celebrities? They're just people who used to put on a good show here in my better days. Oh. I didn't give that information to the papers, but it was exactly 12 o'clock. Neighbors of the man who was killed, Carl Johnson, heard the shot at midnight. And neighbors of the woman heard a shot 20 miles away at the same time. That's right. And those are strange words for me to be saying to you, Blackie, so remember them. You'll never hear them again from me. I can't wait to get home to write them into my diary. Yeah, why not start home? Any suspects, Faraday? Any suspects, Faraday. Yeah, this suspect's one. A guy named Bill King. We know Johnson was scared to death of him, and a guy answering King's description was seen leaving Johnson's place just after the shot. Apparently, you haven't picked up King. We've got men out for him. Uh, what are you going to do about him? Find him, of course, the hard way. By finding out something about the woman who was killed. What was her name? Sarah Adams is the only name we've got for her. She once was a burlesque queen, from what I hear. What about my suspect? Well, Faraday, maybe a way to find King is to check back on the queen. What do you have, Mac? A little information, and the name's not Mac, it's Boston Blackie. Okay, Mac, what's with you? How's business? Not good. Well, this place looks as if it should do all right. You must have a theatrical following, haven't you? Those pictures of celebrities up on the wall there. Know any of them personally? What celebrities? They're just people who used to put on a good show here in my better days. Oh. Well, here's hoping you have them again. Thanks. They say there was a murder in that tenement house across the street, wasn't it? According to the papers. The woman who was killed, Sarah Adams. So? She came in here, didn't she? No. Never saw her. Never heard of her. Look, I got work to do. You have some talking to do. Hey, let go of me. I'll you... pull you across the counter yeah. on your chin if you don't start telling the truth. Lock up, guy. I'll bounce a sugar ball up the head if you don't take your hands off oh, me. Oh, yeah. When I say I don't know somebody, I don't know him. I'd like to give you a memory course, pal. Someday I will. Hey, what's this in this guy, Jim? Nah, it's not the main. I'll well, go on I back to your table. I'll bring you some java. Hey, I thought I heard him say something about Sarah Adams. No, no, no. Go on, will you? You know, she and me used to troop together, Hanson. <laughs> Yeah, Hanson, she and me used to troop together. Still, she got married. Whom did she marry? Keep your mouth shut, May. Brother, you're begging for a clip on the chin. Go ahead, May. Whom did she marry? <laughs> Fellow named King. Yeah, Bill King. Oh. Yeah, that's the guy. You wouldn't have to know if she knew a fellow named Carl Johnson, would you? Johnson? <laughs> sure, Sarah knew him in a house. <laughs> Made me laugh when I seen in the papers that Sarah and Johnson got killed. The cops couldn't find no connection. Is that so? Uh, what are you doing later, Hanson? Want to take a gal with a movie? Yeah, no, thank you. Hmm? Uh, say, you wouldn't know where I could find Bill King, would you? Hey, mister, I don't say I know everything. I... Just say everything I know. Easy now, Matthews, easy. Check, Inspector. You did good work in tracking him down. But if King's in that room at the end of the hall, maybe he's not alone. I know, Inspector Faraday. He has a gun with him. All right. Well, I'm ready for him with mine. Quiet. Here's the door. Do we knock it? Door. If it's not locked, well, if it is, we'll crash it. It's thin. So, but hello. Uh, All company. right, King. You're going to get a lot of things you don't expect. Come to headquarters with us, King. Yeah, what kind of headquarters? Boy Scout? Uh huh. Oh, no, no one. You're a policeman, aren't you? Walk toward us with your hands up, King. All right. Be kind enough to tell me what this is all about. There are two people we think you killed. Well, I think you'll have to prove that, won't you? I'll prove it, all right. We're going downtown. I've got a cell all picked out for you. It's no palace, King. But for a while, you're going to call it home. Mm-hmm. Hello. Mary, this is Blackie. Anybody call? Yes, Blackie. And don't you think it's time you either let me regain my status as your girlfriend or paid me for being a telephone operator? Take 20 years' notice on both jobs. Oh, that sounds more like it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mary. Well, but I have been busy. You know that. Mm-hmm. Who called? Faraday. He wants you down to headquarters. He's picked up Bill King. Good for the inspector. Yeah. Well, thanks, Mary. I'm on my way down to help send King up. Hey, Joe. Yeah. Come on, clean off the counter. It's a mess. It ain't anything like the mess you've got Bill King in with that big mouth of yours. 
Now, you didn't have no... I didn't get Phil in any mess. No. Oh. Phil's landlady just called. The cops picked them up. What for? What do you think? His wife was killed, wasn't she? So what? So, maybe Bill killed her. <laughs> maybe he never sent no buyers to the chair. Look, look. Somebody killed her. Bill and his wife didn't get along so good. So what? I don't get along with a lot of people. The cops ain't after me for murder. Well, they're after Bill for murder. And because you had to open your big yammer. You know what Blackie did after you talked? He went right down to where the cops were holding Bill. So he went to the cops. So, so they'll what? get Bill for murdering his wife. And then maybe killing that guy Johnson. He had a reason to kill Johnson, too, maybe. Maybe? <laughs> sure he had a reason. He had a reason to kill his wife, too. But the cops won't get him for it. Poor Joe. All right, Inspector, I like it here in your office. Now, that's temporary. If you like me here, I'll move in. Uh, what rent do you pay? Very humorous, isn't he, Blackie? King, why don't you get smart? Okay. You were positively identified as the man seen leaving Carl Johnson's house just after he was shot. And I found out at a little cafe that Sarah Adams was your wife. Aren't you the one? Uh, oh, by the way, if I killed Johnson, how could I have killed my wife 20 miles away at the same time? How's that possible? We'll figure that out later. King, on the night of the murders, where were you at 11 o'clock? From then on. Let me see. Oh, yeah, I was playing cards. One of the fellows I played with, Blackie's a friend of yours, I think. Who's that? I know who it is. A fellow named Jim Carter. Oh, you were with him all that time? I've sent for Carter, Blackie. He's this character's alibi. I see. Is Carter on the level? I'd bet on him. If Carter says King was with him, he was with him all right. Well, never mind, Carter. Now, King, look, we're not stupid. No. You're a cute kid. I think of... Come in. Inspector Jim Carter's here. The send him in. Yes, sir. This way, Carter. Thanks a lot. Of... Well, Blackie, hello. Hi, Jim. Hi. I've got a question to ask you. I'll save you some trouble, Blackie. Jim, the police think that I killed two people last night. Last night? Why, you killed three people last night, Bill. Three? What? 10.30. 11.30, huh? From there, we went to Harry's house, picked him up, and... Dro- one does. You were with King here from 11.30 on, and he didn't leave you for one minute? I was with him from 11.30 until after 4 a.m., and he didn't leave me for one minute. Well, gentlemen, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this is where I leave. Here. <laughs> And now, back to Boston Blackie. Bill King shoots and kills Carl Johnson at exactly midnight. Apparently, at exactly midnight, 20 miles across town, King's wife is killed. King is seen leaving the scene of Johnson's murder, but when he is picked up, Jim Carter, known and trusted by Blackie, definitely establishes that he was with King at the time of the twin murders. So King is set free. As we return to our story, Blackie is in the apartment of his friend, Mary Wesley, puzzling over the case. Blackie, this whole thing is impossible. The same gun couldn't kill two people 20 miles apart at exactly the same time. But it did, Mary. The oh. same gun at exactly the same time, midnight. Oh, no. Ballistics prove it was the same gun. Well, maybe Jim Carter was wrong about the time that King called for him. He says he wasn't. And he's honest, Mary. Well, an honest man can make an honest mistake. I'm considering that, too. Look, will you do me a favor? Well, sure, if I can. Get a pad and pencil and write down these questions I gave you. Yeah. Then go over to Jim's house and have them answered. Yeah, okay. I'll phone you there as soon as I get through. Get through with what? Faraday had to let Bill King go. Oh? Nothing on him. But I'm going to prove that he put something over on us. Hello, Jim. Oh, Bill. Come in, come oh, in. Oh, thanks. Saw your light on as I was driving by, so I thought I'd drop in and thank you. Thank me? For what? For helping me out. Helping you out? I don't see where I you helped you out. You told the police where I was last night when my wife and that guy Johnson were killed. You could have double-crossed me. Well, I don't see how I just told the truth. You were with me. Yeah, but you know, a friend who isn't a friend. Now, look, and... Bill, I don't know why you give it a thought. You were with me last night, and that's all there is to it. But there may be more to it, Jim. More to it? What do you mean? I mean, somebody might try to make you change your mind about last night. Might try to prove I wasn't with you. But you were with me, Bill, from 11.30 till after 4. And nothing and no one can ever tell me that you weren't. I 
Hey, Bill. How's everything? Slaughter night, Bill. Yeah. I heard you was at headquarters a while. Yeah, I just came from there, but they had to let me go. That's good. Tough about Sarah. Yeah, sure was. <laughs> I'm going to miss her. Uh, look, who talked? Not me. Boston Black, he admitted he was down here asking questions. Who gave him answers? Well, don't look at me. I didn't. But then who did? She did. Who? Over there in the booth. Hey, you oh, know how hey. women shoot their mouths off, Bill. Why, that... She didn't mean no harm, no, Bill. Never mind. I don't care what she didn't mean. Now, look, Bill, take it easy. Shut up, Joe. I'll handle this. Hello, Bill. Hey, there was a guy in here asking... Yeah, I know, May. Hmm? There was a dame in here talking. I don't like people popping off about me. <laughs> what you gonna do about it? Well, I'll do this about it. Oh. Here's another one. Maybe one more to shut you up for good. No, no, no. Hey, 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 come in. Boston Blackie, just come in. Blackie, come in. Yes, you're just going out, Bill. Down and out. No, you can't. No, I'm here, Blackie. This is our boy. No, I am. Very brave. Oh, thanks, mister. Thank you. That was my pleasure. <laughs> Jim, Blackie gave me this list of questions to ask you. What is this, a sort of written third degree? Oh, now, Jim. Mary, I told Blackie all I know. Well, apparently he hasn't asked you everything he wants to ask you. All right, let's have the questions. Okay. Question one. Why are you sure of the time when you got up last night? Because my wristwatch and the hall clock here had the same time. I didn't have to reset either later on. And my watch has been right ever since. Mm-hmm, okay. And question two. Did you at any time take your wristwatch off? No, I didn't. Yeah, wait a minute. I did. Oh? Bill accidentally spilled coffee on my arm during the card game and held my watch for me while I washed. Oh, where'll I make a note of that, Bill? But, Mary, if if Bill gimmicked my wristwatch, it it wouldn't have been right according to the hall clock. He didn't touch that. Oh, well, the third question's about the hall clock, Jim. Why are you getting dressed? Where was Bill King? Could he... Oh, I don't know. He was standing right around... Well, I'm not sure the rest of the question is, could Bill have had time to reset the hall clock before you two left to play cards? Yeah, he could have. He came out here and waited while I dressed, and I, I didn't look at the hall clock again before we left. That help you any? Oh, I don't know, but I'll let you know as soon as Blackie lets me know. Come on, Arane. Yeah. Wake up. Wake up. Uh, what Come for? On. Who's bothering me? Oh, it's you, Blackie. You sleep enough on your job. You don't mind my waking you up at home. I don't. What time is it? Look at your watch and see. It's exactly midnight. So what? So I just figured the way Bill King could kill two people at the same time. It isn't midnight at all, Faraday. It's 1 a.m. I set your watch back before I woke you up. Wait a minute. That's right, Faraday. You would have sworn in the morning that I was here at midnight. Sure. That's how King could have framed Jim Carter into giving him a perfect alibi. That's exactly how he did it. He woke Carter up at 12.30, not 11.30, and then later reset Jim's watch and clock to the correct time without Jim knowing. They played cards, and, you know, who thinks about time when they're playing cards? That's right. Congratulate me, Inspector. King could have been at Johnson's at the time Johnson was killed. You want me to congratulate you, do you? Well, if King killed Johnson at midnight last night, how did he kill his wife at the same time, 20 miles away, and with the same gun? Do you have to mention that? Yeah, I have to mention that. Faraday, your phone's... I can hear. Hello. Inspector, this is Matthews. What do you want? I'm sorry to bother you this time of night, Inspector. I'll bet. There's been another murder you'll be interested in. The dead man was Lenny Mitchell. Yeah? A pal of Bill King's. Used to work for him when King was in the rackets. A pal of King's, huh? That's right. Okay, I'll be down at headquarters in half an hour. Well, Blackie, we just... I know. I heard it. So Lenny Mitchell is number three on King's list. What do you mean, King's list? Okay, so King could have been at Johnson when Johnson was killed. We think King killed his wife. But when we try to pin those murders on him, we draw nothing but blank. Wait a minute. Faraday, blanks, blanks, that's it. Pick up Bill King again, Inspector. A couple of... King? He told you so. That's right. And if I killed Johnson, how could I have killed my wife 20 miles away at the same time Johnson was killed? Tell it to him slowly, Blackie. I will, Inspector. Go ahead. King, first of all, you weren't with Carter when Carter thought you were. Huh? You set back his watch and hall clock before you woke him. Did I? Yeah. Well, if I did that, wouldn't his watch be wrong from then on? And the clock, too? No, because you reset the hall clock while he was dressing and spilled coffee on his arm during the card game. When he took off his watch to wash, you reset it. King, a witness identified you as the man seen leaving Johnson's house just after Johnson was killed. Oh, that's very interesting. Thanks. 
But just to show you I'm a good sport, I'll say maybe I was at Johnson's when he was shot. Well, that's something. Let's even say I shot Johnson. But how could I have been 20 miles away and at the exact stroke of midnight killed my wife with the same gun that killed Johnson? Oh, we know that, too. Don't we, Blanky? We sure do, but Uh, I think King can do all the talking from now on. King, you said Johnson and your wife were both killed at the stroke of midnight, didn't you? Yeah, I did. How'd you know that? I read it, same as you did in the paper. The papers didn't mention midnight, King. What? All the papers said was at exactly the same hour. But they didn't mention the hour. The killer is the only one who would know that. That's it, King. You've made your mistake. Well, I get well King, what do you have to say for yourself? Your little plan didn't work, did it? I don't have anything to say. Why did you kill your wife, Ann Johnson, and your friend Mitchell? I can tell you why he killed Lenny Mitchell. King killed his wife, let's say, at 11 o'clock with a silencer on his gun. Then he went to Johnson's without the silencer. Got there at midnight and killed him. And at the same time, in his wife's apartment, 20 miles away, Mitchell fired a blank cartridge. Just to confuse us. Now, do you want to go on from there, King? I don't know how you figured it out, Blackie. I thought when I killed Mitchell to keep him quiet that nobody would ever know how I did it. Well, we found out how. Now we want to know why. Well, I'm not positive why, Faraday, but I can guess. Johnson was in love with King's wife before King married her. But Johnson already had a wife. Right, King? Yeah, that's right. And after I married Sarah, I, I saw a chance to make some easy dough to take Johnson down. Go on. Well, after a while, he got tired of paying, said he'd go to the cops. So then I decided to, well, to get rid of him and my wife. You tried to get away with murder by fixing a clock, King, but take my word for it. Time's run out on you. I'm waiting, Mary. Be right there, Blackie. I'm just getting my hat on. Oh, there we are. Well, worth waiting for? It sure was. Oh, by the way, did I tell you what a good telephone operator you were? Well, I helped get Bill King's number, didn't I? That kind of talk is my exclusive property, Mary. <laughs> but you did help. That information from Jim Carter was just what I needed. And all the time I thought it was I you needed. <laughs> oh, you see how wrong I can be? I needed you to help me get the information. Well, you could have sent a telegram and you wouldn't have had to take the messenger boy out to dinner the way you're doing for me. Oh, Blackie, this was a very complicated case, wasn't it? I wouldn't say it was complicated, just impossible. Oh. But there was a fallacy somewhere and all I had to do was find it. Mm-hmm. A gun can't be in two places at the same time, neither can a person. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Every time you work on a case, even though I'm in my own apartment, I'm with you every minute. Oh, that's very sweet. But talking about minutes... How about a minute steak? Mm, I'm hungry enough to eat an hour steak. All right with you? Definitely. You know something? I know a lot of things. What do you have in mind? I just happen to think. If well, Bill King hadn't said the murders were committed at the crack of midnight, we might not have been able to prove our case. That wasn't a crack of midnight, Mary. For him, that was a crack of doom. <laughs> From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Joe McNabb, Johnny. Try Eastern Indemnity. Oh, hi, Joe. What's up? The star of Cape Town. Star of Cape Town. Constellation, celebrity, or ship? Wrong three times. The star of Cape Town is a diamond about the size of a jumbo olive. Oh, sounds like it'd make a nice ornament for a martini. Except I'm strictly a lemon peel man. Oh, this is serious, Johnny. I'd like you to take a look at it. Now, what's so interesting about it, except it's probably worth $100,000? Make it 150 that's what we've insured it for. Oh? Got quite a history to it. Three men we know of have been killed over it in the last 50 years. This stone I'd like to see. Where is it? Name of the stone, Johnny. Star of Cape... Hey, wait a minute. In Cape Town, South Africa? That's right. Interested? I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-Eastern Indemnity Associates Home Office. Following is an accounting of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Star of Cape Town matter. Expense account item one, $1.50 cab fare from my apartment at the office of Tri-Eastern Indemnity Associates. Joe McNabb was waiting for me. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. 
So what about the star of Cape Town? Sounds interesting. You're interested, we're worried. What about it? Ever hear of Andrew Lanning Forbes the Third? Forbes, Forbes. Seems to me I've seen his picture in the papers a couple of times. International playboy type, isn't he? That's the one. He owns the star of Cape Town now, inherited the stone after the recent death of his aunt. So? Johnny, like I told you, we've got that diamond insured for 150000 bucks. But Forbes treats it like it was a ten-cent store hunk of costume jewelry. What do you mean? He carts it from place to place wherever he goes. Paris, Rome, the Riviera, you name it, he's been there. And so is the star of Cape Town. Ooh, you mean that Oh, this... he keeps it in hotels safe, stuff like that, but that isn't good enough. We want him to put it in permanent custody somewhere. Yeah, I see your point. But he won't seem to listen to reason. And right now, it's a particularly bad period for us. How come? Forbes seems to be in one of his party-giving moods. He has them every once in a while. About three weeks at a time, a big party every night, wherever he happens to be. Then he quiets down for a month or two. Yeah, probably resting up. But how, uh, how come he's in Cape Town now? Who knows? Who knows why he goes anywhere he does? Oh, brother, sounds like a real character. Yeah, but what we want you to do is to talk him out of being a character long enough to put that diamond in a safe place and to keep an eye on it until he does. We got a plane reservation for you tonight at midnight. Tonight? Now, just a minute. Now, look, if it's the money you're worried about, don't be. This means a lot to us. We're willing to pay accordingly. Joe, you may not believe this, but I wasn't thinking about the money. Then what? Those three men who got killed over that diamond. You told me about them over the phone. Oh, that. Look, the diamond's 50 years old. Those three killings were 20, 30 years ago. Just the same. Three is always a crowd. And I wouldn't like to see it increase by one. Expense account item 2360, cab fare to my apartment to pack and then to the airport. Where Joe McNabb met me and told me three tired jokes in two minutes in a very subtle attempt to keep my mind off the three dead men as he gently steered me to the plane. Item three, plane fare to Cape Town, South Africa. The plane came in over Cape Town in the early afternoon. Off to one side toward the famous Devil's Peak and down below, the bay glittered like... Yeah, it looked like everything was trying to remind me of that diamond. As if I could forget a stone worthy of 150000 in the lives of three people. Item 5, cab fare to the residence of Andrew Lanning Forbes III. He'd rented a mansion on the side of a hill. I was ushered onto a terrace overlooking the city and the bay. Forbes was waiting for me with a drink in his hand. He was a thin-faced, elegant, tired-looking character whose deep tan didn't hide the lines on his face. He could have been anywhere from 35 to 50. May I offer you a drink, Dollar? Well, uh, a little early in the afternoon, isn't it? Oh, is it? I might cool you off. Okay, thanks. Say, it's uh, quite a place you have up here. Uh, it's adequate. <laughs> you seem amused. Well, there must be 15, 16 rooms at least. Roughly. Adequate seems kind of like an understatement. Uh, quite possibly. Here you are. Ah, thanks. Look, Dollar, it was very thoughtful of the insurance company to send you all the way down here, but... Also, it was... Uh, well, uh, wouldn't unnecessary be the word? Well, that depends, Mr. Forbes. <laughs> what do you mean? The company I represent is pretty jittery over that diamond of yours, the star of Cape Town. Mm-hmm. Would you like to see it? Well, yes, but I think we ought to... Yeah, here it is. You carry it around in your pocket? Well, why not? I have no holes in my pockets. Oh, now, look, Forbes. But no, 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 I'm, I'm really not as bad as that dollar. I, I was expecting you, so I thought I'd play a little joke on you. <laughs> hey, Mr. Forbes, that kind of humor shortens my life. Yeah, well, I suppose it was a bit cruel. Well, there it is. What do you think of it? McNabb said it was the size of a jumbo olive. Looks more like a golf ball to me. Quite vulgar, isn't it? Oh, what a cutting job they did on it. Whew, beautiful. There must be a thousand fests. Yeah, all of them glittering, all of them cold, all of them surface. <laughs> Rather like life, don't you think? Um, look, Mr. Forbes, if you don't mind, let's skip the philosophy for a minute and talk about the diamond. Oh, of course. You're still concerned about his safety. Well, perhaps this will reassure you. Will you come with me? Sure. This way. I have a very efficient wall safe in my bedroom. In here. So, you see, I do take precautions. Here we are. There. Are you reassured now? No. Your bedroom opens off the terrace. It'll be too easy for somebody to get it that safe. Very well, Mr. Dollar. After tonight, I shall place the diamond in a bank vault. That's the best news I've had all day. Yes. Tonight's party will be my last for a while. Party? 
For Agatha. Who's Agatha? Oh, she's my elder sister. She's on a world tour arriving here in Cape Town later this afternoon. I'm going to surprise her. Hey, wait a minute. You came all the way here to Cape Town to throw a surprise party for your sister? Well, I wasn't doing anything else at the moment. <laughs> Why not? Well, I can think of a couple of reasons, but uh, they probably wouldn't sound convincing to you. Probably not. Although they probably would sound convincing to Agatha. Oh? Yeah, she and I are quite different. Half the time she worries about me, and the other, other half the time she disapproves of me. She considers it quite beneath the dignity of the Forbes name for me to go popping around from place to place like this. I see. Uh, she's quite devoted to the cause of the Forbes name. To make sure it keeps standing for, well, whatever it's supposed to stand for. I was never quite sure myself. So you're giving her a surprise party tonight. Will she like the idea? Probably not. That's what makes it fun. Oh, by the way, would you like to come? <laughs> well, under the circumstances, I think I'd better. I, um... I wonder if I could have a guest list. A guest list? Oh, good heavens. You mean you don't have one? Well, of course not. I just invite people here and there and wait to see who turns up. Then you don't have any idea who all's coming? Absolutely not. <laughs> Donna, that's the only thing that makes these parties worthwhile. Oh, great. A character with a quaint habit of carrying his diamond in his pocket, throwing a party where he didn't know who was coming. This was a situation not calculated to help my peace of mind, believe me. Forbes had his driver take me back to town. I stopped along the way at police headquarters and talked to Lieutenant Van Tyle, who agreed to furnish a man to help me keep an eye on the party. Expense account item six, cab fare back out to Forbes' house that evening for the party. I thought I was getting there early, but there were already quite a few people about. A stocky bartender shoved a drink in my hand as I walked in, and I took a look around. Quite a brawl. Then I spotted a girl with honey-colored hair and a green dress that matched her eyes. Well, it was as good a place to start as any. Hi. Hi. My name's Johnny. I know. Oh? I'm Sheila. You a friend of Forbes? My, you are new around here, aren't you? What do you mean? You'll find me at most of Andy's parties. He arranges my transportation. Let's see. Do you? What's your excuse for being here in this gay, mad throng? You an old friend, too? Uh, matter of fact, no. I just met him this afternoon, and he invited me to come. That's par for the course. Ah, here you are. Oh, Forbes. I'm glad you two have gotten acquainted. Enjoying yourself, Sheila? Delirious. <laughs> Isn't she wonderful, Johnny? She's always so gracefully bored. You see, Johnny, I perform quite a useful function around here. I'm always good for laughs. Uh, yeah. Well, um... Is your sister enjoying the party, Forbes? Agatha? Why, of course not. <laughs> Haven't you met her yet, John? No, no, I haven't. Well, she's over by the window. The thin, aristocratic, tired-looking lady. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, that's her look at disdain. She thoroughly disapproves of this whole party, and of me, of course. And of me. <laughs> Come along, Johnny. I'd like you to meet Agatha. Uh oh, you're taking a chance. She'd probably disapprove of me, too. Oh, no, no. You look like the respectable type. Thanks. I guess. She'd thoroughly approve. I, oh, I, I seem to have another guest arriving. Would you two excuse me? I, I'll introduce you to Agatha later, Johnny. Yeah, sure. The perfect host. When he wants to be. Oh. Who's the new arrival? Her name is Helen. Andy met her a day or two ago. Well, I'll say this for her. Yes. Isn't she? <laughs> Sorry. Don't be. I'm used to it. You know something, Sheila? I don't get you. Oh, I'm not so hard to figure out, Johnny. I think you are. You don't like these parties any more than Agatha. Oh, now watch it, Johnny. You start comparing me to her, and she's going to disapprove of you. Okay, but I still don't get it. You don't like the parties or Forbes' other friends, yet you keep... Tagging along. Yeah, I've got a perfect attendance record. Why? Well... I guess there's one obvious reason, but that would sound real corny. Maybe not. So let's just say that after you've been riding the merry-go-round long enough, standing on solid ground doesn't seem normal. Oh. Well, maybe if you keep riding that merry-go-round, you'll grab the brass ring someday. Don't bet on it. Sheila drifted over to the bar, where she sat quietly drinking the rest of the evening. I somehow felt sorry for her. But I knew she'd bought her own ticket to the merry-go-round, at least for the first ride. I looked over at Forbes and started sweating. He was showing the diamond off to the party. But before I could get to him, Agatha did. She must have told him in dignified but firm tones to put the ice on ice. He laughed and took it back to his room, so I relaxed. The party dragged on. Agatha managed to look frigidly pained the rest of the evening, but Forbes was obviously enjoying himself with Helen. 
They danced, then went out on the terrace. Sheila turned her back and concentrated on her drink. Finally, I went over to the bar. Sorry, Johnny. Looks like the bartender's gone home. That's probably a good idea. Good night. She headed carefully for the door and went out. Then I realized I hadn't seen Forbes for 10 or 15 minutes. I went out on the terrace. Nobody in sight. I walked to Forbes' bedroom door. Mr. Forbes? Forbes? No answer. One lamp was lit. Forbes was on the floor. The knife had gone in low under his ribs. He probably hadn't made a sound. Nearby was the case in which he kept the star of Cape Town. It was open and empty. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a girl who is exciting, beautiful... And deadly. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Lieutenant Van Tyle of the Cape Town Police, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yeah, Lieutenant. I've been trying to get you. Anything new on the Forbes murder? I'm afraid not. How about the diamond? It's still missing. Oh, so far we're batting zero. Any suspects? Oh, yes, indeed. Who is it? Not it, Mr. Dollar. They. What do you mean, Lieutenant? How many guests would you say were at Andrew Forbes' party last evening? Um, uh, sixty... Then we have 60 suspects. Oh, great. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cape Town, South Africa, to the Home Office Tri-Eastern Indemnity Associates. Assignment, the star of Cape Town Matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 7, cab fare from my hotel to police headquarters. So far in this job, I'd been a big, brilliant nothing. I figured Lieutenant Van Tyle of the Cape Town Police might be able to supply a few answers. But as it turned out, all he had on his mind was questions. Now, Mr. Dollar, suppose you sit down and explain your connection with this affair. Sure, Lieutenant. I can make it short, if not sweet. Andrew Forbes was an international playboy. I am well aware of that. Cape Town has entertained Mr. Forbes before, or vice versa. Well, then you probably also know that he recently inherited a very large diamond known as the Star of Cape Town. Yes. The company I represent was carrying the insurance on that stone, $150,000. They didn't like the way Forbes was flashing it around. They thought he was a bit too careless with it. 
I was trying to talk him into using a little common sense. And that is why you came here to Cape Town? Yeah, but it looks like I've struck out. Struck Forbes out. is dead and the diamond's gone. You were at the party from some time before Forbes' murder until afterwards, hmm? That's right. You stayed in the main room the entire time? Well, yeah. Oh, now look, Lieutenant, I'd hardly fly all the way here to bump off a guy. Just that's... questions, Mr. Dollar, just questions. Yeah, but what I need right now is answers. As do I. These other guests at Forbes' party, did you know any of them? No. Well, I met a girlfriend of his named Sheila, and a couple other people were pointed out to me. Who were they? Oh, Forbes' older sister, Agatha, for one. A real aristocratic type. You can cross her off your list. Oh? Yeah, she disapproved of Forbes, all right, but not to the extent of sticking a knife in him, I'm pretty sure. It would have been beneath her dignity, if nothing else. Besides, she didn't leave the main room during the party, either. Then there was Helen. Helen who? Well, I never did find out her last name. She arrived at the party late, and Forbes seemed to zero in on her right away. Zero in? I mean, he spent the rest of the evening with her. They danced for a while, then they went out on the terrace and... Come to think of it, I never did see her come back inside. And I didn't see Forbes again either until I went to his room and found him dead. I see. We shall try to find this Helen. Can you describe her? Well, I didn't get nearly as close a look as I'd have liked to. Oh? Yeah, from what I could see, a real doll, Lieutenant. Dark hair, turn-up nose, fine complexion. Uh, Mr. Dollar, we need an objective description, not an appreciation. <laughs> well, at the time, I was more interested in her as a prospect than a suspect. I see. And you say you knew none of the other guests? That's right. We've been unable to find any sort of guest list. Oh, don't waste your time looking. There isn't any. No? Yeah, Forbes explained that he had a charming habit of inviting whoever he ran into. He said that half of the fun was in seeing who turned up. Well, that rather complicates matters, doesn't it? It sure does. Mr. Dollar, diamond thefts are not unknown to us here in Cape Town. No, I imagine not. Here are some photos of known jewel thieves. Hmm, mug shots, huh? Please see if you'll recognize any of these people as having been at the party. Well, it'd be a little hard to remember. You know, people were drifting in and out all evening, and it was... Wait a minute. Who's this guy? That is Julio Biak, a jewel thief. Do you recognize him? Starkey guy. Yeah, sort of looks familiar, but I can't seem to place him. Could he have been at the party? Oh, it's possible, but I can't be sure. Perhaps it will come to you later. I hope something comes to me sooner or later. That diamond, for instance. But at this point, I had to admit it didn't look very likely. One murder, 60 suspects. You get better odds than that on a roulette wheel. I left headquarters and decided to walk around a little, see if I could coax up some kind of ideas to my next step. I went down to the waterfront and looked around. Nice view, no ideas. Then, as I was walking along a narrow, deserted street, I realized I had company. The shadow from the top of the building next to me ran along the middle of the street, and I could see a silhouette. I stopped. So did the shadow on top of the building. I started up again. So did the shadow. I started edging out away from the sidewalk for a look. The shadow raised its arms suddenly, and I ducked. A large building tile crashed to the sidewalk right where I'd been a second ago. I jumped for a rickety fire escape over my head and scrambled up to the roof. Nobody in sight, and roofs stretching out in all directions, warehouses, loading sheds. Whoever it was could have been a block away by now. Pretty ironic. Somebody trying to take me out of the ball game when I didn't even know which team had the ball. I went back to my hotel room. Two steps inside, I stopped cold. I'd caught a whiff of what smelled like a pretty expensive perfume. It certainly wasn't my shaving lotion. Hello, Johnny. Wow. Sheila. Yeah. Yeah, I remember now. You were wearing that perfume at the party last night. I've been waiting for you. Let's talk. Uh-huh. Any particular subject? Last night. What happened, oh, Johnny? Oh, give me that. You were there, too. You remember. I left before it happened. I think. What do you mean, you think? I guess I had a few too many last night. I don't remember some of it. No? You were making pretty good sense when I was talking to you. Well, after that, I mean. And you were with it enough to react when Forbes and Helen went out on the terrace together. Don't, Johnny. Did you do it? Oh, well, now, that's a switch. I'm not kidding, Johnny. You went to his room There's and... only one way you'd know that, Sheila. You were outside somewhere watching. 
Yes. After I left, I went around and back. And? Pretty soon, Helen came out of his room. She was carrying something. Oh, what? Don't worry, it wasn't the diamond. I was close enough to see it. Even if I hadn't been, I guess I'd have known. What do you mean? It was a small bottle of perfume. That was always the first step. Perfume. And always the same kind. Oh, that kind you're wearing. Yes. It's got a great name. Forever. What happened then? I walked around the garden a few minutes, trying to decide whether to have it out with Andy once and for all. I started back toward the terrace, then I saw you heading for his room, so I left. I said, don't, Johnny. If I'd done it, would I have told you I was out in the garden? You would if you were afraid somebody would seen you there and would tell me about it. Oh? And I suppose you figured out a motive for me, too. A couple of possibilities. You told me you'd been on a merry-go-round with Forbes for a long time. Maybe you couldn't stand the thought of anyone else getting aboard. Helen? That sort of thing's happened before, Johnny. Or maybe you figured the only way to get off that merry-go-round was to get rid of the guy who ran it. And the diamond. That could buy you a lot of rides somewhere else. And I thought I was the cynic. You really have a nice opinion of people, haven't you? I'm afraid most of the people I get myself involved with on these jobs aren't very nice, you know. I didn't do it. All right, if you didn't, I'm sure Lieutenant Van Tyle will find out. I know, I'm on my way there now. Oh? He phoned me an hour ago. I thought I'd stop by and talk to you before I went. Johnny, you don't really think I could do a thing like that, do you? I guess not, Sheila. One thing I am interested in, though. What's that? You're finally off the merry-go-round. How does it feel? It isn't real. That merry-go-round was all I ever knew. She walked out of the room looking, well, empty is the best word I can think of. And I kept wondering what she'd been like before the merry-go-round. The rest of the day I spent composing soothing cablegrams in reply to angry ones from McNabb of Tri-Eastern Indemnity. The inquest was the following morning, but the verdict was no help. Death at the hands of person or persons unknown. Lieutenant Van Tyle told me that Forbes' sister, Agatha, had decided to shove off that afternoon on the Southern Empress. So I went down to the dock and aboard ship an hour before sailing, hoping I could get in a word with her. Farewell parties were clogging the lounges and the passageways. I waited outside Agatha Forbes' stateroom until she arrived. Miss Forbes? What? Oh, Mr. Dollar, isn't it? Yes, I didn't have a chance to meet you at your brother's party last night. He told me about you. It's too bad you weren't able to persuade him to put that... That diamond into safety sooner. Miss Forbes, I wonder if you'd answer a few questions about... I'm very sorry, Mr. Dollar. I am completely exhausted. I don't wish to talk about it. But there are certain... I made my statement to the police. There's nothing further to add. About the diamond, however. There's been too much publicity about the entire tragedy as it is. I have no wish to add to it. I'm very sorry, Mr. Dollar. I shall be in New York in a month or so. Perhaps I shall have recovered from the experience sufficiently by then to talk about it. Only trouble is, by then the diamond could be in Timbuktu or... See you later, Miss Forbes. What snapped me into action was a glimpse of a girl at the end of the passageway just entering the lounge. I couldn't be sure, but it looked like Helen. By the time I reached the lounge, she was nowhere in sight. Then I saw another familiar face over in one corner. The mugshot I'd seen at police headquarters. Julio Biak, jewel thief. And now I had him pegged. He'd been the stocky bartender at Forbes' party, the guy who disappeared just before the murder. He spotted me and ducked into a passageway. I went after him. He turned a corner, and that was his mistake, blind alley. So I closed in on him. We circled. Now, I was at the blind end, and that was my mistake, because suddenly there was a knife in his hand. He held it low like an expert. Now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, you must have a trunk full of knives, Julio. Oh, I need this one. Just like the one you slipped into Forbes, huh? And you... He lunged at me. I ducked to one side and kicked at the knife. He whirled and dove, but now I had it. I'm glad you had him sent ashore and locked up, Mr. Dollar. It may be you have found our killer. But not the diamond, Lieutenant. It was not on him, eh? Nowhere. And that can mean just one thing. Either Julio was working with somebody who's sailing on the Southern Empress, or he's after somebody aboard who has the diamond. In that case, Mr. Dollar... In that case, the Southern Empress is going to have another passenger, me. I checked with a purser who agreed to squeeze me aboard. Then I headed back to my hotel room to pick up my luggage. I could still smell Sheila's perfume in the room. 
Then as I bent over to lock my suitcase, I spotted a movement out of the corner of my eye. I tried to whirl, but too late. Something hard connected to the back of my left ear, and I went down. And out. I don't know how long it was before I came to. The room was swimming, but I managed to get to the window and looked out. Then I realized somebody had voted me the man they'd least like to take a cruise with. The Southern Empress was underway and steaming out of the harbor. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, I take a trip, all right. A one-way trip. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Van Dyle of the Cape Town Police. I was just going to call you, Lieutenant. Is something the matter? You sound very strange. Probably from nursing a lump on my head that had put the star of Cape Town to shame. Uh, I don't understand. You found the diamond? No. To put it politely, somebody slugged me here in my room a while ago. Why? To keep me from sailing on the Southern Empress. She just shoved off, and I've got a strong hunch that diamond is aboard. That bears out what we've learned from Julio Biak. Did he confess to false murder? No, but we're fairly certain he's involved. However, he swears he does not have the diamond. Either he passed it to somebody aboard the Southern Empress, or he was chasing whoever's got it. Lieutenant, I've got to get on that ship. You say it is now on the way? And out of the harbor. You wouldn't happen to have a stray helicopter around, would you? I can make arrangements for one with the military... Can you be at the airfield in 15 minutes? Make it 10. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cape Town, South Africa. To the Home Office, Tri-Eastern Indemnity Associates. Assignment, the star of Cape Town Matter. Expense account continued. Item 8, cab fare to the airfield where the helicopter was waiting for me. I don't know which was throbbing the most, the helicopter engine or my head. On the way out to sea, I had time to try to put the pieces together. But as usual, they didn't fit. A playboy named Andrew Forbes inherits a diamond called the Star of Cape Town worth 150 Gs. The insurance company gets fidgety at the way Forbes is flashing the stone around. So they send me to Cape Town to talk some sense to him. But now Forbes is dead and the diamond is missing. And the fact that his probable killer was picked up aboard the Southern Empress before it shoved off convinces me the stone is somewhere on that ship. But I've got no proof, even though I'm breaking my neck to get there at the moment. (laughs) 
We picked up the Southern Empress about 20 miles out at sea, and the helicopter pilot set me down on deck at the stern. A crowd of passengers had gathered, but I didn't see Forbes' sister Agatha, nor Helen, the girl who'd spent so much time with him the night he was killed. I got me a room, then headed for Agatha Forbes' stateroom. As I stood at the door, I caught a whiff of Forbes' favorite perfume, Forever, the kind Sheila had worn. Yes, what... Wow. It's Helen, isn't it? I don't think we've met, Mr... Dollar, Johnny Dollar. No, no, we haven't met officially, but we were both at Forbes' party the other night. You wish to speak with Miss Forbes? And you too, Helen. Who is it, Helen? Uh, Mr. Dollar, I'll be in my stateroom if you want me, Miss Forbes. Well, Very well, my dear. Uh, just a minute, Helen, I... Hmm. Well, Mr. Dollar, I must say you are a persistent person. On my job, I have to be, Miss Forbes. Well, as long as you're here, you might as well sit down. Oh, thanks. I still would rather not talk about what's happened. Well, I can certainly understand that. But if I can throw any light on it, which I doubt very much, then I suppose it's my duty to. One thing I must ask, however... What is it? That there be as little additional publicity as possible. Forbes' name has been dragged through the dirt enough as it is. I'll do my best. Very well. What is it you want to know? Well, several things... First, do you think your brother could have been killed for a motive other than the diamond? Why, I hadn't thought of that. After all, you must admit that a diamond like the Star of Cape Town would be motive enough to the kind of people my brother thought it amusing to consort with. Yeah, you're probably right. But I'm trying to cover all the possibilities. How about your brother's friend Sheila, for instance? I prefer not to discuss her. But do you think she could have done it? I don't know. I'm afraid I wouldn't put anything past her. All right, another thing, Miss Forbes... I was pretty surprised to find Helen here in your stateroom when I knocked. Why? I didn't know you knew her. I have engaged Helen as my traveling companion. Oh. Kind of sudden, wasn't it? As a matter of fact, it was. My brother had told me about her. For one of the few times in his life, he was right about someone. She's a thoroughly nice person. So you hired her? I think I told you before how exhausted I am by all this. I needed someone to make arrangements for me. The last moment she decided to make the trip, and I was delighted. Uh-huh. She made up her mind at the last moment, huh? May I ask why all these questions about her? Well, right now, she's pretty high on my list of possible... That's impossible. As far as we know, she was the last person to see your brother alive. And I refuse to believe she could possibly be involved. I hope she isn't. But I've got to run down every lead I can get. If I don't recover the star of Cape Town, the company I represent is on the hook for $150,000. I have not filed a claim as yet, Mr. Dollar. Nor do I propose to until we reach New York. I shall give you every opportunity to recover the diamond. I appreciate that, Miss Forbes. But I'm afraid it still doesn't leave me much time. I went back to my stateroom. The door was open. But I was sure I'd closed it when I left. Inside was the same lingering smell of the same lingering perfume. Forbes' favorite forever. Sheila wore it. But as far as I knew, she was still in Cape Town. Then I remembered her saying that Forbes had given Helen a bottle of it. I also remembered smelling it in my Cape Town hotel room just before I got slugged. I thought then it was a carryover from Sheila's earlier visit. Now I wasn't sure. I started back out of my stateroom just in time to collide with somebody in the passage. Oh, oh, sorry. Whoa. Say, partner, you sure took the wind out of my sail. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know anyone was out here. Oh, I just passing by, partner. Stacy's the name. Ben Stacy. What's yours? Uh, dollar. On the level? Yeah, cross my heart. Well, when I tell people I bumped into a guy named Dollar aboard a boat, I'll mean it, huh? <laughs> See you around, partner. So he could have been just passing by, like he said. But if so, he moved awfully quietly for a guy his size. I locked my door and headed for the bar. Expense account item 9150, a double martini, which occupied me just long enough to get a couple of things nailed down in my mind. Namely, open stateroom doors and the smell of perfume. Ah, oh, it had to be Helen. No two ways about it. At this point in my brilliant chain of deductions, I made a big mistake. I looked down toward the other end of the bar. And the person I saw sitting there made me realize in one big hurry that my train of thought had just gotten itself derailed. Hello, Sheila. Hi, Johnny. I thought you were back in Cape Town. Why should I be? What's to stay for now? Good question. But you didn't tell me you were leaving. You didn't ask me. Sit down. You must have decided in a hurry. 
That's the only way I ever decide anything. Oh. Well, you've picked an interesting boat to sail on. I suppose you know Helen's aboard. Small boat, isn't it? Oh, look, Sheila, suppose we drop the flip chatter, huh? Okay, Johnny. What do you want me to tell you? That I hate Helen for taking Andy Forbes away from me? Okay. I do. It's happened before. But Andy always came back. What hurts this time is that he was killed before he had a chance to. Sheila... Don't worry. I'll keep out of her way. I won't make any trouble. And, Johnny, do me a favor. What is it? Let's just forget I'm on board. I'd kind of like a decent chance to forget a few things, if I can. Okay. Uh, just one thing, Sheila. Yeah? Were you in my room a few minutes ago? No. On the level? Sure, why? Let's skip it. See you later. Okay. I hope you find your diamond. Thanks. I hope you find whatever you're looking for. You know what it is? No. I got news for you. Neither do I. Well, one thing was clear anyway. If Sheila hadn't been in my stateroom, then the perfume I'd smelled must have belonged to Helen. She seemed to be getting higher on my list all the time. I had to have a talk with her, but by the looks of things, that wasn't going to be easy. She was doing a pretty good job of avoiding me. About half an hour later, though, I spotted her topside in a deck chair with Agatha Forbes. Next to them was my old buddy from the wide open spaces. Why, some of the things we got out west you just wouldn't believe. I am certain we wouldn't. I've never been there, but I... Oh. Hi, everybody. Well, sir, if it isn't Mr. Dollar herself. Now, I ask you ladies, if that isn't just about the most colorful name of Bella Good Gaia. afternoon, yes, sir. Mr. Dollar. Hope you're a little more rested, Miss Forbes. Thank you, I am. And Helen, I'm glad Ms. to see you. Forbes, I wonder if you'd excuse me. Why, certainly, my dear. I'm afraid I have a headache. Why don't you go lie down for a while? Thanks, I think I will. Well, now, this kind of a chilly reception, partner. Looks like a little lady doesn't like you much. Oh, well, you can't win them all. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I'm sure Helen's simply tired, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Stacy here tells me he was quite a good friend of my brother's. Oh? Why, sure, partner. Andy Forbes and I was the best of buddies. Well, I didn't see you at his party the other night. Well, he asked me, of course, but I just couldn't make it. I tell you, though, dog, if I wouldn't have been there if I'd have known it was going to be old Andy's last party. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. That's all right. Um... How long had you known Forbes, Mr. Stacy? Years, Dollar, years. Old Andy and me was always bumping into each other in the darndest places. Cairo, Paris, Copenhagen. I tell you, it was always a barrel of laughs when we got together. I bet. Why, I'll never forget one night in little old Descar. We, say, we're going to be in Descar in a couple of days, aren't we? I believe so. Oh, yeah. I suppose everybody will be going ashore for You bet. Well, you don't want to miss Descar. Why, I can show you some places you just wouldn't believe. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I tell you what, why don't we get up a little party Mr. and... Mr. Stacy, it sounds very pleasant, but I'm afraid you'll have to excuse me. I'm not quite in the mood for sightseeing. Oh, I understand, sure enough, Miss Forbes. Well, Dollar, how about you? Uh, we'll see. Yeah. Well, anybody care to join me for a walk around the deck? No, thanks. i got to keep up my appetite, you know. See you later. But don't you forget about the car. It'll be a ball. Yeah, it'll be a barrel of fun. Miss Forbes. Yes? Did your brother ever mention this character, Stacy, to you? No. Of course, Andrew had many strange friends that he didn't mention to me. Yeah, I'm sure he did. I went back to my stateroom. This time, the door was closed, and there was no odor of perfume. But when I went in, I saw that I'd had a visitor again, and this time he or she had been much more thorough. The room was torn apart from one end to the other. I sat down, tired and beat. I, I thought of that building tile somebody tried to drop on me in Cape Town and the bang on the head I'd collected in my hotel room. I knew that whoever I was after was also after me. And now it looked like a third party was involved. Whoever had torn up my room must have figured I might have the diamond. Sheila, Helen, Stacy, it could be any of them. Or even worse, it could be somebody I didn't even know about. But one thing was sure, 
I was no closer to that king-sized diamond. Pretty soon we'd be getting to Dakar, and once everybody had the chance to get ashore, my chances of getting the diamond back were practically zero. I had a strong and sickening hunch that Dakar could be the end of the trail for me, and I didn't like it. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, my one good lead jumps ship the hard way. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the purser, Mr. Dollar. Oh, I was just about to call you. Oh? Better send a steward to my stateroom to put it back together. What happened? Somebody just tore it apart. But why? Oh, looking for something, I guess. The diamond? But why would they think you would have it? Well, somebody's got me pegged wrong. Well, what's on your mind? A cablegram was sent to Cape Town about an hour ago addressed to Julio Biak. Julio? Yes, isn't he the man who's being held on suspicion of murdering Andrew Forbes? Yeah, but the news hasn't been released, and obviously whoever sent the cablegram isn't aware of it. What did it say? Contact me, usual place, Dakar. Who signed it? Well, the name was Corner. I checked the passenger list, but there's no such name. A steward delivered the message to the radio room. I've sent for him. He should be able to tell us who sent it. Nice work, purser. Could be you just helped me wind up this case. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location at sea, en route Cape Town to Dakar... To the Home Office, Tri-Eastern Indemnity Associates. Assignment, the star of Cape Town Matter. Expense account continued. Item 10, $10. A token of appreciation to the purser for furnishing me the one good lead I've had in this deal. A cablegram to Julio Biak, who is being held in Cape Town right now as Andrew Forbes' probable killer. But Forbes' diamond, the star of Cape Town, $150,000 worth, was still missing. The cablegram indicated that Julio hadn't been working alone on the deal. Whoever sent it was aboard ship and either had the diamond or was looking for it. Before long, I'd know who that someone was. I started for the purser's office. Mr. Dollar. Huh? Oh, Helen. I'd like to talk to you. Well, now, that's a switch. What do you mean? Ever since I got aboard this ship, I've been trying to talk to you, but you weren't having any. I don't know what this is all about, but you've gone too far, Mr. Dollar. Come again? Don't try to pretend. When I found my room all torn up just now, I realized... Oh, hey, wait a minute. Your room's been torn up, too? What do you mean by two? Mine got the same treatment a while ago. I don't understand. I thought it was you who... Look, Helen, I think you and I had better have a little talk right now. 
I steered her to the bar. Expense account item 11, $5, drinks. I still couldn't figure out which team she was playing on, but I had to find out, and this was the best way I could think of. May I have a cigarette, please? Oh, sure. Here. Thanks. I've been so confused, Mr. Dollar. Johnny. Johnny. Confused about what, Helen? Everything. It's all happened so fast. And then when I realized that somebody was watching me and following me... Look, I think you'd better start from the top. I suppose so. Maybe it'll make sense to you. I hadn't really known Andy Forbes very long. Longer than I had. That party he gave, it was so strange. All those people I didn't know. I mean, well, I guess it took me a little while to realize he was interested in quite a few people. Sheila? I feel sorry for Sheila. I guess she's pretty bitter about everything. But I didn't do anything to encourage Andy, and I didn't realize he was serious about me until the night of the party. And then he told me he was... And he gave me... A, a bottle of very expensive perfume, forever. Oh, his usual gift? I'm afraid so. I don't care. He wanted me to have it, and it's lovely perfume. I liked Andy. He was completely irresponsible, but in his own strange way, he was nice. So? When they told me the next morning that he'd been killed during the night, I couldn't believe it. And then when the diamond was missing... Yeah? Yeah. His attitude about the diamond was very strange. How do you mean? He seemed to regard it as uh, an, uh, an inexpensive trinket. He he was so careless with it. Oh, you're telling me. That's why I was sent down to Cape Town, to try and talk him into being more sensible with it. But, Helen, you said something about being watched or followed. Yes. When I left Andy's house that night, I felt that somebody was watching me. Oh. And later I knew somebody had been in my hotel room and now my stateroom torn apart... What does it all mean? That's a good question. One more thing. Yes? You decided to make this trip rather suddenly, didn't you? I wanted to get away from Cape Town. Miss Forbes was kind enough to offer me a job as her traveling companion for the trip, so I took it. Do you like working for her? Yes. She's really a very nice person, perhaps a little on the dignified side. Yeah. She's... I'm pretty concerned over the Forbes name. Wouldn't you be, after all that's happened? Maybe. Oh, Johnny... I've got to be getting back and see if she needs anything, but thanks. For what? Talking to you has made me feel a lot better somehow. Good, good. It's uh, been a big help to me, too. How <laughs> so? Oh, makes things easier for tonight. They're having a dance. And I've been figuring how to go about asking you. Then if you don't mind, I'll go to my stateroom and change. Of course, Helen. See you tonight, Johnny. Right. Well, you two seem to be getting along pretty well now. Yeah, I guess so. I'm glad. I'm sure you realize by now that Helen couldn't possibly be involved in the murder or the diamond theft. I, uh, hope not. You are a very suspicious man, Mr. Dollar. It's part of my job, Miss Forbes. I still don't have any idea who's got your brother's diamond. And if I don't find out before we get to Dakar tomorrow, the chances are I never will. I don't see how you can be so sure the star of Cape Town is aboard this ship. I wasn't sure until today that cablegram convinced me. Cablegram? Yeah, it was addressed to Julio Biak in Cape Town. Biak? Isn't he the one who's under arrest back there? That's right. He was posing as a bartender at your brother's party. We think he's the killer. But apparently whoever sent him the cablegram was working with him and doesn't know he's been arrested. Well, I hope you can clear it up, Mr. Dollar, so that all this publicity will die down. It's been terribly trying. Yes, I imagine it has. I know Helen's felt the strain, too. She's been so nervous lately. Oh, if... If what? No, I was just thinking. If only Andrew had met someone like Helen sooner, perhaps none of this would have happened. Maybe not. Had I known she was coming to the party, I... Don't suppose I'd have tried to talk Andrew out of giving it. She's been the one bright ray in all of this. No, oh, if only. But regrets are so futile. She looked old and tired and lonely. Sure, maybe she was too worried about the dignity of the Forbes name, but I could see now it was about the only thing she'd had all these years. 
And with a brother who'd kept tossing the name around like a cheap toy, well, I quit looking at the picture. It wasn't very pretty. Anyway, I had another picture in my mind. Helen. I couldn't quite figure her. Everything she told me could be the truth. Or it could be just one big lie. And there was something else bothering me about the whole deal, something I couldn't quite put my finger on, a piece that didn't fit, a, a discord in the tune. But Helen kept pushing everything else out of my mind. And the feeling didn't change any that night. We danced. And then we went out on the deck. But all the while, one of my stock Confucianisms kept gnawing away at me. He who gets too interested in suspects is building up to king size let down. It's beautiful out here. Uh -huh. The moon and the sea and the ship's sliding low. It almost doesn't seem real. I know. I almost wish it could go on this way forever. No people, no places. <laughs> There's just one thing wrong, though. What? That routine doesn't work for very long. I know. Johnny. Hmm? Is there something wrong? Why? He seems so far away, so preoccupied. Oh, just uh, thinking about a lot of things, I guess. <laughs> That's not being very informative. I'm sorry, I... I guess I'm not feeling informative. That's okay. Sometimes talking isn't very important. You know, Johnny, the last few days have been a sort of nightmare for me. But tonight everything seems so nice. Why would that be, Johnny? Mm. Maybe I could make a kiss. Maybe you could. Oh, Johnny. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not. Well, say oh. now, if you two don't look just like a picture postcard. Hello, Mr. Stacy. Stacy. Yes, sir, I tell you, if they could put a picture of what I saw a second ago in all their travel folders, they'd double their business. <laughs> How nice for them. You want us to run through it again for the proper camera angle? Johnny. Oh, come on now, partner. Can't you take a little joshing? Oh, I'll try, partner. The reason I've been looking for you two, we get into day car in the morning. Yes, I know. And you can have a barrel of fun in that town. So you've told. What do you say we set up a little party? I can show you some places you won't believe. It sounds like fun. How about a dollar? Yeah. You can count me in, Stacy. Good. I'll see you in the morning then, bright and early. <laughs> he means well, Johnny. Uh, maybe. You don't sound very convinced. I don't know. Half of my job has always been sizing up people. Suddenly, I seem to have lost my touch. Meaning me? I uh, didn't say that. If it's any help in sizing me up, what happened a moment ago? I meant that, Johnny. Mr. Dollar. What? Oh. Oh, excuse me a minute. Sure. Oh. Be right back. Yeah, what is it, Percy? That steward I was telling you about, Mr. Dollar. The one who delivered the message for Cape Town to the radio room? Where is he? That's just it. I don't know. You what? I can't understand it. I've looked everywhere. I'm worried. That's not good. I was counting on him to tell me who sent that message to Julio Biak. Whoever did is probably working with Biak and could have the diamond. Uh, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I'll keep looking and let you know the minute I find him. I turned back toward Helen, but she was nowhere in sight. I started along the deck to see if she... Oh! Oh, Johnny! Johnny! What happened? What's the matter? I was walking along the deck. As I passed the lifeboat, somebody stepped out from behind it and grabbed at me. Who was it? I couldn't see. Well, come on, let's take a look. He ran away when I screamed. Oh... I see. So there I was again. Was she lying or telling the truth? I took her to a stateroom and told her to lock herself in for the night. Then I went back to deck and tried for the umpteenth time to put the pieces together. But I didn't have long. Suddenly everything was noise and confusion. Almost by the time I got to the stern, the ship was circling, lowering a boat. Twenty minutes later, they hoisted a body aboard. He was wearing a steward's uniform, and one look at the purser told me which steward it was. Yeah, my one good lead, gone. Now, 
now here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, I finally figure out the deal, only to find that my opponent is holding all the aces. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Ben Stacy, partner. Oh, hi, Stacy. We'll be docking a day car in an hour or so now. Yeah, I know. Don't forget, I'm going to show you and Helen around the town. Okay, I'll be ready. Say, Dollar, that was a little excitement we had aboard ship last night, huh? That steward who fell overboard? That's putting it politely. Well, what do you mean? I think he got pushed. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location at sea on the Southern Empress, en route Cape Town to Dakar. To the Home Office Tri-Eastern Indemnity Associates. Assignment, the star of Cape Town Matter. Expense account concluded. <laughs> Item 12, 50 cents, room service on two aspirins. Right from the start, this whole deal had been a series of headaches. Headache one, Andrew Forbes, international playboy and owner of the star of Cape Town, insured for 150,000 bucks. Forbes was tossing that stone around like it was a cheap toy. He wound up murdered, the diamond missing. Forbes' probable killer, Julio Biak, was in a Cape Town jail at the moment, but his confederate was still on the loose. The steward who could have told me who the confederate was had been fished out of the drink dead last night. Now we were going ashore at Dakar, and whoever had that diamond could make it hard for me to find. It could be Stacy, the boy from the wide open spaces. It could be Helen, traveling companion to Agatha Forbes. And I knew if it did turn out to be Helen, it would leave me kind of sick inside. Worst of all, it could be somebody I didn't even know about. Hence the aspirin. Stacy had asked us to meet him at the gangway at 10 o'clock, but he was nowhere in sight when I showed up. Pretty soon, Helen and Agatha Forbes came along. Good morning, Johnny. Hi, Helen. Miss Forbes. Good morning, Mr. Dollar. Helen just told me about what happened last night. Somebody trying to seize her on deck. How dreadful. Perhaps I shouldn't have told you, Miss Forbes. No, I... no, I'm glad you did. Anything happened during the night, Helen? No, I kept my stateroom door locked. Well, here you are. Sorry I'm late. I guess I overslept. You already? Already. Say, now, I'm mighty glad to see you with us, Miss Forbes. I was hoping you'd come. I won't be going with you. I'm going to stay aboard and rest. Oh, come on now, Miss Forbes. Do you good to let your hair down and frisk around a bit. Really, Mr. Stacy, I assure you I don't feel like frisking around a bit. I'll see you when you get back. Say, now, I guess I put my foot in my mouth talking that way. Oh, well, I usually do anyway. It's sure big enough. <laughs> well, one thing I had to give Stacy credit for, he was a good guy. 
He threaded us through street after street in the native quarter of the car. Narrow passageways crowded with people in stalls where native hawkers were peddling all sorts of merchandise. This is fascinating, isn't it? Well, like I told you, Helen, they car's quite a place. I love it. I wonder if it isn't about time we started back to the ship. See, just a minute, Helen. I think there's a shop around here you'd be interested in. Silks, perfume, stuff like that. You interested? Sure. Well, let me get my bearings a minute. You need more perfume? Johnny, does it bother you that I still wear this perfume Andy Forbes gave me? If it does, I won't. Yeah, yeah, the shop I had in mind is right down the street. Come on. Stacy led us to the shop. Helen began trying on dresses and robes. This I didn't like. If she had the diamond, this was a golden opportunity to pass it along. But there wasn't much I could do about it. Then all of a sudden I realized that Stacy was nowhere in sight. I went outside and started along the street looking for him. Then I spotted a man following me, a native in a burnoose. So I ducked down the next alley to shake him. But he didn't shake. Then I noticed that this was a blind alley. The native was closing in, and what he had in his hand looked strangely like a knife. Suddenly a door beside me opened. Come on in, Dollar. Stacy. I said come on in. A gun in front of me, a knife behind me. I guess I don't have much choice. So, you had your stooge steer me here. I figured sooner or later you'd start looking for me, so I just thought I'd make it easy for you. Oh, thanks. Stick around, Hassan. I may need you. Very well. Hassan's a pretty effective persuader, Dollar. How jolly. So you're the boy I've been after, Stacy. Correction. You're the boy I've been after, Dollar. What are you talking about? A diamond called the Star of Cape Town. Let's have it. Oh, look, don't give me that routine. Forbes was knifed by your buddy Julio Biak in Cape Town. You killed the steward aboard ship to keep him from telling me it was you who sent the cablegram to Julio. Right, boy, Dollar. That should mean you've got the diamond. Smarten up, boy. You think I'd have arranged this little reception for you if I already had the stone? Wait a minute. You're the one who was doing all the room searching aboard ship? I'm the one. Now let's have it. I don't have it, Stacy, and I don't know where it is. Oh, you got a real sense of humor, Dollar. So has Hassan. Why don't you show him, Hassan? Very well. <coughs> oh. Hey, look, this isn't going to do you any good. It's not going to do your face any good either, Hassan. Hey, look, you... Don't try it, Dollar. I guarantee you'll get yourself shot. Now, look. So you're a nice, brave boy, but you're being foolish. It's no good trying to snow me. I got it all figured out. Just what have you got all figured out? It isn't in her stateroom. It isn't in yours. I searched them both again this morning before we came ashore. That's why I was late. You're talking about Helen. Who else? That's why I steered her to that shop to try on dresses. The little lady who owns it is a friend of mine. She'd have found the diamond if Helen was carrying Helen? It. Yeah, Helen. How do you know she had it? Process of elimination, buddy. She was the only one with Forbes before Julio got to him. I've been watching you and Helen like a hawk dollar. There's only one time she could have given you the stone. That was during that tender little clinch on deck last night, right under my nose. Right under? What's the matter, dollar? Uh, Nothing. Yeah, what Stacy had just said popped the whole deal into place suddenly. Right under my nose. Right where it had been all the time. I tell you what, Dollar, you got just five minutes to tell me where that diamond is. Hassan will be here with you, and he's going to start persuading again if you don't talk. I had to get back to the ship somehow. That meant I'd have to do some fast talking. I looked at Hassan. I couldn't tell which was glittering more, his black eyes or the knife he held against my throat. One wrong word, and I knew he'd start carving. Hassan. What do you want? Um, you come from the desert, don't you? Why? You're a long way from home. Ever get homesick? What do you mean? Oh, I, I was just thinking, with half the money from that diamond, you could buy yourself an oasis with all the trimmings. Do not worry. Stacy will pay me well when we get the jewel. Well, what's he giving you for this job? Three goats and a new burnoose? Dollar. Hey, it was easy with that knife. It's just that everybody who works for Stacy seems to wind up getting paid off the wrong way. The wrong... Take Julio Biak for one. The guy Stacy hired to get the diamond in the first place. He's roosting in the Cape Town jail right now. You lie. Oh, no, you can check on it. Then there's the steward who sent Stacy's message to Biak. He got shoved overboard. You can check on that, too. But, uh, I'm sure a thing like that would never happen to you. Go on, Dollar. Okay. I know where the diamond is. How do I know I can trust you? You can come with me to get it. I don't know. I... At least he was thinking about it. And that's all I wanted. His eyes got that faraway look. That's what I was waiting for. I whipped my arm up and knocked his knife loose. I buried my fist in his midsection. 
lucky jackknife. A rabbit punch finished him off. I dove for the wall just as Stacy came charging in. What the... I kicked just... the gun out of his hand. I went to work. <laughs> Stacy was rugged, but I finally made it. I got the Dakar police to put Stacy and his hand on ice, patched up my face and headed back to the ship. But there was something else hurting me a lot more than my face. Helen. Johnny. Yeah, Johnny. Where have you been? I was... Your face, what happened? Skip it. I have to hand it to you, Helen. That was a real Class A snow job you pulled on me. What are you talking about? Yeah. It was right under my nose all the time. The perfume Forbes gave to you. Now, where's the bottle? Well, on my dressing table, okay. but... Okay. Yeah, pretty fancy bottle. Solid base. Or maybe not so solid. Johnny! Uh-huh. In the base of the bottle. Star of Cape Town. I'll bet you're real surprised, aren't you? Johnny, I didn't know it was there. I didn't have any idea. I swear it. She's telling the truth, Mr. Dodd. Miss Forbes. Wow. Well, Agatha, that gun looks sort of out of character. Perhaps. I won't hesitate to use it if necessary. I don't understand. It was cruel of Andrew and me to use you like this, Helen, but we saw no other alternative. Wait a minute. You and your brother rigged this whole deal right from the beginning, didn't you? Sure. Sure, because you slipped yesterday, Agatha, when you told me you discussed your brother's party with him. But back in Cape Town, he told me it was a surprise party for you. Johnny, I still... Oh, it's simple, Helen. That bottle of perfume would have turned up missing when you got to New York. Agatha would have appropriated it. One big question, Agatha. Why all this? Have you any idea what it means to see somebody drag the family name through the dirt... Time after time with his wild escapades? And have you any idea what those escapades cost? Your brother was in debt, huh? Terribly. We were pressed to the wall. Oh, why didn't you sell a diamond? We were bound by the will not to. But arrangements were made with someone in New York. What we could get for the diamond, plus what we could collect from the insurance. It would be enough. Oh, nice little scheme. But you didn't figure on Julio Biak trying for the diamond in Cape Town and killing your brother in the process. No. First, I didn't know what to do. But it soon became clear that more than ever I had to go through with a plan. My brother's creditors began to make trouble right after his murder. The diamond, please. Oh, now look. Don't you get it, Agatha? You're licked. What do you mean? You've done all this to protect the Forbes name. Of course. You failed. The story's out. No. It's known only to the two of you. How are you going to keep us from talking? I'll do whatever is necessary. Bribe us? Kill us? Sorry, neither one's going to work. Mr. Dollar, do not force me... You're trapped, Agatha. By the same thing that got you into all this. The Forbes name. Are you going to brand it with murder? No. No, I don't think you are. I don't think you could. I... I don't... I, I don't know. Please, please, Mr. Dollar. I'll take the gun, Agatha. Thanks. Oh, Johnny. It's okay, Helen. I guess I... I have failed, haven't I? All the way. Expense account item 13, $375.50. Transportation and incidentals from Dakar home. Expense account total, $1,283.60. I turned the diamond over to the authorities for safekeeping and Agatha Forbes to face charges of fraud. Julio Biak and Ben Stacy were indicted for the murder of Andrew Forbes. Remarks about Agatha. I guess she did what she did because she thought the end justified the means, which is one of the oldest sucker traps of them all. About Helen? Well, now that she's no longer a suspect, could be I'm no longer building up to a big letdown with her. At least it hasn't come yet, and I'm still waiting. And the waiting is real pleasant. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a yacht that wasn't there and a man who wasn't there. They never were. But that's where I found them. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. 
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is written by Robert Reif and produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Gene Tatum, Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, Chester Stratton, Marvin Miller, and D.J. Thompson. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. other. That's one man's opinion. Want to know why? You want to tell me? My old man died last week. He left everything he owed to me. Huh? You remember my old man, Danny Gatling, don't you? Sure. We did business together a couple of times. Yeah. Nice guy, your old man. Yeah, great. Yeah. But all he left me is one dollar. An ordinary one dollar bill. Oh, that's tough. Oh, I don't think so, because he told me you'd like to have the dollar he left me. Huh? That's right. Well, well. I want you to meet me somewhere, let's say, in back of that old closed-up filling station on Bleak Street in an hour. Can do. I thought you could. You'll, uh, have the uh, dollar bill with you? Sure, I'll have it. And I'll sell it to you, Weaver, for $50,000. And now on to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends. Here I am, Gatling. Waiting over here for you. Ah, you must be anxious to get that buck I called you about. You got here before me, Weaver. Uh, got the, uh, dollar with you? Sure. Let's have a look at it. Let's have a look at your face first. I don't do business with guys who cover up. What difference would I look like? Give me that dollar, I'll uh, give you the 50 grand you want it. Let's see the 50,000 at least. Well, I'll tell you, I'll let you see this instead. God, I will. <laughs> what I got on me, Weaver, means you couldn't buy this dollar bill of mine now for a half million, which is what it's worth to you. <laughs> Please, lady, move a little, will I you? I beg your pardon, No, Stacey. look, I, I've got to get to the television. Well, you right? will when it's your turn, and stop yeah, but, pushing. But I, I'm in a hurry, miss. You can I, certainly I, I, wait I... your turn. Besides, I won't be long. There's only one man ahead of me. All right, Miss Whistley, you're next. See, it's my turn now. All right, but hurry up. Well, I'm not going to stop for tea. Well, that's good. Hello there, Miss Wesley. God. How's Boston Blackie? Fine, thank you. I'd like to deposit this check, please. Of course, Miss Wesley, of course. Huh, look, really? Miss, mm -hmm. I... Here you are, Miss Wesley. Oh, thank you very much. Hey, look, will you hurry, All Miss? right, all right. If Blackie were around, your friend in back of you would be slowed up a bit, wouldn't he, Miss Wesley? Oh, there's no question about that. 
Well, goodbye. Bye. Next. Yeah, I'm next. But uh, I, uh, I want to wait a second. Uh, okay, she's out. Now, you be quick, be smart, and be quiet. Oh, what's the... Uh-oh. Uh-oh is right. It's a gun in my hand, buddy. This is a stick-up. But don't get excited. All I want is one dollar. Keep back in the bushes, Bart. Yeah. That guy Gatling is smart. You ain't kidding, Weaver. He's smart enough to get you to hold up the Bleak Street Bank and not get what you want. Shut up. Yeah, okay. Now, I'll... look, I had to get that dollar he wanted to sell me. Hey, what's so important about that? I'll write you a letter. I would have uh... killed him when I met him at that closed-up filling station to get that dollar bill his old man left him, but he slugged me. I would have killed the teller in that bank if he hadn't given me what I asked for. You know, Weaver, you ought to killing this guy. What made you follow him to the bank? He knew I was after the bill. Huh? He knocked me down. I followed him. Huh? When he went into the bank, I figured he was going to put it there for safekeeping. Weaver. Yeah. Yeah, I heard. That car just stopped out front. And here he comes up the walk. Stand back. Get him, Bart. Get him. When I should slug him hard enough to kill him. I don't care. Just hit him. Okay. And get that bill. Give it to me. Go ahead, Okay, okay. okay. Hey, yo. Huh? Who are you? Me. Just me. And this. <coughs> nice work, Bob. Now, I'll get out of this wallet and look through it while I get through his pockets. Yeah, we've a sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's not in this pocket. Not this one either. Not in his wallet. There's only fives here. It's not in any of his pockets. It isn't here. Hey, Weaver. You said the dollar was worth killing for, it, didn't you? Yeah. I hope you're right. Gatling here's dead. <laughs> Now, we know you couldn't give us a description of the man who held you up in your bank. Yes. But uh, you wanted to look at the body of this man we found murdered. So look. Oh, sure, Inspector Faraday. I'm sorry I didn't get a good look at the hold-up man, but his hat was pulled down over his eyes. Yeah, I know. But take a look at this body. Hmm. All right, you heard a description of him over the radio. You thought you might know him. That's right. Well? Yes. Yes, I know who it is. Oh. It's the man who asked me to change a five-dollar bill for him just before the robbery. Right in front of the guy who held you up, huh? Well, and not exactly. He was in front of Miss Wesley, and Miss Wesley was in front of the man who held me up. I didn't get a good look at him. Miss Wesley? Not Miss Mary Wesley? Why, yes, Boston Blackie's girlfriend. You know her, don't you? Yeah, and I know Blackie, too. And I might have known this would happen. Why, what's happened? Well, it always happens as soon as I get a case without Blackie in it. I find Blackie right there, just the same. <laughs> Blackie, have I got something to tell you, and is this exciting? Well, this apartment of mine can stand a little exciting, Mary. It's been a dull day. Oh, not for me. You heard about the bank robbery a little while ago. Yes, I heard about it on the radio, oh, yeah, but yeah. they uh, didn't say how much was taken. Oh, never mind that. I was there, Blackie. Don't tell me you did it. Oh, now, look. But, well, will you believe I was right in front of the man who did? <laughs> how do you know? Well, the time of the holdup, and he kept, kept hurrying me. Blackie. I think that right after I left... Uh, oh, uh, wait, wait a minute, wouldn't you, Mary? Yeah, sure, yeah, uh-huh. Well, uh, aren't you proud of me, Blackie? No, I'll let you know as soon as I find out what this phone call is. Well, hello. Hi, hello, Blackie, this is Faraday. It is? I bet you wouldn't bet it was, Inspector. Whimsical. Blackie, what are you doing? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, stay that way. Is Miss Wesley there with you? Well, now, Faraday, let's not get personal. Put her on. Okay. I want some information. I see. And don't ask me what about, because I'm not going to tell you. You don't have to. Because I'm going to tell you. Oh, you think you know, do you? Yes, Mary was in front of the man who held up a bank today, and he wanted to give you a description of it. Oh, she's already talked to you about it, huh? Yes, she's here right now. I'll put her on the phone if you want. Never mind. mind. Put her in your car. Bring her down to see me at the morgue. Your new office? That's very inappropriate. I'm not dead. Well, I like the other side of the argument, but uh, uh, what is on your alleged mind? There's been a murder. The bank teller tells me that the dead guy was in the bank in front of Miss Wesley just before it was robbed by the guy in back of Miss Wesley. Uh, Faraday, your natural confusion is catching. Mm. It's getting me. A man was in front of your girlfriend. He left. He's the guy who was found murdered. Mm Mm-hmm. I understand. The teller recognized his description and identified him for you. It's Now you want Miss Wesley to help describe the man in back of her. Hooray! Okay, pal. Don't pal me. 
Only uh, tell me, how much did the man who stuck up the bank get? How much did he get? Uh huh. He got just what he asked for a single dollar bill. Fool around with that, genius. What's the double O for, Weaver? Story in the paper here, Bob. About the bank robbery. About finding Gatling's body, too, huh? Yeah, but that's not what worries me. No? Right in front of me and behind Gatling was a girl named Wesley. Mary no? Wesley. She identified Gatling's body, same as the bank teller did. Yeah? As a hint here, she might be able to describe the guy in back of her, too. Well, that's you, huh? Yeah, that's me, all right. Teller didn't get a look at me. Not a good look, anyway, because I kept my hat pulled down over my eyes and I held him up. Yeah? Uh-huh. Somebody's on a spot. And that's you, huh? Yeah, that's me. Uh-huh. So, uh, somebody is going to have to do the same to Miss Wesley as we did to Gatling. And Bart. Yeah? That's you. Okay. Yeah? Uh... You Miss Mary Wesley? Yes, I am. I got to talk to you, ma'am. It's important. Oh, go ahead. And uh, it's got to be in private. Well, all right. Come in. Thanks. Hey, nice place you got here. Oh, it's quiet. Yeah. Now, what do you want? Uh, are you alone? Yeah. That's all I want to know, Miss Wesley. I got to... <laughs> oh. What did you scream for, Mary? Oh, Blackie, I didn't think you were going to hit him in time. I was getting a little excited. I was set from the minute he came in the door. Uh-huh. I thought it was a good idea to hide when you had a caller. Oh. I figured that story in the papers would bring somebody to see you. Oh. Now, let's see who this guy is. Uh, I'll call Inspector Faraday while you're looking through his wallet. Uh, no, Mary, don't. Wait no? a minute. Uh, yeah, yeah. Here's, uh, here's his name in the wallet. It's uh, Bart Everson. Bart Everson. And here's a single dollar bill folded up in his identification holder. Well, so what? So it might be a special dollar. Okay. Remember, just one dollar was stolen from the bank. Oh, that's right. I'm going to examine this dollar very carefully and return it to the wallet. You are? Why? So he still has it when he leaves here with us following him. Well, what for? What for? Yeah. Why, to see if we can make this dollar bill make sense. <laughs> Now, back to Boston Blackie. Joe Gatling offers to sell Bill Weaver a $1 bill for $50,000. Weaver tries to take it away by force. Fearing for his life, Gatling pretends to put the bill in the bank. Weaver robs the bank for the bill, finds that it is not there, then later kills Gatling. But still, the bill is missing. Boston Blackie's friend, Mary Wesley, was in the bank. So Weaver's trigger man, Bart Everson, tries to kill Mary. As we return to our story, Bart pays a visit to his girlfriend. Oh, that door. Hiya, Gertie. Oh, Oh, it's you, is it, Bart? Where'd you get that black eye? Uh, Weaver sent me to knock over a gal named Mary Wesley. See, then some guy clipped me and knocked me cold. What? But I pulled a fast one on Weaver. I don't care what you did. Yeah, but this one was a slick one, Gertie. Oh, Him and me was looking for a certain dollar bill, see, off a guy named Gatling. An important dollar bill. A dollar bill? Yeah, one that Mr. Weaver wants real bad. Bad enough to kill for it. Well, what about the dollar bill? Well, I figured it was something special. So when I found it on Gatling, I palmed it and I told Weaver it wasn't on the guy. On the body, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, Gatling was dead by then, right? Sure. Uh, look, um, uh, about that dollar bill, uh, do you have it with you? Yeah, I got it right here. I got to pull it up in my wallet. See? Uh, I'd, uh, kind of like to have that <laughs> dollar, but I, you wouldn't give it to your girlfriend, would you? No, I guess it'd be worth more than a dollar, Gertie. Well, um, would you sell it to me? Uh, sure. How much? Well, I went to a lot of trouble to get it, Gertie, oh, so, I... uh... Would two dollars be asking too much? Well, Blackie, we followed that fellow.
yellow bar this far, why don't we go upstairs where he went instead of waiting in the hall? Because I prefer to wait here, Mary. I saw the bell Bart rang. It was under the name of Gertrude Lanning. Yeah. It could be she's Bart's girlfriend. Oh. And I don't want to nab Bart till he's taken me to his boss or partner, if any. Well, 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 he's up there with her. We can hear their voices. But, Blackie, what do you suppose this is all about? Certainly not just a, a dollar bill. The bill means something, Mary. Well, what do you... There were markings on the back of the bill in Bart's wallet, and I made a copy of them. I know, I saw you, but they don't make any sense. And neither does the circle around the last two numerals in the serial number. Well, I copied the serial number, too, just in case it will make sense someday. Oh, I still think you should have kept the bill instead of putting it back in Bart's wallet. Oh, no, Mary. I want him to think that we don't know about it. Look, would you do something for me? Uh Uh-huh. Phone Faraday and tell him to join us down here as soon as he can. Oh, he must be expecting trouble. When our friend Bart comes down from the room upstairs, I'm hoping for trouble, Mary. But it's going to be all his. Homicide, Faraday speaking. Hello, Inspector. This is Mary Wesley. Oh, hello, Miss Wesley. You uh, talk to any more bank robbers lately? Inspector, I'm calling for Blackie. Mm, He's not here, I'm happy to say. I know that. He's in a hallway at 1080 Eastern Avenue. Do you get that? And he wants you down there right away. Right away. Oh, he does, does he? Yes, he does, does he? Miss Wesley, you sound more like Blackie every day. Oh, now, Inspector, how soon can you meet him? I'm not sure, but you can tell Blackie something for me. Inspector, please. Relax. It isn't that at all. Oh, I want you to tell him what I found out about Joe Gatling, the man we found dead. Yeah? What? He was the son of the late Danny Gatling, big bank robber, who died last week. Get that? Yeah, I got it. About $150,000 in bank loot Gatling stole was never recovered. Yeah? It's still hidden, and not anywhere that Blackie is, I guarantee. What's down there, anyway? A man with a marked dollar bill. A marked... And before Blackie gets through with him, he's going to be a marked man. Now that I gave you that dollar that I swiped off Gatling, Gertie, you're going to tell me about no, it? I don't know you why. You said I... that, that you know whatever it was that, that makes Weaver want it so bad. I'll let you in on a little secret, Bart. Yeah? Yeah. I know about another dollar bill that's just as important. Yeah? Where do we get that one? Weaver has it. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Hey, what? Oh, hey. come in. Who could that be, huh? You'll see. Weaver. Hello, Gertrude. Hi, Mr. Weaver. Oh, come on in, Bill. Oh, hey. It's spelled to you, huh? Since when? Well, Since I figured that you palmed that dollar bill when we were searching Gatling's body, Bard. What do you mean? And I called right your and... girlfriend here to tip me off if you showed up with it. Oh, that's what you were doing in the other room a while ago, guys. Now, huh? look here, Bart. and Weaver giving me the double cross. Why, I think you're not, not, not going to do anything, Bart, but get a good lesson. Now, please, Bill. Hey, don't kill him. Sure. Bill, please don't hurt him so much. He's just dumb, that's all. Hey, cut it out. He's going to be dumber when I get through with it. Oh, now, Bill. Go oh. easy, will you? Yeah. I think that'll teach him a little lesson. So when he wakes up, Gertie, you, uh, you keep him here. All right, if you want me to. I'll be back to take him with me. Okay. I need him to get $150,000. Blackie, I called Faraday and I'm back, and if we wait in this hallway much longer, we'll be getting our mail here. Why do we go upstairs? Mary, a few minutes ago, another guy rang Gertrude Lanning's bell and went upstairs. Who do you think he was? I don't know. But I think we'd better wait for Faraday. Did he say he'd be here today or tomorrow? <laughs> he said he'd get here as soon as he could. Oh, great. Oh, well, he'll That means we may not see him for a week. Oh. Well, we'll see this thing through ourselves. Mm, I wish I could see through the marking on that dollar bill in Bart's pocket. Maybe we're silly, Blackie, and it has nothing to do with the case. Mary, the dollar has everything to do with it. First is the reason the bank was robbed, then Joe Gatling was killed for it, then you were threatened. Almost killed. Why, I could have been All right, Mary, I know. Uh Uh-oh. Here comes somebody. Who is it, Bart? No, the man who went up to the girls' apartment a few minutes ago. Duck back. Yeah, sure. I'm going to put this guy and ask questions later. Hey, you. Oh, me? Sure, why not? (laughs) Oh, boy, that was a good poke, too. Buddy. I doubt whether my friend appreciates it. <laughs> yeah, let's see who this guy's wallet says he is. Oh, he's certainly not Bart Everson. No. Well, his wallet says he's uh, 
Bill Weaver. Weaver, that's it. Now, name. let's see if he has the marked dollar we found on Bart. Yeah. Mm-hmm, he does. Blackie, he has two dollar bills. Yeah, I just noticed that. Well, I wonder what that... And Mary, mm-hmm. there are funny marks on the back of this other one, too. Yeah. And the last two figures and the serial numbers are circled. Same as the other bill. Yes, but the numbers are different. Mm-hmm. And the marks on the back are different, too. But look. Uh, yeah. If I fold the two bills in half, place them together... The marks run together. It looks like a map. Yes, it does look like a map. And, Mary, this bill I just found has a word on it. Two words. Brent Wood. Oh, man's name. Also a place, Brentwood. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and look at this black dot here. Mm-hmm. When Faraday gets here, that's the place we're going to start. To start what? To start something that will not only finish Weaver and Bart, but this case. <laughs> Okay, Blackie, we're at Brent Woods. We found the starting place, according to the black dot on that bill you copied. So what? So now we have to figure out where to go from here, Faraday. Yeah, I know where I'm going to go. Right back to my office. If you'd had any sense, you wouldn't have made copies of those bills. You'd have brought them along. Look, I copied everything that was necessary. And I wanted Weaver to have his bills. Why? You'll see why. In case we don't find anything out here. You know we're not going to find anything. Look at this place. Trees, trees. Nothing but trees. Coincidence, isn't it? Since we're in a forest. Very jocular. Yeah, I thought so. What do we do now? Cut down every tree till we find what we're looking for? No. Or count them off. Hey, wait a minute, Faraday. You might have something there. Mm-hmm. The serial numbers were circled. The last two on each bill. So? I wrote them down on this piece of paper here. Games, always games. Put out that flashlight and we'll get out of here. Look, Faraday, 52 is circled on this bill, 28 on this one. I'm all agog. 52 what and 28 what? What do those figures mean? Inspector... I have to figure that out. Twenty-five. Five. Twenty-six. Six. Twenty-seven. Seven. And twenty-eight. Hey, here's a tree, Yes, yeah, sure, huh, Weaver? Yeah, and you're lucky I didn't take care of you for crossing me. But I'd be bringing you out here to bury you. Not to make you rich. I sure do thank you, Mr. Weaver. Forget it. What's all this about? This is dollar bill stuff and all that. Well, Bart, Joe Gatling's old man and I were partners on the bank robberies. Yeah? Right? And old man Gatling hid the dough and marked the spot on two one dollar bills. And so? He kept one, I kept the other. Uh, uh, and when he kicked off here, his son got the dollar that, that he kept, huh? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And young Gatling knew what it was worth and tried to sell it to me, when I tried to take it away from him, he got sore and decided he'd never give it to me. Huh? Oh, that's why he went to the bank, huh? Sure. But Mr. Weaver, he, he didn't put the buck in the bank. No, but he wanted me to think he did. Oh. You see, that way, he figured I'd never get it. I'd never get it without holding up the bank. And <laughs> he didn't think I'd dare <laughs> stick it up for one buck, you understand? Yeah. <laughs> Too bad he was so tricky, he got himself killed for it. Yeah, <laughs> he said it. But Mr. Weaver, how, how do we know that we got the right three from just them dollar bills? And at uh, 52, 28 stuff. It's very simple, Bart. The serial number ending in 52 begins with the letter N for north. It means 52 steps north. And the other uh, bill begins with an E. An e is for what? For east, you dope. Oh, oh. So after we took 52 steps north, we took 28 steps east. Because the last two numbers on the bill beginning with E are 28. Now climb the tree. Yeah. The dough is somewhere up there in the branch. And so are we. We're going to drop down on him. Hey, look out, Weaver. That's the back up in the tree. Watch out. You take Weaver. I've got a body. Like that. Let it go. Well, that takes care of them. Yeah. We'll let them see the money we found when they wake up in jail. Uh, you're proud of yourself for figuring what that 52 and 28 meant, huh? Sure. Now, do you see why I copied the bills and let them keep the originals? Yes. Bring them out here so we could grab them. Uh-huh. I'll tell you something, Inspector. What's that? This isn't the first time I've ever solved a case by going out on a limb. Why, good morning, Miss Wesley. <laughs> good morning. Making another deposit again today? No. No, not this time. Cash this for me, will you? I certainly will. Thank you. Hello, Blackie. Hello. And just because I'm right behind Miss Wesley, don't think I'm going to hold you up. <laughs> now on, every time I see Miss Wesley at my window, I wonder who's behind her. <laughs> well, the chances are it'll be me. <laughs> I hope so. Here you are, Miss Wesley. Uh-huh. $50, four tens, five, and five ones. Oh, thank you. Goodbye, Miss Wesley. Goodbye. Goodbye, Blackie. Goodbye. Come on, Mary. Okay. 
Let's see how fast you can spend that 50. Mm, that'll be high. Now, look, look here. Now, don't bother to count it. There are 50 there. These I know. People I'm know how to count. The all right, go ahead and look at the ones. No. But what for? Well, now, look. Look at all the excitement just caused by a $1 bill. But there was something unusual about that dollar bill, Mary. It was marked. And matched another dollar bill that was also marked. Well, these are marked, too. Uh-oh. Here we go again. Yes, Blackie, here we go. To buy a new hat. Because that's what these bills are marked for. All right, stay back now. Stay back. It's not going to do the man any good if you crowd around him like that. Give him some room. Give him some room. Uh, are you sure somebody here is sent for an ambulance? Oh, yes, officer. I telephoned for one. But you didn't see the accident, huh? No. I guess no one did this time of night. I was just taking a walk down by the dock. Here comes the ambulance. Good. Now get back, everybody. All right, all right. Come, Come on. Back. Get back and let the ambulance through. Oh, yes. Get back. Get back. Right here. Right here, boys. Right over here. Over here. Hello, officer. Hello, doctor. Right this way. Want me to help you, doctor? I'll let you know in a minute, driver. Okay. Open the package of the ambulance, someone. Uh, I will, doctor. Thanks. How is the officer? Well, I don't know. He looks pretty bad to me. Hit by a car, it looks like. How does he look to you? Oh, not too good. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'll get the driver and we'll get him on the stretcher and into the ambulance. Okay, now get back, everybody. Please, get back. I'll be right back, officer. Okay, okay. A driver. Right you are, doctor. I mean, Joe. Is Amanda still alive? Yeah, Henry. But we're going to see to it that he isn't very long. My name's Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, the Lion's Eye, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of the guy from Gower Gulch. It's a gray building, about the color of moldy bread. It's an apartment house in the middle of Hollywood, and it figures that the guy who built it quit voting when they named the street it sits on, Taft Avenue. My place is furnished with war surplus from the Spanish-American War. Well, it's got a hat rack, and that's where I live, number 308. In back, where you get a view and some fresh air from the alley. One's about as bad as the other. But I got it fixed up kind of nice. Hot plate, coffee pot, an autographed picture of Sally Rand that somebody left there. Only mistake I made was putting in a telephone. It spoils a lot of things. Regan, Mr. Lyon, wake up. We got a job. 
Why don't you sleep at night? Lucky for you, I got insomnia. We go broke. Try Ovaltine. What kind of a job? How should I know? Get your clothes on. What are you doing, reading the want ads? I got a note from a client. You mean you got money? Hundred bucks is all. Says he'll match it if we run him an errand. Where to? Santa Ana Canyon? He'll tell you. You know, you got morals like a cash register. Can he write his name? Davy Crockett. He's 50 uh, years old. Well, he's a little old for cowboys and Indians, isn't he? That's his name, Davy Crockett. Well, when's the wagon train pull out? Regan, I don't know how I stand for you. Get over there. Get where? Listen, a guy works pretty hard building up a business like I have. Takes a lot out of him. Well, you got plenty on tap. I just want you to understand, that's all. Money doesn't grow on trees. Now, sometimes you gotta play your hunches. Like George Gallup. This time I got a feeling the guy's okay. He writes like a gentleman, Regan. I want you to treat him like one. But where do I find him? He's in a location can give us a lot of business. Where? The city jail. <laughs> Yeah, that's the lion, born under the sign of the dollar. Well, it happened on Monday night, and I found the Lincoln Heights jail looking real tired after a rough weekend. They were putting fresh creosote on the walls in front of the drunk tank, and the guy at the desk looked like he'd burst his radiator if anybody phoned for another reservation. It was about 1 a.m., but after a couple of jokes I know about alligators, Sergeant Gonzalez hauled out a drawer with some cards in it. Under C, he found it. Full name, David Crockett. Cell 273, solitary. Gonzalez walked me through a couple of quarters, and then he opened his cell and let me inside. Davy Crockett was there, awake and standing up. He was about four feet high, skinny, with a head like a sunburned turnip. He had blue veins roaming all over his nose and a handlebar mustache to hold him up. He looked at me like I was holding the fifth ace. Howdy, stranger. My name's Regan, International Detective Bureau. How do I know? Start anything and I'll set up a racket. Well, I work for the lion. You called him. Maybe yes, maybe no. You got credentials? Where do you want them? Easy, son. Not talking to an amateur. Flyweight champion, Buenos Aires, 29. Grab yourself a squat, partner. Mm. What are you so nervous about? Nothing. Precautious, that's all. All right, look, let's start at the beginning, shall we? What are you locked up for? Fire plug. Got him in the dangerous places in this burg. What'd you do? Steal it for your dog? No. Parked my landlady's car alongside it while I ran in there. And... You don't get jugged for traffic tickets. There were two cops. Looked like a posse. I don't like injustice. All right, resisting arrest, is that all? What more do you want? Told you I'm not a man to be trampled with. Taught judo in Tokyo, 34. <laughs> the Jap still lost the war. Sit still, Regan. You're working. On what? Well, it's just another errand. It's not much. Well, come on. Let's pick up the temple, will you? My bicycle's double parked. Say, you ever get saddle sores on a bicycle? I did once. Eight-day race. Yeah, yeah, I know. Now, what about this errand? Little package wrapped up in a sweater. In the alley by the ash can. Go on. I calculate I dropped it about three and a half feet to the left of the big ash can. By accident? Man can't fight with his hands full. I'll get down the address for you here. All right. What's in that sweater you didn't want the cops to see? A pole cat. It fits the rest of your story, yeah. Son, there's nothing in the life of Davy Crockett won't stand inspection. When you get the package, check it in at the Union Station. And then what? Save me the stub. You get a hundred. Save it for bail. You could do this job yourself. Thought I told you, sonny. I'd like to be lonesome. So you had him lock you up on purpose? No, I just like it here. You want a reference? Check any of the boys in Gower Gulch. Movie cowboy, huh? Laddie, you're looking at the greatest jockey since Paul Revere. Eddie Sand... To Eddie Arcaro. I beat them all. Kentucky Downs, 39. Yeah, sure. Well, a job's a job, Davy, but I got a hot tip where I fit in. Where's that? Trailing the field. Well, I left the little man running his fingers through an old copy of Variety, and I went out into the street. It was about 3 o'clock, and a truck was throwing some water out and giving the gutter a shampoo. I picked up my car and started out to play retriever. That's when I spotted the blonde tailing me. She was using a 37 Packard, and the top was down. I could see her in the mirror. I could tell she had yellow hair like a rag doll. It took a few fast turns to get rid of her, but then I was solo when I pulled to a stop by the alley off Gower. It was in back of some old movie studios. About then, a drunk came pouring down the street, did a loop around a fire plug at the head of the alley, and sat down. He was the talented kind, and I figured he thought I was Arthur Godfrey. Well, I scrambled over some broken beer bottles looking for the sweater. 
It finally showed, lying beside a pack of newspaper and some dame's torn petticoat. That's when the drunk lost his tilt and began looking at me. I picked up an old shoe, I wrapped it in a newspaper, and I started out of the alley. The drunk went back to his audition, moving toward me. Hiya, friend. Have a drink. That's not my brand. Don't be a mug. A little drink between friends is real nice. Well, we haven't been introduced. My name's Maxwell. What's yours? Slipped my mind. Ah, that's the trouble with the whole world. No fellowship. Except for my girl, Marie. You know Marie? No, I don't. Sort of short and plump with a little sinus trouble. That's too bad. Thought you might have met her. Lots of fellowship in that girl. Every time you look, another fella. All right, move it, buddy. Now, you don't want to get by me, friends. You want to stand right there and have a little drink. You got the subject we're going to talk about? Yeah, sure, sure. What's in the package? Dirty laundry. Ain't that funny, though. I just got me a new Bendix. Why don't you go into business? That's what I'm going to do. You're my first customer. No, I lux my dainties. Yeah, don't go away, friend. I ain't through with my sales talk. Well, hire a skywriter. Hold up, I said. Get your hands off of me. All right, Regan, the round's over. Yeah, what makes you the referee? This does. Friend here wants to play rough, Red. Reconsider, Regan. It'll make you happy. All right, what do you want? The package. You heard what he said, smart guy. Why don't you work for it? Heavy, Max. Don't leave, Regan. We're not finished. I got the package, Red. Give him a tip for picking it up. Mm, Sure. Oh. Uh. Guess I overpaid him. Well, it was easy to see. It was their play. I had about as much chance as a midget in a basketball game. The muscles ambled off with the package that they took from me, and I crawled back for that sweater. It was still there, wrapped around something hard and round. And when I ripped it off, a shine caught my eyes. It was a metal can of movie film, and the word Peru was marked on it. Not much for all the hush-hush, but it must have had a story. Well, I looked up a friend of mine who owned a camera shop, and I made a commotion with a $5 bill. That shook the sand out of him, and he rented me a projector with sound. The lion's house was the next stop. We threw up a sheet on the wall and turned on the film. That completed the night. We had a trip to a good neighbor without a passport. Wonders turned out to be a Joan Fitzpatrick giving with some kind of a travelogue. the most colorful in the world. A temple of worship. Home of Peru, 2,000 years old. You just perfect Well, stop screaming, will you? It's free. You know I can't stand movies. I got sore eyes. All right, shut up and listen to this. Peru, the marketplace. A street vendor dressed in gay native costume. Selling delicacies to Peruvian children. Beads and jewels of exquisite beauty wrought by the hands of master Peruvian artisans. Horse racing and innovation from the modern world. And native dance. I'm going to bed. You won't sleep. I stole your eye shade. Oh, Regan, I gotta get up early. I got lots to do. It'll keep. A veritable symphony of motion. And so, it's with heavy heart we say adieu to lovely Peru. Land of the Peruvians. Land of charm and enchantment. And with the setting sun, we take our leave. Well, what'd you get out of it? A headache. Yeah, we'll talk about it in the morning. No, I can't wait. Uh, what you doing now? I'm phoning the city jail. Looking for a room? Looking for information. Davey will supply it. You've been drinking. Now listen, big shot. Somebody's after this film for some reason. I'm going to find it. City jail, Sergeant Gonzalez speaking. Danny's Regan. Oh, hi, you, Regan. I'm glad you called. I just got that joke about the alligators. <laughs> yeah, well, do me a favor, will you? Sure, pal, sure. Say, I told it to the lieutenant. He's still laughing. You know, it may earn me a promotion, pal. Let me talk to Davy Crockett. Oh, I can't do that, Regan. Well, you can say I'm his lawyer. Well, it's not that, pal. He's not here anymore. What do you mean? Some guy bailed him out 20 minutes ago. When I was telling the lieutenant the joke, this guy in the briefcase comes in, slaps down the bail. Out walks your friend. Well, he said he liked it there. And Davey must have changed his mind. Where'd he go? Not very far. Just over to the morgue. Well, the cowboy from Gower Gulch had spun his last yarn. Gonzalez told me that somebody had shot Crockett as soon as he hit the street. Oh, none of this made sense. The phony job, the blonde who tailed me, the fight in the alley, the corny movie... Now the lion shoved the film in a desk and I went out the door. I cut across his yard, but I stopped on the opposite sidewalk. My car wasn't alone. 
There was a 40-foot nag sniffing at its rear fender. Hey, Regan. Well, Maxwell. That's me. You look different. Did you take the cure? Shut up. Somebody wants to see you. If it's Marie, tell her my book's full. Thought you might like a lift. No, I got a friend who runs a streetcar. Now go on, beat it. Regan, don't be that way. Oh, for him a pen tell her, Maxwell. Who's this, your father-in-law? You smoke, Regan? No, it might explode. Yes. Uh, so long. Hold this, Buster. <laughs> Get in. Oh, Max. Max, I told you before, you're on probation. Oh, that's all right. Don't pick on him, teacher. He didn't hurt me. Get in front, Max. Sure. Where's your other boy, Red? We could play some bridge. I thought he'd do better in the shoe business. The one I gave him didn't fit, huh? I'm a much misunderstood man, Mr. Egan. I'm sure you'll put your best foot forward. I'd love to. My card, Horace Grundy. Mm -hmm. Sometime earlier, a little man called me, Mr. Egan. Uh, Custer or Boone or... uh... Davy Crockett? Of course. I want you to understand I get many such calls. Party line. It's a private number, but the salesmen bother me anyway. It's tough to be popular. Davy tell you what he was selling? No. Well, he didn't tell me either. Have it your own way. When I told him I'd meet him, he said he'd arranged to get out of jail. He said all he wanted was a job. And he got one. Yes, only there's no future to it. I wouldn't want anything like that happening to you, Mr. Regan. I'll renew my insurance. Oh, no, you'll come with me. It's more friendly. Suppose I don't like to talk. You won't have to, if everything goes all right. Well, it's your taxi. And you're paying the fare. All right, Maxwell. Clover Field. I never knew a guy could say the name of an airport and make it sound like Forest Lawn. Grundy sat in the corner checking the manicure on his fingernails, and Maxwell drove out Olympic. By the time we skidded into Clover, I'd figured absolutely nothing. It was still only 4 a.m., but there was a string of cars parked in the lot. I spotted a 37-packard roadster, but I was too busy getting rushed up onto the field to look for the blonde. Besides, the faster we ran, the more excited Grundy got. And then uh, we rounded a hangar and the reporters hit us. Say, Louis B's pretty sore, huh? No, no, Louis B and I are friends, just his plugs are burned. <laughs> Let us through, boys. Hey, wait a second, this Junior who's traveling on the plane, they say he wants a quarter of a million, you going to pay him today? After I see a workout. Come on, Regan, let's go. Yeah, you're a real big man, Grundy. I'm going to be, Regan. El Romano, best rip of any horse in South America. So that's it, huh? Where the ruins come from. Uh, what's that? Peru. Oh, sure. Peruvian National Airways gave Julio a special plane. Everything special. Like in the movies. Well, look, suppose you watch him unload. I'll take a back seat here. Oh, no, no, Regan. This is a big day. I want you to see what... What's the ambulance for? Well, don't look at me. Stick around, Regan. It could be you. It's Julio. Not the guy who owns him? Must be. I, I tried to hold him. The hold on break. Oh, my rib. Take it easy, boy. We got you. What happened? Bounce, bounce. The landing, she is rough. That is all. Where is the doctor? You're going to the hospital. Lie down. Oh, I'm broken in six places. Lift up the stretcher. Come on, boys. Hurry it up. Oh, he kicked. He kicked me. Move fast, boys. Yes, hot Hey, Mr. Grundy. Mr. Grundy. Mr. Grundy, the horse. Well, the guy by the plane started to yell just about the time they took Julio toward the rear of the ambulance. Grundy took a dive for the cargo door and so did everybody else. Then I had to stand there while six feet of big shot cigar turned into a crybaby. Look, Regan. Look at the horse's leg. He's kicked himself. Okay, so he's clumsy. But he might not run again. He was going to be mine, Regan. That's too bad. Call a vet. I have already paid 50,000 retainer on the horse, Regan. I'll send you a lawyer. I got an idea you're connected with this. Oh, dry up, Buster. It's an accident. Yeah? I got an idea there's going to be another accident. Yeah, Grundy. Maybe you're right. (coughs) Oh! Hey, stop him! I didn't wait to see if he went down. Maxwell swung, but I took off through the crowd. It figured that Cloverfield wasn't for me, and I wasn't going to stick around for the daisy. And then I spotted a ride, the rear end of Julio's ambulance. I made it just as the buggy started to move. I pulled the door shut and tried not to step on that stretcher inside. I shouldn't even have bothered that. The stretcher was empty. The only patient was me. You are listening to the story of the guy from Gower Gulch. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Commissions are still available in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve. Graduate registered nurses between the ages of 21 and 45 may qualify for service with this fine organization. If you are interested in joining the Army Nurse Corps, 
and believe that you qualify for a commission, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to Jeff Regan, investigator, and the story of the guy from Gower Gulch. Well, things were beginning to move like a hula dancer with a hot foot. Davy Crockett sent me out to pick up a roll of movie film. A Joan Fitzpatrick travelogue on beautiful Peru. There was something in it that was hot, but Crockett got himself plugged before he could say what it was. There were shots of a horse race in Peru. And when a big buster named Grundy turns up buying a nag from a Peruvian breeder, I figured a connection. So did Grundy. When the horse got hurt and Julio did a disappearing act with his money, everybody looked at me. That's when I took the shortest way to Hollywood in an ambulance, got my car, and made it for home. Only parked up the street from my apartment was that same 37 packet roadster I'd been dodging all evening. The blonde wasn't in it. She was sitting in my place looking real hopeful. Good evening. You keep late hours, Mr. Regan. That's no, the kind of friends I've got. Perhaps you ought to change them. I'll stick it out. What do you want? A little chance to talk to you. It'll keep till morning. Oh, but Mr. Regan, I've been waiting so long, you've got to talk to me now. Why? I'm Davy Crockett's wife. You've got something that belongs to me. I don't see any wedding ring. I... I don't wear one. Scare off the other boys? That's not a very nice remark, Mr. Regan. No, but you'll let it go. Only because it's not important. Oh, stop it. You're not Davy's wife. If the little guy had anybody he could trust, he wouldn't have had to call in the lion. All right, Mr. Regan. I lie. Now, let's have it, lady. What are you after? The roll of film. That figures. It's mine. Convince me. Mr. Regan, you're becoming very annoying. Well, why don't you call the police? But I tell you, it is mine. Let's see the pink slip. And so it is with heavy heart we bid adieu That's to... That's enough. Yeah, yeah. I thought I knew that voice. Mm. Davy stole the roll from my library. Now may I have it back? Homicide will turn it over to you when they're ready. I can't wait. Well, what makes it so valuable? I'm not sure. Then how do you know it is? Because I'm not stupid, Mr. Regan. Somebody goes to a lot of trouble to break into my film library. But he only steals one roll of film. Go on. I put the police on Davy, followed them to the jail. Saw you go after the film. That added up to pretty important business. Did you push those holes in Davy? Of course not. Now, you're going to get a chance to prove that when homicide starts speaking in your cupboard. About the film, I'll buy it from you. No sale. There's the door, lady. Use it. I threw the light switch and grabbed for the floor. When the noise stopped, I looked up. My landlady was going to be mad. The shots plowed a few holes into her flower pot. The blonde turned a couple of different colors and decided she could find safer company. She left with a fire escape without even goodbye. Well, I headed for the lions. The idea being to make sure that he'd turn that film over to the police and advertise that I didn't have it anymore. That figured to cool me off and I could catch some sleep again. When I got there, the lion looked kind of excited. He was wrapped up in a silk robe with red and gray stripes, and he carried a drink to match. He was holding a piece of that movie film up to the light. Hey, Regan, I've been calling all over for you. Where you been? I'm looking for a bed. I don't pay you to sleep. You're on a job. Now, uh, I've been thinking since you left. We're handling this wrong. Yeah, now, that's what I figure. Get on the phone. What for? To tell Homicide you got a package for him. You're turning over that film right now. Easy, Regan. You heard me, big shot. I'm tired of playing the fall guy. Now, Regan, you don't know what you're saying. I've been running over the section on that Peruvian horse race. And you know what? You picked the winner. And we're going to collect. Who's making book? The insurance company. Well, come on. Clear it up. Look at this clip. Yeah. Well, what do you see? What do you see? Looks like a horse. But look at him. He's way out in front. El Romano. Yeah, maybe. Now, here's the way I add it up. This film tells a story, or everybody wouldn't be grubbing around for it. Well, now, that takes a big brain. So somebody's engineering a phony. Who? That's what you're going to find out. But I'll tell you one thing. That nag's insured by Banner Trust, and they pay off big if we can turn up the swindle. All right. Give me that picture. Where you going? Over to Grundy's to check the horse. Now you're talking, Regan. You dig that out, and we'll be eating squab. Yeah. And if you don't, you'll be collecting your unemployment insurance. Yeah, well, payoff's about the same. I didn't like it any better than a fan dancer likes a wind tunnel. I'd already seen enough of Grundy and his boys for one night, but when the lion gets an idea, he's like a hangman with a new rope. So I went out to test it. I found Horace Grundy's place. It was a bright new house in the San Fernando Valley. There was some fancy fence in back, and a stable looked like the paint was still wet where it said El Romano. A 
trailer was parked on the road with a truck from the veterinarians. When Grundy opened the front door, he looked like he'd been sitting a three-day wake, but without any beer. Hello, Regan. Well, what's the verdict? It's bad, Regan. Bad. Tendons torn. Never run. Never. Yeah, you said that. I can't believe it. Uh-huh. I knew somebody else liked the animals. A guy from Gower Gulch. Decided to talk? Maybe. If you keep your hands in the audience. What else did Crockett say? Now you got him on the wheel. All right, you drive. That's better. Do you know the horse is insured? Not by me, it isn't. You don't own it, you just paid a deposit. Sure, 50 G's. You got it back yet? There's plenty of time. Julia was in the hospital. Oh? Well, now, if it wasn't for the accident, you would have coughed up another 200,000. Yes. No. What difference does it make? The whole deal's a bust now. Well, that horse is a phony. Say some more, Regan. I don't know much more. Davy Crockett was a movie fan. You're doing fine. You had pictures? I wouldn't advertise them, but there's a shot of a horse winning a race. Take a look here. Give me that. All right, it's economy size. You're going to ruin your eyesight. I got a magnifying glass for my income tax. Well, let's get a light behind it. Now, let me see. Horse. Right, you get a star. Four white feet. I can do that well myself. Listen, Regan. Horse in the stable's got three. That does it. My boss gets promoted. Come on. Come on outside. I'll show no, you. I'll take your word for it. Let go of me. I got my information. Max. Maxwell, where are you? I told you. Don't whistle the bulldogs. You're in it now, Regan. You're on my side. I drop your blood pressure. There's a handkerchief on the play. Hey, wait. Wait. Hello. I look for somebody. Good morning. Pan America. Si, si. I'm Julio. Is Mr. Grundy? Well, it's the guy with his mouth open there. How do you do? I'm so glad to meet him. Show it. Okay? You switched horses. Mm, no, no, you'll not understand. El Romano, he kicked me. Wait for the encore. Mr. Grundy, with belief, I'm telling you. Now, look, you better make it fast, Julio. This guy goes Shut off. Shut up, Regan. A man trades a stretcher for a slab. Let him talk. Mm, oh, the hospital. I did not go. Julio is honest. A debt comes first. The interest's going up. When El Romano hurts himself, I know the deal is off. I know I must see the consul, so we cash the check. What? Here we are. Ten thousand, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty. Your down payment is up. Now we are one big happy United Nations, no? Well, that's what happened. Now there were two guys with their mouths open. By the time we got him closed, the little gent from Peru had waddled off someplace, and Grundy folded his money and started to laugh. He was happy, and at least I had what I came for. Figured I could dump the whole plate of spaghetti on the lion. The lead horse in the travelogue was a different nag from the one in the stable. So I got in my car and headed for home. But I picked up a newspaper on the corner, and then the whole bucket turned upside down again. The green sheet was loaded with publicity shots of El Romano from South America. And he was exactly the same oat burner that came in on the plane, feet and all. No switch there. Well, if there was something phony in this act, it was that winner in that Fitzpatrick film. Well, for a minute I felt like a test pilot in a yo-yo factory and then the string broke. I took a fast run to the lions and one more look at those movies. I had it. The case was beginning to wind. Ten minutes later I was back on Gower Gulf. Regan, you alone? Don't be insulting. I'll open the door. What's the matter? You're slow. What do you want? Ask me in. No, no. Ask me in. Regan, look out! Uh, Be careful, Regan. I have a gun. Well, Julio. Uh, Yes, Julio. Uh Uh-huh. What are you doing here? Well, I told you. I know. Back at my place, you're aiming at her, not me. She's been to Peru. She has the films. You knew that. You wish like I know it. I go to the movies like everybody else. I keep my eyes on the winner. After Hollywood Park, I should have known better. Yeah, there are lots of races. El Romano was a dud. He came in last. Sixty lengths with Davy Crockett digging in the spurs. You gave the nag a build-up. Phony publicity to the sucker and insurance company. A quarter of a million I was over. Can it. You could have never closed a sale without Grundy watching a workout. That would have been a slow boat to China. You want to be a sailor, too? Oh, stop being tough, will you? You wore yourself out when you kicked up El Romano in that plane. It looked good. Yeah. Not to me or Joan. Look out, Regan. You're asking for a daily double. Yeah, well, I'm going to take it across the board. Give me that no, gun. Leave me alone. Drop it. No, you're breaking my arm. That's the idea. I'll kick you in the stomach. Oh. You better go back to his stretcher. Well. Yeah. My, you can be useful. Well, when I'm working. What about after hours? I'm not bad, you know. I never noticed. Look again. 
No, I'm all through with the ponies. You want to bet? Davy Crockett told me to play my hunches. Here I am. Yeah, but you're a loser. What do you mean? You threw those holes into Davy. It was Julio. Oh, you're trying real hard, but he was on the plane. What do I do now? Well, you might bid a fond do to Gower Gulch. That's not funny, Regan. I know it. But you ran out of film. Well, the whole thing blew up like a hoop skirt in a high wind. Julio had a real good thing until he ran into the little man with a good memory and a dame with a fast trigger finger. Her blackmail pitch was already set up, but Davy figured to queer it, so she had to knock him off. Well, the hospital boys came after Julio, and homicide dated Joan, the travel queen. The lion was pretty excited about the way things worked out. He figured that the insurance company would come across with some green stuff for exposing a fraud. They did. That was the color of the season pass they gave him to the Burton Holmes travel lectures. Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by Larry Roman and Jackson Gillis, produced by Sterling Tracy. Included in tonight's cast were Leo Clary, Clayton Post, Devon Patey, Ed Begley, and Herb Ellis. <laughs> Twenty-nine thousand nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. For the first time in history, qualified nurses have the opportunity of receiving commissions in the regular Army Reserve. These nurses will remain on inactive status, ready to serve their country in time of emergency. Four thousand of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. All nurses who receive commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. Inactive reserve status will not interfere with the nurse's civilian life, but the educational opportunities offered her by the Army Medical Department will be of a great advantage in her work. Don't wait. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Milton Charles, Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, master detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Doing my safe, you thief! Give me! Oh. Oh. A thunderstorm rages outside. A shot. A man falls dead. So begins a strange adventure for Nick Carter, master detective. An adventure in which a murder seemed to be no murder at all, and a dead body vanished into thin air. The Case of the Disappearing Corpse. Good morning, Matty. Oh, how are you, Nick? What brings you down here to headquarters so early in the morning? 
It's only just 10 o'clock. Well, I've been out in the country for the past couple of weeks writing an article on crime detection methods. Finished it last night. Huh? Just stopped in on my way back to my office past the time of day. That's what's doing. Yeah, it's pretty quiet, Nick. Nothing exciting's happened in the past ten days. Oh, Matty, haven't you even got one simple little murder just to keep me in practice? I'm bored. Uh, well, would you be interested in checking up on a suicide? Now, what's there to investigate about a suicide? Well, you never can tell, Nick. I just got a report that a guy bumped himself off in an uptown apartment house. I was going up to take a look at it myself, but the commissioner just called and must see him in his office right away. Uh, you want to go up in my place? Oh, I don't know, Matty. Well, if it's just the usual routine, you can lay off after you make the call. Anybody else going up? Medical examiners going along? Well, I called my office a few minutes ago, and Patsy had nothing for me, so I might as well run up and see what it's all about. What's the address? Hmm? No, oh, uh, let me see, uh... Oh, yeah, it's uh, 717 West Hampton Street, apartment 4. Okay, Matty. See you when we get back. Well, this is West Hampton Street. What was that number, Doc? 717. Ought to be just ahead, Nick. Oh, yeah, 695, 701, 709. There it is, 717. Well, that's a pretty swanky place, Nick. You can't live here on a white-collar salary. <clears throat> oh, here's the elevator waiting for us. Apartment four, wasn't it? Yeah. Get in and push the button. across the hall here. Yes, sir? Police department. You report a suicide? Oh, yes, sir. Won't you come in, please? Thank you. He... Uh, the body's right in the living room there, to your left. Oh, yes. I see it. Well, doesn't seem to be much of a question about it's being suicide. You're the butler? Yes, sir. My name is Jordan. What do you know about this, Jordan? Very little, sir. Mr. Warner, uh, he's Mr. Miller's nephew, came in about an hour ago and found his uncle lying there in the middle of the floor. I hadn't come down, but he called me and I reported it to the police. I've touched nothing since. Where's Mr. Warner now? Is he here? Yes, sir. He's upstairs in the library. He'll be down in a moment. I see. This dead man? Mr. Miller? Yes, sir. Mr. Anthony Miller. This is his apartment. His niece and I live here with him. Where's his niece now? She's dressing, sir. She'll be down with you shortly. This is a duplex apartment, isn't it? Yes, sir. Reception hall, living room, dining room, and kitchen on this floor. Library and three bedrooms on the second floor. Oh, pretty swank, I'd say. Pretty stuffy, I'd say. Well, thank you, Jordan. Well, as soon as the others come down, bring them in here, will you? Yes, at once, sir. Well, Doc, how's it look? Oh, pretty cut and dried. Pistol in his hand, a hole in his head with powder stains around it. Uh, it looks like suicide, all right. How long has he been dead? Must have been killed about uh, three o'clock. Uh, beg your pardon, sir. Here's Mr. Warner, Mr. Miller's nephew. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Warner? I'm Nick Carter. Uh, Nick Carter? Yes. I'm acting for Sergeant Matheson of the Metropolitan Police. Oh, by the way, Jordan. Yes. I left word for my two assistants to meet me here as soon as they could. When they arrive, will you let me know, please? Of course. At once, sir. Mr. Warner, I understand you found your uncle's body. That's right, Mr. Carter. I did. Will you tell us about it? Well, of course. When I was here last week, I left my camera here. I wanted to take some pictures this morning, so I dropped in here about 9.30 to pick it up. Who let you in? No one, Mr. Carter. I have my own key to the apartment. I came into the living room here, saw my uncle lying there on the floor, obviously dead. So I called Jordan, who came down immediately and informed the police. That's about all. Was the outer apartment door locked when you came in? Yes. Both the regular safety lock and the regular lock were on. Mm-hmm. Are there any windows opening under the fire escapes? They were all fastened securely, sir. I checked them myself to make sure. Then no one could have come in from the outside. No, hardly. Not with the door and windows all locked as they were. I uh, see. Mr. Carter, what's the idea of all these questions? It was suicide, wasn't it? Just purely routine, that's all. Has anything in this room been touched since the body was found? No, not a thing. Good. That your uncle's pistol in his hand? Uh, it looks like it, yes. Yeah, let me take it. There. You recognize it? Well, no, don't touch it. There may be fingerprints on it. That's why I'm holding it with my handkerchief. Yes. Yes, that's my Uncle Gun, all right. There's no question about that. Yes, sir, it's Mr. Miller's gun, Mr. Carter. I've seen it often. Mm-hmm. 
And one of the shells is empty. And one shot, been fired. Well, that's all it took to kill him. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, what is it? This is unusual, to say the least. There's an empty shell in the chamber, but the pistol barrel is clean. What's that, Nick? You see? Either the barrel has been cleaned since the shot was fired, or the shot wasn't fired from this gun. Then this can't be suicide. Can't be suicide? No. It's definitely not suicide. It's murder. Murder, sir? But Where's told... the old man's niece? Say she lives here? Yes, sir. She... She'd be down directly, sir. Mr. Carter, she knows nothing about this. She was still asleep when we phoned the police. Jordan called her afterward. That's right, sir. I did. She knows nothing of this. Maybe and maybe not. I'd like to talk to her anyway, because from what you tell me about the door and windows all being locked, and from the condition of the murder weapon, this must have been an inside job. One of you three is guilty. Well, now look here, Mr. Carter. Sorry, I wasn't... Mr. Warner. This is now in the hands of the police. May I use your phone, please? There's one on the desk, sir. Oh, that, that one's not working, Mr. Carter. If you come with me, I'll show you the one in the library upstairs. Right. I, I know that one's all right. This this one has a, a short circuit or something. Thanks. Be right back, Doc. Right, Nick. Sorry to trouble you. No, no, not at all. You better call Sergeant Matheson. Have him send his homicide experts up here, as well as the cop to stand guard. Well, you probably want you all to go down to headquarters for a talk. I see. Murder has to be treated very differently from suicide. Yeah. Well, there's the library right ahead of you. You'll find the phone in there. Thanks. fortune to live here. Yeah. Oh. Uh, this is apartment four, Patsy. Right here. Uh-huh. Yes. What is it, please? Is Mr. Carter here? Mr. Carter? Yes, Mr. Nick Carter, the detective. You must have the wrong number, miss. What number were you looking for? Look, is this 717 West Hampton Street or isn't it? That's correct, sir. And is this apartment four, or isn't it? That's quite right, sir. Okay, then where's Nick Carter? I'm very sorry, sir, but there must be some mistake. Mr. Anthony Miller lives here. There's no Mr. Carter. Well, didn't the man kill himself here last night? Oh, my goodness, no, miss. You're all mixed up. Well, uh, Scubby, did Sergeant Matheson tell you the name of the dead man? No, said whoever phoned didn't give it to him. Oh, we must have the address wrong, Patsy. Maybe. Uh, could, could we use your phone? Oh, why, of course, miss, if you'll step into the living room... There, to your left. There, there's a phone in there. Oh, thanks. Come on, Scotty. Okay. You can give the sergeant a buzz and see what's wrong. Right there, sir, on the desk. Right on. Thanks. If you'll pardon me for a moment, please. Well, sure. Go ahead. Police headquarters. Uh, let me speak to Sergeant Matheson. One moment, please. Oh, I wonder how it would be to live in a place. Homicide, like Sergeant Matheson. Oh, Maddie, this is Scubby. Yeah, what's on your mind, Scubby? Oh, well, Nick must have given us the wrong address when he told us to follow him uptown to this suicide place. What is the address? Uh, uh, just a minute. Uh, yeah. Here it is. It's 717 West Hampton Street, apartment 4. But that's where we are, Maddie. And they don't know anything about it here. What's that? No, the butler tells us there's been no suicide here. Well, uh, hey, that's the address they gave us this morning when they phoned. Well, have you heard from Nick or the medical examiner? Hey, come to think of it, I have it. And that's a funny thing, too. It's over two hours since they left here. They ought to be back by now. Hey, why didn't they call and say they got the wrong address? There's something mighty funny going on, Scubby. Yeah, looks like it. Well, we'll see what we can find. Maybe it's an address that sounds like this one. We'll call you in a little while if we don't find anything. Okay, I'll tell the boys to watch out for Nick and Doc. Right, so long. You know any more than we do? No. He hasn't heard from Nick or the doc since they left headquarters about two hours ago. What are you looking at? I was just thinking. Whoever lives here has pretty poor taste, even if they do have money. How do you mean? Well, look at the rug in this room. Yeah? It's the wrong color. It's definitely too small for the size of the floor. And the rug in the next room, which must be the dining room. But it's entirely the wrong color for the decorative effect in that room. And that one's much too big for the size of the floor. Yeah, you're right, Patsy. It's funny that people who live in such swell places should furnish their rooms so badly. Yeah. It almost looks as if these two rugs have been switched around, doesn't it? Patsy, maybe that's just what did happen. Maybe... 
Here, let me get a look at the rug under that dining table. Uh-huh. I'll shove the table over to one side and have a good look. Okay. Oh, yeah. Are you looking for something, uh, sir? You're darn right I'm looking for something. You better hope I don't find it. I have to ask you to stop moving that dining table. If you try to stop me, I'll put a gun between your ribs. I'll call the police. Go ahead, call him if you dare. There. Gabby, look, right in the center of the rug, a big blood stain. That's what I thought. And I'll bet my last dollar that you'll find a blood stain that same size and shape in the center of the living room floor. Then someone was killed here. Yes, Patsy. And Nick and the doctor were here, too. This whole business about there being no killing here is a frame-up. Now you talk, and talk fast. What have you done with Nick Carter? Every man in every squad car is to be on the lookout for him. Now repeat that description I gave you. Right. Right. No, 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 it's Gerald Warner. Yeah, he was the old man's nephew. Okay, let me know as soon as you hear anything. Now, Jordan, look here. You're in a pretty tight spot. If you don't want this murder rap pinned on you, you better talk and you better say plenty. But I tell you, I know nothing about it. And you still say you don't know where the old man's niece went either, huh? Miss, Miss Hammond? No, sir. She put on her hat and coat and went out carrying a small overnight bag. Where'd she go? I don't know, sir. Ah, look, don't be a sap. The butler always knows everything about a killing. And most of the time, the butler done the murder himself. But I assure you, Now, look, you, sir, we've I... proved that the bloodstained Scubby and Patsy found was human blood. We found Nick Carter's fingerprints on the desk, the table, and the upstairs phone. We found the old man's body stuffed in that upstairs closet in your apartment. <laughs> And you don't know nothing about nothing. Oh, Sergeant, here's huh? the bullet they just took out of Miller's body. Let me see it. Ah, well, that's an ordinary thirty-two caliber slug. Yeah, but it was big enough to kill him. I know that. What well, I mean was... Sergeant, your detective squad is back from searching Gerald Warner's apartment. Oh, yeah? They find anything? Mm, nothing very valuable. Oh, they did find a telephone number for the niece, Frances Hammond. Uh-oh. There were two numbers in Warner's small directory. One was her home and the other, according to the chief operator, is at 62 East Pine Street. Now, what the deuce would that be? Well, maybe she's got a girlfriend there. That's it, Scubby. Patsy, this is a job for you. Uh-huh. Go to this address and see if Frances Hammond is there. If she is, tell her you're a reporter. Find out how much she knows. Get as much of the story out of her as you can. And if she's not there? All right, maybe you can find out where she is. But go on, get going and hurry. Right. Maybe you can dig up something that'll tell us where Nick is. <laughs> Any idea where we are, Doc? No. Looks sort of like somebody's hunting shack. Yes, I can see that. That doesn't help much. Well, as long as we're tied up to these two chairs like we are, it doesn't make much difference what part of the world we're in. We're no good to anybody this way. Oh, the thing that makes me maddest is the way they fooled me so completely. I never did see who hit me. Well, considering that there were only two men in the place and that the butler was with me, it isn't very hard to figure out who tapped you for the count. I was out cold from the time I was knocked out until I came to in this place. My wrist was so relaxed when they tied me that I can't work them loose. No, don't think I got into this mess because I was bored. Well, I... I don't understand how you found out where I was staying, Miss Bowen. Your cousin told me, Miss Hammond. But it was he who suggested that I come here. He knew reporters would be pestering me for interviews after... After Uncle Anthony killed himself. And he said if I came here, they wouldn't be able to find me. He promised me he wouldn't tell anyone. But he only gave me your address because he knew I wouldn't pester you. He and I have been friends for years. Oh, I hope he doesn't tell anyone else. I'm sure he won't. And now, may I ask you a question or two? I suppose so. I, I really don't feel much like talking about it. I know, Miss Hammond. You loved your uncle, didn't you? Very much. He was always so good to me. Were you and your cousin... Engaged? Well, not quite. Uncle wanted us to get married. In fact, he he made a will leaving me all his money because, well, he he thought that would keep Gerald more interested in me. Was Gerald, uh, Mr. Warner, interested in anyone else? Oh, no, it wasn't that. Uncle Anthony knew that Gerald wasn't ready to settle down yet. He was trying to persuade him it would be the best thing for him. Do you know where your cousin is now? I, no, I don't. Why do you ask me where he is? Don't you know? Well, uh, wait, well, you see, he um, asked me to send him a copy of whatever I wrote in my interview with you. But he's left town and he didn't leave me his address. Can you tell me? Why, 
I don't know. When he wants to get out of town, he generally goes to Atlantic City, the Hotel Martise. Or with Hunting Shack up in Norris County. He might be in either place, I suppose. Uh-huh. Well, I'll send a copy of the interview to each of these addresses. One of them ought to reach him. Uh, tell me, Miss Hammond, did you know where your uncle kept his pistol? Why, of course. We all knew it. It was no secret. I've seen it often. But I... I never thought he'd use it to... to do this. Oh, there now, Miss Hammond. I'm sorry I mentioned it. Oh, please don't let it upset you. I'll just run along now. Goodbye. And thanks. Trying to get across the room by moving your chair like this when you're tied up in it this way isn't the simplest thing in the world. I I can't make my chair move at all. But you're doing fine. Am I getting anywhere near that table yet? You're doing great, Nick. Just a little more. I'm moving backwards this way. It's hard to tell where I'm going. Uh, to your left. Uh, just a hair. That, that, that's it. Now you got it. Uh, so far, so good. Now, just where's the bottle, Doc? With my back to it this way, I can't see where it is. It's almost directly in back of you. Uh, about a foot from the edge of the table. All right. I'll pull the tablecloth toward me. And that'll bring the bottle near the edge where I can get hold of it. Watch it while I pull it now. Is it coming? Uh, careful now. It's almost there. Hold it. It's right at the edge. You ought to be able to get it now. Well, I can if I can get my hands up that high. Yeah. Whoever tied my arms and back of this chair did too good a job. There's no slack at all. Uh, that's it. There. I got it. <sighs> now, if I can break this bottle against the fireplace, I should have a sharp edge that'll cut these ropes in short order. But when you can only move an inch at a time this way, it's slow work getting anywhere. Keep me going in the right direction, Doc. Oh, you're doing fine, Nick. Only a little more now. Uh, uh, to your left a bit. Uh, that's it. You ought to be able to reach it now. Uh, uh, I'll try it. Easy first. Uh, you can hit it all right. Yeah. All right, here goes, Doc. Uh, you did it, Nick. Now edge your chair over toward me. You can cut my ropes first, then I'll cut yours. Gosh, Nick, you're the eighth wonder of the world. Thanks, Doc. Well, look out. Here I come. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Oh, yeah, Chief. You say... Gerald Warner isn't at the Hotel Martise and hasn't been there for several months, huh? Okay, thanks very much, Chief. Yeah, that's what we wanted to know. We know where to look for him now. Yeah, thanks. So long. Well, that wasn't so bad, Nick. But it took longer to cut through the ropes of that piece of glass than I thought it would. Well, we're free, and that's the main thing. Have you found anything around the shack here that looks like a clue? I'm not sure, Doc, but I rather think so. I found these two pistols in the back of one of the cupboards. They're very unusual pair of guns. Uh-huh. Oh, here. This gun has one empty shell in it. The barrel is clean. It has not been fired. Well, that's the gun that was in the old man's hand when we found him, isn't it? I'm pretty sure it is. Now, look at this other gun. Uh-huh. This one has no empty shells in it. The barrel is dirty, and from the smell of it has been fired very recently. I see what you mean. Say, that does make them a little queer, doesn't it? Well, Doc, as I see it, Warner killed Miller with his own gun. Then he tried to make it look like suicide, but he couldn't leave his own gun there. So he got his uncle's gun, which hadn't been fired. Took the empty shell out of his gun and exchanged it for a full shell from his uncle's gun and put that gun in his uncle's hand. And he was just excited enough not to realize that the barrel of his uncle's gun was still clean. Of course. But, well, why didn't he fire the other gun instead of going through all that rigmarole about changing the empty shell for the full one? Probably afraid that a second shot would wake up somebody who might have been partly aroused by the first shot, the one that killed his uncle. Well, I have to admit that it makes sense the way you tell it. And you still think that it will pay us to wait here for somebody to show up? Yes, Doc, I do. Because if anyone was planning to get rid of us, they'd have done it tonight. And they'd have to do it tonight. They wouldn't dare wait until tomorrow. Someone might find us in the meantime. So if we wait... Someone is sure to show up. Okay, you're the doctor. As far as catching murderers goes, you say wait, we wait. Huh. You're 
right, Nick. There's somebody now. Now, remember, sit in your chair with your back to the door. Hold the ropes as if he was still tied up and unconscious. Like this? Let your head drop on your chest more. Right. Now, that's swelled up. Mm. Now, you look as if he were dead to the world. I'll do the same. Quiet. Here they are. Oh, what do you know? He's still out cold. I must have given him a stiffer dose than I thought I did. Ah, it won't hurt him. Makes it easier for us. Yeah, you're quite right, Mike. What are we going to do next, Warner? I still think our best plan is to dump them in the old quarry. It's close by and it's full of water. We'll wait the bodies. They'll never be found. Yeah, it's an awful lot of killing just to get a hold of an old will. Not at all, Mike. If I could have taken the will without killing anyone, I would have been glad to do it that way. But since I couldn't, I'm not going to worry about it. And it's worth every bit of my trouble, believe me. A will I destroyed left everything to my cousin. Now that that's out of the way, I am the old man's only living relative. Sole heir to everything he owns. And that's plenty. Uh, what about that niece of his, your cousin? Ah, but she's not really his niece. She's just a girl he sort of unofficially adopted. He always planned to adopt her legally, but he... Well, never got around to it, so... She gets nothing. Are you going to marry her? Marry her? Hmm. <laughs> oh, no, indeed, Mike. She's not my type at all. I just kidded around with her to keep in right with the old man. But that's all over now. Well, I hope it works out like you wanted to. Well, I've certainly had bad breaks so far. First, the old man catches me at the safe. Then headquarters sends up Nick Carter instead of a regular cop. Then with the butler and, and the plan that I had the apartment all fixed up so you'd never know there'd been a killing, Carter's two assistants show up. And the girl notices the rugs have been switched. That tips off the whole frame up. Ah, uh, your troubles are over now. They will be as soon as we get rid of these two middlers. Yeah, uh, better do it pretty quick now. Uh, take it easy just as soon as it gets a little darker, Mike. Uh, uh, you got any old burlap bags we can put them in? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's some out back. I'll show you where they are. Okay, better have them ready when we want them. That was our chance, Doc. Come on. Let me have one of those shotguns we loaded before. Here you are, Nick. Thanks. Now you take the other one. Get behind the cupboard there. I'll hide over here. Right, Nick. You say when. Let me do the talking. Quiet now. Mike! Mike, look, they've gone! That ain't possible. I just... Get your hands up high, both of you. Carter! How did you... We'll talk about that later. All right, Doc. I'll load the gun on them while you tie their hands and tie them tight the way they tied ours. It'll be a pleasure, Nick, a positive pleasure. Oh, wait till I tie them. Well, Mr. Warner, this isn't coming out just the way you planned it, is it? You've got no proof against me, Carter. You're wrong, Warner. When you knocked me out in your uncle's apartment, you proved you killed him. Tell that to a jury and see how far you get. Oh, that's not legal evidence, it's true. But I have some other evidence that is legal. What? Warner, between the time Doc and I got free and the time you and Mike got here, we searched this shack of yours. And hidden in one of the cupboards, we found these two guns. Well, so you found two guns in a hunting shack. That's really remarkable. One of these guns is the one that was in your uncle's hand when I first saw his body. The other one, I feel sure, is the one that actually killed him. And if I'm not mistaken, it'll be registered in your name, have your fingerprints on it, and will fire a bullet that'll match the bullet that killed your uncle. Would you call those things legal proof? All right, all right. Yes, that's the gun I killed him with. You know, Carter, I should have killed you when I had the chance. Yes, it would have been wiser than to... Nick! Nick, are you there? Nick! Nick! Come in, Patsy. Oh. What's all the excitement? Oh, Nick, I've been so afraid. Afraid of what? Af- afraid for you. Why, Patsy, why, I... you should know me better than that. Say, how did you get down here anyway? Well, when Sergeant Madison got word from Atlantic City that Warner wasn't there, why... I made Scubby drive me down here as fast as he could. Yeah, she wouldn't let me stop and park anywhere. I never have any luck when I'm out with her. Well, you got here just in time to drive back with us. I was just going to take Mr. Warner and his friend here back to town to meet Mattie. Oh, gosh, Nick. After that... that thug tried to tell me that you'd never been in the apartment when we knew you had, why... Oh, I was ready for anything. But she got even with him. I sure <laughs> did. He thought I wouldn't notice that they'd switch the rugs around, but I did. <laughs> That'll teach him. Yes, Patsy. This is one time when a woman's instinct for interior decoration really solved a murder. Well, Nick, how about a glimpse into next week's story of intrigue and adventure? You used the right word that time, Ken. Because next week I'm going to tell you a story in which intrigue is the keynote. 
A man in the death house with only nine hours to live asked me to prove him innocent of the charge in which he'd been convicted. He claimed he was the victim of a frame-up. And when Nick really got into the case, he found that the whole thing was a frame-up, but not quite the way we expected. You mean you investigated the case and found a solution in only nine hours? That's right, Ken. They were a very busy nine hours, and a man's life hung in the balance. What do you call your story, Nick? I call it Nine Hours to Live. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of The Shadow Comics. In The Adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Scubby by John Kane. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. is the Mutual Broadcasting System. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's nine hours to live. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. And now for some late news. Nine hours from now, at the stroke of midnight, Johnny Walter, the bland-faced killer convicted of the murder of Mrs. Cornelius Fielding, will go to the chair. And just 30 minutes ago, the condemned man made a last request. But Johnny Walter did not ask for a sumptuous last meal in the tradition of the condemned, nor did he ask to see his nearest and dearest relative, his wife, Laura. No, Johnny Walter's request was far more dramatic. He asked to see the great detective, Nick Carter. What this last-minute conference means is anybody's guess. Perhaps a reprieve for Waldron. Perhaps a clue as to what happened to the fielding jewels, which up to now have not been found. At any rate, the master detective, Nick Carter, has consented to talk with Walter and probably is at this moment entering Death House Row. Keep tuned to this station for further dramatic developments. Glad we got him, God. Yeah, he's in number one. Moved him there this morning. Shorter waves to walk the chair from number one. Is he all ready to go? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Barbara was in, shaved his head and legs about an hour ago. How's he taking it? Uh, he ain't been a peep out of him. Don't want nothing to eat. Don't want a chaplain. Nothing. Only request he's made to see you. <laughs> Funny time to ask to see a detective. Uh, if you don't mind my asking, Mr. Carter... What made a big shot like you decide to see him? Well, maybe I'm curious to know what's on his mind. Or maybe I'm just a softy about a fellow who's going to die in a few hours. <laughs> I don't believe you got any sympathy for a killer. Not you. Uh, here we are. Here's your company, Waldron. Oh, hiya, Mr. Carter. Hello, Waldron. You got five minutes. All right, guard. Well, Johnny? Oh, so you came. I I was afraid you wouldn't. I must admit I was surprised when the warden called and said you wanted to see me. Yeah, I imagine you were. Oh, it was sure nice of you to come. Skip the formalities, Johnny. Time's too short for chit-chat. Come to the point. What's on your mind? Mr. Carter, you think I'm guilty, don't you? Well, I didn't follow your case too closely, but you had a fair trial, and you were found guilty. What would you have me believe? I'd like to have you believe I'm innocent. Pretty late in the game to convince anybody of that, John. Oh, I'm not looking for a last-minute reprieve. 
That isn't what I called you out here for, but when I got word a little while ago that the governor had refused my last request for a reprieve, I I made up my mind that I'd only be kidding myself to hope any longer. And why did you want to see me, Johnny? Mr. Carter, I know I haven't got a chance. I'm going to be gone in just a few hours now, but I could go a lot easier if I thought maybe someday the world would know the truth, would know that Johnny Waldron is innocent. Johnny, if I thought you were innocent, I'd start the wheels turning right now to get you a reprieve. Oh, wait, let me finish, Mr. Carter. I know you don't believe me. Nobody does. And I couldn't expect you to believe me after the way things went at the trial, but... Well, as I've been sitting here in death row waiting, the idea came to me maybe Nick Carter would show him someday. Well, of course, I'd be gone, but... Well, you see, there's Laura, my wife. She's going to keep on living and... Well, it'll be hard for her. I suppose she believes you're innocent. Oh, she's stuck by me swell. Oh, she's a wonderful woman. I... I don't want the world to look on her as the widow of a murderer. Mr. Carter, all I'm asking you is that... After I'm gone and... Well, in your spare time... If you'll try to prove they executed the wrong man... Just... Just for my wife's sake. Johnny, if you're innocent... Who do you think did rob the Fielding safe and kill Mrs. Fielding? I don't know, Mr. Carter. There's nobody you even suspect? Well, the only one that I... Oh, no. No, I'm not going to accuse somebody I'm not sure of. I I only got a few hours more to live and... Now, listen, Johnny. If you want me to do anything for you, you better tell me everything you can about this. Oh, no. You, you'll find them for yourself once you start looking. Well, I've got to have some kind of evidence to go on. Well, I don't have any. The cards were stacked too well against me, but... But go see Laura. She never stopped working for me. Maybe she knows more by now. Look here. If that's the case, why haven't you had a lawyer working for you right up to the last minute? Lawyers? <laughs> I never had that kind of dough. Oh, a couple of shysters came around thinking maybe I had the fielding jewels tucked away someplace, but, well, when they found out they weren't going to get a cut, they faded it pretty fast. Even if you do anything for me, Mr. Carter, I won't be able to pay you for your trouble. You'd have to do it just as a favor to a dying man. You don't know where the jewels are? No, Mr. Carter. Mm-hmm. How could I know? I didn't do that job. Look, go see Laura. She'll tell you whatever she can. Time's up, Mr. Carter. All right, guard. Well, Johnny, I'll look into your case. I don't suppose you'll believe me when I say that I'm... <laughs> I bet he's been telling you an innocent man's being sent to the chair. Tells everybody that. Did it ever occur to you that he might be telling the truth? Uh, well, well, why are you... So long, Johnny. Good luck. Well, thanks for coming, Mr. Carter, and thanks for whatever you do for me. I'd very much like to know what happened to the Fielding Jewel. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, well, well, maybe they'll turn up while you're investigating. You think so? I wonder. Say, guard, how long is it now until... Eight hours, Johnny. Just eight more hours. <laughs> Office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Patsy, this is Nick. Oh, Nick, thank heaven you called. This place is a madhouse. The office is filled with reporters. The newspaper and broadcasting companies have been telephoning. The district attorney's been trying to reach you. Well, what's the matter? Well, they want to know if you're going to try to get a reprieve for Johnny Waldron. What? And the DA said he'd stick around his office all evening. And he's contacted the governor, and he'll be on tap ready. Reprieve? Wait, heaven, I just talked to the fellow. I don't have any evidence, none whatsoever. What's the matter with the DA? Well, he says that when you go to work on a case, even at the zero hour, something usually pops. Now tell him to hang under the hats a while. And you, Patsy, go up to the courthouse and get a transcript in the Walden trial. And dig what you can out of our files about him. Uh-huh. I'm heading back from state's prison right away. I'll meet you in front of the office. All right, Nick. We're going to have to work fast. They throw this switch in exactly seven hours and 40 minutes. <laughs> Well, Waldron was really hired as a chauffeur, Nick. Mm -hmm. But it was brought out at the trial that he tried to get in right with the old lady every chance he got. You know, Mrs. Fielding was an invalid. Yeah. And Waldron used to carry her up and downstairs and waited on her, all all that sort of thing. He was inside the house a great deal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, then let's see. Oh, the gun. The gun she was killed with was traced to Mrs. Fielding's stepson, Tom Fielding. Uh But the prints on the gun were Waldron's. The stepson Fielding. You live there with her? Ah, uh, just the two of them. Mm-hmm. Waldron and all the other servants slept out and reported for work in the mornings at 8. 
When was the body found? Uh, on a Thursday night at 10 o'clock in the library of the house. Fielding came home from his club and found her. The safe was open, the jewels and the money gone. Of course, any of the servants as well as Fielding himself might have known the combination to the safe. Mrs. Fielding often opened it in front of them all. Uh, the defense harped on that at the trial. But Waldron's prints on the gun and his alibi being so flimsy, well, just cooked his goose. I see. Nick, how did Waldron strike you? Guilty? It's the evidence that tells the tale in any case, Bessie. We could find the party who has the missing fielding jewel. Ha <laughs> ha, it would look pretty grim for that party. Wouldn't look good, that's certain. Oh, Nick, look at the time. 5.50. And six hours and ten minutes, an innocent man may be electrocuted. No innocent man will be electrocuted for a crime he didn't do if I can possibly help it. And here's our first stop, Bessie. His old tenement house. Laura Waldron lives here. <laughs> You're very nice to come to see me, especially today. Mrs. Waldron, this is my assistant, Patsy Bowen. How do you do, Miss Bowen? Hello, Mrs. Waldron. Won't you two sit down? I... Oh, here, here, let me dust the chair. Oh, no, don't. It's perfectly all right. Well, since Johnny's been away, I... I haven't been as good a housekeeper as I used to be. No heart for it anymore. Even this one room of mine... Mrs. Waldron, I came to see you because... You went to see my husband, I know. I, I heard it on the radio. That's right. But it's too late to get Johnny off, isn't it? And besides, we don't have any money to pay for a famous detective like you. Mrs. Waldron, the only thing Nick Carter ever asked is that justice be done. Now tell me about Johnny. His habits, what he likes, what he doesn't like. Johnny's good, Mr. Carter. You see, I know he's innocent. Have you proof, Mrs. Waldron? Proof? No. No, just my heart tells me he wouldn't kill anybody. But more than that, I know because he was with me at the time the police say she was killed. The prosecution tore that alibi to shreds. Yes, a wife's testimony doesn't count for much in court. And yet how thankful I am that he was with me that night, that, that I know he's innocent. You understand what I mean, don't you, Miss Bowen? Yes. You understand when I say the world can stand against your man, but if you know he's right and, and good and true... It... Oh, Mrs. Warren... <laughs> Isn't there any way at all it, it can be proved that your husband was home with you that night? Oh, no, no. You don't think of providing alibis or staying in your own home. If you can call one room in a place like this home. I don't know what will become of me now that Johnny's going... Well, Tom Fielding has offered to help me, but... Tom Fielding? You mean the stepson of the woman your husband is convicted of murdering? Yes. In what way has he offered to help you? Money. He knows Johnny isn't a murderer. Uh, his testimony in court didn't follow that line, Mrs. Waldron. Oh, of course not. Mr. Fielding had himself to protect. Well, that's right, Nick. Fielding was under suspicion. Just this afternoon he called again. And where are the jewels, I said to him. If my Johnny did it, where are the jewels and the money? Would I be begging for work if Johnny had done it? You're working now, Mrs. Waldron? Day work. Scrubbing up places where they don't ask too many questions, but... <laughs> But I'd mop the streets of this town from one end to the other every day if, if Johnny didn't have to die. Oh. <laughs> oh, don't, Mrs. Waldron. Don't cry. Oh, you'll have to excuse me. It's just that I can't stand to think. I, I'm counting the minutes and seconds now. Only a few more hours and... Oh, Johnny will be gone. Mrs. Waldron, I'd like to ask you another question, if I may. All right, Mr. Carter. Maybe Nick can save your husband yet. Oh, if he only could. There isn't time left for me to chase down every witness and question him. Now, tell me, Mrs. Walden, whom do you suspect of robbing and murdering your husband's late employer? Who? Oh, Mr. Carter, I have no proof against anyone. I didn't ask if you knew who murdered Mrs. Fielding. I only said, whom do you suspect? But I have no right to suspect him. Right. What do you mean? Oh, he's been so kind and offered to help. John Fielding... That's who you think did it. Well, I've never dared to think it out loud before. He was her stepson, you know, but she loved him like her own. Oh, they had their quarrels, but they were just money spats. I'm not saying he did it, only... Only what? Uh, will you talk to him, Mr. Carter? All right, I will. We'll go right over to the fielding house now. Oh, but you won't find him at home at this hour, Mr. Carter. He's always at the club at this time. 
Uh, I know from when Johnny used to drive for him. That's the old hunt club, isn't it? Yes. At 10th and 8th. Well, come on. Let's hurry. Time's precious. Okay. Uh, goodbye, Mrs. Waldron. Goodbye. And thank you. I'll be right here waiting and, and praying you find the guilty man in time to save Johnny. There's something puzzling you. What is it? Didn't you think Mrs. Waldron's story made sense? Well, it did, and it didn't. But, Nick, doesn't it seem a bit odd for Tom Fielding to offer her money? Yes, if that's true. Well, then her story does make sense. Patsy, it's not what Mrs. Waldron said that's bothering me. Something else. Something else? What, Nick? I wish I knew. There's something about her that puzzles me. Something that doesn't fit into the picture. It's in the back of my mind somewhere, oh, I? can't quite seem to get hold of it. If you ask me, Tom Fielding is the one who could straighten out a lot of things. Well, he's the man we're going to tackle right now. Hmm. This hunt club is pretty swanky, isn't it? Uh-huh. Oh, good evening, sir. Can I park your car for you? Well, no, thanks. We won't be here very long. Oh, I uh, beg your pardon, miss. Ladies aren't permitted in the old hunt club. I'm sorry. Well, that lets you out, Patsy. Mm, yes, I guess it does. You better wait for me here. <sighs> I guess I'll have to. Oh, oh, Nick. Yes? It's 8.15. Only three hours and 45 minutes to go until midnight. Oh, ring again, Nick. Fielding wasn't at his club, so he's got to be home here. Uh-uh. Your woman of intuition isn't working right tonight, Patsy. No. There's not a light in the whole house. I don't think anybody's home. Oh, Mr. Tom Fielding, if you only knew how much time we've wasted looking for you. Well, Patsy, even if Mr. Fielding isn't at home, I think we'll see what evidence we can uncover. Huh? I don't like waiting. What? Well, what are you going to do? In the interest of Johnny Waldron and his wife, Laura, I'm going to do a little high-class lock picking. <laughs> ah, there we are. Come on. Stay behind me. Whoa. It's dark in here. Shut the door. I'll use my flash. Where are we headed for? The library. Oh. That's the room Mrs. Fielding was killed in, wasn't it? Uh-huh. Let's see. In these old houses, the library is usually back this way off the center hall. Come on. Uh, Nick, suppose there's somebody beside us in the house. Well, let's hope there isn't. Ah, here we are. Yes, this is the library. What are we looking for, Nick? Right now, I'm looking for Mrs. Fielding's safe. Safe? Mm-hmm. Safe? Oh, yes. Uh, it's behind that portrait of her. I remember that from the testimony. Thanks. Turn on that small lamp and take a glance through the papers on the desk while I open this safe. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, say, if Mrs. Fielding held her son and heir down while she was living, he's certainly making up for it now. Look at that wine cabinet crammed full of black market stuff. Hey, look at this for swank. Have a gold tip cigarette, Miss Bowen? Why, yes. Thank you, I will. That's a shame on you. Huh? How'd you feel if Tom Fielding walked in here and caught you swiping his expensive cigarettes? Only one, Nick, for a souvenir. And for that matter, how would you feel if Mr. Fielding walked in and saw you about to open his safe? Oh, oh Nick! That's... Are you okay? Uh, uh, Yes, I... They shot through I, the window. Bullet went into the side of the desk here. We better get out of here, Nick. Now, one minute, Patsy. I've got to see what's in this safe. It's almost open now, I think. Um, Nick, who, who do you think shot at us? Mr. Fielding? Oh, dig that bullet out of the desk. It'll be a handy piece of evidence. All right. Say, you're taking this attempt to murder us awfully lightly, Nick. I don't think it was murder, Patsy. Huh? You were standing by the wine cabinet, not four feet from the window, and I was a perfect target standing here. Patsy, I think you'll find somebody was just trying to scare us away. Oh. Uh, I got the bullet out, Nick. Hmm. Looks like a thirty-two. Ah, there we are. Patsy. Yes? Look here. The missing jewels. Oh, Nick. Yes, right here in Fielding's safe. Oh, Nick, that's wonderful. Hey, what are you doing? I'm getting the DA on the phone for you. You've got the evidence for Johnny Walton's reprieve. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I knew he wasn't guilty, Nick. Mrs. Walton was telling the truth. Patsy, put that phone down. But, Nick... Put it down. Oh, but, Nick... Get me you... police headquarters first. I want a general alarm sent out for Tom Fielding. But Johnny Walton... I still have two hours. If Walton is innocent, I'll prove it in time to save him from the chair. Nick? 
Dick, why should you want to talk to Mrs. Waldron again when you haven't asked for the reprieve? It'll only make her feel worse. There's something about her that doesn't quite add up, Patsy. I've got to know what it is before I can go further. This is her door, isn't it? Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, Nick Carter, your thinking on this case is beyond me. Well, it's hard to explain, Patsy. When I don't know myself what the missing link is, how can I explain it to you? But you found the jewels. Tom Fielding had them in his own safe. Why, it's perfectly obvious. He didn't get along with his stepmother and therefore... Nick, what are you doing? Going to open Mrs. Waldron's door. Oh, oh, don't do that. I'm sure she's here. She's probably been crying and doesn't want to see anyone. Let me call to her first. Mrs. Waldron? Mrs. Waldron? Sorry, Betsy, but we haven't any time to waste. Let's see. Where's the light switch? Uh, here by the door. Oh, she isn't here. So it seems. Nick, look here. There's a gold-tipped cigarette in this ashtray. Hmm? The same kind we saw at Fielding's house. Let's have it. Oh, no lipstick on it. Kind of pinched in at the end. Just as if... He's been here... Why, I never would have believed it of him. Believe what? Well, that a man like Fielding would come to a place like this. Why, a man like that wouldn't get his hands dirty putting them on the doorknob of a hovel like this. Hmm? Say that again, Patsy. I said a man like Fielding wouldn't dirty his hands on the doorknob of a place... I got it. Patsy, you just gave me the key I've been looking for. Huh? Come on, we've got to hurry back to Tom Fielding's library, or there may be another murder. times when having a siren on this car comes in handy. And tonight's one of them. I hope we're in time. Do you think the police have picked Fielding up yet, or do you think he'll be at his home? Uh, he's at home. I'll bet my bottom dollar on that. Nick, do you know what time it is? Stop worrying about the time. Come on, come on. I'm right with you. The place is still dark. There's a little light shining in the hallway. Oh, he's here, all right. Watch your step, Betsy. Don't worry about me. I slipped the latch on the front door when we left. Let's see if it's been bolted. Uh-huh. Still open. Come on. Uh-huh. Where do you think he is? Library, probably. I hear someone, Nick. They're both here. That's Mrs. Waldron's voice. Uh, open the door, Nick. It's locked. I'm not up to try to take it. Oh, Nick. Nick, hurry. I am hurrying. Oh, Nick, please. Oh, oh Nick, he's killed her. He's killed her. There. Mrs. Waldron. Oh, thank heaven you came. Oh. He was just going to shoot me. I, I got the gun away from him, and I... And you shot him. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter, but it was self-defense. I swear it was. Oh, Mrs. Watering, it's too bad you had it to go... It was worth it. It was worth it. Now Johnny will be saved. He won't have to die in the chair. Nick, you've only seven minutes to call. It's seven minutes to twelve. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter, please, hurry. Now, just a minute, just a minute. But calm yourself, Mrs. Walden. Here, have a cigarette. Uh, a cigarette? All right. May I light it for you? Oh, thanks. If you wait just a moment, I get my cigarette holder out of my bed. So you do use a cigarette holder. I thought so. Nick, the time is getting awfully short for your call to the DA. I'm not going to make that call. Why, Nick? Not going to make it? No, Mrs. Waldron. It was a nice frame-up you and your husband tried against Tom Fielding, but it didn't work. Frame-up? Yes, frame-up. You and Johnny staged this whole thing to get him a last-minute reprieve. Well... It was very clever, but you made a couple of bad mistakes. For example, this gold-tipped cigarette butt I found in your room tonight. What about it? When I found this butt in your ashtray, all pinched in at the end from having been smashed in a holder, I knew you had lied about not having seen Tom Fielding. These particular cigarettes are made to order for him. I didn't leave it there. I couldn't be sure of that until I found that you used a cigarette holder. Then I knew I was right. You did leave it there. Go on and prove it. Another thing. Patsy, take a look at Mrs. Waldron's hands. My hands? Why, they're beautiful. Beautifully manicured. Exactly. Mrs. Waldron, with hands like yours, you don't scrub floors for a living. That dingy one room of yours is merely a front. Look out, Nick. A gun, huh? Yes. I know how to use this gun, too. And I'm going to... Sorry for you. <laughs> Sorry I had to hit you, Mrs. Waldron. Betsy, take uh-huh. a look at Tom Fielding. See if he's still alive. Right, Nick. You haven't anything on me. You can't get me You're for this. Nick. Good. Phone for an ambulance, quick. Okay. But, Nick, can you prove this charge against Mrs. Waldron? Can you be positive that she and her husband framed Fielding? Not yet, Patsy. But I'm so sure I'm right that I'll risk my reputation on it. Oh, but, Nick, as long as there's the slightest doubt about it, shouldn't you call the DA and give Johnny Walden the benefit of the doubt? No, Patsy. As far as I'm concerned, there's no doubt whatsoever. I'm so sure I'll even risk Johnny's life on it. Hello, Nick Carter's office. Oh, yes, Sergeant. Yes. Uh-huh. It was. He is? 
Oh, I see. Well, thank you, Sergeant. Uh, yes, I'll tell Nick. Goodbye. Was that the report from police headquarters, Patsy? Yes, it was Sergeant Madison. You were right, Nick. Ah. That gun you took from Mrs. Walton was registered in Johnny's name. And she lied about taking the gun away from Fielding and shooting him in self-defense. Fielding's fingerprints weren't on the gun anywhere. But hers were all over it. Did they check the bullet you picked out of the desk? The one that was fired at us earlier this evening? Uh Uh-huh. It came from the same gun. Uh Uh-huh. What about Fielding? Matty say? Uh, He's going to live. In fact, he's already regained consciousness long enough to make a statement. Good. Oh, that Mrs. Waldron was clever, wasn't she? Yes, Patsy, very clever. She and Johnny had that all fixed up in advance. As soon as she knew we were going to investigate the case, she suggested we see Fielding. And then while we were looking at him, she rushed to his apartment and planted the jewels, which she was keeping for Johnny, in Fielding's safe. But he came in and caught her at it. Why, Nick, that's exactly what Mr. Fielding's statement said she did. She had a gun and held Fielding up and knocked him out. And she bound him, gagged him, and hid him away in one of the back rooms. And waited for us to arrive, as she knew we would. And shot at us to make us think Fielding was trying to scare us off. Exactly. Oh, oh but Nick, you haven't even heard Fielding's statement. How, how can you know all this? Well, Patsy, it's very simple. Hmm? When I examined him after she shot him, I noticed there was a bad bump on the back of his head. And the marks were still in his wrists and ankles where she tied him up. Oh, Nick, you're, you're always holding out on me. And one other thing... What made you think Fielding's life would be in danger way back when we were in Mrs. Waldron's apartment the second time? (laughs) Curious, huh? Uh Uh-huh. Well, Patsy, after your inspired remark about hands, I suddenly realized what it was about Mrs. Waldron that puzzled me. It was her hands. I knew that with hands like hers, she couldn't be earning her living scrubbing floors. (laughs) I see. And if she were lying about that, it was very probable she was lying about everything. And the whole thing was a plot to make Fielding look guilty. Yeah, Uh, but... Why should that make you suddenly afraid that something might be going to happen to Fielding? Patsy, if she and Johnny were so anxious to get Johnny a reprieve that they were willing to give up the jewels to make it look as if Fielding were really the guilty man, it was entirely possible that she might go further and kill Fielding and try to make it look as if he'd killed himself. Yeah, but how would that help Johnny Waldron? If it was done right, it would look as if he were remorseful at having let Johnny take the blame. And she almost got away with it. But she didn't, because Nick arrived in the nick of time. (laughs) You're a wonderful detective, Mr. Carter. And so, ladies and gentlemen, at midnight last night, Johnny Waldron went to the electric chair to pay for the crime of having murdered Mrs. Cornelius Fielding. His dramatic last-minute attempt to get a reprieve failed, thanks to the quick action of that master detective, Nick Carter. In those few short hours that Carter was actually on the case, he found the missing jewels, uncovered a well-laid plot between Johnny and his wife to pin the murder on Tom Fielding, and saved Fielding's life. Tom Fielding and the entire community owe a debt of gratitude to Nick Carter. You liked them before, you'll like them now. What do I mean? Well, during the war, you called them war bonds, and then you knew them as victory bonds. Now they are called United States Savings Bonds. But whatever the name, they're still the best way to save money. They're still the finest and safest investment you can make. Their return of $4 for each three you put into them, and their ready availability, offer you the ideal way of saving money for your future. Whether you buy them from your bank or post office, or whether you buy them on the payroll savings plan, they help to ensure your financial security. United States savings bonds, the same bonds you've been buying for years, are available in the same denominations as before and bear the same high rate of interest. And one last word. Don't sell the bonds you now have. While they are redeemable any time after 60 days from date of purchase, hold on to them. Make your money work for you by buying and holding... United States Savings Bonds. Well, Nick, what do you have lined up for us next week? Another exciting adventure? It was exciting, Ken, but Nick was on the receiving end of the excitement for once. Well, how do you mean, Patsy? Well, Nick met two dear little old ladies, Ken, and what they did to him. (laughs) Oh, my. Yes, I blush every time I think of that episode in my career. Say, is this a detective story or what? Oh, it's a story of crime and its solution, all right, but between the beginning and the end, we're... The two charming elderly females. I hope I don't miss that. What do you call it? I call it the case of the little old ladies. (laughs) 
Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In The Adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Barth Conry. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's the case of the poker murders. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters, a detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Deep in the waterfront section of the city, there lies a condemned slum area. The streets, dark and deserted, lined with empty, crumbling tenements. Deep in a grimy tenement deep within, a masked man sits in a hidden room and plays solitaire. This is the sinister master of crime known as the Ace of Spades. Yes? The six and seven of clubs to see you, Ace. Send them in. Well, here we are, Chief. Yeah. You're five minutes late. Oh, sorry, Ace. The cops are watching this area. We had trouble slipping in. Since when have I accepted excuses? <laughs> yeah, boss, we know. What about the other three? Are they waiting at the rendezvous? Yes, sir. But you've both memorized my instructions. We got them down cold, Chief, but suppose there's a hitch. There won't be a hitch. The Ace of Spades doesn't make mistakes. Of course... If you make one. No, no, we won't, Ace. You can depend on us. All right. Now, you two had better get going. Okay. One thing. What is it, Chief? Don't forget to leave your calling cards. I don't want to disappoint my dear friend, Sergeant Matheson. retainer they're paying me, I have to see him. This way, Mr. Williams. Mr. Carter, my company's in trouble. Yes? Well, sit down, Mr. Williams. Tell me about it. As you know, we're the biggest underwriters in the business. But this first storage robbery yesterday, well, we can't take any more of those. Oh, the ace of spades, huh? Yes. Whoever he is, he's hit us five times in the last two weeks. We're paying out a fortune in claims. You're working with the police on this? The police? (laughs) They're helpless. The ace of spades has been too smart for them. Take that fur warehouse job last night, for instance. Yes? Every burglar alarm was cut or disconnected. The vault combinations were known beforehand. And the locations of the most valuable furs. What about the guard? Was he one of your own operatives? Yes. One of our best men, too. They locked him into one of the refrigerated vaults. Mm Mm-hmm. The Ace of Spades men leave the usual calling cards? Yes. It was a five-man job, apparently. They left the six, seven, eight, nine, and ten of clubs. Oh, straight flush. It's a pretty high poker hand. Among his other accomplishments, our friend seems to have a perverted sense of humor. Well, it's a brand of humor I can't say I relish. Mr. Carter, will you help us with the case? I will. Tell you the truth, Mr. Williams, I was just about to drop down and discuss it with my old friend, Sergeant Matheson, in the Homicide Division. You see, the gentleman who calls himself the Ace of Spades interests me no end. I'm looking forward to meeting him... 
personally. Hmm. Black ten on red jack. Red four, black five. Yes? The Queen of Hearts is here, Ace. Queen of Hearts. Put her on. Ace, I've got to see you. I thought I told you never to come down here. I had to come. I just heard some news. Nick Carter... I know. He's been called in by Acme Underwriters. How did you know? I make it my business to know everything, my dear. But Ace, Nick Carter's clever. Dangerous. Yes, I know. It will be intriguing to match wits with him. Now then, my dear, you'd better run along. You've work to do tonight. Aren't you even going to see me? I'm sorry, but I'm busy. I know. You're playing solitaire. Sometimes I think you love that game more than you love me. Come, come, my dear. There's no basis for comparison. Solitaire, like every other card game, is relaxing. Women, when they're as lovely as you, are exciting. Ace, please. Good night, my dear. Nick, you won't be late for Rhoda Stanley's birthday party, will you? No, Patsy. You drop me at headquarters and go right on. I'll join you later. Uh-huh. Oh, it's funny the way I bumped into Rhoda after all these years. Hadn't seen her since college, and then all of a sudden I was standing in a nylon line at Trimble's, and there she was. Yes, and now we're going to her birthday party. Uh-huh. The minute she found out I worked with you, she insisted on our coming. She's dying to meet you, and, well, I promised to produce. You sure you don't mind, Nick? No, no, of course not, Patsy. Oh, it ought to be something. She's married to John Stanley. The banker? Uh-huh, that's right. Oh. <laughs> Which is the same thing as saying she's married to $10 million. <laughs> and I was the girl in my graduating class voted most likely to succeed. Well, Patsy, it's a funny thing. Hmm? What's funny? Stanley's bank, the Marine Trust, is putting up the capital to tear down that slum area where the Ace of Spades is supposed to be hiding. Oh, do you really think that's where the Ace of Spades' hideout is? Could be. There are more than 200 abandoned tenements down there. And the two patrolmen murdered in that section seem to point to it. Oh, I won't forget those two homicides in a hurry. Each of them had a playing card pinned right over the bullet holes. Yes, a pair of jacks. A fair sample of the Ace's grisly humor. What kind of a man can he be anyway? Infernally clever, Betsy. We know that much. A brilliant planner with a mind that doesn't overlook the minutest details that might trap him. But why all those poker hands whenever he's pulled a job? He's an egotist. Type of criminal who glorifies in his crimes. Enjoys leaving his signatures at each one of them. Oh. This close enough, Nick? Yes, I can walk the other half block to headquarters. Nick, I... Please be careful. Don't take any chances. Now, don't worry. The ace of spades may play his cards according to Hoyle. But I'll play him any way I can. To win. Hiya, Matty. Oh, Nick. <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, for once I'm glad to see you. This ace of spades has really got me on the merrig around. First, he knocks over two of our best cops. Then he kills this watchman on that warehouse job last night, and he leaves nothing, no evidence. Except those blasted playing cards. Yes, I know. Nick, I tell you, this ace of spades is like a ghost. This whole case like a nightmare. Matt, have you got the cards his men left? Yeah, here they are. Hmm. Common pattern. They sell hundreds of decks like this all over town. Uh, what about the... Fingerprints? Yes. No, none. We powdered every card. Even used the iodine test. Nothing doing. Suppose you searched that abandoned slum area. Look, are you kidding, Nick? Of course we did. The night Burke and Finnegan were killed, we went through it with a fine-tooth comb. A devil of a job it was, too. As I can imagine. And as much that place has been blacked out ever since the city decided to dismantle their street lamps in the area to save electricity. Yeah. With all these hundreds of empty tenements, the Ace could change his headquarters at will. Why, you could drive a car through there with the headlights turned off and never be seen. Yeah, I know. That's what makes it tough. The place is as black as, uh, well, the Ace of Spades. I got a couple of men down there now, nosing around. Not that I expect to find anything. Uh. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Nolan's calling in from a call box down in that cinema area, Sergeant. Yeah? Shall I switch you on? Yeah, yeah, I'll talk to him. Hello? 
Hello, is that you, Sarge? Yeah. What is it, Nolan? Well, Connors and myself saw a light in one of these here tenements. What? Are you sure? Yeah, positive. The light's gone now, but we got the place spotted. Shall we go in and investigate? No, no, no. Now, now listen, Nolan. You and Connors stay there and keep your eyes peeled on that tenement. Yeah? I'll be right down with the squad. Okay, Sarge. We'll be on the corner of the place, Sarge. Nolan! 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 Say that call box was located at the corner of 16th Street and Avenue F, Matty? Yeah, that's right, Nick. A couple of more blocks and we'll be there. From the looks of things, you must have every cruise car on the force in this area now. Yeah. But judging by what's gone before, I don't think it's going to do us any good. Matty, just look at this area. Nothing but rows and rows of dark tenements and boarded up stores. Yeah, well, I look, know. there isn't a whole pane of glass in the place. The streets and the sidewalks are certainly littered with this place. Hey, Nick, I heard a shot. Take it easy, Matty, take it easy. One of your boys up ahead just blew a tire. Picked up a piece of broken glass, probably. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, this place gives me the creeps, I guess. I... Uh-oh. There's the call box that Nolan called from. I don't see anything. You, Matty? No. Nolan and Connors must be somewhere around, one way or the other. Better hug the walls, Matty. Yeah. Right now we're out in the open like a couple of sitting pigeons. The ace. Matty. Here in this doorway. <gasps> Nolan and Connors. Dead. Yes, riddled by bullets. And look, Matty. The ace left his usual calling cards. The Jack of Hearts on Nolan and the Jack of Diamonds on Connors. And Burke and Finnegan drew a pair of jacks, too, when they were murdered down here. Four jacks. Four of a kind. Well, whatever the ace of spades is, Matty, he's consistent. He's still killing. And according to Hoyle... See, what's happened to the master detective you promised to produce tonight? Well, I can't understand what's keeping Nick Rutter. He was supposed to be here long ago. Well, we won't worry about it. Let's just have another cocktail, huh? After all, it is my wife's birthday. <laughs> As you know, Patsy, I'm a lucky woman to be Mrs. John Stanley. Look at the birthday present John gave me. This necklace. Oh, I've been noticing that, Rhoda. Matched diamonds, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's a magnificent thing. Oh, that must be Nick now. I'll get it. Uh, what the devil? All right, Stanley, get those hands up. Yeah, and fast. Hey, now, wait a minute. What does this mean? We're playing cops and robbers. That's why we're wearing these masks. But you... Shut but... up, Stanley. I'll do all the talking around here. All right, Joe, get to work on that wall safe. It's behind that picture. You know the combination. Right. John, all my jewelry's in there. Yes, I know, my dear. I'm afraid there's nothing we can do now. Or any other time. Pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Yeah, lady, I sure am. How you doing, Joe? Okay. Just got the safe open. Swell. Now, Mrs. Stanley, I'll take that necklace. Oh, John, my birthday present. Will you give it to me, or do I have to tear it off your neck? Rhoda, I'm afraid you'll have to do as he says. No. No, I won't. Oh, Rhoda, your husband's right. We're helpless now. These no, men are... they're not going to take my necklace. All right, lady. Looks like I'll have to oh, rip it off God. that pretty white neck of yours. Take your hands oh, off my wife. Shut up, Stanley. Stay where you are. I said let her alone, you hear? Take your hands off. Oh, John! John! Nice work, pal. Yeah. Haven't had a chance to use that blackjack in a long time. You've killed him. He isn't breathing. He... Naturally, lady. That was no love tap I gave him. Oh. You got all that stuff out of the safe, Joe? Yeah. Everything's worked like clockwork. As the chief would say, according to plan. You'll pay for this. Both of you. That's what you think, lady. Oh, um, here's a couple of calling cards. Just to, uh, remember us by. <laughs> The ace of hearts and the ace of clubs, huh, Patsy? Yes, Nick, and both of the men were masked. We couldn't tell who they were. They hit John. They killed him. He tried to protect me. Oh, now, Rhoda, don't try to talk. You've had a terrible shock. Just lie back on the couch and try to rest. The doctor will be here soon. John! John! I'm sorry, Mrs. Stanley. But someday you'll have the satisfaction of seeing those killers go to the chair. Nick. One of those crooks said everything went according to plan. 
Do you think the Ace of Spades planned John's murder? Yes, Patsy, I do. But it was so wanton. Whenever the Ace of Spades kills, he kills for a reason. He isn't the type to kill just for the pleasure of it. Now, Patsy, did you notice anything about these thugs? Anything unusual that might give us a clue? No, they were both masked, about medium height, wore black gloves, and... Wait a minute, Nick. Yes? I do remember something now. When the man who hit John with the blackjack raised his arm, I saw his cufflinks. And what about them? They were little black aces of clubs. Well, unusual. Do they look expensive? Oh, yes, very. And not the usual kind of thing you'd pick up in a jewelry store. Probably made to order. Patsy, you're magnificent. I am, Nick? You are. You've stumbled on something we've badly needed in this case. A good lead. From now on, we're going to play a little game. A little game? Mm Mm-hmm. Of what? A little game of poker. Mind if I use your phone, Sergeant Matheson? No, not at all, Mr. Williams. Sergeant, my company is demanding action from you and Mr. Carter here. Yes. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Williams. Frankly, we can't wait for anything much longer. You realize the losses act me underwriters are taking? Hello. Hello, Boulevard Garage. This is Mr. Williams. Is my car ready? What? Two new tires. I see the old ones are pretty badly cut up, eh? Well, that makes three new tires in all. Uh Uh-huh. All right, go ahead. I suppose it can't be helped. Car trouble, huh? Yes, but that's the least of my worries, Mr. Carter. My firm's insured the Stanley Jewels along with that diamond necklace for almost $100,000. Unless you nail down the ace of spades pretty quickly. Ah, Well, might as well try to nail down a ghost. We'll do what we can, Mr. Williams. I've got a lead on him now, I think. What lead? Well, I'd rather not say until I'm sure it'll be of value. Very well. I don't care how you get the ace of spades as long as you get him. And soon. Good day, gentlemen. Goodbye. Hey, Nick, what's this lead you're talking about? I'll let you know, Matty, when and if it pays dividends. Oh, by the way, did... Yeah, now, wait a minute. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Sergeant, is Nick there? Oh, yeah, sure, Patsy. Yeah, Nick, it's for you. Hmm. Hello, Patsy, did you find anything? Plenty. I canvassed the big jewelry stores just as you told me to do. And? After walking my feet off and talking to about a hundred supercilious jewelry clerks, I finally made a strike at Rutledge's. They make up those cufflinks? Yes. Did they have a carbon of the sales slip? Yes, Nick, they did. Ah. The man who ordered those cufflinks was Frankie Morello. Morello, huh? Good work, Patsy. Go home now, soak your feet in hot water. I'll let you know when I need you again. <laughs> Yes? The Ace of Clubs is here to see you. Send him in. Hello, Chief. You sent for me? Yes, Frankie. Sit down. Thanks. Well, Chief, how'd you like the way Joe and me pulled off that Stanley job, huh? That's an interesting pair of cufflinks you're wearing, Frankie. Little Aces of Clubs, eh? Yeah, pretty neat if I do say so. Had them made to order. That was very careless of you, Frankie. Ace... What do you mean by that? You wore them on the Stanley job. You gave Nick Carter a clue. You'll find out who you are sooner or later. Yeah, but Chief, Nick I... Carter's a dangerous man with a clue, Frankie. Now he hopes to get at me through you. It's going to be embarrassing to have you around. Hey, Chief, I, I didn't wear these cufflinks at the Stanleys. I swear I didn't. Oh, didn't you, Frankie? No, no, you got to believe me. Yes. Send in the Queen of Hearts. Right. What? Meet the Queen of Hearts, Frankie. You. Yes, Frankie. It's I. Sorry, Frankie. Chief, no. No! Extra, extra! Body of Frankie Morello found on Lowly Country Road. Ace of Spades pinned the corpse of gangster. Extra, read all the... Oh, 
fine state of affairs, Nick. Frankie Morello, our only clue wiped out. Yes. But only you and I knew about that cufflinks clue, Nick. What is this ace of spades, a mind reader? That's who you forget. Huh? When you and I were discussing it at John Stanley's house, someone else was there who could have overheard us. Oh, Nick, you're not suggesting that Rhoda... She was in the room with us when we talked it over. Well, I know, but she was in a severe state of shock. Was she? Nick, you don't mean... I mean that things are beginning to add up. Look, Patsy, those crooks knew where the wall safe was, even at the combination. Oh, yes, that's right. The ace of spades could have received that valuable information direct from Rhoda. Yes, but we can't be sure of that, Nick. No, but there's one thing we can be sure of. Neither you nor I tipped off the ace of spades about that cufflinks clue. And somebody did. And the ace felt it was important enough to force him to destroy the evidence, his own henchman. And it must have been Rhoda who tipped him off. She was the only other person who knew about the cufflinks. Exactly. I... Oh, I, I can't believe it. What? Well, I, I knew Rhoda Stanley well. Of course, I haven't seen her for... Oh, Nick, how could Rhoda be an accomplice to the murder of her husband right before her own eyes? Patsy, those jewels in the safe were insured for $100,000. That's a lot of money. Not to mention the millions that John Stanley probably left her in his will. But if Rhoda's mixed up in this, then who is the ace of spades? I've got a hunch, but I'm not positive yet. Whoever he is, he has an intimate knowledge of the jobs he tackles. And all these jobs have been pulled off against Acme underwriters. Patsy, suppose someone had easy access to the files of the company. Files? Yes, on banks, furriage, first storage vaults, and other properties, giving their floor layouts, burglar alarm setups, and so forth. A clever crook could pull off a nice, clean job with this information, couldn't he? Yes. Oh, but there might be any number of men who'd have access to this information. Adjusters, executives, insurance actuaries, any number of people on the inside. True, but we can narrow it down further. This man, this ace of spades, would not only have to be an inside man, he'd have to be someone who got around on the outside, too. Knew all these places by actual experience, because he'd visited them. That's the only way he could operate the way he's doing. Wait a minute, Nick. You mean... I'm not sure, Patsy. But I hope to know within an hour. Come on. Get your hat. Let's go. Go? Go where? To the boulevard garage. That's where Ralph Williams keeps his car. <laughs> Nick, that garage attendant looked a little suspicious when you told him you were a dealer and that Mr. Williams sent you down to make an estimate on his car. Uh, I'm going to make an estimate, all right. Uh, here we are. Nick, you still haven't told me why you're interested in Mr. Williams' car. Not interested in the car itself. Just the tires. Uh, the tires? Yes. I understand three of his tires were cut up so badly he had to have new ones. I think I know what cut his tires that way. I want to be sure. Well, hurry up. That that attendant is keeping his eye on us. Patsy, I've found what I've been looking for. Nick, I just don't get it. Here, take a good look at all four of these tires. Huh? See the glass particles and the treads? There's old tires, full of them. Yes, but what do they mean? I mean that Mr. Williams has been driving this car over roads littered with broken glass. And the only place in town where there are roads like that is in the abandoned slum section. Then, Nick, what you're saying is that... Ralph Williams is the ace of spades. Yes. And I'd bet every poker chip in the pot on it. Investigation, Williams speaking. Who? Claims Department. Oh, yes, Mr. Redden. Funny, I was just talking to Mrs. Stanley. She's right here in my office now. No, we haven't been able to break that Stanley case. The ace of spades got clean away with those jewels. Huh? I know it's a lot of money, but we're licked and we'll have to pay the claim. Yes, I know, and you're perfectly right. But even Nick Carter's fallen down on this one. All right, Mr. Redden. Goodbye. Well, my dear, it looks as though you're in. They're going to okay the claim. When will it come through? The cash, I mean. Sometime next week. And after that, my dear, I suggest you go away for a long vacation trip. In fact, I think I'll join you myself. It's, uh, getting pretty warm in town. Yes, come in. A messenger brought this letter for you, Mr. Williams. Oh, thank you, Miss Hamilton. Hmm. From Nick Carter. Nick Carter? 
I wonder what he wants. Oh, now, my dear, nothing to be nervous about. Let's see. There, there's nothing in it but a playing card. Yes. But look at that card. It's the Joker. <laughs> Nick, the messenger left William's office five minutes ago. I know. It's almost dark. He'll be out soon. What he does, Patsy, we'll tail him. Nick, why did you send him that joker? Just having a little fun. In the ace's own way. But isn't that dangerous? Shouldn't we have just gone up and got him? What if he gets away? He won't. You forget one thing, Patsy. What? The loot. The ace is almost half a million dollars salted away somewhere. And he's certainly not going to leave town without picking it up. That's the big reason why I sent him the Joker. He knows we're on him now. It'll flush him out. Of course. And he'll lead us right to the hideaway. If everything goes according to Hoyle. Nick, do you think it's in one of those slum tenements somewhere? I bet on it. Can't think of a better place to hide anything. Here, wait a minute. Hmm? Yes. Here comes Williams out of his building now. Yes, and... <gasps> Rhoda Stanley's with him. Hmm. They're getting into a taxi. All right, Betsy. Here we go. Nick, look. They've stopped at the Riverview Boathouse. Yes. They're getting into a launch. But I don't understand. This means they're not going to the tenement area. On the contrary, Betsy. You forgot one thing. The river fronts that area, and the boat running quietly with its... Lights out might get in a lot easier than a car, especially when all the streets are being watched. We can't let them get away, Nick. What now? I'm going on to the tenement area. You get Matty on the phone. Uh-huh. Have him throw a cordon around this entire area and tell him to notify the harbor police, too. All right, Nick. I fancy make it plain to Matty that the harbor police are not to stop the boat. I just keep them under surveillance. We want the ace to pick up that money before he tries a final getaway. <laughs> Nick, it worked out just as you figured. The ace of spades came off that boat and went into that five-story tenement right across the street there. Yes, lucky your men were posted under those docks, Matty. Otherwise, we might have missed him. Well, the Stanley woman's waiting in the boat. We can pick her up later just as soon as we... Hey, Nick. Huh? The ace of spades is coming out. Get back into the doorway. He went in empty-handed and came out with a suitcase. Yeah, that's the swag, all right. Well, here goes. Just a minute, Ace. What? No! Drop that gun! Drop it, I say! Nice shot, Matty. Winged him in the arm. Yes, sir. You trumped the Ace of Spades neatly. Well, Nick, they're starting to tear down these tenements today. Oh, what a place. Even in daylight, it gives me the creeps. Yes, but someday they tell me this is going to be a beautiful housing development with parks and playgrounds for the kids. Maybe, but right now it looks like a kind of death house. And speaking of the death house, I wonder what the Ace of Spades is thinking about now. About black on red or red on black. Uh, Nick, what on earth do you mean? I just spoke to Matty on the phone a few moments ago. He tells me the Ace of Spades sits in the death cell all day and all night, playing solitaire. Say, Nick, uh, how about giving us a few of the ingredients that make up your story for next week? Why, sure, Hugh. Take a beautiful young girl who's positive she's going crazy, just as her mother did before her. Then add her boyfriend, who refused to believe she was losing her mind in spite of the evidence to the contrary. Mix them together, and add a country doctor who alone knew the secret behind it all. And you have the tense and unbelievable situation with which Nick was faced. And uh, what do you call this witch's brew, Nick? I call it... The Case of the Demented Daughter. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. 
Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of The Shadow Comics. In the broadcast of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, original music is played by George Wright, script is by Max Ehrlich. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at this same time. This is Hugh Sanders saying so long until next week. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. It's true. I know it's true. But it's not true, June, darling. <laughs> Don't you suppose I'd know it if you were going crazy? But why do I hear these noises all the time? Why am I so cold when it's, it's really warm in here? Why Listen, do I... Listen, June, you're just working yourself up over nothing. Now, why don't you... Holly my... told me my mother acted the same way, Phyllis. My husband didn't mean that. My mother heard noises like thunder in her ears. He told me that she was cold and shivering no matter what the temperature was. Alex told me that. Well, even if that's true, it doesn't prove... It does, it does. I'll kill myself before I let them take me away. I won't go to an asylum. I won't. I won't. I won't. A young girl convinced that she is going insane. A fiancé who is not convinced, who doubts that it can be true in spite of the evidence... An appeal to Nick Carter, Master Detective. The uncovering of a strange and unnatural plot. Not for money, not for power, but for hate. This is the story unfolded in The Case of the Demented Daughter. That must be Randy Wyatt. I made a date for him to see you at 10.30. Is Mr. Carter here yet? Yes, he is. Won't you come in? Thank you. Mr. Carter? Yes? I'm Randy Wyatt. Your father and mine used to be pretty good friends. That's why I'm taking the liberty of asking you to help me now. Why, no liberty at all. Come in, sit down. Thank you, sir. What seems to be the trouble? Well, last night I got this note from the girl I'm engaged to. She sent my ring back with it. May I see it? It's no use, Randy, darling. I'm doomed. And I won't have you burdened with an insane wife. So this is goodbye. Your heartbroken June. I tried to call her as soon as I got the note, but the housekeeper wouldn't let me talk to her. Said she was too ill to come to the phone. Well, have you seen any signs of this insanity she speaks of? I know, and I don't believe it. There's been something funny going on somewhere. She's been a little more nervous than usual when we've been out together this past month, but that isn't insanity. You say when we've been out together. Does that mean that you don't see her at home much? Well, for the past month, she seemed to prefer to get out of the house doesn't want to stay home anymore. Well, have you seen her at home at all? Well, I was there one night about a week ago. Her sister Phyllis and her brother-in-law, Alex Benson, were out, and we spent the evening there alone. Did she seem to be the same as usual? Why, except for one little thing, yes. She complained that she felt cold, almost shivery. The house was cold even for me. The thermometer said 78, but it wasn't as warm as that in there. But the fact that she was cold when the thermometer said 78 seemed to prey on her mind. I tried to tell her that the thermometer was wrong and that I was chilly, too, but she insisted I was just being nice to her. I see. Well, is she any reason to be afraid of going out of her mind? When I was waiting for June the other night, Alex, her brother-in-law, warned me that she was acting queer. Said he felt I ought to know. Told me her mother died in the Hara Hill Sanitarium. I tried to laugh at him, but he insisted he and Phyllis had seen definite symptoms. Mm-hmm. Anyone else lived there with June beside Phyllis and her husband? The housekeeper, Miss Everett... 
uh, cook and a maid. Mm. They must have plenty of money. Oh, yes. June's father was a rich man. And he left his entire estate to be divided between the two girls. How long ago did her mother go to the sanitarium? Uh, let me see. June was six then, so it must have been 1932. She died there in 1940. I see. What does this Alex Benson do? He has a very good business, I understand. Doing very well. And this housekeeper you spoke of, has she been with him long? Since a couple of years after Miss Kemper was taken away. She's a peppery old lady, but an excellent housekeeper. She and Phyllis brought June up. I'd like to talk to your fiancé, Wyatt. Can you arrange it? That's what I'd hoped you'd say, Mr. Carter. June isn't crazy, I know that. Just as sure as I know my own name. Well, when can we see her? Around five this afternoon, perhaps? We can try. Where shall I meet you? You better be here at the office about 4.30. We'll go up together. I'll be here. Oh, Mr. Carter, I do hope you can straighten this out. Well, I'll certainly do what I can, Wyatt. You're swell, Mr. Carter. Well, see you at 4.30. Goodbye. So long. Goodbye, Mr. Wyatt. Oh, the poor kid. Losing her mind at her age. I'm not at all sure she is, Patsy. Huh? Look at this note she sent Wyatt. Well, well what about it? The writing looks awkward, but she was probably upset. Oh, look closely. See how the pencil bears down much harder in some places than in others? Yes. And it's not always in the places where the lines would naturally be heavier. Which means? One explanation would be that somebody was guiding her hand, forcing her to write this. Oh. Patsy, I think we'll do some checking up. Okay. What'll we do? Uh, call Scubby the paper. Ask him for a full report on both Phyllis and Alex Benson. Uh Uh-huh. Society doings and any other information you may find in the morgue. Yeah. Also tell him to check up on Alex's business and financial ratings. All right. Anything else? Yes, I want you to call in the housekeeper. Give her some excuse. Find out all you can about her. I'll tell you what. I'll pretend I'm making a checkup of the conditions under which housekeepers work for some magazine, say. That'll do it. Good. While you do that, I'm going down to the surrogate's office and take a look at the father's will. If there's any conspiracy going on, there's very likely to be money involved. Okay, Nick. See you here as soon as I get the dope by Mrs. Everett. As I told you when you called, young lady, I can give you only a few minutes. Well, I'm glad you could see me at all, Mrs. Everett. We can sit here in the breakfast room. Thank you. Now, (laughs) ask your questions and I'll answer them, if they're not personal. Well, they are personal, but only in a general way. How long have you been here? Since uh, 1936, the year after Mrs. Kemple died. Uh Uh-huh. Had you worked previously? I had. Fourteen years. Two jobs. In each case, I left because I was offered more money. If somebody offered me more money than I'm getting here, I'd leave tomorrow. Uh, Are you married, Mrs. Everett? I was. My husband died. Any children? I have not. I hate them. How do you find working conditions here? I've seen better and I've seen worse. How do you get along with your employers? Mr. Kemper was a fine man. We got along well. Oh. Do you mean you're having trouble with Mr. and Mrs. Benson? No. Phyllis and Alex are all right. We got along well enough, but that June... I can't stand her. I never could. Oh. Do you have any special reason to feel that way? Or is it because you don't like children? She's a brat. Always was. Used to play tricks on me when I first came here. Left a toy wagon for me to stumble over when she was little, and I fell and broke my ankle. I'd have left here then, but Mr. Kemper offered me so much money I couldn't afford to go. But I made that June pay for what she did. Why, I was... I'm talking too much. What else do you want to know? You wouldn't want to tell me what they pay you here, would you? I wouldn't. I told you not to get personal. Now, i got to go. Good day. Goodbye, and thank you, Mrs. Everett. All right, Scubby, I'll tell him. Thanks. Goodbye. Oh, hi, Patsy. Hello. How'd you make out? Here's a typewritten report of my interview. I didn't like that Mrs. Everett at all. Oh, well, she doesn't like June, huh? Mm-mm. Oh, good work, Patsy. That covers it. You, you really like it, Nick? I do. Get your hat. We're taking a ride out to Harrow Hill Sanitarium where Mrs. Kemple died. I want to talk to the doctor out there. Right with you, Nick. Walter went out after you phone, but he'll be back pretty soon. Oh, have you heard from Scubby yet? Oh, yes. He says he found plenty of stuff about Phyllis and Alex, but nothing you'd want. Hmm. Except that... Alex's business is in a pretty bad shape. He needs to expand and has been having trouble getting capital to do it. Yes? Guppy says he couldn't find out whether he'd put any of his wife's money into it or not. I see. What'd you find out at the surrogate's office? I found that Mr. Kemple left a large fortune. He 
divided equally between the two girls. But there were two interesting clauses in the will. Hmm? One was that should either daughter develop a mental weakness of any kind, the other daughter was to have control of the money and administer it for the other's benefit. Hey, Nick, that's something. That's the other, peculiar. It's a statement that since the circumstances surrounding the birth of the two sisters were fully taken into account in drawing the will, no claims on that basis were to be allowed under penalty of forfeiture of all rights under the will. What in the world does that mean? I wish I knew. I called the lawyer who drew it, but he refused to talk about it. So I'm having Walter look up the birth certificates of both girls. Might be some help there. Uh-huh. You think the doctor at the sanitarium could help you? I don't know. I hope so. That's one reason I want to have a talk with him. I'm sorry I can't be of more help to you, Mr. Carter, but my knowledge of the Kempel family is limited to Mrs. Kempel herself, as I said. Doctor, tell me, did Mrs. Kempel know what was happening to her? Oh, yes. Some years before it actually happened, it became evident that sooner or later she would have trouble. Hers, as I said, was a case of schizophrenia, split personality. And in her case, the other side of her was homicidal. But you say it can be inherited, Doctor. It can be, but fortunately, it rarely is. Well, thank you for your time, Dr. Lennox, and for your information. I think it'll help us to get to the bottom of this. Turn left here, Mr. Carter. The Kemple place is halfway down the next block. Nick, did I hear Walter telling you he could find only Phyllis's birth certificate? That's right, Patsy. No record of June's birth at all. Oh. Why, do you know where June is born? No, I don't. Oh, by the way, Mr. Carter, I tried to get in touch with June to tell her we were coming, but the housekeeper wouldn't let me speak to her. Said she was asleep. Darn that woman, I don't trust her at all. Is this the house? Yeah, that's it. All right. You'll have to wait in the car, Patsy. Mrs. Everett knows you. Right, Nick. I hope we can get in. Oh, I think we'll manage somehow. If Phyllis is here, she'll let me in. Maybe there's nobody here. Huh. I think I hear someone coming. When there's somebody sick in the house, you ought to know better than to make so much noise. Mrs. Everett, I'm sorry, but we must see June Kemple at once. She's in her room and in no condition to see anyone at once. Who are you? This is Mr. Nick Carter, Miss Everett. Please let us see June. Hmm. What's a detective doing here? I'm not here as a detective. Rather as a friend. May we see June? Very well. She's in her room. You can go up, but make it as short as you can. She's sick. Thank you. Come on, Mr. Carter. I can't understand Miss Everett's dislike for June. She never has a good word for her. Some people are like that, Wyatt. Some people just don't see... Daddy! Daddy, help! Help! That's June. Come on. Oh, Randy. June, honey, what's wrong? I couldn't open the door. I I couldn't make my hands open the door. It was probably stuck, June. No, no, it wasn't the door. It was me. My hands. What do you mean by that, Miss Campbell? It's just the way my mother acted when she was sick. Alex told me about it last night. She couldn't make her hands do what she wanted. I tried to open my door and I couldn't. I just couldn't. I had to try and try before I could get it open. Oh, Randy. It was like a nightmare. A horrible nightmare. Come now, honey. Don't cry like that. I just can't stand it. Please, honey. What? Look here. What is it, sir? Notice this? Why, it... Oh, that's wax, isn't it? It is. Wax that someone stuffed in the latch of a door to make it difficult to open. Not impossible, just difficult. Then there is a plot to drive her insane. I knew it. Either that or a plot to make her think she's insane. Nothing very mental about a piece of wax and a door lock. Listen, June, honey, marry me right now. Let me get you out of this house. You'll be safe once I get you away from here. Oh, no, Randy, I can't. It wouldn't be fair to you. Listen. Someone just came in. Well, Nancy, got that. Randy Wyatt and the detective are out talking to June. And she shouldn't be seeing anyone. She's sick. I tried to keep them out, but I couldn't. Now go up and see if they're doing. Is everything all right, June? Yes, Miss Benson. There's nothing wrong with June. I'm surprised you felt you had to see her when she's so ill. Miss Benson, this is Mr. Carter, a friend of mine. How do you do? Uh, I wanted him to see June. 
Well, now that you've seen her, you better go. Come, June. I'll take you back to your room. You better lie down and be quiet. All right, Philly. But it's no use. It's no use. Well, Mr. Carter, I guess we... Yes. Come on, White. I'm sorry that Phyllis seems a little abrupt, but we're really very much worried about June. As I told you, Randy, she's exhibiting all the symptoms her mother had just before she was taken away. Alex, this is Mr. Carter. He knew my father years ago. How are you, Mr. Benson? How do you do, sir? Mr. Benson, do you happen to know where June was born? June? Yes. Well, no, I don't think I do. Oh, wait a minute. It seems to me I've heard Phyllis say that she was born in Barnstable. And where's that? Well, it's about an hour out of the city, I believe, on the River Turnpike. Uh, uh, Phyllis, wasn't June born in Barnstable? Yes, she was. Oh, Alex, I don't know what we're going to do with that girl. She's possessed with that one idea. And since Mother... Oh, I don't know what to do. Come on, Mr. Carter. we better get out of here. Yes. Our work is finished here for now. But, Nick, aren't you going to eat anything before you go? Yeah, uh, we'll grab a sandwich and a cup of coffee on the way. Why, oh, Sim Carter, you're to go. What are you expecting to find in Barnstable? June was born there. If her birth certificate doesn't give us a clue to that clause in Campbell's will, I'll find somebody there who can. Patsy, you wait here at the office for me. But what do you expect from me, Mr. Carter? You say you found the birth certificate in good order. Uh, after we finally got that guy to open up town hall so we could have a look. <laughs> Boy, was he hopping mad at being called away from his supper. Dr. Jessup, you signed the birth certificate, so you should be able to answer my question. What is there about June's birth that would cause her father to put that strange clause in his will? I couldn't tell you, Mr. Carter. Mrs. Kemple came up here for a rest, and June was born while she was here. Uh. Dr. Jessup. Suppose I should tell you that I think someone is trying to make June think she's losing her mind because her mother did. Would that stir your memory? Losing her mind because her mother... Oh, no, that's impossible. Why, she... Uh, pardon me, I must see who's at the door. Certainly, we'll wait. It's strange that they should come to the back door. Nick, he knows something. Sure as you're a foot high, he knows something. Yes, Waldo, I think he does. And I think he's going to talk... <laughs> Nick, sounds as if he's in... Dr. Jessup, what's wrong? Dr. Jessup. You're right. See Leona Perkins. She... She... Look at Nick. He was shot twice, right through the chest. So I see. But we didn't hear no shots. Silence, sir, apparently. Waldo, see if you can spot anyone out there. Right, Nick. I'll get him. Oh, poor guy. I hadn't come here when... Waldo! Waldo! Did you... It's no good, Nick. I thought I saw a guy hiding in the trees there, so I took a couple of shots at him. Yeah, I guess it was just shadows. You ought to know better than to go shooting off that old forty-four of yours blindly that way. But, Nick, I want to... you stay here. Call the sheriff. Tell him what happened. I'm going to find Leona Perkins before someone tries to eliminate her, too. Are you got that, Patsy? Tell Matty to have his man keep constant watch on the Kempel house. And tell me just who goes in or out. Uh-huh. And he's to wait until you come and report to you. Right. I'll pick you up at the office on my way back. Oh, and have Randy Wyatt there, too, so he can go with us. Oh, where did you say you are now? In Barnstable, at the home of Leona Perkins. She was June's nurse after she was born. She knows the answers if anyone does. All right, I'll see you at the office, Patsy. Sorry, Mrs. Perkins, but I had to get that call through without delay. Now, you know Dr. Jessup, of course. Yes, of course. I worked with him for 15 years. He sent you to me? Yes. I'm... I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but Dr. Jessup has just been killed. Uh, Dr. Jessup? Killed? Yes, shot. By someone who wanted to keep him from telling me what I came to Barnstable to find out. Dr. Jessup? Dead? I can't believe it. Uh, before he died, he told me to come to you. But you would tell me what the mystery is about June Campbell's birth. Why are you asking these questions, Mr. Carter? Because June's sanity is in danger. June insane? She can't be. Why not? Her mother was, I understand. Died in the sanitarium. Then you understand wrongly, Mr. Carter. Her mother is perfectly sane and she's still alive. Alive and well. 
What's that you say? Do I look insane to you? You? Why, why, no, no, of course not. Mr. Carter, I am June's mother. You? You are June's mother? I am. June is really my daughter. Miss Perkins, I'm afraid I don't understand. Why was she brought up as the Campbell's child? Mrs. Kemple had one daughter, and she wanted another, desperately. But she knew she was gradually going out of her mind. And she was afraid if she bore another child, it too might be susceptible to the same dread disease. So she decided to adopt a baby, but secretly, to prevent any possible discrimination against it. She made inquiries in several places. Dr. Jessup heard of her search and came to me. How did he happen to come to you? He was my doctor. My husband had just been killed in an accident. And my baby was to be born in three days. We were very poor, and I was frantic with worry. I had no money, Mr. Carter, no relatives. I'd never worked a day in my life. I could see no way to provide for the child who was coming. And you agreed to give up your baby? Yes. In a moment of weakness, I did. When June was born, Dr. Jessup registered her as being born to Mrs. Kemple instead of to me. Oh, perhaps it was wrong of him, but he felt it was the wisest thing to do. You've never seen her since? No, Mr. Carter. Bitterly as I've regretted my decision, I've sworn I'd never try to see her again. And I never have. Did anyone else beside you, the doctor, and the Kempels know of this? No, not a soul. Even Phyllis was never told. She believes June to be her own natural sister. Ah, I doubt that she does now. Mrs. Perkins, you must go back to the city with me at once. Not only June's sanity, but her life may be in danger at this very moment. And you say you found some real evidence, Nick? The best in the world, Patsy. I found Mrs. Perkins here. Well, I don't understand, Nick. You'll know the whole story in a few minutes. Just as soon as we get to the Kemples' house. Is it a plot against June, Mr. Carter? Is she really all right? Yes, Wyatt, I believe so. It'll take time to get her back on her feet, but basically she's as sane as you or I. But who would want to do a thing like this? It'd only be one person. And how she found out about it, I don't know. But she did, obviously. Uh, Mr. Carter, how much further? I promised once I'd never see June again, but now I... That's one promise that is better broken than kept. Well, here we are. Oh, that must be Maddie's man across the street. You three go in. I'll be with you as soon as I get his report. I must protest, Mr. Carter. This is outrageous. Sorry, this Mrs. Time Everett. Of night. It has to be done this way. Everybody's here, Nick. All except Phyllis. She's been in bed with a migraine headache ever since dinner. Ah. Uh. Well, we'll go ahead without her. Okay. June? Yes? You say various things happen to you that seem to indicate that you're losing your mind. Yes, Mr. Carter. Just like my poor mother when when she was losing her mind. How do you know about your mother? Oh, I... I Alex told me. Alex told you. Uh-huh. Mr. Benson, may I ask if you knew Mrs. Kemple? Why, no, I didn't. She died before I met Phyllis. And how do you know how she acted while she was going to pieces? Well, I've heard the story from Phyllis. Complete with details? Why, why yes. Recently? Why, I guess she has told me more in the last few weeks than she ever did before, but what are you getting at? I won't let them take me away. I'll kill myself first. I will. I will. Steady, June. Steady. <laughs> that won't be necessary. There's nothing wrong with you mentally, and there never has been. But... All those queer things. Every single one of those things is a trick, suggestion, planted in your mind. But my mother died in that place. No, June, you're wrong. She didn't. Why, Nick? June's mother is alive and well today. I'd like to introduce her to you. Mrs. Leona Perkins. This is the most fantastic story I ever heard. Are you sure? I am. I have positive proof. Dr. Jessup's story and Mrs. Perkins' story, which can be backed up with documentary proof. And if you want something you can see for yourself, look at June's little finger. I've just now noticed how she has the same peculiar little crook at the end of it that Mrs. Perkins has. By golly, Nick, you're right. It's just the same. You're my mother. My real mother. Yes, June, darling. Your real mother. Oh. Oh, 
Oh, my. <laughs> Mr. Carter, who in heaven's name would want to do this to June? A person who was afraid that she might be susceptible to the thing that killed her mother, and consequently hated the person who wasn't. A person who wanted to prove that it was someone else, not her, who was the weak one. Carter, do you realize what you're saying? Unfortunately, Benson, I do. But you mean that Phyllis... Phyllis... Oh, of course he doesn't, Alex. That's sheer nonsense. Mrs. Benson, didn't you help June write the note that broke her engagement to Randy Wyatt? Yes, at her request. After you talked me into doing it. And didn't you suggest that June heard things and felt things, and then when you got her believing she did, didn't you suggest to Alex that those things were a sign of mental weakness? She did. I can tell now. She was always asking me if I didn't feel this or hear that. I thought she was trying to help me, but... I was trying to help. Where have you been the last two, three hours? In my room with a headache. No, you weren't. You drove to Barnstable, shot Dr. Jessup so he couldn't tell me the secret and came back here. My man saw you come in. You sneaked in the back door and up to your room, changed your shoes because they got muddy in the doctor's backyard, and then you came down here to brazen it out. Randy, if you look, I'm sure you'll find the muddy shoes in her room, and you'll find the motor of her car still hot. And probably you'll find a gun in her car, too. I'll take a look right now. Stay where you are, all of you. You may find the muddy shoes, but I've got the pistol right here, and I'm going to kill you all. You're a pack of sneaking... Better take filthy... her away, officer, before she hurts someone. Officer? I'll what take her. Oh! I will sit. I'll take him. Okay. All right, all right. No harm done. Alex, take her upstairs. Keep her in her room. Yes, Mr. Carter. Come on, Phyllis. Sure. Lock me up. Just the way they locked my mother up. You think I'm crazy, but I'm not. I'm as sane as any of you. I'll show you. I'll show you. How could you do such a thing, Phyllis? Why should you hate me so? Why shouldn't I hate you? I've hated you from the moment I found those old letters of father's after he died. Those letters from Dr. Jessup, which gave away the whole story. Dr. Jessup said he hoped I'd never suffer as my mother did. Said he could understand how pleased father was to know that there was no possibility of you having inherited any tendency to a mental weakness. I knew what he meant, and I hated you for it. I wish I'd killed you long ago. Oh, come, Phyllis. You'll feel better in your own room. Uh, Mrs. Everett, will you come with us, please? Of course, Mr. Benson. Take I'll your hands off. I know nothing about what a terrible thing. Yes. She never found those letters. This whole thing might never have happened. They not only turned her against June, they planted the fear of insanity in her own mind. And the hate and the fear together grew into a phobia that was too strong for her. Mr. Carter, I, I don't know what to say. If there's any way I can repay you, you have only to name it. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. I feel as if a load had been lifted off my heart. This is a wonderful thing you've done, Mr. Carter. A wonderful thing. God bless you for doing it. Nick! Hmm? In the excitement, I forgot. Forgot what? Waldo! Well, what about Waldo? Waldo is being held in Barnstable on charge of killing Dr. Jessup. What? Yes. He called just before you got back. Said he'd try to explain what happened... But the sheriff didn't believe him. <laughs> Especially since two shots had been fired from his pistol and two shots killed Dr. Jessup. Oh, poor Waldo. I suppose the more they questioned him, the more excited he got that he finally talked himself right into his cell. Well, you better do something about it, Nick, before Waldo goes crazy. Uh, b b b before he... Okay, okay, Patsy. May I use your phone, June? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> poor Waldo. Oh, operator, I want the sheriff's office in Barnstable. Yes, the sheriff's office, that's right. And I want to talk to the sheriff himself. Yes, the sheriff. Well, Nick, how about a little look into next week's story? No sooner said than done, Hugh. It all started with a man being strangled in his hotel room in the very early hours of the morning. And yes. then went on to include a piece of silk torn from a shirt, a dictaphone record, and a missing wife. Who was missing because her husband wanted it that way. But refused to stay missing when she received a letter containing a railroad ticket. It was really the hotel uh, maid. Uh, uh, oh, Patsy, huh? save something for next week. Uh, what do you call your story, Nick? I call it the case of the dictaphone murder. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of The Shadow Comics. In the broadcast of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor and Peggy Mayer. Any resemblance of these programs to actual persons, living or dead, 
or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at this same time. This is Hugh Sanders saying so long until next week. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Pat Novak, for hire. I'm Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak, for hire. It's an easy way to put it, because... If you're going to make a living down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you got to do everything but run for office. I rent boats and kick around a few scruples if the price is right. It's a living, and if anything goes wrong, you can always get your mother a visitor's pass. If you do get in trouble, you go first class all the way. I found that out when I first met Doreen Wilde. It was almost dark, and... I was sitting in the office with the door open when she first showed up. Showed up's the right word. The wind was blowing outside and pushed her dress tightly against her legs as she walked in. She was young. And from what I could see, she made Cleopatra look like Apple Mary. She had a voice like a bowl of warm stew. Hello. Are you Mr. Novak? That's my story. I'm Doreen Wilde. Mind if I sit down? On your desk here? You'll block the view. You'll get used to the new one. There. Now lean back and let me look at you. Hmm. I want to hire you, Mr. Novak. After the look or before? You've got a power complex, darling. You know a man named Joe Condono? Oh, he's a gambler out on Geary Street. Friend of yours? I don't dislike him that much. We have business connections. That's why I want to hire you. To give him some money tonight. A needy case or a bad debt? A bad debt. Condano has an IOU from my brother for $10,000. You can go from there. Not if I'm supposed to say it was a fixed game. Condano's been around a long time. Yes. That's right. There are only two kinds of gamblers in this town. Honest ones and dead ones. So if your brother owes ten grand, he better pay. That's why I'm hiring you. Just pay off Condano and make sure you get the pictures. Pictures of the Grand Canyon, huh? We'll talk about my past some other time. Well, for the moment, we'll just say you're photogenic. That's right. Your brother can't get the ten grand, so Condano's shaking you down. Yes. Yeah. I'll bet you make a nice rattle. How did Condano get the pictures? My brother gave them to him. You got a charming brother. You see only his better side. Will you do the job for a hundred dollars? How long is it going to take? Two hours, maybe. You'll have to meet with my brother. To meet with your brother a hundred bucks is coolie wages. He'll give you the information, then you can see Condono. Where do I meet your brother? Room 729, the Dixie Hotel. He'll be there about 8.30. That packing crate down on Powell Street? Your brother's a cutie. I know winos that wouldn't go in there. We'll meet you there at 8.30. Oh? You gonna be there? Yeah. Do you mind? I can stand it. Good. Do you carry a spare battery for that gleam in your eye? Your hundred bucks covers that, too. See you at 8.30. She smiled at me and I felt like a guy that just found an oil well in the basement Well, there were a lot of things about the deal I didn't like But she kind of made you forget I kept remembering her as she walked out of there with a slow, easy gait She had knee action that'd make a Nash jealous 
Well, I hit the Dixie Hotel about 8.25. It was the kind of a hotel that has a 4 a.m. checkout rule. There were two or three guys sitting around reading tip sheets, and over in the corner, a couple of well-upholstered gals were talking about recipes, I guess. The desk clerk was the worst of the lot. He looked like a guy that might have been expelled from Alcatraz. Nobody looked up as I walked through. When I got to 729, I knocked. There was no answer, so I opened the door and walked in. There was a bed lamp on and a lot of smoke in the room. Through the smoke, I could pick out the committee. They were crazy about me. Come on in. Looking for someone? Yeah, yeah, but she's got a better figure than you. Close the door. No, she's not here. I'll just run along. Close the door, mister. You need the ventilation. I said close the door. Now sit down. Sit down on the bed there. You're a tough host. So I'm broken hearted. Just be a good boy now and give it to me, huh? You got the wrong guy. You give it to me fast, mister. I don't know what you're talking about. I came up here to meet somebody. Already met him. I've run across better people in sewers. Now look, meathead, I'm only going to say this once more, so make a copy. You got the wrong guy. You think I got something? I haven't got it. No. No, so you and your playmates swing out of here in your tails. I never saw you until three minutes ago, and I'm tired of the friendship already. All right. Eddie. Yeah? Go through this guy's coat. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Now, wash your hands, Junior, and then put them in your own pockets. Oh. Uh, you, uh, you got a favorite profile, fella? Hmm? Because I'm going to put this gun on one side. Take your choice. <coughs> Grab him, hold him up. <coughs> All right, Eddie. Now you don't have to wash your hands. <laughs> woke up with a head the size of Rhode Island. I rolled over and tried to get up, but I was about as strong as a moth in a wind tunnel. The room was dark, and I couldn't see very well. It was a stale, musty odor. Could have been a marathon dancer's dressing room. With a little fixing up, the sort of place you wouldn't be found dead in. There was a guy lying next to me who didn't feel that way about it. One look at the guy, and I could see he was dead from the crew cut down. Somebody wrapped a towel around his throat and forgot to say when. I should have got out of there right then, but I used my brain like a bottle of medicine, a small dose every three hours. I stood there, looking down at him. Felt like a guy that's just rolled a seven the second time out. A small chunk of light squeezed through the door, and I could see particles of dust settling on his face. He was lying there, straight and white-faced, with a little bit of scowl as if he didn't like the idea. I went through his wallet and found a few bucks and some identification. Enough to prove he was Frank Wilde, Doreen's brother. Oh, it looked nice and clear. They'd done everything but pin the IOU on his shirt. Well, I couldn't wait around because when Homicide got there, I was going to be as popular as a can of salmon on Friday. Homicide meant Inspector Hellman, a guy that couldn't even make the vice squad. We were as close as a piccolo and a bass trombone. I got to thinking about him and decided to get out of there. It was a good idea five minutes ago. Hello, Novak. Oh, Hellman. Small wake, huh? Just a few close friends. You always drop by room 729 this time of night? I got a bad memory for faces. Who's your friend? His name's Frank Wilde. That's one answer. I was supposed to meet him here at 830. That's another. You got a third? Hmm? Who killed him? I don't know, Hellman. Maybe three or four people. Maybe a pack of lugs from Joe Condano's. Yeah? I think you're modest, Novak. I think maybe you killed him. Oh, yeah, sure. I wrapped the towel around his neck, beat myself to death with a pistol, and jumped into the same grave. Maybe. Oh, stop it, Hellman. That isn't smart. That still leaves you in the running. I came up here to make a hundred bucks. That's all I know about it. Check down at the desk. They'll tell you. I checked on the way up. The desk clerk says room 729 is in your name. Get your dough back, Hellman. You've been hijacked. Yeah? Look up a gal named Doreen Wilde. Who's she? The stiff sister. He got in a jam with Joe Condano and bailed himself out with some pictures. Oh. What kind of pictures? <laughs> you just look her up and find out where she was at 9 o'clock tonight. I got a bird in the hand. And call on Joe Condano. His gunsel's held a convention here tonight. That's too much legwork. You're handy, Novak. I can't afford a bum rap, Hellman. Get yourself another boy. You get me one. It's your hotel room. There's a dead guy in it and you got a bad record. I can make that add up for the D.A. You can't add a pair of zeros without crib notes, Hellman. I can try hard, and I'll be all through in 24 hours. That's how long you've got, Novak. you got one day, and you're not going to be lonesome. 
because I'm going to put a tail on you the whole time. Well, that'll be fun. I'm going to know where you are every minute. Stop posing, will you? You couldn't follow an elephant across a basketball court. Just stay handy, Novak. I'll be ready. I'm going to fingerprint this room and run that towel through a test. And then I'll be ready. Yeah, you better watch out for that towel. Huh? Remember, when it comes to towels, Hellman, you have to start from scratch. <laughs> Hellman was smiling like an Academy Award winner. I didn't blame him, because from my side of the road, things looked rough. From here in, he could play a pat hand and come out all right. There were only two other people, Joe Condano and that girl. I was real worried, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. Well, he was all right for a guy who tries to drink all the whiskey in the world every night, only some night he's going to make it. I finally found him at the Bellevue Hotel, holed up in the hunt room. He was getting the most he could out of a bottle, old whiskey and young ideas. It was 10 o'clock, and he was carrying a bigger load than the Berlin airlift. <laughs> Oh-ho! <laughs> a drink for Mr. Novak, and one for me. I'll have to catch up. Skip me. You busy, Jocko? I'm deep in the labor of love. What happened to your face? I got a better offer. I'm in a jam, Jocko. You gotta help me. Oh, you're always in a jam. You're the eternal patsy. Also, you're my solitary reason for going on. Forget it, Jocko. Well, you're the last project Providence has allowed me. An hors d'oeuvre that fate has thrown me to nibble on. I'm your conscience, you know. Yeah, all right, all right. You have no conscience of your own. Oh, you have fleeting moments of fright which you confuse as moral sense, but... No conscience. All right, let's get off the platform, shall we? I need help quick. Uh, what kind of jam? A big one? Yeah. I woke up about an hour ago holding hands with a dead man. Where? Room 729 at the Dixie Hotel. I hope you changed rooms. Hellman walked in and found me praying for the dead. He's got an idea I did it. A shrewd policeman. That was the second feature. We opened with a pistol whipping by Joe Condano's gunsels. Oh, you gotta help me. Would uh, a drink help? Hellman's got a guy tailing me. I gotta go slow, Jocko. I want you to hit Condano's place and pick up every scrap of dope, will you? Oh, I'd look out of place in the gambling joint. There's a bar. Tour the joint and find out when the boys got back, huh? Where do you plan to be? Uh, hiding under a rose bush? I'm going up to see a girl. She's the dead guy's sister. Are you going up to extend sympathy? Uh, she's mixed up, too. Condano's holding some blackmail pictures. Mm. Let's reverse the assignment. Now, look, you see Condano, I'll tag by Doreen Wilde's place. Huh? She must be Harry Wilde's daughter. Who's he? The money crowd, to use a low term. What's he like? A retired octopus. After he got sick of chasing cigarette girls, he settled down to be a social worker. Yeah? Now he's like all social workers. A guy who's embarrassed because he wasn't born poor. And for years, he's been annoying the poor by trying to help them. Hit Condano's place. Now, if you hit anything good, phone me at her apartment. And keep out of trouble. Well, I'd say the same to you if it weren't futile. Good night, lover. When I walked out, Geary Street was cold and deserted. The fog had moved in and staked out a claim all the way down to Market Street. There were two Marines across the street arguing, so I didn't hear it at first. When I got out of range, I began to hear the footsteps behind me. I stopped once and the footsteps broke off. I walked on a few yards and the footsteps were right behind me. They had a familiar ring and I was sure it was either Hellman or a water buffalo. When I stopped and waited, Hellman walked up. You're out late, Novak. What happened to that tail? Did he ask for more dough? I put our best man on it. Where are you going? Well, now, I'll bet you get some real good answers on that question. Where are you going, smart boy? Doreen Wilde's apartment. Yeah, why? To find out where she was at 9 o'clock tonight? It won't do you any good. Why? Coroner's report. The guy got knocked off about 7 o'clock tonight. Well, he took a long time dying. That towel was a joke. If he wasn't strangled, he would have been red-faced. He wasn't. Oh, well, now, let me guess, Hellman. He died of lingering malaria. Yeah, he was poisoned. That means he was dead when you brought him in. Oh, well, that changes things, doesn't it? A little. Don't let me keep you, Novak. I'm busy anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Check in your alibi for 7 o'clock. Uh, 
I had no alibi for 7 o'clock. That was right after the girl left my office. Oh, I might be able to dig up a witness, but I wasn't sure. It's like asking a horse if he's going to win the derby. Well, the questions were piling up, so I dropped by Doreen Wiles' apartment. I began to wonder. It was right next door to Condano's place. When she opened the door, I thought out what the right kind of breakfast food will do. She was wearing a slack suit without much slack, and she was swaying slightly in a warm, slow way. Well, if there was any rhythm there, it's the kind you hear a thousand miles down the Amazon. And when she said hello, you knew it was all chemistry. Hello, Mr. Novak. I missed you at room 729. This will do just as well. Come in. Yeah. Hmm. You're wearing your face a different style. Yeah, Condano's boys didn't like it the old way. I like it. I like it very much. Yeah, what happened to you tonight? Frank was supposed to pick me up. He didn't come by. I see. Your brother finally showed up at the hotel. Yes? Yeah. He paid off that IOU. Is that a quaint way of telling me he's dead? I suppose. Oh, don't sob so loud. You'll wake the neighbors. You know by this time that to me, Frank was a poor excuse at best. Nothing more. Besides, I knew he was dead. Father's down there now, identifying the body. Just for the record, who has those pictures now? Condano, I suppose. His boys piled me tonight looking for something. I got the idea it wasn't my social security number. Oh, you've had a busy evening. Yeah, they're going to book me for Frank's murder. Just call me Patsy. You need a drink then, darling. It can wait. Now, look, you're going to save some time if you tell me right now. No, I didn't kill Frank. So I'd be willing to contribute to a shrine for the man who did. How about Condano? I don't know. In fact, I don't know Mr. Condano. Thirsty yet? Yeah, go ahead. Patsy, I'll give you $5,000 to find out who killed Frank. Hmm? Oh, I'll admit it was a good idea killing him, but I want to see the family name cleared up. Why don't you change names? That's easier. Oh, don't be crude. Will you do it? I may hang, and you can save your five grand. Here's your drink. The money might help. Should we call it a bargain? Suit yourself. Good. You don't want to stand there balancing that drink. No. That's it. Sit down. You know, you're an interesting guy, Patsy. I like you. Yeah? Yes, don't snowball the statement. Why'd you make it, then? It, it seems safe enough. You sure? You're a little close, Patsy. Are you sure? At this point, I don't care. Come here, baby. Patsy. What's on your mind? Where I can buy a desert island, cheap. Looks like you got an offer. Oh, father, he'd forgotten his key. Excuse me. Come on over, Father. I want you to meet Mr. Novak. Mr. Novak? Yeah, they think I killed your son. Hi. He's the one I told you about. Oh, yes. Yes, now I remember. Oh, it's probably for me. Hello? Oh. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think so. I... I'll be right there. I've got to run, darlings. Only be gone a while. Father, keep Mr. Novak sober, hmm? I'll pick up from there. Good night, Father. See you soon, Patsy. Hmm. A remarkable girl. She's active, too. Does she always sail out for a night camp? A remarkable girl. More so than Frank? Yes, I, I'm afraid so. You seem to like him better dead. Well, at least he's more harmless that way. Perhaps that sounds unbecoming of a father. Well, if he looks better that way, suit yourself. I've never made any attempt to camouflage my feelings. I'm fond of my daughter. And my son, I've loathed. In a casual way. He's a mishap of nature which for years I've been content to blame on his mother. This matter of the gambling debts, uh, case in point. You know about that? Oh, yes. Plus Doreen's liberal contribution to the problem. By the way, Mr. Novak, who did kill him? I thought maybe you did. No. I'm not a doer. I just cheer from the grandstand. Uh, excuse me. Hello? Um, it's for you, Mr. Novak. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Patsy. I'm down at Condano. I know that. What'd you find out? 
Never play two and eight on a roulette wheel. All right, drop the clowning. Well, I found out about your friend. Yeah? They came in about ten o'clock, so that puts them right in line. No, not anymore. The guy got knocked off at seven o'clock. Oh, impatient, wasn't he? In that case, you better start looking for a tie-up between the girl and Condano. Not a chance. No? She doesn't even know Condano. She makes friends very quickly then because she just walked into his office. Well, things were beginning to fall into place. If the girl and Condano were that chummy, they were using those pictures. To squeeze the old man, probably. There was only one thing about it that didn't make sense. Why did Condano's boys beat my brains out if he had the pictures all along? Well, I talked to the old man a while, and then I headed for Condano's joint. They were closed when I got there, so I went home to bed. Oh, I'd have given a good price if Tamara never rolled around. But the sun was eating through the haze the next morning when I walked into Condano's place. A sad old biddy with a mop told me Condano was in his office, so I knocked on the door. Yeah? Hello, Condano. I'm the guy your boys pistol whipped. Novak, come on in. I wouldn't worry. Maybe you'll heal handsome. Thanks. I'm sorry about that, Novak. I'll bet you are. Well, that's the way you'll get it. It won't come engraved. If I say I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, you're full of tears. You gonna shed one when they send me up on a bum murder rap? No, I'll buy you a handkerchief, though. If you got the time, you might tell me what Doreen Wilde was doing in here last night. What do you care? Maybe we're in love. And maybe you're putting the screws on old man Wilde. Hello? Yeah. Did you tell anybody you were coming here? No, just a birdie. It's for you. Yeah. Hello, Jocko. When? Well, from where I'm sitting, it doesn't make sense. Oh, of course not. Yeah, yeah, I'll let you know. Well, how are you feeling, Condano? Get to the point, Novak. They found a dead guy out in the marina this morning. He was shot and banged up badly, but they identified him. What's that to me? Nothing, except they identified him as Joe Condano. No. Confused? No. It was a guy named Eddie Darrow. Friend of yours? Yeah. Yeah, I guess he was. What does that prove? It proves lots, Novak. It proves unless you find her in a cemetery, never trust a woman. <laughs> Well, with a good assist from Deep Short, we could make it now. I knew that. Condano was mad about something, and the lid was going to blow. I called Hellman. His lid was gone ten minutes ago. He had the murder gun, and it belonged to old man Wilde. A messenger walked in and put it on the sergeant's desk a few hours ago with no explanation. Well, that was the clincher. From here on in, it was cakes and ale. I told Hellman what I knew. He picked me up at Geary and Taylor, and we headed for the Wilde apartment. The girl and the old man were in the living room when we walked in. Everybody had breakfast? Patsy, I didn't know you came out till after dark. Well, we just wanted to call on your old man. Wild, this is Inspector Hellman. Mm. Is there anything I can do? You're ambitious, Wild. Hellman's here to arrest you for murder. I'm amused, but not frightened. They might have gone easy on you for killing your son, but not Eddie Darrow. And who is Eddie Darrow? The guy you thought was Condano when you killed him last night. Your daughter was helping him put on that squeeze. She even sent in your gun this morning. Please, Doreen, tell these men... Well, the starting backfield. Hello, Condano. Step aside, Novak. You don't need that gun, Joe. Not for long. All right. Push the girl out there. Push the girl out there. For a gambler, these are bad odds, Joe. Just keep talking. Just keep talking loud. And when you stop, all of a sudden, you'll know I'm through it. You made the first switch, Joe. I didn't trust you, so I sent Eddie Darrow up. He was a good guy, and I liked him. I didn't kill him, Joe. You made it easy, though. Say him fast, baby. Here it comes. Look out, Tony. Watch the old man. <laughs> Uh, give me that gun. Yeah. We keep shooting the wrong people around here. I'm sorry, Hellman. I bungled, huh? Yeah. Yeah, you bungled, Joe. How's the old guy, Novak? You should live so long, Hellman. He's dead. You're gonna need me soon, huh, Hellman? Yeah, right now. Come on, Joe. Tag by headquarters, Novak. Sure. Well, it was fun while it lasted. Yeah. I'm sorry he jumped in front of me. He didn't have to do it. No, but you expected it. 
I suppose. I'm made to expect things, Betsy. Uh Uh-huh. And you're not going to mind this. (laughs) I expected that, too. You can slap me, but don't leave me, Patsy. I don't want to be alone. You got a cigarette? They're on the table. I see. A match, Patsy? You go build your own fire. I'm leaving. Please, Patsy, I don't want to be alone. You won't. I'll send you a whistle. Goodbye. sweet double cross right from the start. Frank pitched the first curve. He stole the pictures from Condano's office the day of the payoff. He was going to wait for the dough from his sister and skip. In the meantime, the old man found out about it, killed the son, and left him in the hotel after Condano's boys had cleared out. Oh, it would have worked out all right, but Doreen found the pictures in the old man's room and guessed what happened. She gave him back to Condano and then made a deal with him to put a squeeze on the old man. Then she double-crossed Condano by tipping off the old man that Condano was on his way up. I guess he figured the girl for a fast play and sent a pal instead. The old man didn't know the difference. He really thought he killed Condano. And then the girl wrapped it up by sending his gun to headquarters. Well... Things had gone right, she'd have been right in the middle of that gravy boat. Her brother and Condano would be dead. Her father would be up on a murder rap. Once it started to unravel, it moved real fast. The first tip off I got was when she offered the dough for her brother's killer. She'd have all that dough, and on the book she'd look like a field of Vermont snow. Uh, she was feeling around between somebody's shoulder blades and From then on, all the cards fell just right. Condano was probably right. If they're not in the cemetery, watch out. Well, Hellman had only one question. Why would a guy want to kill off a dame like that? After I saw the pictures, I wondered myself. Armed Forces Radio Service has just brought you Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. Be with us again next week when over most of these same stations we'll bring you Pat Novak for Hire.
That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. It's about the only way to say it. Oh, you can dress it up and tell how many shopping days there are till Christmas. But if you got yourself in the market, you can't waste time talking. You gotta be as brief as a pauper's will. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, everybody wants a piece of the cake. And the only easy buck is the one you just spent. Oh, it's a good life. If you work real hard and study a little on the side, you gotta trade by the time you get to prison. I rent boats and do a few other odd jobs you can't afford to pick it on. It works out all right if you put your tongue in hock. Because down here you shouldn't talk. It's like installing a set of drums in a belfry. You make some noise, but it's never the right kind. I found that out a few days ago. Must have been Tuesday or Wednesday night anyway. I was sitting in the office reading Time magazine when the door opened. I looked up and had to keep right on going because the guy was so tall he'd have to bend over to see through a transom. And he had a voice deep enough to red out as a bassoon. Good evening, Mr. Novak. I'll take your word for it. You have a small office. I'm small time. What's on your mind? My name is Leahy. I want to hire you. Yeah. Sit down. Are you cold? Yeah. That overcoat around your neck, you're either cold or a priest. Oh. I'm a priest, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry, Father. You got a slow brogue. What do you need? A few hours of your time. I want you to help a man escape from prison. Uh Uh-huh. Father, you'll never get along with a bishop. Mr. Novak, in a curious way, this is an errand of mercy. Well, this isn't my year for mercy. I'm sorry, Father. Maybe you don't like to hear it that way, but if I got the right fee, it wouldn't be mercy anymore. When I say it's an errand of mercy, that's what it is. Sometime tonight, a man is going to break out of Alcatraz. If he's allowed to get into town, he may kill somebody. You want me to stop him? That's right. And if he doesn't kill anybody, he can still be shot down by the police. Well, that's the percentage, Father. If he comes off that rock, he knows that. Stop worrying about him. If you could bring him to me, I know I can talk him into going back. Tell headquarters they'll do the same thing. If I did that, I'd break a promise. This is the only thing I can do. Will you help me? Yeah, I suppose. How do I pick him up? Treadwater in the bay till he comes by? He's due in at Pier 19 sometime tonight. When he comes ashore, bring him to me. I'll be waiting at the ferry building. Well, suppose he doesn't want to come. Suppose he wants to party. How am I going to get him there? I don't ask you how to say the beads. If you're any good, you'll get him there. But you don't want him in sections. I want him all at once, Mr. Novak. I wouldn't ask you this if it weren't important. But i got to help him. He's one of my boys. Yeah, sure. What's his name? Joe Feldman. Feldman? Yeah. If I don't worry about the spelling, you don't have to either. He's one of my boys. Slow down. Nobody's pushing your father. I don't know when he's due, but I'll be at the ferry building from 8 o'clock on. Yeah, I only got one worry. Is there really a guy named Father Leahy? I suppose you'll have to take a chance on that. Yeah, well, it's a big chance. You come in here with a story anybody can see through like a screen door and I'm supposed to buy it. You could dig up a collar. What happens if you're a fake? Just try to guess right. Suppose I don't. Then you're in the same spot Pontius Pilate was. Good night, Mr. Novak. Whoever Joe Feldman was, he had a good friend. Because when Father Leahy walked out of there, I knew he was all right. You could tell without even testing him. The way when you pick up a pool cue, you know right away whether it's any good or not. He stood at the door for a minute, and then he walked out. And you got a funny feeling that he didn't walk into the night that he was big enough to wrap it around his shoulders and take it with him. I got a last look at him as he turned the corner under a street lamp. He looked even taller now, and you knew if somebody stood him in an oil field, you couldn't tell him from the rest of the derricks. Well, I made a couple of phone calls, and then I closed shop and went down to the end of Pier 19 to wait. The bay looked as dark as a bruised crow, and the fog was beginning to drift in over near the piers. By 9 o'clock, you couldn't see a thing. You felt like a guy trying to shave in a bathroom full of steam. I was about... 30 feet from the end of the pier when a small boat pulled in and let somebody out. I was sure it was my boy, so I moved behind a shed and waited. The boat pulled away and the guy started down the dock. I waited until he moved past me. Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. You ought to be glad. How's the rock? Huh? You lonely, mister? What do you care? If you are, buy a beer and talk to the bartender. I'm busy. All right, you're tough, Feldman. Let's go now. You got dates for us? You're going to see Father Leahy. Come on. Oh, you Dublin for Gabriel? Leave me alone, mister. I don't want to go. Now, look, Junior, if we draw straws, you're going to get the short one. Oh. 
that's supposed to be a gun in your pocket? Well, you get a chance to find out. That's what I'm going to do, because I have one, too. If it starts to hurt your stomach, back down. <laughs> no worries yours, Mr. Timid. <laughs> it's a bad night for bluffing, so goodbye. Yeah, come here. <laughs> go easy, fellow. It's a big one. Well, you can let go easy, then. Come on, drop it. Drop it in the water. Let go. <laughs> now, you want to start again? No. All right, I'll see you, man, lady. I got to make a stop first. Make it after. It'll take five minutes. Look, mister, if you want to do it the easy way, let me make the stop. You go with me. All right, five minutes, and then you see Father Leahy. Suit yourself. I doubt if I'll make heaven, but if you want to run interference, it's all right with me. If you need the credits, you need the credits. Joe Feldman wasn't very friendly. He sat over in the corner of the cab, and he didn't say a thing. He just kept looking at me and waiting, like a guy feeding arsenic to a rich aunt. A few minutes later, the cab pulled up in front of a hotel on Geary Street, and we walked in. One look at that lobby, and you got the idea. The place was about as cozy as an abandoned mine shaft. Over by the wall, there was an old mohair couch, and the legs on it were so warped, pretty soon it was going to look like period furniture. There were a few chairs, and... Over by the stairs, a faded calendar of a girl in tights holding a jar of mayonnaise and winking, whatever that meant. And there was a broken clock over the desk. But you knew it was all right, because nobody there cared about keeping track of time. It was something you got rid of in a hurry, like a bent quarter. We went up to the second floor. We walked down a long hall that smelled like an ante room to a sewer. When Feldman knocked on the door, she opened it right away. The room was full of taboo. She stood leaning there for a minute, a sort of a girl who moves when she stands still. She had blonde hair. She was kind of pretty, except she could see somebody had used her badly, like a dictionary in a stupid family. Feldman seemed to know her. Hello, Ann. Well, the harvest hands arrive all at once. Yeah. It's good for the crops, but tough on a woman. Come in. Who's your friend? A missionary, I guess. He grabbed me down by the docks. Does he talk or just stand there looking healthy? He growls a little. Do you really growl? Come on, hurry up, lady. Your friend's got a date. I'll bet you bite instead. <laughs> Don't worry about him. He can go over in a corner and play fifth wheel. Now, look, he's got five minutes. Use him quick. Yes? I uh, came up with a message, Ann. The time's been changed. Stay around till 10 o'clock. All right. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. You want the other four minutes? Let's go. All right. Open the door. Yeah. You didn't open it fast enough. When Feldman hit me, I wobbled for a minute and went down like the price of winter wheat. If Father Leahy had any loose prayers lying around, now was the time to crate them up and ship them over, because I wasn't going to stay awake long enough to test the varnish. I rolled on the floor a couple of times, and then I took a rain check on the next couple of hours. When I woke up, it was like buying a new Nash and then finding out you can't drive. Joe Feldman was lying next to me with his throat cut like a pound of rib roast. His head was over to one side, and his body was twisted over the other way as if he couldn't make up his mind which direction to die in. I got up and rolled him on his back. He was grinning like a Pullman porter at the end of the line, and his mouth was half open as if he expected you to drop in a suggestion on your way by. I noticed right then how thin and small he was, about as fat as a shadow and tall enough to scrape his head on a lampshade. Well, there wasn't anything I could do but wish him luck. So I called the check stand at the ferry building and had them page Father Leahy. About two minutes later, he answered. Hello, Father Leahy? This is Novak, Father. Yes, Call in the outfield. Your boy's dead. I see. What happened? Somebody didn't like him lots. I wasn't around for the main event. Where are you, on the pier? No, I'm in some cave up on Geary Street. He wanted to come by here first. Father, who's Ann? I don't know. Has Feldman got a girlfriend? He's got two sisters, I think. One of them's named Ann. A tall blonde with lots of speed? That's your definition, but it'll probably do. Now, she was around for a while, in case you ever want to check. Get on the back stairs and pretend I never heard of Joe Feldman. I'm sorry, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it worked out that way. So am I, Father. 
If you liked him, I'm sorry. He may have been a nice little guy. Huh? Well, I could do without him, but if you like it, I'll say he was a good little guy. How little? I don't know. We could start a picket fence with him. Why? Because you've got the wrong man, Mr. Novak. Huh? If he's under six feet, you've got the wrong man. Whoever you've got up there isn't Joe Feldman. Well, he's happy about it now, Father. Whoever he is, I'm sorry. It's the percentage. Why the percentage? If it isn't Joe Feldman, why? That's the waterfront, Father. If your name's Joe Nobody, you still can't do better than eight to five. <laughs> At least Joe Feldman was smart. If you're going to get your throat cut, it's a good time to send in a substitute. As soon as Father Leahy hung up, I knew hanging around that hotel was going to be a waste of time, like sending mash notes to a bearded lady. If I couldn't prove the guy was alive, they were going to charge extra down at the desk. And if Hellman down at Homicide ever found out I brought the guy up here, I'd have about as much chance as a bottle of scotch at a cocktail party. So I picked up my hat and started for the door. I looked at him once more, but he wasn't going to say goodbye, so I started out. Boo. Oh. Hello, Hellman. Expecting me, Novak? No, I'd have rolled him first. Yeah. Invite me in. Crash the party, Hellman. You'll be more at home. All right. He sure looks lazy. Who is he? He's supposed to be Joe Feldman. But Feldman let him do the hard work. They must be good friends. You better check. I don't know the guy. Yeah, help me roll him over. Okay. There. Here, here's his wallet. Let me have it. You're going to break your fingernails. Give it here. All right. Yeah. No money in here. You're going to drop the case? Here's his card, Mike Greeley. Didn't he like you either? You're wearing out the rug, Hellman. I don't know the guy. You brought him up? I checked at the desk. Well, check on who left then. I brought him up here on a phony lead. Why? Because I was hired to tow him around. He liked the room, so we dropped by. And he cut himself shaven? I wasn't around. There was a girl here for the handshakes. Oh. What kind of girl? I don't know, Hellman. How many kinds are there? Her name was Ann. She had a fast pulse. That's all I know. You must know more than that. If you don't, you'll never get a lawyer. I won't need one. You'll save money at least, because you've got a real hole this time, Novak. We get a phone tip and find you in the murder room. you got half a story, Hellman. I know, but I'll get the other half. Until then, you're under technical arrest. It's practically the real thing. Uh, you got a technical head, Hellman. I wouldn't tip myself off. Somebody else would. Walk around, Novak, and tire yourself out. Because you'll wind up sitting down. In the meantime, I'll have you tailed. Your men couldn't follow a moose through a revolving door. Now, look, Hellman, I'm going to double back. This guy's a phony lead. I was supposed to meet a guy named Joe Feldman, but he never showed up. He didn't? No. I got a dead copper to prove he did. Your boy, Joe Feldman, killed a sergeant named Grubb at the Gold Rush Club Club a half hour ago. You better start that walk, Novak. <laughs> Two kind of raps you can't ever beat. Cheating a woman with kids and killing a copper. So I knew Joe Feldman could put in for reservations right away. And I knew Hellman would stay with him like a February cold. He'd stay with the whole thing. And I'd have a real tough time explaining. <laughs> I couldn't explain it to myself. What about the message up in that room? Why did the little guy tell Ann to stay until 10 o'clock? Why did he get off at Pier 19 instead of Joe Feldman? Once he got there, what was Feldman doing at the Gold Rush Club, and why did they spot him so fast? Well, it pointed to one thing, a police tip-off, but that's as far as I could go. On the way down, I stopped at the desk, and I asked the clerk to see the register. He pushed it over toward me. It was a dirty brown thing that looked like an old tortilla somebody had left behind. It didn't do any good. The registration was a phony. Well, I had to do something in a hurry, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. He's a good man, and he used to be a smart one, too. And still he started chasing a jigger of beer with a glass of whiskey. I finally found him in the Pied Piper room arguing with somebody about the words to Annie Laurie. Ah, Patsy, a drink for Mr. Novak. Something cheap but impressive. Oh, stop it, will you, Jocko? Are you going to be drunk all your life? Yes, it's only a matter of willpower, Patsy. I'm probably the only man in the world who intends to carry a hangover into eternity. Well, stop long enough to give me a hand, will you? I'm in trouble. Of course you're in trouble. You'll always be in trouble because you can't recognize it, Patsy. You're fuzzy, Jocko. You have the social outlook of a bull with a hot foot, and there's no hope for you because if from time to time a moral feeling does sweep over you, you mistake it for influenza and go to bed. All right, all right. Oh, you try hard enough. You go through the motions, Patsy, but you never get anywhere. 
You go stumbling through life doing a tight wire act on a rubber band. You're always in the middle. Will you listen to me? It's because there's no variety in your life. You won't allow it. You're a broken down banjo. Not a very good instrument to begin with. And to make matters worse, you allow everybody to come along and pluck the same string. All right. Are you all through now, Jocko? Yes. You sound angry. I think you have a bad disposition, too. What kind of trouble? Well... I tried to help some guy out of prison tonight. You got drunk and thought you were the parole board? No, I did it for a good guy, a priest named Leahy. Yes? The guy was already out, and Father Leahy was trying to hurt him back without getting shot. But this guy, Feldman, didn't want to play. Another drink will clear this up for me? I picked up the wrong guy. I took him to a Geary Street hotel. I napped a while and they cut him up like a piece of parsley. Sounds like a gruesome hotel. The dead guy's name is Mike Greeley. I don't even know who he is. Well, this is no time to start building a friendship anyway. Uh, who is in the room? Some girl. She may be Feldman's sister. Would she kill a man? Well, if she did, he'd be crushed to death. No, I'm sure somebody else came in that room. You better talk to Feldman. Well, he's a hard man to reach. A sergeant almost made it tonight. Feldman shot his way out of the Gold Rush Club. Hmm, that's one way to get out of a nightclub. Well, Hellman steamed up, so you got to help me, Jocko. You'd better look up Father Leahy. You'll probably be electrocuted, and if you are, he may have some drag. I want you to go down to the Chronicle Morgue and pull the clips on Joe Feldman, will you? Get everything you can, and then hit the horse parlors. Find out what they know about him, huh? Maybe he's a heavy drinker. I'll check the bar. Jocko, wake up and get down there. If I don't pace Hellman on this thing, I'll be a dead pigeon. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. You might start cooing. Good night, lover. <laughs> Well, as soon as I left Jocko, I went down to the Gold Rush Club on O'Farrell Street. It was a little nightclub where they charge 80 cents for a drink of whiskey that'd kill a redwood. The floor show was just as bad, and the headliner was an oriental dancer whose only talent was a zipper. I sat at the bar, and I tried to pry some talk loose, but they liked the boss. I finally got a hold of a fat waitress who should have been wearing a harness instead of slacks. She told me a little. The owner was a guy named Charlie Giffen, and he used to make book with Joe Feldman. She told me that Joe's sister worked at the Gold Rush Club for a while, but she got sick a few months ago and quit. I asked the girl if tonight's shooting was a police plant. She didn't know, but she said that Feldman had been in to see Giffen tonight, and on his way out, he ran into trouble. I gave her five bucks, and she looked hurt as if somebody had given her a plow for Christmas. She showed me where Giffen's office was, and I walked back there. Giffen wasn't there, but the taboo was. Do you have the right door, Mr. Novak? You seem to be in all of them. Do you mind if I lean in the doorway? No, but I'll bet you need shoulder pads by this time. Where's Charlie Giffen? Why? I want to ask him about Joe Feldman. Ask me. I'm his sister. I'll ask you about Mike Greeley. Who killed him? I don't know. Is he dead? Yeah, he couldn't stand the bleeding. He was all right when I left. What were you doing up there? Waiting for Joe. My sister and I were going to meet him up there. Relax, Mr. Novak. Relax for me. No, when people relax for you, they do it on the floor. I was out long enough for homicide to catch up. They want me for Mike Greeley, but I'm going to send them you or Joe. You're forgetting my sister Norma. Should I? For most things, yes. But she was up in that room tonight after me. I'll ask her. Ask her about the money, too. Well, you're out in front of me on that. You can see me better that way. Joe had a lot of money on him tonight. With the police out, he wouldn't carry it with him. By now, the money's gone, so's Norma. Uh. Do you know where it is? No. Well... You growl, and you bite, and you lie. You must have a full day. Sit down, relax. I want to see Giffen. He won't be back tonight. Now lean back. That's it, Patsy. You really want that money? I can split a motive. Can you split it 90-10? If you can't, you better get your breath back. I won't need it. I don't want to talk anymore. Come here and make me stop. Over close. If I get any closer, I'll be on the other side of you. Yes. Hmm. Patsy. You ought to get time and a half, darling. Hello, Anne. Thought you were coming in to curl up with a good book. Uh, Mr. Novak came by full of questions. This is Charlie Giffen, Patsy. I got some questions for you, too, Giffen. Well, ask him down the bore of this gun. Over by the desk, Novak. Did you lose that knife, Giffen? By the desk. That's it. Where's the money, Novak? I gave her the last report. Where's the money? Joe gave it to somebody. Try the Red Cross, mister. You got a tender face, Novak. Now get out of this club before I slap on a cover charge. Oh, 
I was getting sick of tonight. In three hours, I'd seen more service than a mix master in a cooking school. When I left the Gold Rush Club, I dropped by headquarters. Hellman had nothing to show but his badge. They had a dragnet around the city for Joe Feldman, and they'd lined up the record on the dead guy in the hotel. He'd been a friend of Joe's before his trip to Alcatraz. There wasn't much I could do. If Homicide couldn't find Joe, I couldn't find him. So I looked up Norma Feldman in the phone book. She had an apartment out on the avenues, but when I called, there was no answer, so I tagged by my apartment to see if Jocko had left a message. When I opened the door, Norma was there, and she had a gun to keep her company. Come in, Mr. Nowak. Yeah. I came up here to kill you. Well, if you're Norma, the rest of the family's ahead of you. What's happened to my brother? I don't know. Please, what's happened to him, Mr. Novak? Well, if he killed a cop, he's hiding out. I know he didn't mean to do that, Mr. Novak. Joe's not that way. Somebody told the police he was going to be there. That's why I came up here to see you. Oh, put down the gun, huh? You can't shoot through the tears. <laughs> Mr. Novak, if you know where he is, tell me. Make him give himself up. Make him stop hiding like a small, frightened animal. He looked big to that copper. <laughs> Please. Please find him. <laughs> yeah. Hello, this is Jocko. Yeah. You sound ruffled. Joe Feldman's sister just walked in to kill me. Don't argue. It's the best offer you've had. What'd you find out? Feldman has two sisters. I know. They both go to pieces. The Gold Rush Club is owned by Charlie Giffen. He owed Joe Feldman $2,000, and the horse people say Joe collected it tonight. Well, that fits in, Jocko. Everybody in town's after that dough. They'll have to look some more. Hmm? I'm out on Arguello Boulevard. Homicide just fished Joe Feldman out of the gutter. If Homicide finished second, he was a lucky guy. He didn't have the dough on him? No. Well, he stashed it somewhere. Then he left it with a woman. Yeah? Because he's got a woman's compact in his pocket. You uh, better hit the sister's place. How do we know he got it there? A woman's compact? If he didn't get it there, Alcatraz is getting too social. <laughs> Well, the minute Jocko hung up, things began to fall into place. But I knew the last piece was going to pinch somebody hard. If the Feldman blood was going to turn bad, Father Leahy was a good man to send in, so I called him. He was out, but I left word for him to get out to Norma Feldman's apartment. Norma and I left, and on the way, we picked up Hellman. When we got out to her place and started up the stairs, we could hear people moving above. There was no point in trying to keep quiet. Because Hellman was creeping up the stairs like a stallion with a broken leg. Yeah, if you got a bomb, touch it off too, huh? Well, open it, Hellman. Hello, Novak. Did you find the dough, Giffen? You mean my stolen dough? Yeah. Come on, eh? No, you and Ann better wait. This is Hellman from Homicide. We're leaving. You better move, Novak. Not until you settle a murder rap. Can you pay it off that fast? I can do it on the way to the door. Oh, wait a minute. Point the gun at Hellman. He's official. I can tag you both, so move away. You too, Norma. Anne and I are leaving. Look, Giffen. Homicide gobbles up nightclub big shots like you. You're nothing to me, copper. Move away. You got the hammer. Use it and come on through. All right, I will, copper. Hey. Yeah, hey, you need a refill, Giffen. That's right, darling. Hand him your gun. And And you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have taken him out. All right, so they fell out. You better take him for murder, Hellman. You little bum. That leaves you all the money. I can spend it, darling. Well, you better do it fast, then. Grab him, Hellman. Yeah, yeah I got him. Oh, you can fucking for both murders. My Greeley and my brother. I'll testify and I'll ride there in a cab on your dough, Giffen. Yeah. Are you going to pose or take me, Hellman? If you're anxious. Sorry about you, Norma. You get nothing out of this, but that's better than I got. Goodbye, Anne. Lots of luck. Thank you, darling. You know what kind. I hope you're rot. Come on, Hellman. I'm ashamed of you, Anne. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm ashamed of you, Anne. What you did to Joe, I'm ashamed of you. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm sick, you know that. I didn't know how it was going to work out. Poor Joe was trying to help you and you got greedy. He was trying to help you. That's the only reason he came out. You let this happen. I told you I didn't know how it was going to end. I thought they'd get him and take him back again. There's no good in you, Anne. They couldn't find good in you anywhere. You let that happen to Joe. You stood by and watched him walk into something like that. All right, I stood by. What can we do about it now except weep, and that won't help him. But hating you will. That'll help Joe a little. I'm here at least to hate you for the short time left. Please, Norma. Giffen told you to spend it fast. Well, you better. You better spend it fast. 
Ask him at the hospital if that isn't so. What do you mean? Ask him out there what you've got. They don't. You ask him what you've got. Ask him what's staring you to pieces. Ask him, they'll tell you. They'll tell you you've got cancer. Norma, please. They'll tell you cancer. Ask them. They'll tell you you're full of it. Now spend your money. Spend your money and see that it lasts as long as you do. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Novak. Well, did you miss much, Father? No. Feldman luck is running kind of bad tonight. It does for some people, I guess. All they get is unhappiness. They wear it the same way you'd wear a sports coat, only they never seem to get a new one. I'm sorry about tonight, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it's not a smoother world. Yeah. But if it were, you'd be out of a job, Father. See you later. If you get a bad first break, you never run the table. That's what happened to Joe Feldman. Charlie Giffen owed him dough and wouldn't pay up. But Joe didn't care until Norma showed up and told him how sick Ann was, so he decided to collect from Giffen and divide the dough between the girls. Father Leahy couldn't stop him. All he could do was try and make it work out. Joe was going to get the dough and meet the girls in that hotel room, but he changed his timetable and sent Mike Greeley up to tell the girls. Giffen showed up there and figured that Mike had tumbled to a double cross, so he killed him. Anne engineered the double cross, but she didn't mean to go that far. She wanted all the dough and tipped off Giffen. He was supposed to turn the dough over to her and then have the police pick up Joe, but Joe got there early. He took the dough away from Giffen and shot the copper on the way out. Giffen followed Joe and killed him out in Arguello, but the dough was gone. He finally tumbled to Norma's place, and that's how her apartment filled up so fast. Well, Hellman asked only one question. What did I get out of all this? Nothing. Father Leahy offered me 50 bucks, but I didn't want it. Jocko was with me, and he offered to give it to charity. I guess he did, because where Jocko spent it, the drinks aren't worth money. Pat Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Richard Diamond's private detective.
Diamond Detective Agency, handy hints on homicide. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Just pick a victim. All right. Got it? Yes. Six of spades. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Helen. Hi. Am I going to see you tonight, Rick? Uh, depends on how many lights you leave on in the study. But are you coming over? Wouldn't miss it. I've been puckered up since 8 o'clock this morning. <laughs> Francis has the night off. I'll have dinner for you in by the fire. Well, take it easy. The last time you built a fire, it got so hot I had to keep basting myself for a week. Oh, Rick. Sure. The next day I walked by Linda's and some guy grabbed me and shoved an apple in my mouth. <laughs> Said he'd get fired if I didn't climb back in the window and lie down. Oh, I'll see you tonight. Bye. Bye. Now, let's see. Where did I put the soap? Mr. Diamond? Oh, it depends on what you want him for. If it's the rent, he's being buried over in Jersey this afternoon. My name is Dr. Edward Gerson from Bellevue Hospital. I have nothing to do with the rent. Well, if you're with the Sanity Commission, Diamond's still in Jersey. It is apparent that you are behind in your rent and you wish to remain buried in Jersey for the moment. Well, it's not as bad as it sounds. Are you a potential client? I'm a psychiatrist, Mr. Oh. Uh... Well, pick a good one. How about Apple Knocker? All right. I'm in a rather peculiar position, Mr. Applenocker. Oh, I don't know. I always sit like that. <laughs> for the past four days, I've been treating a young man for an unusual type of shock. What did he do? Run his electric crane in the bathtub? <laughs> You're quite an interesting case yourself. Are you always so unconcerned when someone comes to you with a problem? Look, doctor, everybody's got a problem. That's why I'm in business. If you've got a big one, you'll get by uh, my little remarks, and I'll be glad to see what I can do for you. Quite a philosophy. All right, then. Let's both get down to business, Mr. Apple knocker. Oh, now, uh, what's your trouble? This boy I mentioned, he disappeared five days ago. Hmm? You said you'd been treating him for four days. He couldn't have been gone very long. A day and a night. Hmm. He was found the next morning wandering through the Bowery. Unable to speak, unable to understand anything. I see. Someone took him to Bellevue. Luckily, the family's private physician is also on the staff at Bellevue. He saw the boy and called the family immediately. And you've been treating him ever since? Yes. Last night, the boy began to talk, make reasonable sense... Now, this would continue for perhaps a few hours, then he would lapse into a complete state of confusion. Each time he was given a sedative, and each time, as the sedative wore off, he talked for a while, knew who he was, start to tell about the missing night, and then lapse once more into this state of, well, confusion. Hmm. And you think something happened during this missing night, and he doesn't want to remember it. Correct. Did you ever study psychology? Uh, every day, Doctor. I get enough screwy cases in here to make your clientele look like a bunch of Einsteins. And now stop unlocking my mind. There's a draft. <laughs> well, as you said, this boy won't let himself remember something that happened on that missing night. He'll talk about everything up to that point, but the minute he reaches it... Yeah, he jumps the tracks. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, what do you want me to do? You uh, know what I want you to do, Mr. Diamond. Okay, okay. Now, here's one that will throw you. You know what I want you to do? <laughs> the boy's family is quite willing to meet any expense that you feel is necessary. Oh, remind me not to take you on a double date. <laughs> if I don't discover what happened to this boy on the night in question, I'm afraid he might lose his mind permanently. These periods of confusion are becoming more frequent, and sooner or later, he won't be able to distinguish between the real and the unreal. I'm going to put him under narcosynthesis this evening, and I'd like you to be present. All right, Doctor. What's the boy's name? William Carter. Be at Bellevue at 8 o'clock and ask for me. The boy's family will be there also, and you can tell them about your fee. Now, uh, just give me a quick answer and leave my motives alone. Is his family wealthy? Quite. And I'll see you at 8 o'clock, Dr. Gerson. You uh, would have anyway. Goodbye, Mr. Applenocker. You know, you can feel pretty silly when a guy like that walks in and answers all your questions before you got time to think them up. Anyway, I remembered my dinner date with Helen and put in a fast call to the little redhead. She was unhappy, naturally, but she said something about me holding the pucker and to drop around whenever I had the time. At 8 o'clock, I was standing in the long hall at the Bellevue Hospital. Dr. Murray, report to the second floor desk, please. Dr. Murray, to the second floor desk. Good evening, Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, hello, Dr. Gerson. What's the matter? Dr. You're looking a little nervous. Well, hospitals bother me. That's very Dr. interesting. Hacker, please. The family Dr. is at the end of the hall. Let's go down. Uh, tell me, Doctor, just what exactly happens when you put William Carter under this narcosynthesis? It's an intravenous injection. It unlocks those little doors in the back of his mind. Gets him to talk. You'll see. It's really very amazing. Uh, right here. Oh, 
Good evening, Doctor. Mrs. Carter. How's the boy? Uh, not much change. This is Mr. Diamond, Mr. and Mrs. Carter. How do you How do? How do you do? How do you do? Uh, Mrs. Carter, uh, Dr. Gerson wants me to find out what happened to your son the night he was missing. Have you any idea? He said he had a date. When I asked him who it was, he wouldn't tell me. That's all we know. I think William will be able to recreate what happened for you, Mr. Diamond. Now I'll leave you to discuss uh, business. And when you are through, stop at the desk. We'll show you where I am. Well, I... <laughs> well, I, I... Yes, Mr. Diamond. What is your fee? Oh, thank you. Believe me. A uh, hundred a day in expenses. And uh, your retainer? One day's work. Mr. Diamond, can you help our boy? Uh, Mrs. Carter, I, I don't really know. No, I'll write you a check. Oh, thanks, thanks. Mrs. Carter, uh, whatever it is that's strong enough to make your son jump his, uh, uh, lose his memory, it might you be... You think maybe it's something bad? I know it's something bad. How bad? I, I've got to find out. I hope it's not uh, more serious than I think. Oh, yes, I know. Here you are, Mr. Diamond. Oh, thanks. I'll keep in touch. <laughs> I left the Carters with that lousy feeling in my stomach. I looked at the check. Two hundred bucks. For what? Maybe a down payment on a man's sanity. Maybe not. William Carter could have done a lot of things that missing night. Maybe that two hundred bucks was going to be a mortgage on murder. I went down to the desk and an intern showed me downstairs to a small room with one desk lamp in the corner. I'm glad you didn't take too long. The patient will be down in a minute. Oh, uh, isn't this a little irregular, Doctor? I mean, uh, uh, oh, me listening in on a man's secrets? If he's done something against the law, I want you to find out whether it really happened. Well, if he tells you about it, it must have happened. He might have thought it happened. I can't take the chance. If he's committed some sort of a crime, I don't think I'll be able to do much for him. Now, I want you to sit behind that screen there and be perfectly quiet. Sure. Comfortable? Oh, yes, yes. The needle can't reach this far. Uh, this uh, should be quite interesting for you, Diamond, particularly in your kind of work. Uh, you can find out about uh, anything you want with this stuff, can't you, Doctor? If it's a recent shock, why? Oh, I was just thinking about a little blonde I know. Now, here he is. Uh, Roll him right uh, over here. Uh, oh. Now, lift him over on the bed. Uh, oh. It's all right, William. Uh, Everything is going fine. All oh. right, thank you, nurse. Uh, How do you feel, William? Uh, Can you understand me? Uh, say it again. Say it again. Can you understand me, William? Yes. Yes, yes, but keep talking. Say anything. Just, just make my mind stop jumping around. Sure. Uh, uh, it's nice in this hospital, isn't it? Huh? It's nice in this hospital. Yeah. Oh, what's the matter with me? Just be quiet. Think about lying in a boat under the warm sun. Uh, lying in a boat. Lying in a boat. Lying in a boat. Uh-huh. Just lying in the sun, rocking back and forth. What are you going to do? This won't hurt. You're going to have a nice, long sleep. Oh, yeah, please, please. I want to sleep. There. Now start counting. Do what? Do what? Tell me again. Start counting. One. One. Two. Two. You're doing fine. Keep counting. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven, eight, nine. I sat behind the screen and listened to the doctor begin. At the start, Carter seemed almost glad to talk about it. He described the beginning of the evening. He had a date. A girl named Helena on 53 East 51st Street. Did you have a good time with Helena? Wonderful time. We went dancing. Where did you He go kept dancing? talking all about the evening. Uh, they danced and drank. We went to a little the doctor kept digging, working at village. it, Very looking good. for every little detail. After you got through dancing? We went to her apartment. 
we uh, had some more drinks. Pretty strong ones. Who made them? What? Who made the drinks? Uh, Helena did. Uh, then he came in. Who came in? He did. Uh, the man. The man? The man just came into Helena's apartment. Who are you? Helena, who is this guy? What are you doing here, William? What are you doing? What do you want? Get out. Get out. I don't care who you are. I'm not going to get out, William. I don't believe it. You're not her husband. Stop it. Take your hands off her. He's hurting Helena. Yeah. I'll fix you. Helena needs help. There. You hit him. Yeah. Gotta get out of here. Why do you? I gotta... I gotta get out. He's dead. I killed him. Well, Diamond, did you hear enough? Yeah. It's up to you. Find out if he really did it. Okay. Thank you. For what? Well, according to William Carter, he'd gone to a girl's apartment, the husband had come in, and he'd killed him. Cases like that don't make me a happy gumshoe, but I had a $200 retainer in my pocket, so I had to keep going. My first stop was the 5th Precinct Police Station and Lieutenant Walt Levinson. When I walked into the squad room, I spotted Sergeant Otis tying a square knot in his shoelace. I'll be right with you, gumshoe. Hey, Otis, what happens when you break one of those shoelaces? Oh, what do you think happens? I get a new one. For those shoes? What do you use, the mooring line for the Queen Mary? Oh, why don't you lay off? I thought we was pals. Is the lieutenant in? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Otis, if your shoes wear out, why don't you do like the Dutch do? Oh, what's that? Wear wooden ones. Just go out and rent yourself a couple of rowboats. Oh. Hello, Walt. Good evening, Mr. Diamond, and thank you for stopping by so late. Well, now, what do you mean? You've got some horrible scheme up your sleeve, but I don't have to play straight, man. I'm off duty in exactly three minutes. It'll take two. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I want a list of DOAs for the night of November 12th. What's the matter? Can't you find a little old corpse all by your lonesome? Oh, shut up. Or does the police department have to furnish you with one? Well, if you just cooperate, sassy, you'll be out of here in two minutes. Here. Now, thanks. Wow. Hmm. Three of them, huh? If that's what it says. Why? Is the one we haven't found? Two women and a man. Yeah. The man's my department. Homicide. Mm. Herbert Fisher. Found in his wife's apartment on 51st Street. Married to Helena Fisher. Hmm. What about Helena, Walt? We're still looking for her. Neighbors say she and her husband hadn't been living together for several months. The old boy must have come home, found her with another guy, and got heated up. Either the wife or the other guy killed him. Huh? How do you know there was another guy? Well, the neighbors say a young guy started seeing her about a week before. Came up with her that night. We haven't a line on him yet, but we're checking. What killed him? Poker from the fireplace. Beaten over the head. Oh. No prints? Nope. Clean as a whistle. Say, what's with you? What are you so interested in this killing for? Oh, I just like to hear about crimes. Oh, now stop that. If you know something... I do know something, Walt. Yeah? What? One word. Will it help me solve this case? I don't know. Well, what is it? Bye. I left the precinct and headed back to Bellevue and Dr. Gerson. I had a hunch that was growing roots, and if William Carter's sanity was going to be saved, it would have to be done in a hurry. Up till now, only four people knew who was in that apartment when Fisher was killed. Myself, a missing girl named Helena, the potential killer, William Carter, and the good doctor. The girl hasn't gone to the police? Why, if William Carter did it? Well, that's what I've been asking myself all the way down here, Doctor. Unless she wants to protect him. That's the only one I could come up with. I want to ask you two questions, Doctor. First, do you think William Carter would pick up a poker and beat a man on the head? That's hard to say. He might. Would he then wipe his fingerprints off? According to what he told me, he killed the man and rushed immediately from the apartment. I'd say no to the fingerprints. Mm, That's what I'd say. He suffered the shock immediately after he killed the man. He knew he had to get out, but after that, he can't remember a thing. May I use your phone? Certainly. Doctor, how could Carter be sure that he'd killed the man? Why, I don't know. If you remember, he didn't say. He just said he'd killed him. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. I thought you were going home. I got to sit up with a headache. Oh, well, I want some information. Where did the murdered man live if he wasn't staying with his wife? Oh, now. 
wait a minute. We know who did it. Hmm? You do? Sure. Some guy named Carter. William Carter. I sent some of the boys over to his house ten minutes ago. Now, how do you know he did it? Because Helena Fisher walked into the station and told us so. You got the girl? Yeah, we're holding her till we pick up the Carter guy. Seems Carter was in her apartment with her. Uh, I know the story. You do? You do? I'll be right down. Well, they've got Helena, Doctor. She says William Carter killed her husband. Yes, I heard. Well, I'm afraid I can't do much for him now. I think you can. There's one thing that smells too rotten to make sense. Why did William Carter take enough time to wipe off those fingerprints? Because he didn't want to be discovered. Well, if he didn't want anyone to know he did it, why didn't he kill the girl? Oh, good Lord, I never thought of that. I got an idea. And it may mean you bending the law a little, Doctor, but it might save William Carter. What do you want me to do, Mr. Diamond? Is there any way you can find out from Carter exactly what he did after he struck the man? Of course. When he comes out of his sleep, he'll be able to talk about it. Can he be moved? Well, yes, if it's necessary. Then get him out of here. Take him somewhere. Even if his family covers for him, it's just a matter of time until Lieutenant Levinson finds out he was picked up and put in here. Well, this is extremely dangerous. Look, if he believes he killed this guy, the girl's story will hold water. The only way that I can see to make him snap out of it is to prove to him that he really didn't kill anybody. That's right. Uh, don't you think he did kill that man? Uh, maybe, but I doubt it. Can he walk? Yes. Good. Take him down to my office. Here's the key. Stay there until you hear from me. You know, I, I like you, Diamond, and I respect you, but this is... You want to save the boy's life? Of course. Then get him down to my office. <laughs> left the hospital and grabbed a cab back to the 5th precinct. Sometimes when things don't add up like ABC, you've got to go out into left field for the answer. Everything pointed to William Carter and he believed it himself, but I kept thinking about those fingerprints. I told Walt my idea. Are you crazy? So the guy did wipe off the fence but didn't kill the girl. Whatever. People do crazy things the first time they knock somebody off. Besides, you can't go around posing as a police sergeant. Oh, now stop that, Walt. Admit it. There's a hole someplace. But you told me yourself the Carter guy admits killing the girl's husband. In his condition, he'd admit anything. He says he did it. The girl says he did it. What more do you want? I don't want any doubts at all. Will you just try the idea? If you'll tell me where you've got William Carter. Promise not to have the boys there? Just you? Yes, yes, I get me. He's in my it. office. Wouldn't you know it? Okay, Walt. Get the girl in here and tell her just what I told you. I don't need any rehearsals. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Send Mrs. Fisher in here. Right. I hope you know what you're doing. You're putting me in an awful spot. Well, if it works, Walt, the state won't burn an innocent man. Yes, but this... Uh, Mrs. Fisher, Lieutenant. Oh, come in, Mrs. Fisher. Thank you, Lieutenant. Sit down. This is Sergeant Diamond. Oh, Oh, how do you do, Sergeant Diamond? Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Fisher? We've checked your story and everything seems to be all right. You can go home, but please don't leave town. Uh, I'm terribly sorry about this. I, I know I should have told you sooner, but William was... Well, I, I didn't know what to do. You did the right thing. Have you found William yet? No, but we will. Well, didn't you check his house? Isn't he with his family? No, he didn't come home at all. Oh, and that reminds me. You know, you're the only witness who can prove he did kill your husband. Oh, why, yes, I guess I am. Well, I'd be extremely careful. He just might, uh... Lieutenant! You don't think he might try and, and kill me, too? Well, you never know. After a man kills once and he's got time to think about it, he's liable to do anything. Well, then, I, I demand police protection. And you'll get it. Sergeant Diamond here has been assigned to the case. Oh, how nice. I'll do as much as I possibly can. Well, when do you start? Right now. I'll meet you out in the squad room right after I have a few words with the lieutenant. All right, Sergeant. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant. Perfectly all right. This is ridiculous. All right, all right. You get over to my office and pick up William Carter and the doctor. I'll stall Mrs. Fisher take her to a bar or something. All right. But if the commission hears about this, Sergeant Otis will be the new head of homicide. Oh, this is nice, Sergeant Diamond. Do you always guard people like this? Just the pretty ones. Oh, thank you. If you really think William might try to harm me... You'll have to stick pretty close, won't you? Mm-hmm. Do you mind? Not at all. What time is it? Uh, 11.30. Getting tired? Yes, a little. It, it's been a hard day. I'll bet it has. What if William comes to my place in the middle of the night? Where will you be? Watching the front door, baby. He won't get in. Watching the door from 
Inside or outside? Outside, baby. Sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so am I. Here's my apartment, Rick. Oh, no, nice place. I don't like it very much since... Look, couldn't I stay in a hotel? Oh, no. Too many ways for a killer to get in. But do you really think William might try and, and get me? What's he hiding out for? Well, he, he could be scared. All the more reason. Men like that don't hide out for a week if they're going to give themselves up. And if William isn't going to give himself up, he'll probably try to get rid of the one person who knows he did the killing. But William isn't like that. He wouldn't... Uh, wouldn't what? I was just going to say he wouldn't kill anybody. But he did. He knows he did. Yes. Well, I'm going out in front and check the building. I'll, I'll be back. Oh, do you have to go? That's a good idea. You just take it easy. But, but, but William has a key. Oh, well, then you better give me one, too. I'll be right out in front. Oh, all right, here. Uh, don't be too long, Rick. I can't stand this place long if I'm alone. Sure, baby. Yeah, yeah, I spotted you when you drove up. Hello, Doctor. I hope your plan works, Diamond. Yeah. Well, hello, William. He can't hear you. I put him into a deep sleep. He'll only answer my voice. There's only one way that we can get him into that apartment. Well, let's go. Mrs. Fisher is scared to step. William? Yes? Get out of the car. Uh, come on, Walter. You've got to be there to hear it. We solved this one. I'll never tell anyone how. Let's go. Come with me, William. Now, William, remember, you are to go up to Helena's apartment and go in. Uh, here's a key, Doctor. Do you understand, William? I am to go up to Helena's apartment and go in. Here's the key. Use the key to let yourself in. The key to let myself in. When you're in, close the door and stand in front of it. And that's all. All right, Mr. Diamond. Here we go. Four of us went in through the front door and Dr. Gerson briefed William once more. Then we led him up the stairs and up to Helena Fisher's apartment. I could hear her humming as soon as William tried the key. We all ducked. What? Who's there? Rick? Answer me, who's there? <gasps> William! What do you want? William, what are you doing here? William, say something. Don't just stand there. Oh, you, you... You've got to get out. The police are looking for you. There's one downstairs right now. Well, say something. Stop staring. William, get away from that door. Please, William, please, please. I... I, I know what you want, William. I, I won't tell anyone. William, say something. Don't look at me like that. You, you're going to kill me, aren't you? Look, William, you didn't do it. I killed him. I just told you he was dead after you hit him. When you left, I killed him with a poker. William, please! All oh, right, Helena. Greg, Greg. Oh, he was going to kill me. Oh, sure. Like he killed your husband. Yes, yes. How's William, Doctor? I'll wake him up when he gets back to the hospital. He'll be all right when he reads Mrs. Fisher's confession. Rick? What's going on here? You better go along with the lieutenant, baby. Why? He heard your whole confession from outside the door. What? Why, I, I, I just said he was... Going to kill me. Also, we found some of your fingerprints on the poker. You're crazy. I wiped them off. <gasps> uh, she's all yours, Walt. Let's go, Mrs. Fisher. You tricked me. You tricked me into saying that. Come on, lady. I don't want to get rough. I'll kill you, too. I'll... <clears throat> I think you can take her along now, Lieutenant. <laughs> Holy cow. Why, doctor. Well, I've never hit a woman before, but... This one made me very unhappy. Well, you're a good doctor, uh, doctor, but you're certainly no gentleman. You should have kicked her. Rick, mm -hmm. what kept 
kept you out so late. It's after midnight. Oh, I'd stick around and watch Otis turn into a pumpkin. Now, that's Cinderella. Yeah. Can you imagine Sergeant Otis as Cinderella? The good prince would slip his sacrum trying to haul his slipper around. Tell me a fairy story, Rick. Well, once upon a time, there were two idiots. Rick. And they lived happily ever after. Sing. Don't like it? Sing. I liked it. Sing. I'll do as I please. Rick. I love those dear hearts and gentle people who live in my hometown. Because those dear hearts and gentle people will never ever let you down. They read the good book from Friday till Monday. That's how the weekend goes. I've got a dream house I'll build there one day with picket fence and rambling rows. I feel so welcome each time that I return that my happy little heart keeps laughing like a clown. I love the dear hearts and gentle people who live and love in my hometown. Well, how was that, honey? Well, Harold Applenocker. Where'd you pick up that there song? Well, my hometown, Mountain View, back up in the hills of Arkansas. Oh, well, that sure was mighty fine. Well, Lula Bell, I'm glad you liked it. Mind if I bust you up with another eight bar? Nope. Bust away. I love the dear heart and gentle people who live and love in my hometown. Da -da 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 -da. Well, well. Yeah, I think I did pretty fine, that air song. Oh, yes, sir. You done busted me up right proper. Oh, you ought to come over to Mountain View sometime, little Bell. Got dear hearts and gentle people all over the place. Oh, I'd like to make the trip. Oh, you'd love the people. You'd love to see them, love to greet them. How would you greet them, Lula Bell? How would you greet them? What would you say? Howdy. Oh, they love you, Lula Bell. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Joan Banks, Sam Edwards, and Norman Field. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC Sunday? There's a full evening of great entertainment in store for you tomorrow on NBC. You'll hear rib-tickling comedy on the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. And for mystery, there's Sam Spade's latest caper. Tomorrow, Sam meets a Mr. Tom Turkey... For the very best radio fare, always tune to NBC. Coming up, it's Brian Donlevy and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Good evening, Francis. You look like you're going out. Yes, sir. Miss Asher wants me to go down to the delicatessen for some cold cuts. Well, where is Miss Asher? In the study, sir. Well, I'll see you later, Francis. Why don't you bring back some roll mop? Roll mop, sir? Herring with the bends. Very toothy. Uh, yes, sir. Ali, Ali, oxen free. Rick. Hi. Hi. Well, get the silk thing there. Lounging pajamas. Yeah. 
I guess we're going to stay in, huh? Uh huh. I just sent Francis out for some food. I uh, met him at the door. Look, I've got to do a few things in the kitchen. Why don't you stretch out on the couch and take it easy until dinner's ready? Okay, I'm uh, I'm pretty tired. Might rock out. No, a little sleep might do you some good. Here, read a magazine if you want to stay awake. Hmm? Oh, swell. Gory detective. Who sends you these things? The corpse of the month? Mm-hmm. Pretty bad. I won't be long. Okay. Oh, no. The case of the bloody... Oh! <sighs> It was going on 11 o'clock, and the fog encircled the old house like a thin, wet blanket. Oh, swell. The figure of a man crept stealthily across the gravel of the garden path. Oh, these riders really dream it up. Hmm? Hmm? Mr. Diamond? What? How did you get in here? I followed you from your office. Shh! You left the door unlocked when you came in. Well, now, look. I know I shouldn't have come into someone else's house, but, but this is a matter of life and death. Hey, stop pulling down the blinds. I don't want anyone to see us talking. Well, you're on the eighth floor. Who's chasing you? A herd of monkeys? Please. Please, you must listen. Now, look. If you got troubles, come to my office in the morning. Tomorrow morning may be too late. I'm supposed to die tonight. Try, try breathing. You expand your chest. Take a lung full of air. No, no, I... Yeah, it does wonders. Keeps you around for days. You better get out of here. Please, Mr. Diamond, don't give me away. Please. Uh, yeah, baby. Uh, wait a minute. A duck under that desk. Oh, bless you, Mr. Diamond. Yes. Yeah. I thought I heard you talking to someone. Talking? Oh, no, no. Must have been reading out loud. This is swell literature. Mm, the case of the grizzly ghost. Oh. I like to keep up on the exploits of a private detective. You don't tell me anything about your cases. Oh, I'm modest. Hey, you got your coat on. Where are you going? Oh, Francis just called. He's had a flat tire. I'm going to pick him up in the other car. Uh, don't you want me to do it? Oh, I'm not going to let you out of this house. I'll be right back. Okay. Read the grizzly ghost. It's not bad. Bye, baby. Bye. Okay, Spider-Man, you can come out now. Oh, thank you. Now, what the devil's going on? I told you my life's in danger. I need help. Tell me about it. I haven't time now. Come to this address in about an hour. My name's Leeds. Leland L. Leeds. Oh, for Pete's sake. I must get back before they miss me. I don't want them to know I got out. Say I called you and told you to come over. Here's the address on this card. Please don't fail me, Mr. Diamond. Now, wait a minute. My fee's a hundred a day in expenses. Of course, of course. I'll have a check for you. Goodbye. He went out like an undertaker stealing a can of embalming fluid. And I poured myself something just about as strong. Helen would scalp me for leaving, but for some reason, nutty little guys like that interest me. I left Helen the note saying I'd be back later and took off to the address Leland L. Leeds had given me. It was out of town about ten miles, but after hunting around for a while and running up a good-sized taxi fare, I finally found the house. Yes? Uh, uh, yes. I, I, uh, I got a call from a Mr. Leeds at this address. He asked me to come over. My brother? I don't know. Well, it couldn't have been. He's very sick. He's upstairs sleeping. Well, he was just coasting off to Dreamland when he called me. I, uh, I think you'd better let me in. Oh, a detective. All right. Just, uh, what did my brother tell you, Mr.? Uh, Diamond. He said his life was in danger. I'm Nina Leeds. I think you'd better come into the living room, Mr. Diamond. Dr. Miller can explain things better than I can. Sure. Roger? Mm Hmm? This is Mr. Diamond. He's a detective. Oh? Lee just called him. This is Dr. Miller, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Doctor. How do you do? You from the police? No, no. Private stuff. Oh, I see. Oh, Mr. Diamond, I'm afraid you made a trip for nothing. Oh, here are the drinks. Uh... Oh. George, uh, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a private detective. What? Mr. Diamond, this is George Brodine. How are you? Oh, fine, thank you. Anything wrong? I don't know. Lee phoned Mr. Diamond and told him he was in danger. How did you know that, Doctor? I told Miss Leeds what he said, but not you. I'm Mr. Leeds' doctor. He's having a nervous breakdown and suffers from an extreme persecution complex. If he called a detective, I'm sure he must have said something like that. That's quite correct, Mr. Diamond. What do you do, Mr. Brodine? Why, I'm with the New York Museum. I'm a friend of the family. I've been watching Lee break up for the past month. Mm Mm-hmm. May I talk to your brother, Miss Leeds? I don't think you can. I gave him a very strong sedative. Let me get you a drink, Mr. Diamond. When Lee wakes up, you can talk to him. Sure. Hmm. 
We went into the bar, and she got out a big bottle and two glasses. I forgot all about Leland L. Leeds for a while and started uh, concentrating on his lovely sister. It was easy. Champagne? Uh, sure, but I've run out of slippers. I've got a small foot. Might take you a long time to get a nut. I drink fast. It's the open toes that bother me. I like the patter. Where'd you come from? Same place you did, lover. Experience Alley. What do people call you after they get to know you better? Oh, different things at different times. For now, you can call me Rick. And later? Oh, you'll think of something easier. It's like that when you haven't got much time to talk. Here's to later, Rick. Uh, yeah. What does a doctor specialize in? Roger's a brain specialist. Mental disorders, mostly. <coughs> it's Lee. He's off again. <coughs> Maybe he's been listening to Sam Spade. Come on. You'd better stay down here, Nina. I'll take care of it. I'm going up. Lee needs me. Uh, George, get my baggage in the hall. All right. You'd better not come in, Mr. Diamond. I think I'd better. <laughs> Lee. Lee. Lee, what is it? I saw the blood again. Oh, Mr. Diamond, I'm glad you came. Now, calm down, Lee. Everything's going to be all right. Get away from me. He thinks I'm insane. You all do. You want my idol and you stop at nothing. Now, there's no sense in this much self-indulgence. Uh, here's not... your bag, Roger. Thanks. What are you going to do? Just give you something to make you sleep. I don't want to sleep. I'll wake up and see the blood again. There's no blood. It's just your imagination. You're overwrought. You think I'm crazy. But I saw it. I tell you, I saw it. Now, this won't hurt. No, I... I, I don't want to sleep. Please, Mr. Diamond, help me. Lee, do what Roger tells you for my sake. Come on, come on, come on. The injection should take... Hold I'll get up. a minute. I, I wouldn't go to sleep. Lee, please. Then leave Mr. Diamond with me. I want to talk to him. Well, I guess it'll be all right. Don't stay too long, Mr. Diamond. I want him to rest. Okay, Doctor. Remember, he's not at all rational. Come on, Nina. I'll see you downstairs, Mr. Diamond. Hey, what's the idea, Leeds? I, I'm locking the door. I, I don't want anyone coming in. It, it, pardon me for walking around in circles. I've got to stay awake. Uh-huh. Those people downstairs are... Trying to drive me crazy. They must have been working overtime. And they're after my idol. Your what? My idol. That carved image standing on the night table. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Here. Here, look at it. Look at it. Well, that's dandy. How many box tops did you have to save? Mr. Diamond, at this moment, you are holding $100,000 in your hand. I am? Last month, my grandfather passed on and left his entire estate to my sister and me. Among the effects was that idol. It was left to me. What is it? Platinum? Oh, no. No, Mr. Diamond. That is the lost idol of King Tut. I always wondered what happened to it. Oh. Oh, then you know the legend. Well, uh, I'm a little, little hazy on it. Maybe you'd better bring me up to date. Oh, of course, of course. It was supposed to have been buried with King Tut. However, the story goes that a slave absconded with it before they sealed the tomb. And that makes it worth a hundred thousand? I guess so. Uh, you guess. You don't know? I only know what my grandfather told me before he passed on. He told me its value... And said there was a curse on it. Uh, what does it say? Crime doesn't pay? Well, Mr. Diamond, it seems that on the first night of the new moon, after one has gained possession of the idol, he will die. Next week, Tom Swift and his electric grandmother. You don't believe me. Oh, sure. No, you don't. You're just like the rest. But it may interest you, Mr. Diamond, to know that one month after the idol was uncovered and my grandfather gained possession, he died. It was a new moon. How old was he? Seventy-four. Oh, well, that couldn't be it. Now, relax and tell me why you came to me. What about your fee? Oh, forget it. You can just buy me a broom to ride around on. Good night, Mr. Leeds. Remember, Mr. Diamond, it's a new moon. You don't have much time. Oh, brother. Did you talk to her, Mr. Diamond? Uh, you might call it that. Now do you understand? Your point's well taken, Doctor. What about that hunk of stone? Maybe if you gave him a teddy bear? Oh, the idol he's got is absolutely worthless. His grandfather had the same unusual ideas about it. Is there such an idol? Well, there's a legend, but no one has ever found even the slightest clue that it's a fact. Now, I've examined Lee's idol, and it's certainly not worth more, oh, any more than the granite it's carved from. Hmm. Well, I'll be saying good night. I hope he gets better. Can I get you another drink, Mr. Diamond? You certainly deserve something for your trouble. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, goodbye, Doctor, Mr. Rodine. Thanks, Miss Leeds. I wish I could make this up to you. I'll uh, take a rain check. It'll be raining a lot this month. Uh, yeah. Well, good night, Miss Leeds. Good night. I went out and got a cab. 
As far as I was concerned, the frightened little man in the nightshirt was going to end up modeling straitjackets, and the private detective would only add to the confusion. It was 8 o'clock, and I told the cabbie to take me to 975 Park Avenue. Helen would be angry, but it was worth going back to. A couple of hours with her could make a guy as contented as a bear that had just cornered the honey market. We pulled up in front of Helen's apartment, and I paid the cabbie. I was just going in when a small convertible skidded to a stop in front of the building. Mr. Diamond! Mr. Diamond! It was Leland L. Leeds again, and you could still see part of the nightshirt under his top coat. He leaned out of the car window and called. Over here, Mr. Diamond. Please, I must talk with you again. I'd had enough of the jumpy little man with the idol, so I started into the apartment without answering. He called again, climbed out of the car, and started to cross the street toward me. I looked back just in time to see the other car swing in toward me. back into the street and looked after the disappearing car. The lights were off and I couldn't get the license number. It was too far away. I leaned down with the little man in the nightshirt. He was pretty far away, too. He was dying and hurt. Mr. Diamond? Yes, Leeds? Take the idol. When you left, I... I found out why it was worth all that money. They... They didn't want me to tell you, so... So they... They followed me and... And ran me, ran me down. It's... It's in my coat pocket. He died lying on his back in the street. Several people were coming out of the building, so I reached into his pocket and pulled out a chamois bag. I guess the idol was inside, so I put it in my coat and went in to call the police. Oh, Mr. Diamond, Miss Asher's been worried. Hello, Francis. Tell her I'm back and let me use the phone. Certainly, sir. She's upstairs. Is something wrong, sir? You look worried. Man got hit by a car. I've got to call the police. Oh, my goodness. Is he hurt badly? Bad enough to get buried. Oh, my goodness. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Otis, let me talk to the lieutenant. Is this Diamond? No, it's the Beaver Boys. Now put the lieutenant on the phone. And what do you do with all those tired jokes? You can't keep using them. I give them away to idiots. Want to start a collection? Oh. Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, this is Diamond. I got a body for you. I go off duty in 20 minutes. Call back then. Lying out in front of Helen's apartment, 975 Park. Rick, my stomach is bothering me. Why can't you be a good boy and stay out of trouble? Take some soda and get over here. Take some soda? Every time you call, I end up taking enough to give an elephant the hiccups. Well, you're a fine one. Oh, I'm sorry, Rick. I didn't know you were on the phone. Uh, wait a minute, Walt. Hello, baby. I'm talking to the lieutenant. Hmm. Aren't you afraid you'll catch cold in that thing? I'm mad at you. Oh, you're cute. Hey, what's going on? Uh, just Helen. If you could see her, your ulcers would start popping like chestnuts. Uh, say hello. Now, uh, the law will send you his greetings. Hello to the law. Uh, she says... I know. I heard it. Now, what about the stiff? His name's Leland L. Leeds. He got belted by a car. It was too far away to get the number. What makes you think it's a job for homicide? Get over here and Helen will give you the story. I've got some work to do. But uh, wait a minute, Rick. Oh, you're getting lazy. What's the matter? Don't you want to find out things for yourself? Rick, what happened? Francis told me some man got hit by a car. Right on your doorstep. Oh. Let's go into the other room, baby. I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> We went into the warm study and Helen poured me a tall drink. I briefed her on what had happened earlier in the evening and she sat down next to me. There's something about red hair that does things to me. It smelled fresh and clean and with her that close, I could have been sitting in the middle of the Arctic and still kept my temperature above 102. Rick, do you have to go back out there? Well, somebody's got to tell his sister and in a way, I feel a little responsible. Are you going to give her the idol? Hmm? The idol. The thing you took from poor Mr. Leeds' coat. You could at least show me what I'm playing second fiddle to. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I nearly forgot about it. Oh, here it is in the chamois bag. Oh, what an ugly little thing. And that's supposed to be worth all that money? Well, that was what leads, uh... Hey, something's missing. Yeah, one of the eyes. Must have come loose when the car hit him. Probably in the bag. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Rick! Yeah. It was painted over. You'd never guess it unless you pried it loose. Why, it's as big as a marble. Is it real? Well, you've got enough of them around, you tell me. It is. 
Rick, I think it's a pigeon blood. It's worth a fortune. What are you doing? I'm scratching the other one. Well, Mr. Leeds wasn't so squirrely after all. This is ridiculous. You only read about things like this. Two pigeon blood rubies. No wonder he thought it was worth $100,000. He said he found out tonight. He must have been scratching at them. Oh, then it wasn't just a hit and run. I don't know. Baby, I don't want to get hung up with a lot of explanations of Walt. Rick, what are you doing? Taking the other eye out. There. Now, now here. Hang on to these and don't let them get out of your little hot hand. When Walt gets up here, tell him what I've told you. Well, will you be back? An hour ago, I laughed at a little guy when he told me he was going to die. He said it was a full moon and he had a curse on him. I'm still a skeptic, but I'm a new boy when it comes to voodoo. I've got to hurry over there before the whole bunch of them turn into bats. I went down in the service elevator and out on the street. The wagon was driving off with Leeds, and Walt and Otis were going into the building when I slipped up to the convertible and got in. Leeds had left the keys in the ignition like I figured, so I took off and headed across town. Twenty minutes later, on a lonely stretch of road, I started counting suspects. All three of them could be in on it. Dr. Miller, who said Leeds was insane. George Brodeen, a man from the museum who said the idol was worthless. And that lovely sister. I didn't notice the car pulling up behind me until it was too late. It was doing a good 70, and as it swung around to pass me, the guy at the wheel cut in sharp and hit me broadside. Hey, look out! I went through a white fence and over an embankment. The car rolled, and somebody dropped the night on my head. I went to sleep. I don't know how long it was before I started coming around, but when I tried to shake myself back, it was like pulling my head out of a barrel of molasses. It stuck to my eyes and plugged up my ears. I tried to claw the stickiness away, but my hands were like two baseballs. I moved my shoulders and felt the stiffness in my back. It spread out to my hands and down to my feet. I opened my mouth and took in a lot of air. I finally made it. Someone was trying to get me from the highway, so I pulled myself clear of the wreck and started moving in a circle, keeping whoever it was at a good distance. I was too pushed around to put up a fight, so I made it back to the highway and walked along until I found a little gas station on the road. The joint ain't open. And then your lock's busted. No, it ain't. Then I floated through the wall. Where's your phone? It ain't for public use. Try isn't. Okay, wise guy, the joint isn't open. The phone isn't for public use. And you isn't so big you can't get tossed out on your face. And you isn't so wealthy, five bucks won't make a difference. Oh, why didn't you say so? Phone's on a wall. Thanks. You know the Leeds family? Yeah, they get gas here sometimes. Hello, Evergreen 34369 operator. How far is the house from here? I'm a little turned around. About a half a mile. Hello, Francis. Is Lieutenant Levinson still there? No? Well, just tell him to get out to 19319 Jackson Heights Boulevard. I've got a killer for him. Yeah, oh my goodness. Now hurry it up. You a cop? Shamus. What do you take for the use of your car for an hour? My wife would kill me. I'll drive you wherever you want to go. He gave me a lift in his old sedan, and ten minutes later I was ringing the doorbell to the Leeds house. I was glad the girl answered. She made me feel better right away. Oh, Mr. Diamond, come in. Oh, thank you. Where are your friends? Raj and George. They went out to look for my brother. He disappeared right after you left. I'm terribly worried. Oh, uh, have you got that drink? I could use it now. Certainly. I don't know why Lee ran off like that. He shouldn't have been driving in his condition. Were Roger and George together when they left to look for Lee? No, they took separate cars. Why? Has something happened, Mr. Diamond? Have you heard from my brother? I guess I'd better give it to you straight. Your brother's dead, Miss Leeds. I'm sorry. Dead? Oh, no. He was hit by a car. It's all because of that horrible idol. That stupid, horrible idol. If my grandfather hadn't told Lee it was worth that much money, this never would have happened. Did you think it was worth anything? No, of course not. But we couldn't convince Lee. Now he's dead. 
Would you please answer that, Mr. Diamond? Sure. You take it easy. <laughs> Nina, I... Oh, what are you doing here, Diamond? Did you find Lee? Why, no, no, I didn't. I've gone to every place I thought he could possibly be. I even looked up your address and went over there, but the building was closed. You better go in and see Miss Leeds, Doc. She's pretty upset. Upset? Nina, what's wrong? Oh, Raj, it's Lee. He's been killed. What? That's right. But how did it happen? Bingo. I'll tell you as soon as I let Mr. Brodine in. There, there, Nina. Just let yourself out. Do you do? Come in, Mr. Brodine. Uh, well, Mr. Diamond, what are you doing here? I think I'd better have a sign made. The doctor and Miss Leeds are in the living room. Has something happened? Mr. Leeds is dead. What? This is the most surprised household I've ever run into. Roger, is this true? I guess so. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Nina. Is there anything I can do? No. No, thank you. Where did this happen, Mr. Diamond? In front of 975 Park Avenue. Car hit him. I was with him when he died. Oh, this is terrible. I thought at first it was an accident, but I'm not sure. What do you mean? When I left to come out here, someone ran me off the road, nearly killed me. Who would want to kill Lee and then try to kill you? <laughs> probably a coincidence. Certainly, certainly. Probably just a drunk. Could have been. Lee gave me this before he died. A chamois bag. What's in it? The idol. Oh, that awful thing. What do you want done with it, Miss Leeds? I don't care. Just get it out of this house. What are you going to do? I don't know. You want the thing, Doctor? Why, what for? That's a good question. How about you, Brodine? You want it? Oh, well, what would I want a worthless piece of stone for? Well, as long as no one wants it, may I use this fire poker, Miss Leeds? What are you going to do with it? The idol is worthless. It's caused a lot of trouble for you and your family. I'm going to break it up. No! Give me that, George! Well, Brodine, you're sure getting grabby. All right, now all of you stay right where you are. Well, for a museum collector, that's a pretty modern gun. Yes, and I know how to use it. George! This is the hokiest case I've ever been on. Even the dialogue's bad. I suppose you think you're pretty clever making me show my hand like that. I read Gory Detective. I found that the idol was really worth all that money, but I had to make the killer tip himself. You did. Mr. Diamond, do you mean my brother was really right all along? In a way, yes. He believed what his grandfather had told him. But it wasn't until tonight when he scratched one of the eyes of the idol that he knew for sure. Scratched one of the eyes? That's right. Pigeon blood rubies painted over. Well, now I'm leaving you. Well, that's good, but you're minus something. Minus what? A couple of rubies. I took them out of the idol. You're lying. Take a look at the bag. What? They're gone. I'll kill you for this. Give me the gun, George. Look out. He's going to shoot. Give me the gun. All right, everyone. This is the police. He shot Diamond, all right, Lieutenant. Put the bracelets on him, Otis. Sure. Come here, you. Not him. Put him on Diamond for disturbing the peace. Pin the medal on the other guy. No, no, no. Sure no. thing. How do you like that, wise guy? <laughs> oh, no. Rick. Oh, I'm dying. Ricky. Oh. Rick, wake up. Uh, 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 all right, all right, George, drop the gun. Rick, you've been dreaming. Uh, oh, hello. Oh, you were having a big, fat nightmare. Oh. I came down from upstairs and you were asleep on the couch with gory detectives. Oh, well, well, I started reading some story and I got mixed up with the gypsy idols and the rubies. I got shot. That's the case of the ruby eyes. That was the craziest dream. I solved the crime and got shot six times for my trouble. Oh. <laughs> oh, Lieutenant Levinson and Otis came in and arrested me for disturbing the peace. After you were shot six times? Yeah. <laughs> Otis loved it. That wasn't in the magazine. I worked out my own ending. Move in. That's pretty. What are the lyrics? Well, uh, there are an awful lot of them. <laughs> I'll sing them. Okay. I'm sitting high on a hilltop. Oh, I remember that. Tossing all my troubles to the moon It's from Thanks a Million Where the breeze seems to say Don't you worry With Alice Pay. Things are bound to pick up pretty soon Here neath the sky on the hilltop Seems to me the world is all in tune I forget all the bustle and hurry Tossing all my troubles to the moon 
someone will love me and everything will be just grand. Just so the stars up above me continue doing business at the same old stand. It's mighty sweet in the evening when I've had a busy afternoon. Sitting high, high, high on a hilltop, tossing all my troubles to the moon. Sing it again, Rick. I'm sitting high on the hill. Oh, Rick, the grouch. Yeah, listen to that. Where the breeze seems to say, don't you worry. Hey. <laughs> how do you like that way, guy? Oh, that's really awful. Yeah, well, maybe you know how I feel when you open that big bazoo of yours. You mean I sound like you do? Look, Diamond, what do you think the rats keep jumping out of my window for? Well, maybe if you had some plastic surgery. <laughs> and your crummy jokes are as bad as your crummy singing. So please, save the world from a horrible fate and cut your throat or something. Oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you all about... Oh, I'm sitting high on a hilltop, tossing all my trouble. Hey, hey you! Shut up! We want to hear Diamond. Yeah, shut your big bazoo! Yeah, shut up! What's that? You heard us. We want to hear Mr. Diamond. Oh, no, no. Rick. Yeah, my dear public. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Peter Leeds, Yvonne Patey, Stephen Dunn, and Jack Crucian. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. <laughs> now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC tomorrow? Detective Story fans will want to hear Madeline Carroll and Basil Rathbone in the detective melodrama The Amazing Dr. Clitterhouse tomorrow on Theater Guild on the Air. And for more detecting, listen tomorrow for The Adventures of Sam Spade. He'll present his most humorous caper of the season. Yes, you'll enjoy both Theater Guild and Sam Spade tomorrow on NBC. Next, it's Free Ride to Danger with Dorothy McGuire on NBC. Portions of the following are transcribed. Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Is this the Diamond Detective Agency? Yeah. Down, up, round, and down. Mr. Diamond, I presume? Yes, and maybe no. Down, up, round, and round. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand you. Uh, yes, I'm Diamond, and you're not presuming on me, not if you're a client. Well, no, that's not what I mean. What is that object you're playing with? Uh, this? This is a yo-yo. You make it go down, up, round, and down. See? Uh, yes, yes. But, but I came in on business, Mr. Diamond. I want to hire you. Just drop it like this. Down, up. As a detective. Oh. Well, a hundred a day in expenses, and I throw in the yo-yo lessons free. Get me the Mr. Diamond. Are you in business? Do you have the hundred a day? I do. I am. That's fine. Your name? Oh, I, I can't tell you that. Goodbye. <laughs> Will you kindly put that thing away? 
I have a terrible head. Oh, I don't know. It's not so bad. Carve it yourself. Why, you insufferable... Now, wait a minute. Until we've had a formal introduction, the word insufferable is your ticket for a new set of dentures. Now, why don't we get formal and save your gums that lonely feeling? I told you my name is not important. That I believe, but let's kick it around anyway. Is that necessary? Look, look, you said you wanted to hire me. So either tell me your name or what you want me to do, or let me get back to my practicing. Uh, I, I should find another detective, but you came highly recommended, so... All right. Uh, you can call me, uh, Johns. Other wife? What? Forget it. The initials on your briefcase read J.B. Oh, oh, that, uh, it's one I borrowed. So, now that I've conquered your coyness, what's the pitch? Pitch? Oh, oh, you mean my assignment. Oh, it's very simple, but first, I must insist that no word of this conversation leaves your office. So far, no one would believe it anyhow. But my ethics are in good order, Mr. Johns. Good, good. This must be kept very secret. Shall I pull down the blinds and stuff the keyhole? Oh, that shan't be necessary, thank you. Your secret is... Uh, murder, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I just knew you were going to say that. Where's the corpse? Uh, the corpse? Oh, that's what I came to you for. I want to have professional advice on every angle before I kill. Now, you've had police experience. Uh, I... unless my hearing aid's on the blink, you're saying you want to commit a murder. Oh, not want. I'm going to. This evening. Oh. What do you want me for? The victim? Oh, I have the victim. The opportunity. Method. Uh, and the man to handle the, uh, uh, details. However, I want to be sure that I'm not tripped up by my lack of foresight to police procedures. Uh, sure, 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 yeah. Uh... Whom are you calling? The police, but you'll probably get sent to Bellevue. Mr. Diamond, your ethics. Ethics about concealing or helping a murder are free passage to Sing Sing. The phone. Put it down quickly. Oh, my. Isn't that shiny? A real gun. Those things are illegal, you know. Must you shake it so much? Uh, oh, uh, sorry. I, I'm a little nervous. Oh, swell. You're nervous. Uh, quiet, quiet. I'm thinking. This visit has obviously been an error. But perhaps not a fatal one. Let's see. I have it. Into the closet. What? With my bicycle, it'll be too crowded. Your bicycle? Or oh, my exercise bicycle. That's my, there's my rowing board and oh, my, my be weight. Oh, be quiet. Stop walking. Oh, this is ridiculous. Now open that door. Oh, okay. Uh, now that bicycle. It has a seat? Well, yes. Sit on it. So the Diamond Detective Agency sat in the stuffy closet listening to the sound of the desk being pulled over and jammed against the door. Not having anything better to do except call myself names, I rode. On my fifth lap around the world, I gave birth to a brainchild and began applying the art of leverage against the blockaded door using both legs and the flat of my back. Result? A charley horse. On the third lap following, I came up with something more substantial. A heavy barbell. Four smashes and three torn ligaments later, the thin door collapsed over the desk blocking it. I picked my way over the debris, trying to focus my eyes to the light. By instinct, more than sight, I found the phone. But as I reached to pick it up, I suddenly realized I was shaking hands with someone. Back up, Diamond. Oh, this is getting ridiculous. All my clients waving guns at me. I'm no client, Diamond. Mr. Johns wants I should keep your company for a while. Oh, well, you're a small one. This gun makes me a big one, Diamond. Real big. That's why my nickname is Big Man, even though I'm only four feet tall. Well, oh, maybe I could help you. I've got a lot of exercise things. Be funny or shut up. How about a few yo-yo lessons? <laughs> Say, it's very funny. Shut up. Big Man, what would happen if I took that gun away from you? You want to try? Uh, I was giving it a thought. But on second thought, uh, no. Yeah, smart Shamus. I can empty this magazine in your stomach before you make two steps. It... Rick, I... Oh, I didn't know you had a client. Take it easy, Diamond. I got a gun in my pocket. Uh, the, uh, H Helen. Helen, baby, come in. Uh, uh, meet big man McCarthy, an old, old pal from PS69. Big man, this is, uh, Miss Asher. Oh, yes, delighted, Mr. McCarthy. Hey, same here, chick. Say, pal, you got good taste. Some built. <laughs> Such a flatterer. Rick, what happened to your closet? Uh, the termites broke my non-aggression pact. Uh, what's on your mind, baby? Well, I came to see if you were ready for the benefit tonight. You are, aren't you? Oh, well, am I? Just watch this new yo-yo trick. They call it round the world. Oh, wonderful. Oh, Rick, you know so many things. Where'd you learn that? A PS 69, of course. Where else? Mr. McCarthy. Do it again, Rick. I want to see how you do it. Sure, baby, just watch. You take it in your hand like this and throw it out like this. <laughs> oh, Rick, you struck that poor little man. No. 
Well, that poor little man had a big nasty gun in his pocket and it was pointed right at my breakfast. Why, that horrible little... Why didn't you hit him harder? He might have hurt you. Oh, darling, are you sure you're all right? Uh, I'm sure, baby. Well, you send for the police. He should be behind... Now, look, Helen, this is my department. You'll go along with your errands. Rick, he's dangerous. Helen, will you go away? I have a few questions I want to ask this little hood, and you'll be of no help, believe me. Well, all right, but you be careful. Oh, and uh, about tonight. It's not at my apartment, but the park is penthouse up above in the same building. Now, come early and help Francis and me get things ready. Stop pushing. I'll see you tonight, baby. Oh, Rick. Are you sure I can't stay? Go, scat. Now, for you, Mr. Big Man. Come here. Wake up. Wake up. The mule train went that way. Come on, come out of it. Ah, that's you, huh? Yeah, me. Now, what's the real name of your boss? Who's he going to kill? You can't stop the questions, Diamond. I'm not going to talk. You want me to wring it out of you like a wet wash? Who is Mr. Johns? You know, there's a big advantage in being a little diamond. Yeah, you can hide under smaller rocks. <laughs> Who's your boss? There's another advantage, too. A man my size can be awfully hard to catch. What? Hey, come back here. Charlie. <laughs> he never looked so good. Shut up, Otis. He's really been worked over. Wonder what gang did this to him. Rick. Rick, snap out of it. Oh, oh. Rick, what happened? Oh, just came through the door. Oh, what? Coming through the door couldn't wreck you like that. Oh, without opening it? You mean... Oh, no. You got that shiner by running into the door? <laughs> Shut up, Otis. Okay, Rick, where's the body? Uh, beside you. Now, that's Otis. I mean, where's the corpse? Uh, the corpse isn't a corpse yet. Otis, get my bicarbonate. Hey, Yellowtooth. Go on, Rick. The corpse isn't a corpse. Tell me, what is it? A ghost? Exactly. Otis? Hey, hey Yellowtooth. Mm. Now, Rick, do me a favor. Please tell me what you're talking about. Oh, you aren't trying, Walt. All I said was that the corpse isn't a corpse yet and that it's a ghost because I don't know who's going to be the corpse. Rick, before I go stark raving mad, will you tell me what you're talking about? Well, a man came into my office this morning said he was going to commit a murder threw a gun on me when I started to call you. Locked me in a closet. I broke out only to find he left this little man, big man, the midget who just ran out of here. Stop, please. So Helen came in. I turned the tables on big man. She left. I asked questions, drew a blank. Big man started to run. Why didn't you nab him? He ran through the door. I ran into it. You're up to date. <laughs> I'm up to date. Get him. I'm up to my ears in confusion. So we've got a man who's going to murder someone. All right, what's his name? He said Johns, but it's a phony. Initials on his briefcase read J.B. Uh, say, Shamus, what do you look like? Uh, Otis, do you have a son? Oh, you know I don't. Well, that's what he looked like. Rick, are you sure this J.B. is planning to kill someone tonight? Well, if he isn't, he sure took a lot of pains for nothing. Let's get down to headquarters. I want to check the files. Well, okay, but we don't keep files on ghosts. Well, by the way, why did you come up here? Helen called. Said you were holding a pigeon for us. Oh, lovely girl. I'll say... Can I have a dance with her at the benefit tonight? Uh, no, Otis. I think i better fix you up with Francis. Swell. Otis, you gravel-head Francis is a butler. Oh, it's all right, Lieutenant. I like them foreign dames. Well, that's all the pictures, Walt. I've looked them all. Johns doesn't have a record, neither does a big man. Yeah, they wouldn't. The one time we get a chance to stop a murder before it's committed, and we've even got a good description of the potential killer. Well, this... this J.B. was no bum. Not even an ordinary working man. His clothes are expensive, and the briefcase he carried probably cost more than your weekly salary. Now, it's an even bet he belongs to the social upper crust. That or close to it. Well, that would narrow the field a lot, but still... How I... about the newspapers, Walt? They have society reporters who know anyone who is anyone... It's a long shot, but name, name me a better. You can go through the newspaper logs. They might have a picture of Oh, something. no, no, Walt, no pictures. I'm nearly blind from looking at pictures now. Thanks, but I'll try the reporters with a description. You sounds like you're going to search for a needle in a haystack. Oh, Otis, please, your cliché is showing. Ah, uh, that's screwy. You can't kid me. Only dames wear clichés. How could mine be showing? Sergeant, when you die, will your brain to a clinic? Maybe they'll discover a cure for it. Ah, oh, lay off. Besides, I got a good idea for your investigation. I wouldn't miss hearing this for my next two issues of Batman. 
Yeah, I was thinking you could maybe save a lot of time if you got an artist to draw a picture from your description. They do it in all the movies and catch crooks easy. Otis, how would you like a transfer hey, to Walt. Staten? Wait a minute, wait a minute. He may have an idea. I know where there's an artist who could sketch J.B. from a description. It's crazy, but you may as well try it, Rick. Otis, you can drive him there. Uh, uh, Lieutenant. Uh, tell him yes, Walt. I can't stand to see him cry. All right, Otis. You can use the siren. <laughs> Come on, Otis. It's right at the head of the stairs. Uh, who is this guy? Her uh, name's Vladimir, and be careful. He's temperamental. Oh, that's okay. I've been vaccinated. What, what, what? Open up, Vladimir. Runga Go away. My name's Patrick O'Brien. It's Diamond, not the landlord. Comrade, come in. Stalin. No, Vladimir, that's Sergeant Otis. Oh, what a startle he gave me. Uh, Vladimir, can you sketch a man's face from a description? Can I sketch a man's face from a description? Can I sketch... Did I not once sketch the whole Russian army and with one pencil? Okay, Vladimir, but can you do it? Comrade, you doubt it? I am the greatest artist that's impossible. I can draw... Uh, Comrade, you are paying cash money. Cash money? Oh, for that I can draw you Siberia and never miss a salt mine. I'm such a genius, I can't stand myself. Another man, Vladimir. Can you sketch the man's face? I think so. Okay, but make it fast. I'll give you the general idea and correct you as you go. Corrections you can make. One criticism, I go back to my chef cream signs. Come with me to my hizzle. <laughs> Almost, Vladimir, but the nose still isn't quite right. Make it look a little more like a pickle. Sweet? Dill. Off that side, just a pinch. Oh, like this? Yeah, yeah, you've done it. That's him. Ah, how much do I owe you? For you, comrade, hundred dollars. What? Fifty dollars. A buck. S sell my genius for a buck? <laughs> I die first. A buck and a quarter. Comrade, please, I'm a capitalist now. A buck and a half. Last price. I wouldn't get... Last, pr last price, I take it. But I may die. If you do, give me a call. It's a good job, Vladimir. Of course. Was I not the artist to sketch the Tsar himself? Of course, it didn't pay so well, but it was great honor. Looks pretty fuzzy to me. Comrade Diamond, your patronage I appreciate. But if you must bring along this peasant, don't. Even his face makes me sick with the repulse. Uh, Otis, come on. You'll have to pardon him, Vladimir. Whenever his shoelaces come untied, his brain slip out. See you later. Oh, Chichornia, comrade. When we left Vladimir, I sent Otis back to Walt and took off for the newspapers. I showed the sketch to one society reporter after another and watched so many heads shake, my eyes began to cross. It was 6.30 when I finished playing Quizmaster, and there was no use kidding myself. I had struck out. I had to tell Walt, so I started for the 5th Precinct. I was at a point where I'd have hocked my social security for 30 seconds with a little big man. Then as I walked down the street, I suddenly felt the nerves in my spine jump down into the pit of my stomach and goose pimples skidded up my back like scared rice. It was a feeling I'd had before. So without turning, I headed for the steps of a basement apartment. <laughs> Well, I got my meeting with Big Man all right. And it came within inches of being a vamp into a Gabriel solo. Big Man apparently thought his shots hit pay dirt. But when I peeked over the top of the stairs, he was in his car and going. I took in the torn knees of my pants, said a few messages to the spirit world that would have barred me from any seance, and hauled what was left of the Diamond Detective Agency to see Walt Levinson. Well, you can have it, Walt. This is getting ridiculous. Beating my brains out, getting shot at, and for what? Shot at? That's right. I said shot at. You can have the whole stupid mess. I like to get fees for playing post office with slugs. And if a guy gets killed, call me. I'll help with the embalming. But, but... Oh, but nothing. 
It's 7 o'clock, and I'm not sticking around to split a three-way crying job over a killing that may already have happened. I'm going to Helen's and get a drink. Oh, all right. Go ahead, Rick. There's nothing more you can do anyhow. I'll see you later. All right. And you stop looking like a panda with a bellyache, Otis. No, what did I do? Oh, shut up. Uh, hey, where are you going? I'm going out and punch the first little guy I can find right in the nose, just on general principles. I left the precinct and headed for Helen's party. I remembered that the benefit was being held in the penthouse and went on up. I was surprised to find Helen's butler, Francis, opening the door. Good evening, Mr. Depp. Oh, my, did you have an accident? This day has been an accident, Francis, but if you mean my clothes, I was playing spin the bottle with a bulldozer. You do look a little battered, if I may say so, sir. You ought to see the bulldozer. What are you doing opening the door up here? Oh, the Parker's butler was taken ill, sir. As I was helping Miss Asher with the decorations anyway, I remain to take his place for this evening. Is she here? Yes, yeah, yeah, she's in the living room, sir. Thanks, I'll go on in. Hello, baby. What? Hit you a bus? Just the door and the sidewalk. The bus I get later. Oh, Rick. And just look at your suit. It's ruined. Now, what's with the concern over my suit? You lobbying for my tailor? I wanted you to look your very best tonight. Here, let me see those knees. Come on, sit over here. That's it. No. Oh, well, they're not as bad as I thought. Oh, cheer up. Maybe they'll get infected. That'll help. Who did this to you, Rick? Our sweet little friend of this morning, Big Man, or I should say his boss, J.B. He's the one who sent Big Man after me. J.B.? A specter sent to haunt me for my past sins. He hired the little killer you saw me sock with my yo-yo. Your yo-yo? Oh, you haven't lost your yo-yo, have you? Oh, Helen, baby, your Ricky's nearly been killed. Must you worry about my yo-yo? I'm sorry, but it is all right. In my pocket, here. See? Good as new. Oh, that's fine. Now, what about this J.B. person? Why did he send Big Man to kill you, Rick? Because I know he's going to commit a murder tonight. Maybe doing it right now. Wait a minute. You said Big Man. Did you let him go this morning? Uh, yeah, yeah, I let him go. And I've worn my feet off up to my eyebrows trying to find out who his boss is and who's on the spot to get knocked off. Oh, poor Ricky. I wish I could help you. It's not me that needs help now. I quit. It's the guy J.B. is after. J.B., uh... Are those his real initials? Yeah. No, we've had lots of things to go on. Initials, descriptions, even a sketch of him. Here, I've got it in my pocket for all the good it did. Oh, wait, don't tear it up. Let me look at it. Oh, Rick, silly. This is no murderer. That's a sketch of Johnny Blackwell. It's a... Helen, you know who this man is? Of course. It's Johnny Blackwell from Newport. He and his wife are up here visiting Adam Worcester. Rick, what is it? You're... You're all turning blue. All day long, I... When you were in my office, you could... Oh, if I'd only asked Helen... Yes, Rick? Give me some cyanide, no water. Oh, but you must be mistaken about the sketch. Johnny Blackwell can't be a murderer. Well, I'm getting out of here. Where can I find him? If you'll just sit still, he'll come to you. Adam Wister's bringing him and his wife to the benefit tonight. <laughs> Well, that's the way the screwy world works sometimes. One minute you're on your uppers, with a stick of baloney, you're trying to hold off three guys with swords, and Kismet makes a switch and tags your side for a gain in your living. I called Walt to pass on the good news, and in eight and a half minutes by the clock, he joined me with Sergeant Otis in the kitchen from where we could peek out at the growing crowd. Let me take a look, Rick. Has Blackwell come in yet? Uh, stay back. I'll let you know. Otis. Get out of that ice box. Oh, I'm hungry. You heard me. Oh, there's fried chicken, Lieutenant. Fried chicken? Mm, I haven't had... Oh, that's... Oh. Walt, Walt, come take a look. There's Blackwell. Where? Over there, just sitting down. The man with the sandy hair. Yeah, yeah, I see him. Who are those people with him? Well, the woman must be his wife. Oh, but get a load of the little weasel. That's Big Man, the guy who got away from me this morning. Oh, and the other man? Must be Adam Wister. Helen said he was bringing the Black Wolves. Well, he did. So now we wait for the play. Well, we waited and watched the Black Wolf party settle down to enjoy itself. Big Man acted like he hadn't eaten for a week and made hors d'oeuvres vanish in his mouth like marbles down a manhole. 
After what seemed like weeks, the situation grew, suddenly took shape. On Blackwell's urging, Big Man rose to dance with Mrs. Blackwell. Mrs. Blackwell was a dark-haired honey with curves right out of one of my better dreams. But my mind was on her husband and Worcester. As soon as they had the chance, they got up and headed out of the room. Watch them, Rick. They're headed for the library. Come on, this way. Through this door and down the hall. Well, Adam, it's nice to be visiting you again. Well, glad to have you, Johnny. We're sorry to hear about your losses in the market last year. The story here was that you were cleaned out. Hey, Diamond, what's he saying? Shut up, old Oh, I still have a little money, Adam. In fact, I'd like to buy back in with you as a partner. You don't have that much, Johnny. And your wife won't give it to you. She may, Adam. She may, and quicker than you think. Walt, come on. We picked the wrong victim. Let's find the big man. Hey, it's nice on the terrace, Mrs. Blackwell. Yeah, real nice out here. I don't like it. It's chilly. Oh, it'll warm up, Mrs. Blackwell. No, I'm going back in. Better not. I don't like the way you're acting, big man. Get out of my way. Get back and shut up. How dare you talk to me like that, you little... Now I'm big, Mrs. Blackwell, real big. (gasps) A gun? What in the world? I'm gonna kill you. Kill me? Yeah. Only it'll look like an accident. Why, this is ridiculous. What kind of a joke is this? <laughs> it's no joke, Mrs. Blackwell. Your husband don't think it's no joke. He wanted me to tell you he was real sorry. Now I'm going to kill you. You mean it. You really mean it. Yeah, sure, Mrs. Blackwell. Mr. <gasps> Blackwell needs your dough. Bad. Back up. He can have it, all of it. Only don't kill me, don't. Sorry, Mrs. Blackwell, too no. late. Now start back. Please, please. Over to that wall. You're going to play Humpty Dumpty. Oh. That's right. Now oh, get up no. on the wall. No. I'm a guy who's willing to help you. Me too. Diamond, why you... Catch the girl, Walt. Big man's mine. He he was going to kill me. All right, Mrs. Blackwell. Take her inside, Otis. Rick, you okay? Yeah, getting my hands on this little rat was better than a year's vacation. Well, we sure heard enough to give both him and Blackwell a long vacation on the state. Keep him on ice. I'll collect the other one. I'll be delighted. Uh, Oh, my joy. Oh, waking up... Uh... What a shame. (laughs) What a lovely party. I do love these informal get-togethers, don't you, big man? It was short but very sweet, the wind-up of the no-one-was-murdered case. The score was the kind to make you forget you didn't get a fee. Two killers caught no victims. When I saw Walt take the little big man, not so big without his gun, and his boss Blackwell off to the Bastille, my worries melted like a snowman in a blast furnace. And speaking of melting, the lovely Mrs. Blackwell showed signs of being upset. So, what could I do but console the pretty little thing? Oh, Mr. Diamond, I think you were so wonderful and brave. Oh, you show a few nice points yourself, Mrs. Blackwell, and call me Rick. You saved my life, Rick. And call me Rita. You can get to the point quick. Why, Rita? Oh, there you are, Mrs. Blackwell. I know you must be terribly upset. Oh, Rick has been a great comfort to me. I'll bet he has. But I've arranged for Francis to take you home. Uh, now. Now? Oh, well, thank you, Miss Asher. And Rick. Yes? Don't worry about the name calling. Just say, hey, you. I'll know what you mean. I think I know what you mean. By you. Well? So help me, I'm innocent. With lipstick on your collar? That Otis. I've warned him to be careful with my shirts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, time for my yo-yo act? Your act. I... Oh, Rick, uh, about that... No, no, no. Look, I've worked my finger to the bone practicing. Don't tell me. Why, well, you specifically asked me to be here tonight. I... I know. And come on with me over to the bandstand. Oh, no. No, you don't. I'm an artist tonight, not a singer. No sing, no yo-yo. You mean if I sing, I can do my yo-yo act? If you make it pretty. Uh, it's blackmail, but I'll do it. Well, you stay right here. I want to talk to the orchestra leader. Okay, I'll practice. Well. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Richard Diamond, his piano, and his yo-yo. <laughs> Sing good, Rick. Like a robin with a sponsor. Are the stars out tonight? I don't know if it's cloudy or bright. 
Because I only have eyes for you, dear. The moon may be high, but I can't see a thing in the sky. Because I only have eyes for you. I don't know if we're in a garden Or on a crowded avenue You are here, so am I Maybe millions of people go by But they all disappear from view And I only have eyes for you. And now Mr. Diamond will present an exhibition of dexterity. Now? Now. Oh, no, Shamus, no. You're doing it all wrong. You gotta use my wrist action. Oh, the start of the act. Oh, come on, let me show you. Here, give it to me. Now you you start it down like this. <laughs> Alan. Yes, Rick. He's better. Uh, let's go home and Nick. Wait till I get my hat. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Hans Conried, Grace Albertson, Sidney Miller, and High Everback. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions of the program were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. (coughs) Now this is Tal Avery inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Saturday night is packed with entertainment when you stay tuned for NBC's star lineup of shows. There's always a program of interest on NBC. Now stay tuned for Edward G. Robinson and the Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Portions of the following program are transcribed. As Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Is uh, this the Diamond Detective Agency? Well, what does the sign on the door say? Yeah, uh, Diamond Detective Agency. And take a guess. Uh, are you Mr. Richard Diamond? It depends. How much does he owe you? Uh, 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 nothing. You just want to speak to him? I do. You come as a client? Yes, I do. You have a hundred a day in expenses? Yeah, I do. Then I now pronounce this man and client. Your name, please? Uh, my, my name's Thomas Jason. The stockbroker? <laughs> you better pay cash. Oh, I, I'm retired now, Mr. Diamond. And to end this uh, nonsense, here's your hundred dollars. Oh, thank you. Now, what's your trouble? Uh, it's Carol, uh, my adopted daughter. We adopted her when she was twelve, but my wife died shortly after. Frankly... Carol has been trouble ever since. And now? Uh, now, I- I'm afraid it is no longer a matter of delinquency. I, uh, yeah. Well, there have been several incidents that make me suspect that she's trying to do away with me. Oh, sweet girl. What's her reason? Uh, my money. In my will, she is my only heir. 
Why not change the will? I, I said I suspected her, but I'm not certain, Mr. Diamond. And you understand, it would be terrible to disinherit her if I am wrong about my suspicions. I, I, I simply must be sure before I change my will. Do you have any idea of your suspicion? Uh, yes. Yes, yes. This morning I did speak to her. They mentioned the possibility of cutting her from my will. She flew into a rage, made several terrible threats. Uh-huh. What do you want me to do? Uh, well, sir, I want you to... Oh, excuse me. Diamond Detective Agency, we have the only corpse with a lie-down design. Oh, Rick. Why don't you answer the phone right? Okay, Helen, baby. Diamond Detective Agency, Mr. Richard Diamond speaking. What? See, it throws you. Uh, uh, Mr. Diamond. Uh, honey, I'll see you tonight. I've got a client. She? He. Good. Bye. Uh, you were saying, Mr. Jason, before I was so nicely interrupted... Yes, I, I want you to either prove my fears to be true or groundless. If I am right... I will change my will, of course. Where do I start? Uh, Come to my house at three this afternoon. Here's the address. I'll introduce you to my stepdaughter, Carol, as a business acquaintance. After you've met and talked with her, I'll give you what details I have about her threats and actions. Okay, Mr. Jason, I'll be at your place at three this afternoon. Uh, Good day, Mr. Diamond. I checked the time and found it to be nearly twelve, so I beat it out to grab a bite of food before the noon rush began. Cafes in downtown Manhattan at lunchtime can only be compared to a can of sardines after all their relatives move in. When I had down my daily bread, I went back to the office, did a little washing, and found myself with still time to kill. So being interested in my new client's problems and always liking a clear view of a new case, I dropped in at the 5th Precinct to see what Lieutenant Levison had on the Jason family. When I walked into the squad room, I found Sergeant Otis tilted back in his chair with his number 14s crossed on the desk in front of him. From the sounds he was making, he was either sleeping or gargling with molasses. Sergeant Otis. Oh, boy. Sergeant Otis. Some dog. Otis, wake up. Oh, what? Oh. Oh. Oh, it's you, Shamus. Patrol leader Diamond with his stout-hearted brownies, who are shocked by your dreams. Shame on you. Hey, how'd you know I was dreaming about a dame? I peeked. Mm. You know, I think I'll tell the lieutenant that you were sleeping on the job. Well, oh, oh, no, please don't do that, Shamus. He'll start me pounding a beat again. Please don't tell him. Well, maybe I'll let you off the hook, but only if you tell Walt we're pals. That might stop him from giving me the devil about ribbing you. Pals? You mean friends? Buddies. Oh, no, I couldn't stand it. Hello, Walt. Okay, so where's the body? Nobody. You lost one? Now you stop that. Well, get you. All bad because I can't find a body for you. Oh, please, Rick. What do you want? I just wanted any dope you might have on the Thomas Jason family. Jason? Yeah, the broker. Oh, oh nothing on him, but plenty on his stepdaughter, Carol. Like what? Oh, she's a regular. Usually D&D, drunk driving, disturbing the peace. You want to see the file? Yeah, I might be worth a look. Uh, have my pal Otis bring it in. Sure, up. I... You what? My pal. What did you know? It isn't I have friends. (laughs) Is that why he tries to hide under the desk every time he sees you coming? Call him in. See for yourself. You think I won't? Otis, get the file on Carol Jason. Bring it in here. Uh, Yeah, Lieutenant. (laughs) Now we'll see. Friend, (laughs) that's a laugh. (laughs) That's a laugh yourself. You better be feeling good. What do you mean by that? You'll see. Uh, Yeah, Lieutenant, here's the file. I'll take it, Otis. Thank you very much. Sergeant Otis, you have an opportunity to do me a great favor. Please, and without profanity, tell me what you think of Rick. Oh, he's nice. What? You're turning blue, Walt. I'll turn blue if I want to. What did you do to Otis? Dope him? You heard him. He thinks I'm nice. We're pals, buddies. I heard him all right, but I wouldn't believe it on the stack of police manuals. Otis, I'll give you one chance. What's this all about? The Shamus told you, Lieutenant... I think he's a swell like a great guy. Thank you, Otis, my friend. Uh, always kidding, but a good pal. Otis, do your feet ache? My feet? Why, no, Lieutenant. Well, they will. I'm sending you to a beat. A beat? Yes, and Yonkers. Oh, no! I went through the file on Carol Jason and found out Walt hadn't been kidding. She'd been picked up for everything from kicking dogs to slugging her boyfriend with a champagne bottle. Real nice girl. 
I left Walt trying to third degree the truth out of Otis and headed for what I hoped would be a nice, easy case. In a few minutes, I was in front of my client, Jason's house, on East 66th Street. It turned out to be a modest little shack of some 30 rooms with a brownstone cover. I was ushered in to wait in the library for Thomas Jason. But I got a surprise. Mr. Diamond? Well, now I'll bet you're Carol. Your stepfather's told me so much about you. You're a friend of my stepfather's? Well, uh, you might say we have things in common. Where is he? I'm afraid you can't see him, Mr. Diamond. You see, he's become quite ill. Oh, ill so quickly? I talked to him a few hours ago. He's about as sickly as Paul Bunyan. Mr. Diamond, will you please leave? Not until you tell me what happened to Jason, where he is and why I can't see him. Get out. Do you hear me? Get out. Oh, put a cork in it, honey. Your father suspected trouble. Apparently, it came quicker than he thought. Me, I want to know all your little secrets. Just who are you? Policeman? Private policeman, dear. Your father hired me this morning. Well, I'm firing you this afternoon. Father's ill and I will not allow him to be disturbed. He paid me for a day's work. Tomorrow you can fire me. Is he here? No. Now, will you get out or do I call the real police? No, oh, maybe you'd better, dear. There's a smell around here that isn't a room full of roses. Oh, all right. If it's going to save trouble, I will tell you this much. Father had a serious mental condition. This afternoon, a couple of hours ago, he had an attack. And I was forced to have him taken to a place where he could be treated properly. With what? Embalming fluid? Why, you insulting. Where was he taken? Who's the doctor? I think I've answered all the questions I need to, Mr. Diamond. My actions are entirely legal. If you persist in your insinuations, I shall see that your license is revoked and that you are charged with defamation of character. Oh, get you. You've been reading up on the law, and I bet I know why. All right, dear. I'll leave now. Go on, and don't come back. Temper, temper, temper. I'm going, but we'll see each other again. Uh, hello, Pop. Got a minute? Yeah. You reckon so, Misty? What's on your mind? Oh, questions. Like how long you've been out here mowing the lawn? Uh, most of the day. Why? Did you uh, see Mr. Jason leave? Oh, sure. Left in an ambulance, he did. He was wearing a funny white coat with the arms tied in back. Oh, my fashion certainly changed. You didn't notice any name on the ambulance, did you? Well, as a matter of fact, I did, mister. Oh, my, it was a silly name. About the silliest I've ever heard of. Oh, the name, Pop. What was it? Oh, don't be in such a dang rush. It was uh, Home Sweet Home Rest Home. Oh, no. Ain't that silly? I don't think my client agrees with you. If he was taken there for a rest, it may be a permanent one. Next stop, a drugstore with a phone book. Said book gave me the address, and I was soon in Baychester, looking at something pretty swank in the way of nuthouses. Home Sweet Home was two acres of lawn, trees, and a square white blockhouse, and all surrounded by 15 feet of spiked steel fencing. By this time, the setup was really beginning to smell, and I decided that maybe a shamus might not be welcome. So for a moment, I stood by the big gate debating how I could get in. The answer was fairly simple. I rang the bell. It caused a huge character wearing a white jacket with arms like hairy telephone poles to appear. Yeah. What can I do for you, mister? Now, let me in. Why? This is a rest home, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I want to rest. Oh, funny. Beat it. I want to speak to the doctor, King Kong. Is he in? Maybe, maybe not. Who wants him? I do. Who are you? Uh, let's just say I'm a patient. You want to keep me out here dying of schizophrenia? Dr. Thorne is busy now. Come back later. Look, in one minute I start throwing fits... Think how that'll ruin your trade. Yeah, the doc wouldn't like that. Maybe you had better come in. Now, that's right neighborly of you, friend. Wow. Nice place. For nuts? Please. I'm a patient, remember? So, if you're a nut, I should care. If you ain't, why should you? Now, that's a homely bit of philosophy. Tell me, what do you do here? Break skulls? I don't think I like you. And I'm a nurse. What a shock this will be to Dr. Kildare. I don't know him. Now, you wouldn't. His nurses are pretty. If he had to have you as a nurse, he'd quit medicine and take up playing the glockenspiel. Well, you're nuts. Wait here. i get the doctor. Yes, nurse. Dr. Thorne, you got a patient, I think. All right, Brazo. 
I am Dr. Thorne, sir. What can I do for you? He's not stuck. Be quiet, Brazo. Oh, he's right, Doc. I, I'm nuttier than a squirrel's hideout. Well, I'm afraid I can be of no assistance, uh, Mr. Promise you won't tell? Is I promise? I am Sherlock Holmes. What? H O L. I can spell. I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place, Mr. Holmes. This is a private sanitarium, and certain procedures must be followed. I have money, I can pay, and I want to stay here. But, Mr. Holmes, you must be examined by a doctor and committed by a relative. You're a doctor? Examine me. But your relative, you you can't commit yourself. Why not? I demand my rights. Oh, this is preposterous. This is not a hotel. You can't just come in and register. Tell me, who's your doctor? Where is your home? Well, look, look. Tell you what, you let me stay here for the day and I'll tell you who my doctor is. And if you don't let me stay, I'll tell everyone what a bad place you have. Uh, you, uh, you said something about having, um, money. Just how much money? I've got a mattress full. Can I stay? Well, perhaps it can be arranged. Though, of course, I must examine you. Of course. And there will be a certain, um, fee, you understand? Mm, I'm beginning to. Tell me, Mr. Um, uh, stop! certainly are most annoying. Tell me, why do you want to stay here anyway? Well, I, I've got to stop the plot. The, the plot? You know about that? Sure. You plan to rub out fearless Fosdick, but I'm not going to let you. Oh, I see. Tell me, do you, uh, do you have any dreams? Well, of course. I have dreams about eating ice cream cones, and oh, what a mess they are. What's so messy about eating an ice cream cone? My mouth is always filled with BBs. BBs? For my air rifle, stupid. How else could I stand off the Indians? Well, what Indians? Well, the Indians who want to steal my ice cream cones. Now, why would Indians want your ice cream cones? Oh, they're mad about pistachio. You are crazy, aren't you? Brazo, take Mr... Um... H-O-L. Oh, never mind. Take him to observation room B, Brazo. I don't have time for... The examination now. Uh, wait, uh, can't I be with the other patients? I get lonely. Later, later. Come on, Sherlock. <laughs> this way. Well, I was in, thanks to the good doctor not being able to pass up a possible easy buck. The big ape Brazo led me to a small room with bars on the window and a spring lock on the door. When he left, I made like a smart gumshoe and went after the lock with my penknife. Due to my early training in picking locks at the automat, I was out like Alabama. I found myself in a long hall with seven rooms, three on each side and one at the end. I knocked on every door. Nothing. Not even Bogart. The last one had to be Jason. Are you in there, Mr. Jason? Diamond. Oh, oh I am glad to hear your voice. Please, get, get me out of here. Now, just take it easy. I don't have a key, and this door has a padlock on it. But you must get me out. Sure, sure, but give me time. First, tell me what's the score. Why did they lock you up? Carol had it planned. She has paid Dr. Thorne to keep me here until I go crazy. She wants to have me judged legally insane so she can take the estate. Yeah, well, maybe I can put a few kinks in her plan. Wait, wait Diamond, where are you going? Uh, there's a phone in the doctor's office. If no one's there, I'll use it to get help. But what if you can't get to the phone? And I go out and get the Marines. If I can get by that ape man, that locked gate. Don't go away. Oh, there you are, Sherlock. Oh, don't pick on me. I was only three and a half years old. Yeah, I'm upset with you, Sherlock. You oughtn't to be running around the halls like this. Well, huh? That guy's got to have his constitutional, Brazo. Yeah, well, you're true with yours. The doc wants to examine you now. I've, I've, I've changed my mind. I, I don't think I no, like it I said it the doc wants you what the doc wants he gets. Well, bully for him, but this is one time you won't. I'm leaving. I don't want to break your arm, Sherlock. No? So you don't leave until the doc says so. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint him, but certain things are necessary, like this. Oh. Now, you shouldn't act like oh. that. I might get mad. Oh, my knuckles. What is your jaw made of, concrete? Uh, come on, Sherlock. Or do you want to try again? Uh, no, thanks. One busted hand is enough. And don't try to run. The gate's locked. And if I have to catch you, <laughs> I'll fix your legs so you can't run again. Oh, friendly little butcher, aren't you? Uh, right in here, Sherlock. The doc is waiting. <laughs> here he is, Doc. Good. <clears throat> you can go back to the office, Brazo. I won't need you. Where? Well, you seem to be well trained as a detective, Mr. Holmes. Do you always pick locks so easily? I do better with my erector set. Uh, but you needn't examine me further. I've changed my mind. You've changed your... 
This is odd. First you demand in, now you want out. I just remembered I forgot to pick up my station wagon. But the Indians, you want me to help you keep them from stealing your ice cream cones, don't you? Uh, they already got them, and all my money, too. They're both gone. Your money? And you don't have any money? Not a bolivar. Now, may I go, Doctor? You're going to stay right here, Mr. Holmes. There's something peculiar about the way you've recovered from your illusions. Uh, Doc, uh, Miss Jason to see you. She's in your office. Very well, Brazo. Stay here and guard this man, whoever he is. Uh, Holmes, age old. Will you shut up? And make sure he stays put this time, Brazo. I have some questions I want to ask him. He won't go in no place, Doc. You go ahead to the office. Well, Carol... This is a pleasant surprise. Come to visit Jason. So, and our plans will have to be changed. Changed? Something has come up that may cause an investigation of stepfather's illness. We can't afford to take a chance of that. But we can't let Jason go now. I had no such intentions. He must be taken care of tonight. Taken care of? But that's impossible. How could he I... He must be gotten rid of. What? Oh, no. No, I didn't bargain for murder. Look, Thorne, you're in and you stay in. I've paid you $10,000. Don't forget it. But why all this sudden rush to change our plan? Why can't we A private it? detective came to see me this morning. He was hired by stepfather. I knew he had suspicions, but I didn't know they'd gone so far. A detective? Oh, he can't act legally, but he's a sort to cause trouble. Detective. Private detective. Sherlock Holmes. He's rambling about. I'm afraid we're in serious trouble. Come with me. What? Your private detective. I think he's already found Jason. Come on. You wouldn't like to earn a hundred bucks, would you, Brazo? No. It is you, Diamond. Uh Uh-oh, fun's over. Thorne, you fool. How'd he get in here? He said he was a patient, Carol, and I swear he seemed crazy enough. He probably said he had money. Uh, You seem to understand each other, honey, but do you mind? I'd like to take Mr. Jason home now. For a couple of extra dollars, you let him walk right in. Oh, Thorne, you're an idiot. I suppose he found Jason and talked to him. Well, he did get out of his room and wander about. Oh, that's great. So now I know the whole works. Uh, Too bad, baby. Your plan is kaput. No, it's... White Diamond. You've just talked yourself into real trouble. This gun says for you not to get any bright ideas. My IQ just dropped 30 points. Shut him up, Rizzo. Sure. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh! Now, stay with him while Thorne and I make arrangements. We won't be long. <laughs> Do I get the... Yes, Rizzo, when we're ready. Yeah. Come on, Thorne, I want to talk to Stepfather. <laughs> Brazo's fist was made of the same stuff as his jaw. By the time I came around, darkness had painted the window, and the room was full of shadow and Brazo. The big hulk was squatting a few feet away, paying no attention to me. So I waited till my mind was clear while I eased off my right shoe. The heel was leather with a steel plate in it. I could only hope it was harder than Brazo's skull. With the shoe in my hand behind me, I was ready. Only to have him catch me stirring. <laughs> Coming to, eh, Shamus? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, hand me my cigarettes, will you, Brazo? You need a smoke, eh? Oh. <laughs> sure. Uh, where, where are they? Uh, fell out of my pocket, uh, over there behind you. Oh, uh, where, where? I don't see you. <laughs> I say, that's not... Need another? Oh. Stop that. Oh, come on, Buster, fall. <laughs> well, is little old Brazo finally getting sleepy? Happy New Year, Buster. Levinson, homicide. Walt, Rick, if you don't want me to be a customer of yours, get out to the home sweet home rest home fast. What? Hey, what kind of a gag is this now? It's no gag, believe me. My client and I are the blue plate specials and dinner is about to be served. The home sweet... Oh, it still sounds like a gag. Who'd call anything that? Now, don't argue, Walt. It's no joke. Okay, Rick. What's the address? 1820 Allerton Avenue, Baychester. And bring a blowtorch to cut an iron gauge. You may have to. All right. I'll be there in 30 minutes. The quicker, if you can. Stand right there, Diamond. Or I'll use this gun. Uh, good afternoon. I represent the sleep Looks like I Mort- came just in time. Only now that you've fixed Rosso, you have to dig your own grave. Dig my own grave? Oh, honey, is this trip really necessary? Keep moving or I'll kill you right here. Uh, I I move. Keep going. Over there behind those trees where Thorne and Jason are. Well, is Jason... He's alive, but not for long. Where's Brazo? I thought he was going to... Diamond knocked him out. I can dig their own graves. There, the shovels. Get busy. Carol, please, you may have the money. I swear... Shut up and dig. Carol, this is... Just work the shovel. Can 
Can you imagine Richard Diamond, private detective, letting a sawed-off female make him dig his own grave? You can't? Well, she did. And for a good half hour. I stalled as long as I could to give Walt Levinson the chance to get there. That's enough. I said that's deep enough. Oh, please. I, I, I'm just started. You're finished. Jason, get into that hole with him. Uh, very well. I, I guess this is it, Diamond. I'm sorry to have dragged you in. Well, that's a horrible way to say it. Don't we get time for a last cigarette? No. Thorne, take this gun. What? Oh, no, I'm not going to kill them. Shut up and take this gun. Oh, don't do it, Thorne. Be a man about it. Here, Thorne. Don't be such a weakling. Two shots and it's over. No, it was your idea. I'm no murderer. Shut up, boy. Stick up for your rights. You shut up. Thorne, do you do the job or do I make you number three in that grave? You wouldn't dare. You, you need me. Shut up, boy, Thorne. Tell her. Go on, Thorne. Take the gun. No, I can't. I just can't. Not my face. You weakling. I'll do it myself. Now, turn around, Diamond. Oh, now, look, baby, this thing's getting out of hand. You shoot me and the law will be all over the place. Not until I've filled that grave in over you. I call them, baby. Oh, you're lying. Am I? Well, just turn around and take a look at that lovely big fat policeman standing over there by that tree. Oh, you really don't expect me to fall for an old stunt like that. Well, if you don't, you'll fall for something. It's your funeral. No, it isn't. It's yours. All right, lady, drop it. What? Why, you... Smarty. I'll kill you anyway. <laughs> Carol. Rick, Rick, what the devil's going on here? What are you doing down there? I'm looking at the girl. I, I think you shot her pretty bad. Who are these two guys? Now, the guy with the cast in that knees is Doc Thorne. Better put their cuffs on him as an accessory. But you can't do this. I was the one that re refused to shoot you. Oh, stop licking my hand. You can tell it to the precinct judge. Otis, snap the cuffs on them and take him out the car. Sure. Come on, you. Now, what about this other guy? The girl's stepfather. How do you feel, Mr. Jason? Sick, Mr. Diamond. How about the girl, Rick? Shall I call the ambulance? I don't know. Carol. Carol. Well, Rick? Uh, take your time, Walt. She's not with us. I gave Walt the story, then took Jason to his house. Stayed there long enough to brush the dirt off my clothes, wash my hands, and then I headed for a delayed date. At 975 Park Avenue, I found the big fireplace and the lovely redhead waiting for me. A redhead wearing a dress that was part green silk and part... Well. I'm the library, darling. Come on in. Uh, hello, Helen, baby. You sound like you found oil in the basement. What's with the cheer? Me? Isn't it always? I like you. Hmm. I like the way you say that. Looking up at me with those big green eyes. They're not green. They're hazel. Oh, are they? Hmm. Let me look closer. Uh, not until you sing for me. Sing? Oh, honey, I'm tired. I want to rest. No, you don't. No, over to the piano. No, Rick, not here. But, Helen, all I wanted to do was... I know, Rick. Oh, you've been using that Ouija board again. I don't want to sing. Now look in my eyes. Close range? Contact. I'll sing. That's better. Like, uh, you must have been a beautiful baby. I love it. You must have been a beautiful baby You must have been a wonderful child When you were only starting to go to kindergarten I bet you drove the little boys wild And when it came to winning blue ribbons you must have shown the other kids how I can see the judge's eyes As they handed you the prize I bet you made the cutest bow Oh, you must have been a beautiful baby Cause, baby, look at you now Like that? That was wonderful, Rick. Come here. Mm, about time. Mm. Oh, Rick. Do you think you can do that and sing, too? Honey, when you look at me like that, I could kiss you, sing, and knit a whole sweater at the same time. Rick, could you? Want to try? A sweater will take years. I'll buy that. Come here, we'll start with the neck. Rick. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm, you know something? Mm, what? I may even knit you a whole suit. You 
have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, High Averback, Betty Moran, Howard McNear, Edwin Max, and Jay Novello. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. (coughs) Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. How much is your life worth? Think about that for a minute. Is it worth a little care? Well, that's all that's needed to protect it on America's streets and highways. Only your careful driving and your acceptance of personal responsibility for your own life can guard you from the dangers of the road. The price that you may pay for carelessness is a high one, and it's a price that thousands upon thousands of accident victims have already paid. Their gamble with death behind the wheel is a stark warning. A warning that an accident can happen to you. Last year alone, some 32,000 persons were killed in traffic accidents, and well over a million others were injured. Smash-ups have averaged more than one a minute, every minute of the day and night. These are the facts of traffic dangers. As for the facts of traffic safety, well, they all boil down to just two facts. Careful driving by automobile owners, careful walking by pedestrians. So drive carefully, walk carefully. The care you take may save a life, and that life may be your own. Saturday night is packed with entertainment when you stay tuned to NBC's star lineup of shows. Each Saturday, make it a point to listen to NBC. You'll hear Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, Grand Old Opry, and Songs by Morton Downey. Now, stay tuned for Lionel Barrymore and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. John, this is Harry Branson of Philadelphia Mutual. Harry, what are you doing in town? I'm not. At least not in your town. But you've got a case for me. Do you know anything about violins? Oh, don't tell me. So he opened up his fiddle case and out came a submachine gun, that it? John, that technique went out with prohibition. Now, seriously, this case contains a genuine Amati. Good. What's an Amati? One of the finest, most expensive violins ever made. This one was insured for $30,000. Was? Yes. Now, someone has to find it for us. What's more? Okay, Harry, I'm on my way. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. The following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Expense account item 1, 1240, train fare and incidentals to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I took the train because Harry Branson didn't seem to be in any particular hurry, and I kind of like a slow look at the countryside this time of year. When I got to Philadelphia, I checked in at the Bellevue Stratford, shaved and showered, then went over to Harry Branson's office in the Security First building on Walnut Street. You deceived me, John. I thought when we talked long distance that you'd be here right away. But instead of flying down... Old oh, Sobersides Branson Possibly hadn't a changed a bit. Time. Hair know. a little grayer than the last I time I'd seen him, perhaps. I hear further from Amarillo but still the same you. serious lad who always anything, acted as though tell. he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. Now, I feel a deep personal concern over the whole matter because it was a man I put in this office myself who issued the policies, both of them. Two policies on this fiddle you were talking about? No, John. One on the Amati violin, $30,000. Yeah. And one on Ricardo Amarigo himself for $20,000. Who is Ricky? Who? 
Well, isn't that what you said his name is? I'm sure I didn't mention anyone by the... Oh, 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 Ricardo Amerigo. Yes, yes. Well, uh, where's he playing? The Purple Cat? Or uh, maybe Wee Willie's joined over on John, this, this man is a concert violinist. Or was. He's disappeared. Now, please, no more levity. <laughs> Sorry, Earl. It's Harrison. Sorry, Harry. All right. I'm quite all right. Now, I, I realize that you have quite a sense of humor, John, but in a matter as important as this... Yeah, sure. Now, let's have the story. Very well. A few years ago, Ricardo Amerigo was one of the world's leading concert violinists. As famous in London, Paris, Rome, as in the concert halls of this country. Uh -huh. Such virtuosity, almost unbelievable. I shall never forget one evening here in our Academy of Music. He had just finished a perfectly brilliant Vinyovsky. Amazing technical performance. Yeah, well... And uh... for an encore, he played Sarasate Zapatiado. Even more brilliant. Harry. Uh... But the audience wouldn't let him leave the stage. Ricardo Amarigo... Has disappeared. Oh, oh, yes. And you're in a hurry to get on with the case. I'm sorry. Now, thinking of his superlative performance that night carried me away for... <clears throat> yes, he, he's dead. Disappeared. And the violin? No trace. Dead? He didn't say that before. I know. You see, there's no proof of death. No body. Disappeared. Well, uh, don't let me shock your finer sensibilities, Harry. Murder? We have thought of that, of course. Who's we? The Port Morris police. Port Morris, New Jersey, that is. Oh. Yes, you see, since Amerigo's car went through the bridge rail, crashed right through it and plunged into the river stream... Trying to tie Harry Harry down to pertinent facts Morris that would help me in my investigation was, uh, well, futile. At least three times during the next half hour, he went off on glowing descriptions of violent recitals he had known. Heifetz, Selman, Chrysler, and so on. But he did come up with one of two things I wanted. First, Amerigo and his fiddle had been driving down from Philadelphia to some spot on the South Jersey seashore. Crossing an old wooden bridge over a little stream, an inlet from the ocean, the car had smashed through the guard rail and gone to the bottom of the inlet. The car, of course, was found. Amerigo and his violin, no. Second, and just as important, the name of the beneficiary of Amerigo's policies. Item two on expense account, one dollar even. Taxi to the Harnell Building, also on Walnut Street, in the office of Peter Corbin, Amerigo's booking agent. The building was plush, but Corbin's office was about as bare as I'd ever seen. An old beat-up desk, a battered filing cabinet, and a couple of straight chairs. That was it. Come in, Dollar. Come in. Sit up. Sit up. Corbin was chewing the stub of a cigar that he'd forgotten to relight for at least a couple of days. We made with the usual howdy doos Well, your man Branson told you exactly right, Dollar. I'm Ricardo Amerigo's sole and only beneficiary. Well, isn't that a bit unusual for a man's agent to be his heir? Or uh, was it because you were all personal friends? I'm going to give it to you straight. I brought Amerigo over to this country. Myself, my own sole expense. I actually gave him the build-up. I started his whole entire career. I kept him on top, all at my own expense. Well, didn't you collect a regular agent's commission on his earnings? Oh, sure, sure. Plenty more. Why kid about it? Sure, while he was working. What's that supposed to mean? Bottle. What? Yeah, started hitting the bottle. Bad, not good. And believe me, the word gets around fast. Instead of making me money, himself too, of course, he started costing me money. But you see, he never saved anything, even when he was earning big. You know how these artists are. Yeah, I've heard. Well, it's the same with all of them. He got in debt actually up to his ears. And nobody, no, no family, no relatives, nobody to pull him out. Nobody but me. Big-hearted corpse. So you had him take out a lot of insurance and name you as beneficiary? Well, that was his idea, actually. Of course, he always did have the Amadi insured. That's his violin. Oh, so I learned. Oh, you know about violins? No. Oh. Well, but the life insurance, that was his own idea. Double indemnity, all that sort of stuff. Double indemnity? Oh, yeah. But guess who had to dig up the moolah for the last couple premiums? <laughs> Big-hearted he... Corbin. You're right. Not a bad investment, though, was it? What? Hey... A hey, couple of thousand in premiums, and you stand to collect plenty. If we can find proof that he's dead, and if we can't oh, recover the... I don't like the... that, Dollar. I don't either, Corbin. It doesn't smell good. Oh, you think me, his yeah. own agent, actually rigged something like that for one of my best friends? You think that... Listen, wise guy, even if I did have any any of a such idea, it'd be crazy. Anything actually is as is, is, is obvious as that. Well, sometimes the most obvious is the best cover -up. Oh, get out of here, Dollar. Unless you want somebody to start collecting on your insurance. Even if it isn't you, huh? Get out! So help me. Yeah, pretty obvious. And every time you open your mouth... Oh, oh no, you don't. <laughs> Why is it that people who telegraph their punches are always the first to start swinging? Uh, I don't know. Anyhow, I left Corbin to pick himself up and start thinking about some alibis he might need. And in the camp back to my hotel, I did a lot of thinking myself. 
Sure, the obvious off times is the best cover-up. And yet it might be too obvious. Far too obvious. Branson here? Johnny Dollar here. Oh, uh, John, good. Listen, at least there'll be no double indemnity to pay in the Amerigo matter. For accidental death, that is. You see... Wait a minute. About an hour ago, you weren't even sure he's dead. Did somebody find the body? It, no, unfortunately, but I've just received a call from the Port Morris police. They completed their examination of Amerigo's car. Uh, after they pulled it out of the creek, of course. I hope so. John, they found conclusive evidence of murder. Harry, I'll call you from Port Morris. <laughs> Expense account, item two. Subway, ferry, train, and bus fares to South Vineland, New Jersey. South Vineland, because Ed Bowles lived there, and I knew that if anything, anything at all happened in the heart of sunny southern Jersey, Ed would know about it. Retired and raising some of those wonderful South Jersey sweet potatoes and peaches with plenty of hired help, he amused himself by moseying around, getting to know everybody and everything that happened in his section of the state. He had an insatiable curiosity and money enough to keep it satisfied. Hi, you conniving, chiseling son of a gun. <laughs> I've been waiting for you to get here. What took you so long? Hey, what was that conniving, chiseling crack, son? We're still on expense account, aren't you? Yeah, sure. Sure, but... and so help me, nobody in history ever had the knack of padding out an expense account the way you can. And collect those fancy commissions on top. Hi, when I was a private investigator... Who is retired? <laughs> You call this retired 270 acres of sandy soil from which to try to wrestle the poor oh, living? Oh, no, wait a minute. That, that Cadillac El Dorado out front, that belongs to one of the hired hands. 983 right? peach trees. And isn't that a landing field I see out there through the window? A lot of sweet potato land to be cultivated. Well, yes. Hey, why didn't you fly down or let me know and I'd have picked you up? Look, with all the time I have on oh, I my hands... I thought hand, you said you were very yeah, busy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how long are you going to stay so I can figure out where we'll go, or what we'll do? Ed, I'm on a case. Well, sure. Ricardo Amerigo and his priceless fiddle. Oh, no. It was easy. When I heard about him going over the bridge, I contacted Barney Peters of the Port Morris PD. From Barney, I learned all about the next of kin. It, his agent, that is. Pete Corbin. Right. And that boy at Philadelphia Mutual, Harry Branson. And I knew Branson wouldn't call anybody but you in on the case... So, here you are. Still a private eye, aren't you, Ed? <laughs> Gotta have some way of killing time. And I suppose you have the whole case solved. Yep. Well, according to Harry Branson, who heard from the Port Morris police just before I left Philly, it was murder. Oh, you point killer. I thought I'd be the one to tell you that. No, sorry. The cops knew it first. Second, I told them. Huh? Yeah, I showed them where somebody'd used a hacksaw on the steering arm of Amerigo's car when they dragged it out of the creek. Ah. Ah, so that was it. Yep. And who wielded the hacksaw? Well, Pete Corbin. Who else? Why? Who else stood to benefit by Amerigo's sudden trip to the great beyond? No, oh, no, no. It's too easy, Ed. What's more, he's the only one who had constant and complete access to Amerigo's car. Why, he not only mothered little Ricky, clothed and fed him and kept him in booze, but he paid his rent, swept out his apartment, serviced his car. No, it's too easy. And Johnny... That car was even kept locked in Pete Corbin's own garage. And Corbin had the only key. Where did you learn that? From Corbin's landlord. By phone, of course. Said he thought Corbin did that so Ricky couldn't go out driving when he was drunk. And me? I think it was the other way around. He'd only let him drive when he was drunk, huh? Instead of a good chance of smashing up what would look like accidental death. So that Corbin would collect the double indemnity. It's open and shut. <laughs> Any proof, Sherlock? Ha! Ah, just get to Corbin, throw it all at him, and break him down. Maybe he'll even find the hacksaw tucked up his sleeve. Uh, too easy. Any bets that it isn't Corbin? Yeah, yeah, I'll bet you. You name it. My commission on the case. I'll match it. Oh, and uh, plus your expense account. Look, Ed, I want to see that car and the bridge and the creek, anything else I can find. Sure, sure, I'll fly you down there. Then we can go on over to Atlantic City, hit some of the night spots. Your treat. You know, so we can build up the expense account enough for me to collect plenty. Ed Bowles had been a pretty good investigator in his day. Seldom gone off half-cocked. Yet all his evidence was purely circumstantial. 
And where was the body? What's more, Pete Corbin acted anything but scared. Or so I thought until I put through a routine call to Harry Branson. He was worried. He had a right to be. Pete Corbin had packed a bag, jumped into his car, and disappeared. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a soggy day in a soggy South Jersey swamp. And a discovery almost too good to be true. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Sam Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Sergeant Barney Peters, Port Morris Police. Oh, hi, Sergeant. Thought you and Adam Bowles were coming over here to look at the evidence in the murder of Ricardo Amarigo. We are. Ed's out warming up his plane. That's why I answered his phone. We got a visitor here in Port Morris. Who? The guy Ed thinks did the job. Pete Corbin, Amarigo's booking agent? That's right. In Port Morris? That's right. Well, are you holding him? I can't. No legal reason to, in spite of Ed's suspicions. Well, what's Corbin doing there? I don't know, unless Ed's right about him. Huh? And Pete knows you're on his trail. Well, what's that mean? What well, could mean he's down here gunning for you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Port Morris, New Jersey. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Item three, one dollar even. For whatever it was, the local druggist recommended to pull my stomach back together after the flight in Ad Bull's private plane from Ed's farm in South Vineland to Port Morris. In a sense, I'm glad we flew. In a car with Ed at the wheel, we'd have been all over the road. As it was, we were only all over the sky. A oh, beautiful day for flying, isn't it, Johnny? Can't you hold a straight course, Ed? What's the matter with this ship? Yeah, not a thing. I like to weave around a bit. I like the feel of it. You know, all that power under you. Yeah. Sure you're not just trying to scare me into welching on our little bet? Yeah. I'm going to win that bet, Johnny. Your commission on the case, plus all that goes on that well-padded expense account of yours. You just get busy and find the body. Why don't you forget your dark past as a private eye and stay retired? What? And leave an old friend like you floundering around with a case and... Hey! You don't watch your steering. We'll be floundering around in those salt marshes down there. Sorry. But can't you see, Johnny? Pete Corbin, Amerigo's agent, has to be the heavy. He's the beneficiary of Amerigo's policy. Amerigo owed him a lot of money. Too easy. And Pete's the only person we know of who was with Amerigo constantly. You got motive, opportunity. Too easy, I tell you. 
But I wonder what under the sun Pete's doing in Port Morris. Ah, uh, that we'll be finding out. We'll land there in a couple of minutes now. The little town of Port Morris was set on the edge of one of the wide salt marshes that border a lot of the South Jersey shore. Just a vast expanse of salt hay and dented with little coves and inlets. Soggy, swampy country. Ideal breeding place for the famous Jersey mosquitoes. And I guess for me, the ideal breeding place for trouble. Sergeant Barney Peters met us at the mucky little landing strip just outside town. And we headed out on a narrow, muddy road across the marshes. Yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. If I were you, I'd try to pin down this Corbin. Well, where is he now? Back in town. Got Alf McCracken keeping an eye on him. Alf supposed you saw Amerigo crash through the bridge that night, you know. Barney, I still wish you'd cooked up something to hold him. But what, Ed? Sure, Ed. Every bit of evidence you think you've got on Corbin is purely circumstantial. What else have you got to go on, John Boy? Oh, we'll see. We'll see. After I have a look at the bridge Amerigo busted through in his car. It's just up ahead a bit. Crosses the Lucky Hole Creek. I'd also like to know who could have... Well, I'd like to know what could have happened to his body. To that $30,000 Amati violin. You'll see. Just keep in mind that there's a mighty big flow of water in the creek from the tide coming in and going out. Hmm. Tell me, Sergeant. Johnny, I checked it. Huh? Tide had just turned, was on its way out to the ocean at the time Amerigo's car went over the bridge. Right, Barney? That's correct, Ed. Right now, though, it's probably about as low as it'll... Whoa! What's the matter? Just pulling over to let this car that's coming pass us. Otherwise, one of us might shear off into the swamp. Yeah, these roads weren't meant for two-way traffic. John Poole's coming pretty fast for a road like this. He isn't careful. Hey, look, Pennsylvania plates. Huh? He's right. That's Corbin's car. Corbin, huh? Swing across the road. Block him. Quick. Son of a gun. Now, now, where's Corbin, all right? Well, then swing around. Go after him. On this road? He'd slide off into the swamp so fast. By the time we go on up to the bridge and turn, he'll be halfway back to Philadelphia, blasted. Well, we had the bird in hand and didn't know it. What are you going to do now, Johnny? Just exactly what we started out to do. You're losing valuable time. Now, if I were still in this... Oh, Ed, why don't you stay retired? We drove slowly on up to the bridge, stopped and got out. And although the tide was almost low now, it was easy to see how that rush of water would easily carry a violin or a body or most anything right out to sea. Or could it? The tide was running the same way when it happened. Out. Yeah. And the current was a lot stronger than it is now, so you can imagine what it would... Huh? Yeah. What's the matter, Johnny? Well, that, uh, that big bird nest, whatever it is, down there at the side of the creek, 50, 60 feet. Oh, that's just where the reeds and hay got matted up. It does look like... Hey. Yeah. If that isn't a fiddle case propped up on top of it... Sure looks like sure one. Sure it is. Sure. The tide was higher then. The fiddle stuck in those reeds. Wait here. Well, now, Johnny Jones, you come back here. Dollar! Dollar's like quicksand. Stay out of it. Well, you're done, fool. It was Come like quicksand, too. You'll never make it. Black, glowy muck. And I sank into it up to my knees. I almost had to swim through it, hanging onto it, pulling myself along by the reeds and bulrushes. But half of this case hung on that $30,000 Amati violin, and I wasn't going to let it slip out of my hands. A couple of times, I dropped into soft holes almost up to my shoulders, but somehow I kept going. Pulled the fiddle case off the pile of matted weeds and started back. I had used up most of my strength with only one hand to pull, to pull myself along to... Ed! Ed! Johnny! Johnny, try and grab this rope! Here! Can't! Breach! Try it again, Ed. Try it back. Try it again. Johnny, use the violin case. You keep your float. I... I'll try. You all right, Dollar? Dollar! Here, Johnny! We're over again! Johnny! Johnny! I hadn't passed out. So help me, I hadn't. Not entirely, that is. Or I'd never have been able to grab the line that Ad Bowles threw to me. Needless to say, I took a lot of kidding from Ed and Barney Peters on the drive back to Port Morris, especially since I didn't really know what had happened until I came to in the back seat of the car clutching the fiddle case. Jerk. 
If you'd held onto the rope with a death grip you have on that violin case, we'd have got you out of that muck before you swallowed half the salt water in that inlet. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll say this for you, Mr. Dollar. You don't give up easy. The fiddle. The $30,000 Amati. At least I had half of this miserable case in hand in my hands. There'd be no insurance collection on that violin. And then I saw it. What's the matter, Johnny? You passed out again? No. No, Ed. You should have cleaned me up before you piled me into this car. What? Look. Well, what is it? Piece of shirt. Ricardo Amerigo's shirt. Is that... Yeah, look. Monogram on the pocket, R.A. And what looks like bloodstains. Hey, you're right. Where'd you get that? I must have picked it up when I picked up the fiddle. Well, at least it proves that Amerigo went down with his car. There's no doubt of it. What I didn't tell him was that the piece of cloth from Ricardo Amerigo's shirt was fastened to the violin case. Deliberately put there. But by whom? By Pete Corbin, Johnny. That's your man. Are you listening? Yeah, I'm listening. Beneficiary, confidant, caretaker of both Ricky Amerigo and his car... Who else could have sawed through the steering bar that made the car run off the bridge? And a guy who was smart enough to have it happen in this godforsaken salt marsh. Now, just a minute, Ed. Okay, Barney, in the heart of sunny southern Jersey, where he expected nobody to find car or body or even the fiddle until long after the insurance claim was met. Thanks to a tide that'd carry everything out to sea. For indeed, my friend, if your deputy, Alf McCracken, hadn't actually seen Amerigo's car slip through the bridge rail... Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. If Pete Corbin had planned this whole thing, he would have made sure the corpus delecti would be found. Johnny, that's why he had the accident happen where somebody saw it. Yet that somebody, Alf McCracken, didn't see the fiddle float away, didn't see the body float away from the car. Oh, stop it, John boy. You know as well as I do that this whole thing was engineered by Corbin. All right, tell me, investigator, what was he doing down here today? Lord knows, and I don't care. Probably to plant that piece of shirt. Johnny, I've given you all the help I'm gonna on this case. From now on, you either follow my tip and lose your bet to me, or you don't and give yourself a black eye with insurance Foy. company. Johnny. Oh, uh, yeah, Barney. That's a good detective. He'd have to be to retire on that nice farm of his over in South Vineland. He even broke a burglary case for me once here in Port Morris a couple of years ago when I couldn't break myself. Ah, pastime. But you've got guts. I like you for it. Thanks a lot. And to me, the Pete Corbin theory looks, well, too easy. Oh, not you, Barney. That's what I've been trying to preach to that stubborn egghead sitting beside you. I'll lend you a suit of clean clothes, and you can chase this thing down the way you want to, without the dubious help of somebody who is just trying to win a bet from you. Traitor. And if I were you, I'd hunt up a few other people who knew Ricky Amerigo besides his press agent, Pete Corbin. You are a mind reader. Gentlemen, I have only one thing to say. And, Johnny, it's addressed to you. When you finally find that Pete Corbin done it, you know where to send the check to me. At Port Morris, we learned that Alf McCracken had lost track of Corbin when the former dropped in at Osborne's Oyster House for a dozen of the half shell. Hadn't even seen him take off in his car, much less leave in a hurry after spotting us on the road to Lucky Hole Creek. I took advantage of Barney's offer, borrowed a suit of his clothes, and accepted a ride from him to the crossroads of Woodbine where I could get a bus back to Philadelphia. Sure, half my job was done. I'd recovered the $30,000 Amati violin. But I could still hear the oh-so-pleasant voice of Ad Bowles, ex-investigator, not so retired. You know where to send the check to me, Johnny boy. Expense account item five, $4.95. Bus fare from Woodvine to Philadelphia. And believe me, it's a long bus ride. As soon as I got to my hotel and changed into my own clothes, I called Harry Branson at the insurance company. Mr. Branson here? This is Mr. Dollar, Mr. Branson. Yes, Mr. Uh, John. Yeah, I'm back at my hotel, music lover. And I've just won the $30,000 Amati. What? Yeah, I got the fiddle for you. Well, thank heaven you recovered it. Uh, what of Ricardo Amerigo? Uh, later. Do you want the Amati? I'll be right over. Where is it, John? Where is it? Right here, Harry. Right here. Case, bow, and all. Oh, thank heaven. And by some miracle, it's dry as a bone and all in one piece. Voila. Oh, thank heaven. It... John. John? What's the matter? This? 
an Amati? Oh, no. Oh, no. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the results of a poker game. And believe me, there are times when the cards can be really stacked against you. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Sam Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Yeah, Pete Corbin, Dollar. I found your message when I got in, but I don't know why I'm returning your call after that lacing I took from you. Well, at least you haven't run out on us. Why should I? How would you like to explain what you were doing in Port Morris, New Jersey yesterday afternoon at the scene of the so-called accidental death of your client, Ricardo Amarigo? Oh, yeah, I I I thought that was you I saw in that car down there. It sure was. Are you in your office? Yeah, that's right. I thought you wanted well, to stay know... there. I do want to know. That and a lot of other things. I'll see you in about an hour after I've made another call. Okay, okay. I'll be here. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. To the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of further expenses during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Expense account item six. $33.75. Dry cleaning and new shirts, socks and so on, including one pair of shoes to replace the ones I lost in the South Jersey swamp while rescuing what I thought was a priceless Amati violin in a muddy Tidewater inlet called Lucky Ho Creek. But when I showed it to Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual, well, at least he promised to have an expert look it over and pass final judgment. That's the reason for item 7, 85 cents, taxi to Harry's office in the security first building. Oh, come in, John, come in. Hi, Harry. Well, what have you found out? Nothing yet, but I should hear from the violin man any minute. John, I do hope I was wrong. Sit down. Thanks. Harry, I could have committed mayhem when you told me that fiddle I picked up in the swamp isn't the Amati. To think you nearly drowned retrieving it. Oh, brother, that's putting it mildly. But I'm sure Foresto will know. Foresto? Uh, Foresto Sir Negliario, uh, however he pronounces it, the violin man. He really an expert? Well, he's the one who okayed the $30,000 policy on Amerigo's violin. Uh, let's just hope this one's it. Did you learn anything in Port Morris? Only confirm what you'd already learned from Sergeant Peters down there. That someone had sawed through some steering connection on Amerigo's car before it crashed through the bridge? Yeah. Still no sign of the body? Nope. 
Oh, uh, a man named Adam Bowles called. Oh, he's an old friend. Used to be a private detective and just can't get it out of his system. Oh. Well, he called me, you know. I know. And I must confess, John, that I'm inclined to agree with him. That Peter Corbin, Aberigo's agent, did it? Agent and beneficiary, John. And apparently the one person who knew Amerigo well enough... I said it to Ad Bowles until I was blue in the face, Harry, and I say it again. Too easy. But who else? I don't know. That's what I came back here to find out. All the evidence... Circumstantial evidence. The kind of man that'd be a fool to let pile up against him if he really was guilty. Hmm. Even so... Harry, let me do it my own way, huh? What if this Corbin tries to skip out? Then will be the time to... He's kidding. Yes, uh, Mr. Sherney Arrow to see you, sir. Sherney Arrow. I, I, I knew that was it. Uh, send him in. Our uh, man is here, John. Foresto? Yes, uh, sure. Is, uh, oh, well. Uh, come in, uh, <coughs> Foresto. Meet Mr. Dollar. Yeah. How do you do, Mr. Dollar? You brought the fiddle? Yeah. Uh, right here on the desk. Well? No, thank you. I'll open up the case. Well, is it? Mr. Branson, Mr. Dollar, I'm sure. Well? Well, Mr. Scherniero? Scherniero. Look, you've only got to look. Now that I've cleaned away some of the mud and the salt from the swamp where it was found, we're lucky it did not do any real damage to change the appearance. But nobody could tell the way you gave it to me. Well, how about now that you've cleaned it up? Yes. Ah, you see here. The shape of the F holes. The curve to the belly. Yeah. The beautiful shape, the signs of age, and above all, here, you see, the label. Label? Through the F hole, you can see it. There, Nicolo Amati. Then it is Amarillo's. See. Si. You're sure, Mr. Chaniero? Hmm, the label says. And Foresto says. Well, look, I talked with a fiddle player in the orchestra at my hotel last night. He told me there are literally thousands of imitations of every important violin ever made. Shape, size, label, and all. Now, listen, Foresto. Yeah. Tell me the truth. Do you really consider yourself an expert? Well, I'm, uh, I'm a seller of violins in my store. Violins, harmonicas, alcorinas, victrons. How good are the violins you sell? Oh, so good ones. Some as high as $65. Harry, do you mean to tell me... With all due apologies, Foresto, do you mean to tell me he was your authority for a $30,000 policy on Ricky Amarigo's violin? Well, of course, a representative from the Wurlitzer Collection in Chicago verified Foresto's opinion at the time. Gee, the Wurlitzer know every good violin in the world. Yeah, Harry, let me have it. I'll give you a receipt for it. I'll bring it back when I'm through with it. Whatever you say, John. I assume you want to check further on the authenticity. And you are right. John. Yeah. To put it bluntly... You've still not accomplished very much insofar as Amerigo himself is concerned. With this fiddle under my arm, I think maybe I will. See you later. Maybe Harry had been right in the very beginning. Maybe I should have known a little more about music, or more specifically, violins. Or maybe I should have left this aspect of the case to someone else and concentrated on the disappearance death of Ricardo Amerigo. Maybe I... Ah, uh, well... Expense account item eight, 80 cents. Taxi to booking agent Peter Corbin's office. All right, Dollar, let's not waste either your time or either mine. You want to know what I was doing? That's right, Corbin. The Amati. I found it right where you planted it, in that swamp near Port Morris. You actually found the tank to... What do you mean where I planted it? What else were you doing down there in the South Jersey swamps? Is that where you found it? Well, you ought to know. But frankly, Corbin... I think you overplayed it a bit when you tucked part of one of Amerigo's monogram shirts there with it. I don't know what you're talking about. Actually, I mean it. Then what were you doing down there? And, brother, you better make it good. The same thing you were, trying to find out what happened to Ricky Amerigo. I tell you, Dalla, I was his best friend. It's a true fact. If his fiddle was down there, too, I didn't see it. I wish I could believe you. But the way it looks from here, you were willing to have the Amati violin found lying out there in that salt marsh because you couldn't get rid of it without exposing yourself. It didn't put any money in your pocket the way you figure Amerigo's death will. The way it looks from here, Dollar, that's where you're wrong. Yeah? Yeah, actually wrong. If Amerigo's dead, I collect in his insurance as his beneficiary. That's what the policy says, but believe all me. Right, all right. But you think I wouldn't collect on the Amati fiddle, whether it was found or if it wasn't found. That's where you're wrong. What are you talking about? Because I'm also a beneficiary to his will. How do you know? <laughs> 
Because I'm not only the sole and only heir in his will, I'm also the executive of... Uh, yeah, executive of his estate, too. Oh. Yeah. So if I was the heavy, what would I take a chance leaving a $30,000 fiddle laying around in some swamp? Hmm? Cover up? $30,000 worth? All right, what did you do with a hacksaw? You mean somebody sawed up the fiddle? Oh, no, let me see. No, 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 easy, will you? Somebody saw it partway through a steering arm on Amerigo's car to make it crash. Murder? Well, that's a pretty fair question. Oh, no, oh, no, darling, no. Oh, no, who would murder a nice, sweet guy like Ricky? Maybe he was a drunk, maybe he hit the skids, but he had no enemies. He couldn't have. Okay. Please. Maybe he was just a drunken bum, worthless. He threw away a concert career, but he was still... He was a gentleman, an actual gentleman. And he was a sweet guy. Nobody could have murdered him. Oh, no, no, darling, not Ricky. Pete, Pete, would you... Who was it? Tell me, huh? Who was the lousy punk? I'll kill him. Okay, Pete, I believe you. I don't care whether you believe me or not. Will you tell me who done it? Pete. Ricky. Pete, will you listen to me? I'm listening. Now, look here. Look here and tell me. Is this Ricky's Amati violin? Yeah, that's... That's it. Ah, oh, poor Ricky. Poor drunk... You're lover. sure? I'm sure. All right, Pete, I'm going to give it to you straight. All I ask is you now tell listen to me, me will you? We don't know who killed Ricky Amerigo. We haven't even found his body. The Port Morris police are still trying, of course, but it... It could have been carried by the tide through that in, inlet, the Lucky Hole Creek, right on out to the sea. Or, of course, it may appear somewhere along the creek. It'll take weeks to search that swamp thoroughly. Now, Anyhow... if they do find him, I want to see he gets a decent burial. Will you promise me? Okay, I'll try, but listen, will you? Because of the sawed-through steering arm, his death was made to look accidental. Double indemnity. And you're the beneficiary. He not only wasn't making you any money because his drinking kept him off the concert stage, but he owed you money, plenty. Now, that's a motive... As for opportunity, who else had as much as you? Nobody, nobody, nobody. But I love the poor guy. I try to keep him alive and get him back in his own. You told me, and I believe you. But the fact remains that the insurance company, the police, even a pretty smart private detective I know, all figure you for number one suspect. And they hope to accumulate enough evidence to move in on you. And you're with them, No, no. What? Yesterday right here you told me. Sure, I know I did. But I've had time to think it out. Now, pinning it on you is just too easy. Much too easy. I'll say it to your face, Pete. You're no metal giant. But only another fool would let circumstantial evidence like that pile up against him and then commit a murder like that. I may be wrong. Lord, help you if I am and find out. But I think you're clean. I swear I am. I'm going to play it that way unless I find solid reason to change my mind. Because, Pete... Yeah, Johnny? You're the one person who can help me in this case. I'll do anything. Actually, anything. Just ask me. All right. Now, first, tell me where you were last Friday evening when Amerigo's car made that dive off that bridge. Alibi? That's right, brother, and you can be sure I'll check it. At Willie's. All right, who's Willie? Willie? Willie Elliott. He's a saxophone player. one of my clients. He was a friend of Ricky's, too. Well, where can I find him? What's his address? Uh, I'll write it down for you. We had a four-handed poker game. Who else in the game? Uh, well, Jerry Goldsmith, one twenty. He know Ricardo, too? Oh, yeah. Composer, conductor, violin player. Fiddle player, huh? Who was yeah. the fourth? Uh, Eric Snowden. Who's he? He's a fiddle maker. He lives at his shop. Uh, I'll write that Fiddle down. maker, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Here you are. Yeah, he was the sole and only man Ricky would ever let touch his Amati for repairs and fixing up, you understand? Who else were good friends of Ricardo's? Ah, uh, <laughs> while he was making it, plenty. Lately, nobody. You sure? Oh, nobody. Johnny, I know. Of course, he hung around a lot of bars. He was a regular. Give me a list. Well, let's see. There's a little place over on Pine Street called the Yellow Lamp. Yeah. Expense account item 9, 370. A quick sandwich for Pete Corbin and myself and a flock of phone calls to Pete's poker pals. Just to make sure they were in and available when I could get around to see them. I had to phony up an excuse for seeing each of them. A friend of Pete's just in from out of town suggested I give you a call, that sort of thing. And apparently it didn't arouse any suspicion. At least it was a start. And for the first time... Call it a hunch or whatever you like. I felt I was going to get somewhere in this case. As it turns out, I was. Believe me.
Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a trio of musicians. The question, which one's story was playing a little flat? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Sam Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. You? You are investigate. Hello? What'd you say? Who is this? You are investigate Ricardo Amerigo. Yeah, that's right. I'm investigating the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Who are you? Hello? Hey, listen, do you have some information, a tip on the case? Who are you? Hello? Hello. Hey, what is this, a gag? Yeah. Or is this supposed to be some kind of a cockeyed threat, a warning for me to get off the case? This is no gag. Hello? Hello? Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of further expenses incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Expense account item 10, $21 even, for drinks, for me alone. And believe it or not, I'm cold sober. But the least I could do was buy one at each of the bars on the list Pete Corbin gave me. A list of all the places Ricardo Amerigo used to hang out before his disappearance in a South Jersey swamp. In spite of all the circumstantial evidence pointing his way, I still wasn't convinced Corbin had engineered an accident to kill Amerigo. Pete had also given me a list of Amerigo's closest personal friends, three of them. I told them I'd see them later. Meanwhile, I hoped to learn something helpful from the places where he apparently spent most of his time during his last few months on this earth. But the result can pretty much be summed up at the last bar on the list, the Hangover Club. There you are. Cost you 80 cents. Here. Keep the change. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's just like I tell you, mister. You to come in here, buy a few drinks, sit and drink them, leave. Well, uh, didn't he ever talk to anybody? <laughs> Not even me. Just sit here and get plastered. Told one of his friends to come in and drag him away. Who? Did you know any of them? Oh, sure. Well, he got your saxophone player at the Crystal Room. Oh. Who else? Jerry somebody, fiddle player. <sighs> Jerry Goldsmith. Yeah, they're on my list. Huh? Anybody else? No. Nah. Oh, yeah, away, well, sure. His agent, Pete Corbin. Yeah, that's... Hey, if you knew that, why'd you ask me? I've heard the same thing exactly 20 times so far today. Yeah, well, I'll say this for them. They must have loved Amerigo. They might have fought and argued with him when they caught him in here, but it was all for one thing, to try and straighten him out. But, mister, he was too far in. Yeah. Yeah, shame for a talent like him, concert violinist, 
to hit the skids the way he'd done, but nobody couldn't seem to help. The story had been exactly the same in every bar on the list. Apparently, the only friends, the only associates that Ricardo Amerigo had had were those Pete Corbin had named. Expense account item 11, 110. Cab fare to the apartment of William Elliott over on Callowell Street. Same story. No new names of friends or even acquaintances. He and Corbin and Goldsmith and the old English violin maker, Eric Snowden, had known Amerigo for years, good times and bad. Had all tried to help him, straighten him out, were deeply grieved over his death. Item 12, 570. Cab to a suburb called Lenark to see Jerry Goldsmith, where... I'll admit I expected to get the same story, the same names, no more, no less. This time I took the Amati violin with me. Hi. Who are you? I'm Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, you called. Come in. Friend of Pete Corbin's, you said. Uh, sit down. Mr. Goldsmith, I'll get right to the point. I'm an insurance investigator, and I that came in... That violin case. That... that looks like Ricardo's. It is. And... and the Amati? Yes. Oh, thank God. I found it down on the South Jersey swamp where Amerigo's car plunged off the bridge. It had been lying there, hidden by the marche for several days. Is it all right? May I see it? Well, one reason I brought it along was so you could substantiate identification. I make no bones about it, Mr. Dollar. I coveted this violin like nothing else in the world. I've played many fine instruments, strads, guanieri, even this, my stainer. I see. But Ricardo's Amati, it... There was something between that violin and myself that could exist for no one else. Not even Ricardo Amerigo when he was at his greatest. And when he started his, his terrible downfall. You, uh, wanted it even more, huh? Yes, more than anything else in the world. Enough to kill for it? <laughs> Mr. Dollar, I should kill you for even thinking such a thing. I love Ricardo. Okay, sorry. The fact remains, somebody sawed through a steering arm on his car. Oh, I still can't believe that. No one could have killed Ricardo, no one. Only three others beside myself even knew Ricardo these past few years. Corbin, Elliot, and Eric Snowden. Pity him, feed him, clothe him... Try to fight him away from the liquor that had ruined his brilliant career, yes. Even hate him at times for what he'd done to his life, but murder... I'm sorry. May I? Sure. It, uh, is the Amati. Yes. Yes, I know it as well as I know my own. May I play it? Sure. What's the matter? Uh, I don't know. Mr. Dollar, it, it isn't here. The tone, the brilliance, the response, it isn't here. Something's wrong. You're sure this is the Amati? Oh, of course I'm sure, but something's wrong. Something's happened to it. It, it, it isn't the same. Well, do you think the dampness of the swamp might no, have done... No, no, you can see. It's, it's all right, but... But it isn't. Well, I I don't know anything about violins. There are no cracks, no marks, no damage. Uh, even the sound post. But you're sure it's Ricardo Amerigo Zamati? Yes, yes, I told you so. I couldn't possibly be mistaken. But something is... Mr. Dollar... Well? I, I don't know. You know something? I don't either. I'm afraid I left Jerry Goldsmith rather abruptly and in a rather distressed condition. But I had plans, and the sooner I could carry them out, the better. Item 13 on expense account, 420, taxi fare back into town at the shop of Eric Snowden, violin maker. The only man who'd been allowed to touch Ricardo Amerigo's Amati, except, of course, for the music store owner who'd cleaned it up after I found it in the swamp. Yeah, it was possible he had done something to it that would destroy its tone. But for some reason or other, call it a hunch if you like, I hope not. Snowden's shop was located on a colorful little side street, really not much more than an alley called Eisminger Street. 
Right in the middle of one of the busiest sections of the city, surrounded by skyscrapers, office stores, and all the traffic that goes with them. This one little alley. Except for Snowden's place, the tiny buildings packed side by side are all residences. Left over from years gone by when this was a residential section. And still unspoiled by the bustling activity around them. Thank you, Mr. Romandy. And I'll be sure to hear you at the Academy of Music Saturday night. Uh, sir, sir. Mr. Snowden? Uh, yes, I'm Eric Snowden, but that, that violin case. I'm Johnny Dollar. I fought you. Oh, please come in. Uh, Mr. Dollar. That's right. It's Ricardo Amerigo. It's been found. Uh, please let me. Mr. Snowden, I'm an insurance investigator. Part of my job has been recovery of this violin. It's possible loss was the most heartbreaking thing I ever contemplated, but you found it. I uh, think so. You think? I don't understand. Well, here, take it. Examine it. Yes, but uh, not here. Come, we'll go up to my workroom on the second floor, where I can check it thoroughly. I'll lock this front door so we won't be disturbed. Now, come with me, please. I can't believe it. It's so wonderful you found it. It would have been a terrible loss to the world. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, you're not a violinist yourself? No. I'm afraid the only violin music I know is what I hear and... Uh, now, here we are. Oh, quite a shop. Most of the finest violins in the world have been here, one time or another. The Stradivarius of Yasha. It was quite a shop. The, violins the walls of were lined with fiddles Prince in the making Christ and with tools. Eugene some familiar and I some that were... Oh, wait a minute. Hacksaws. A couple of them small and delicate, Boy, but one a big one and dirty. As Eric Snowden turned away to open the violin case, I ran my fingers over the blades. Yeah, there was grease on one. Axle grease. Uh, now here... Well, Mr. Snowden? Yes, Mr. Dollar. This is Ricardo Emerigo's violin. You're certain of that? Eh? Do you think that I, of all people, wouldn't know? Mr. Dollar, aside from Ricardo himself, I am the only person who has touched this magnificent instrument for years now. I must confess, I resent your least question of my judgment. All right, I'll be honest with you. I don't pretend to know much about violin, so I had somebody play it a while ago. Sacrilege. All right, be that as it may, it didn't sound to him or even to me like a $30,000 violin. And whom did you permit to lay hands on this priceless instrument? A friend. I should be horsewhipped. Only an artist. A great artist should be permitted to handle a thing like this. But I suppose you uh, understand that, Mr. Dollar. I don't suppose you... Well, go on. Mr. Dollar, someone has tampered with this. Oh? Of course it doesn't sound right. Did this friend of yours presume to be a violin maker, too? What do you mean? The sound post, the placement of the bridge. Of course it doesn't sound right. Now, now why does somebody have to... Do you want to answer that? Uh, no, no, let them wait. This is more important. No wonder you or your friend or anyone else question the validity of this instrument. Hey, whoever that is down there, he really wants you. Look here, a simple adjustment here and here. Oh, bother. Go ahead, I'll wait. All right, I shall be right back. It was a quick suspicion when I spotted the hacks on the wall, and I couldn't forget the warning over the phone. While Snowden waited on his customer, I poked around the shop some more, looking for goodness knows what. And I found exactly nothing. No doubt Snowden was telling the truth. Until I started to sit down to wait for him, and as I pulled over a stool, I knocked open the door of a cabinet next to his workbench. I started to close it again, and then I saw it. Hanging there on a the hook was a violin. I grabbed it out of the cabinet and held it under the light beside the one in Amerigo's case. I held them up together. It was unbelievable. The shape, the color, the markings, nicks on the little pegs you tune them up with, the... Spot of stain on the scroll, even a tiny, almost indiscernible scratch on the back. An old pencil mark on the inside near the label. It was impossible, but it was true. These two violins were absolutely identical. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, 
Well, it's a wind-up. But believe me, a wind-up with a real twist. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Sam Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. John? John, this is... Don't tell me. Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, listen, John, I know you found his Amati violin. Are you sure? But Ricardo Amerigo himself, nothing. And after all, there's not only the $20,000 policy on him, but... What do you mean, am I sure? Are you sure it was Amerigo's Amati violin I found? Why, of course... What do you mean? What if it wasn't? What if it was just an imitation? John, stop it. That's impossible. What do you mean? That $30,000 well-insured fiddle I picked up in the South Jersey swamps may be a phony. Oh, no. For heaven's sakes, come over here to the office and tell me... Oh, take it easy here, old boy, until I've had time to find out a few things. John? See ya. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. To the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is a final accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. When Ricardo Amerigo's car was hauled out of a swamp somewhere near Port Morris, New Jersey, there was no sign of his body. Only a sawed through steering arm on the car that indicated somebody had done him dirt. However, I did find the fiddle. The $30,000 Amati that had helped him become one of the world's top concert violinists. Anyhow, with a fiddle under my arm, I ended up at the shop of violin maker Eric Snowden for final confirmation that it was the genuine Amati that I'd found. This Eric confirmed. However, while we were in the second floor workroom of his shop on Eisminger Street talking about the fiddle, somebody pounded on the street door downstairs. Oh, bother. I I'll be back in a moment, Mr. Dollar. And that's when I accidentally, and so help me it was accidental, I knocked open the door of a cabinet and discovered another violin, identical in every respect with the one I'd found in the swamp at the scene of Amerigo's accidental death. Okay, so I did exactly what you would have done. I put the one in the cabinet into Amerigo's case and the one from the case into the cabinet. One of them was the genuine Amati. But which one? I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but he was so insistent, I thought he was one of my, uh, shall we say, better clients. As it turned out, it was just a youngster who wanted to see one of the new G-strings. A youngster? <laughs> oh, I see you're joking. But now, let me take this magnificent instrument, readjust the sound post and bridge so that it... No, no, wait, Mr. Snowden. Eh? Uh, it's later than I thought. There are some things I must do immediately. Suppose I come back here later. Very well. Meantime, I shall make the adjustments on the Amati to restore its No, tone. no, I've got to take it with me. But I don't understand. There are a few things in this case I don't understand right this minute, but uh, I hope to before very long. Uh, Mr. Dolly, you talk in riddles. Why don't you leave the violin? No, thanks. Me? I'll see you later. Uh, but, but please be careful with it. If anything should happen to that priceless... Don't worry. Nothing will happen to it. I found that I'd almost spoken too soon. 
For I found her down the stairs, across the floor of the store, and out of the door. Without the caution, the book says one should exercise when leaving a suspect in a case. I'd no sooner got out on the street. It was a flower pot, big enough to have killed a horse in its fall from the upper story window ledge. Oh, no. Good heavens, wait, Mr. Dollar. That was an accident. But I didn't I wait. Expense account item 14, 10 cents. Phone call to Harry Branson at the insurance company to have the police put a man on Eric Snowden's shop immediately to make sure he wouldn't try to skip. Item 15, 750 for a cab to the house of fiddle playing Jerry Goldsmith out in Lanark. Mr. Dollar. Hello, Goldsmith. I didn't expect it. You left in rather a hurry earlier. Sorry, I had to keep a date. Hey, look, Jerry. When I was here before. You still have the violin? Yes. Yes, when I was here earlier and you played it, you didn't seem to think it was really Ricardo Amerigo Zamati. No, no, I, I didn't say that. At least Well, I... at least it didn't sound like it when you played it. Yes, Mr. Dollar, that's right. Oh, now, think a minute. You were a bit upset, excited, uh, whatever you want to call it, when I brought it to you. Yes, that's true. Nevertheless, and I, I think do... you were also afraid I might have suspected you of Amerigo's murder when you admitted his violin was the one thing you wanted more than anything else in life. Except, of course, to have Ricardo straighten out. Become himself again. Become the artist again. Deserve to have this... Oh, I don't know. Whatever I say seems to make it sound like a... I don't know. I know, look, Jerry. Calm down, will you? I'm not trying to pin a murder rap on you. Calm down and do something for me, will you? Why, yes, of course. What? Here. Have you had something done to it to restore the tone it used to it have? It hasn't been touched by anyone else since I laid my hands on it. But I want you to play it again. Yes, of course I will. But didn't you say that some old fool with a music store cleaned it up? Jerry, it hasn't been touched by anyone else since I laid my hands on it. Now play it. All right. Go ahead, Jerry. isn't it? Yes. Yes, it's it's the Amati. A beautiful, wonderful... Funny. I never realized what a violin could... Can you hear me, Jerry? Yes. Yes. And to think it's taken something like this to lead me to a killer. Expense account item 16, 420. Cab to Philadelphia Mutual, the office of Harry Branson. But if you're right, John, you mustn't go out there alone. Don't you understand if he's the man who planned the murder of Ricardo Amerigo? He wouldn't stop... Yes, yes, I had the police put a man out there to cover his shop. But, John, I still think... It's... Expense account item 17, $1.60. The buck was a tip for going through a couple of red lights. Back to the shop of the violin maker, Eric Snowden. Mr. Dollar. Hi, Mr. Snowden. I'm afraid I left you rather abruptly a while ago. Mention it, Mr. Dollar, it's you. I, that, that, that near accident when you left that flower pot, I, I don't know how it possibly could have shifted on the window ledge up there. On the third floor window ledge of this little combination store, workshop, and home of yours. That much I did notice while I was ducking it. If it had come off a second-floor window, you know I might have suspected you of giving it a helpful shove. Oh, good heavens, Mr. Dollar, you can't possibly mean that. All right, forget it for the moment. Uh, but how can Let's you... go up to your workshop on the second floor. Come on. Well, well yes, of course. Uh, but uh, may I ask why? I want to show you something, and I think you know what. No, I certainly don't. Unless something has happened to the Amati. Oh, something certainly has. You damaged it since you were here. No such luck. Uh, Mr. Dollar, please, what are you talking about? Okay, here. Now, tell me the truth. Is this Ricardo Amerigo's Amati violin? Yes. Yes. I've told you so. You're sure? Uh, of course I'm sure. You know something? You aren't, but I am. What? Now, open that cabinet there beside your work table. What for? Because I tell you to. But, but I... Uh, 
Just what are you getting at, Dollar? Are you going to open it or shall I? No. Get out of here. This is my shop, my place. You you can't do this sort of thing to me. Would you rather the police did? They're on their way. The police? But I... Well? There's no need to open it. Ricardo Amerigo Zamati is in it. Well, that's where you're wrong. This is the Amati. In this case, the one in the cabinet is the identical copy of the Amati that you made. Yes, Mr. Dollar. Why, Snowden? Because the loss of this priceless instrument would have been unthinkable. $30,000 insurance on it. Oh, money doesn't buy a violin like this. It must be played by an artist, by many artists, like the artist Ricardo was. So, so when Ricardo disappeared... Or was murdered? When Ricardo disappeared, I had to make sure that the Amati would, would still... I didn't murder him. Isn't this the hacksaw that cut the steering rod on his car? Well, Snowden, isn't it? Yes. Uh, no, I and mean... And because of it and your crazy plan to keep the real Amati, you and you alone are going to take the rap for Amerigo's murder. No, no, please. Ricky! Ricky? No use, Eric. That's right, Mr. Dollar. I'm Ricardo Amerigo. you what? The dirty, drunken has-been that started all this. Sawed through the steering rod on my car, wrecked it in the swamp, left some of my clothing there. That phony fiddle was my idea. Not to collect the insurance on it, not that alone. But to make sure it could come back again. Be played again by somebody that deserved to play it. The way I... The way perhaps one time I deserved to play it. But, Ricardo... A man disappears, murder, whatever. There's a fuss about it for a while and it's over. But this... No. No, this must live. This violin... You will now. The world will be the better for it. But you... And this apparent murder... The insurance was my last hope of paying back Pete Corbin, my agent, and the others who tried so hard to straighten me out. Pay back some of the money and the heartbreak they spent on me. Or let your insurance company pay them back. Because I never could... I couldn't even leave my hiding place here in Eric's house. Because I knew that sooner or later he'd pity me enough to give me more of the drink that's been all I've been living for. Eric, God bless him. Eric knew, of course, but only he. Be kind to him, if you can. Ricky. That's all, Mr. Dollar. Oh, unless... Will you buy me a drink? before you call in the police. Expense account item 17, 850. One bottle of the best I could buy before I call in the police. Item 18, hotel in Philadelphia, miscellaneous fare, back to Hartford. Total expense account, 182.65. Remarks? No insurance payment necessary on either the Amati or the man. And I guess he really was a man more than he knew. What the courts will do about him and about Eric Snowden, well, the courts will do. And I'm glad I have to have no part in it. (laughs) You know, it's funny. Somehow I think I have a little better appreciation for music now than... Oh, well. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, the Duke Red Matter. A racehorse that could only be stopped by a killer. And the killer didn't stop with horses. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in the cast were Harry Bartell, Lawrence Dobkin, Victor Perrin, Barney Phillips, Forrest Lewis, Eric Snowden, Herb Vigran, and James McCallion. 
Musical supervisor and violinist, Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mr. Costello at the Plantagen Hotel in Vicksburg, Virginia. You left word? Oh, yes, Mr. Costello. I'm acting for Eastern Seaboard Casualty Insurance. You know, investigation. Oh? I understand you had a burglary down there. We sure did, Mr. Dollar. Well, the main reason I wanted to talk to you, Mr. Costello, was to let you know I'm getting the first plane out of Hartford as soon as the weather clears. Uh, You're coming here to Vicksburg? Yes, that's right. Eastern Seaboard Casualties asked me to investigate the burglary for them. Good. Then I'll expect you when I see you. And I'll be there. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Chief Accountant, Eastern Seaboard Casualty Insurance Company, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the plant agent matter. Expense account item one, two dollars, cab fare, my apartment to the Hartford airport. Item two, one hundred seventy-three dollars. One airline ticket from Hartford to Vicksburg, Virginia, and back again. We took off in ten below zero weather about one thirty in the afternoon. By five o'clock, we circled into Vicksburg for a landing. Item three, five dollars, cab fare, to the Plantation Hotel, three miles outside of town. A pleasant, spacious, gentle old building set back among the wintry trees. Fifteen minutes after checking in, Mr. Costello appeared, wrung my hand, and reported that the Vicksburg police had apprehended the burglar who had rifled the hotel safe the night before. All of the loot had been recovered. As a matter of form, I spent two hours with the police itemizing the stolen property, which was all intact. Then I returned to the hotel, assured Mr. Costello that everything would be all right, and got busy trying to make return reservations for Hartford. Now, the rest of this report is by way of apology for my tardiness in submitting the expense accounts. In between phone calls to the airport, I went downstairs to the bar for a drink, and then stepped outside for a walk and a breath of fresh air. In the back of the parking lot behind the hotel, a blonde woman, about 30, in a green suit, was talking to a tall, typically dark man who had his back to me. They were arguing about something. As I walked past them, I couldn't help hearing too well. Please, please help me. Are you talking to me? Yes, please. On your way, mister. This is private. You hear me? (laughs) Just keep your hands to yourself, bud. Well, keep rolling, then. We're having a little argument private. Please, please, I don't know who you are, but I'm... Shut up. She's uh, had a little too much to drink, mister, that's all. Oh, that's all? Well, it doesn't look that way to me. Now, what's this all about? I just told you, Nosy, she's had a little too much to drink. Now, go on, bud. Get on your way. Wait a minute. I told you to keep your hands to yourself. Yeah. You! I don't want to keep it up. You hear me? Yes. I hear you. And I... I'll let it go this time, mister. Just this once. Do you want to have him hauled in, miss? Oh, no. No, that's all right. It's all right. Okay, then, okay. Come on, beat it, you. Now, listen, Beat Buster. it, I said. She's tired of you, and so am I. Go on, beat it. Okay. 
Just remember, Amy, I was only trying to talk some sense into you. So long, hero. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was awfully kind of you. Okay, did he hurt you? Yes. Where it hurts the most, I guess. I'll never get accustomed to being disappointed in people. Oh, well, he didn't look like your type anyhow. So why don't you just... Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, hey, look now. This is just the end of everything. Everything. Yeah, I, I know well, maybe it looks that way, but, but maybe it isn't. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry to have caused you all this trouble. Well, that's okay. It must look rather cheap and dingy. I mean... I don't know what I mean. Well, look, uh, let me ask you something. Did you really have too much to drink tonight? No. No, I only had one drink with him. All right, then maybe you'll let me buy you one. How about it? You're very kind. You look like you should be with someone for a little while right now. So what do you say? How about it? You're a very kind man. And that's the way it began. In the parking lot outside of the Plantation Hotel in Vicksburg, Virginia. She trembled a little when I led her back inside to the warmth of the bar and the people and sat her down at a booth. Looking back on it now, I guess we had a rather strained, one-sided conversation. She did all the listening and seemed preoccupied with her problems, whatever they were. Even though I'm not the greatest wit in the world, I did manage to get a faint smile out of her. It was a nice smile from a warm, frank mouth. Item four, two drinks for us. (laughs) <laughs> That's cute hey, See there Next thing you know You'll be telling me a joke Oh that reminds me That reminds me of another one It's uh, it's one of the oldest And most respected jokes In the country You've probably heard it A thousand times It seems Ten men were standing In the rain Under an umbrella And none of them got wet Well Just about then A fellow walked up You You've been very Very kind to me Thank you again Well I'm I'm glad you feel better. Miss, uh... Are you, uh, from here in Vicksburg? No, my home's in Hartford, Connecticut. I flew down here this afternoon on business. I'm waiting for a flight out. Oh. What's your name? Johnny Dollar. Thank you again, Johnny Dollar. Hmm? Thank you for not asking me my name. For not asking me about the man in the parking lot. For not asking me to explain what my trouble is. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. And thank you for sitting here with me this little while and trying to make me laugh. Hmm. You really feel all right now, huh? Yes, I think so. Good, that's swell. Because I wouldn't want to let you go if I thought you were going to step outside and start crying again. No. No, I won't do that, I promise. You sure? Positive. Okay. Ah, you want one more for the road? Oh, thank you, but I'd better not, Mr. Dollar. I really should be getting home. Well, uh, will everything be all right at home? Oh, oh yes. He wasn't my husband or my boyfriend even. He won't bother me. Okay, then. Here, let me help you on with your coat. Thank you. There you are. You have a car? No, I'll get a cab. There's always one out in front. Good, I'll help you. Thank you. Say, uh, look, I'm going to tell you something. I'm staying here in Vicksburg at the Plantagen, and I doubt if I'll be able to get a plane out tonight. Probably not until tomorrow sometime. So look, if you need me for any reason at all, why don't you just call me? Okay? Yes. Thank you. Good. Cab, taxi. You're still worried about him, aren't you? Why do you say that? The way you looked around when we stepped outside here just now. Would you like me to see you home? No. No, thank you. You've done enough already. And about him... I made a mistake, that's all. Oh, we all make mistakes, so forget about it. Well, I'm afraid this one can't be corrected very easily. But here's my cab. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night. You and I will probably never meet again. But I shan't forget your kindness. Thank you. Okay, good night. Downtown, please. I hope you have a nice trip home, Mr. Dollar. Oh! Hey, whoa, driver, hold it. Hey, anything wrong? What is it? I don't know. 
I have the strangest feeling. Wait a minute, Donna. Hey, look, do you feel all right? You're shivering. Yes, I... I know I... Oh, oh it hurts. Oh, what, what hurts? It hurts. I didn't think he... What, what is it? What can I do? Help me. Please, Mr. Dollar. Help me. Let's go, driver. She fell back across the seat of the cab, writhing with pain. I took her in my arms and tried to find out what it was, but by that time she wasn't able to speak. In another ten seconds, she was unconscious. The cab driver delivered us to an emergency hospital five minutes later. They carried her in through the ambulance entrance. I let the driver go and waited around the desk to see if I could learn what happened. Just waited. Vicksburg emergency. Waited. One moment, please. Go ahead, please. Vicksburg emergency. Not at this time of the night, sir. You'll have to call first thing in the morning. I'd suggest any time after 7.30. Yes, sir. Yes? Hey, uh, look, would it be all right to go back and talk to the doctor now? I'm afraid not, sir. Well, could you bring him out here? I've been waiting for quite... I'm sure he'll be out in a very short while. He knows you're waiting to talk with him. I thought maybe he forgot me. No, sir. I just want to make sure she's all right. The doctor will be out. Vicksburg emergency. Just a moment, I'll connect you. Go ahead, please. Has she had many of these attacks, sir? Hmm. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. I just met her. Oh. Well, if you'd like, we could call you at home and let you know how she is. This isn't my home. I'm on my way out of town as soon as I can get a plane. I'll wait. Certainly. Excuse me. Yes, doctor. Yes, he's right here. Yes, sir, thank you. The doctor will see you now, sir. Good, thanks. End of the hall, room 111. Okay, thank you. I don't know what it was or why that hallway looked so long to me. Call it an old-fashioned premonition or what have you. That's what I had walking down the hall to see a doctor about a girl I'd known only a few minutes. There were three people in the room, two doctors in their white clothes and a nurse. I can still see the light burning above their heads, the way they looked tired, exhausted. All three of them had been working very hard. Doctor? Yes? Oh, uh... You're the man who was with her. Yeah, that's right. How is she? When did this happen? About a half hour ago. I put her in a cab at the Plantagen Hotel, and she complained of feeling sick. So I brought her here, but she lost consciousness in the cab. I see. Sit down, please. Oh, why? Some papers we want you to fill out. Just routine. Oh. Your name, please? Johnny Dollar. And she is Mrs. Dollar? No. Oh, I see. Uh, you're a friend of hers, Mr. Dollar. Well, yes. Look. What is it, Doctor? What's the matter with her? I can't exactly tell you that right now, Mr. Dollar. What? Well, now, wait a minute. Why can't... We have to contact her family first, Mr. Dollar. This girl is dead. Now, if you're willing to... Picture it. Yourself in my position, I mean. I'd known the girl only a few minutes. I didn't even know her name. Yet somehow I'd become closely involved with her. Too much so, I guess. All I knew about her was that she was someone who had died while asking me to help her. Under the circumstances, what would you do? Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's exciting episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... How can you help a dead girl? Somebody had to help her. And guess who? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson, It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Are you the Mr. Dollar from Hartford? That's right. Who's this? Jim Akins, Vicksburg Police Department. I'm sending a car over to pick you up, Mr. Dollar. Some questions I want to ask you about that young lady you were with last night. I hope you weren't planning on leaving town. Of course I wasn't. I canceled my plane reservations last night. If you tell me where you're located, I'll come down by myself. No sense getting head up. You aren't in your own backyard now, you know, Dollar. I know where I am, the town where a girl died in my arms. If you can stop getting lazy with me for a minute, maybe you can tell me who she was. Why? Because I'd like to talk to her family. I was the last one to see her alive. Who is she? We haven't identified her yet. To us, she's still Jane Doe. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Vicksburg, Virginia, to... (laughs) to Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the plantation matter. A real mystery about a very mysterious girl who happened to be dead. Expense account item five, ten cents, one morning newspaper, which carried a two-inch story and a half-inch space about an unidentified girl who had died at Vicksburg Emergency Hospital the previous evening. I was reading it over in the lobby of the Plantation Hotel when one of the Vicksburg police force stepped up to the desk and asked for my room number. He was a swarthy man in a black suit, plain clothes type. Well? I beg pardon? I'm Johnny Dollar. Oh. Jim Akins. We talked on the phone a little while ago. You said you were sending a car. Well, you sounded so huffy about everything, I thought I'd drop over myself to say hello. I got the car outside. Okay, okay, let's go then. Where are you from, Dollar? Hartford, Connecticut. I'm an insurance investigator. Look, I talked to a man in your burglary division yesterday about the burglary they had at the hotel yesterday. I was sent down here by Eastern Seaboard Casualty Insurance Company. You got any identification on you? Yeah, sure. Here. Okay. Look like who you say you are. Now, just what was your connection with that girl who died at the emergency hospital? I met her outside in the parking lot last night, back at this hotel. She was with a man. I don't know who he was. They were having an argument. I stopped when she asked me to help her. I, uh, I got rid of the man and took her inside here and bought her a drink. Then I started to put her in a cab to send her home. But she got sick before the cab could take off, so I took her to the hospital. She died there. And that, Mr. Reagans, is it. How long did you know her? About a half hour, all told. She didn't tell you her name? No. Where she lived? No. Hmm. The name of this man she was with in the parking lot, who was he? I haven't the slightest idea. Well, what kind of trouble was she having with him? She didn't tell me that either. I didn't ask her. But you sat in the cocktail lounge over there and you had a drink or two. One. One. No name, no address, no nothing. Well, maybe we better do all our talking downtown. Anything you say, Higgins. Let's go. Higgins turned out to be a lieutenant, and it took him the whole ride downtown to thaw out and make up his mind that I was just as concerned about what had happened to the unidentified girl as he was. He rephrased, but asked me the same questions in front of a stenographer when we got down to his office. He was still asking me questions when he led me and the police stenographer to the basement of the building, the morgue. And she didn't say anything to you about herself before she collapsed, huh? No. All I know is what I've told you. You're sure? Positive. Hey, look, let me ask you one. I've put up with yours for over an hour now. (laughs) Why, sure. What killed her? Yeah. Well, do you know? No, we're still trying to find out. What did you talk about while you were having a drink with her? She asked me for help, that's all. It seems she needed somebody else to do the talking at the time, so I did it. I made jokes and tried to get her to laugh. I was a great big cut-up. Get sawed me if you want. It won't do much good. Still got some things to find out. Yeah. Lousy, ain't it? It sure is. This is the girl you were with last night? Yes. You're positive? I'm positive. 
Okay, Dolly, you want to sign this for the records? Well, that's... That's good. All right, Sam, you can send this on upstairs. We'll be up pretty soon. Now, Dollar, did anyone there at the hotel bar seem to know her? I don't know. Cocktail waitress, somebody like that? I don't know. Well, I do. We asked around. No one there had ever seen in the Plantagen Hotel before. Tell me something, Dolly. You ever worked on one like this? No, not quite. Okay, then. I'm going to tell you what we're up against. All the clothes she was wearing was standard brand stuff. Mostly come from stores downtown, some of them New York. It's going to take us a long time to check them out. We may not be able to trace them at all. We're going to work on the cleaning marks, too, and that'll take time. Now, from what you say and from what she said, and that wasn't much, she's probably a local girl. Somebody's wondering about her, but nobody come in and make out a report asking for her. I hate to do it. I might have to take a picture, run it in tonight's paper, just to find out who she is. That could be pretty lousy for somebody. It's a lousy business. I thought you could help me, Dollar. How? Well, two things. One, that bird she was with. He was arguing with out in the parking lot, you say. That meant he must have had a car out there. But you didn't bother to take a look at it. No, no, I didn't. And another thing now, where's her purse? I don't know. Well, she must have powdered her nose when she sat down to have that drink with you. Every woman does. She must have reached for a cigarette or something in that purse. So where's that purse? I don't know. Well, now, you see? You see how much help you are to me? Oh, just a second. Morg, Lieutenant Akins. Oh, yeah, put him on. While Lieutenant Akins talked on the telephone, I lit a cigarette. After that, I tried to interest myself in a calendar that was hanging on the wall. After that, I tried tying both shoelaces. But wherever my eyes roved around that white-tiled room, somehow, they always came back to rest on the quiet, still form of the girl who'd asked me for help. By any standard, she was attractive. Fine, golden hair spun out of smooth white skin. I remember her eyes had been very big and very brown. Now they were closed. But she looked more asleep than, than what she was. She looked as though she might wake up any minute and answer me if I said out loud what I was saying to myself silently. How can I help you? Let's get out of here, Dollar. Okay by me. That was the lab on the phone. Had a little trouble with analysis. What analysis? What kind of trouble? Identifying. They called in a toxicologist from the university. A drug called perimythol killed her. Perimythol? That's a new one on me. Yeah, me too. Petrol-based stuff. Now, they figured it had been in her stomach an hour or so before she collapsed. Could be a suicide, judging from the way she acted and talked to you. What about the boyfriend? Well, that seems to fit in okay. Told you she was disappointed in him, didn't she? Well, sometimes women want to end it all in front of a guy they're having trouble with. It'll probably turn out that Oh, way. you talk like a cop, Akins. That's what I Everything's am. so simple. Make it fit into your formula. This girl knocked herself off because she lost her boyfriend. This girl killed herself because she lost her job. Fill it in, fill it in. Get it off the whoa, books. Whoa, Dollar, whoa. What's the matter with you? What are you getting at? Oh, Oh, I don't know. Forget it, will you, Lieutenant? No, now, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. I'm not all cop, Dollar. I saw her laying there, too. And I can see she was a nice girl. And something went awful wrong with her. If I'd been the last one to be with and talk to her alive, why, I'd probably be taking it the same way you are. But take it easy. Sorry, Lieutenant. Yeah. Well, I'll buy you some breakfast. He did... But it didn't help much. And after that, we shook hands and parted. Expense account item six, two dollars. Cab fare back to the Plantagen Hotel. I went up to my room, packed my bags, called the airport, and made arrangements to leave on the six o'clock plane. There was nothing more I could do about the case. Nothing more at all. It was police business. I had time before the plane for a quiet drink at the hotel bar. What's your pleasure, sir? Oh, some of that little water. Yes, sir. You, uh, you on duty last night by any chance? Yes, sir. Why you ask? I just wondered if you happen to remember me. No, sir. Uh, uh, were you at the bar? At that table over there with a lady, a blonde girl in a green suit. Well, I'm sorry. I just don't remember. Well, here you go. Thanks. Here. Keep the change. Well, thank you, sir. Now, I probably waited on you, but 
Well, uh, so many people, you know. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, why you ask? A lady lost her purse. Thought maybe it might have been turned in here. No, sir. We didn't get any places last night. Uh, a couple money clips is all. <laughs> yeah, not much in them either. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're talking about the lady who died later on, ain't you, sir? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Uh, police officers was in here asking the same questions. I thought they would be. You, uh, policeman too? No, I was a friend of hers. Oh. Well, uh, then you should call the police. They're still trying to find out her name. So am I. Hmm? Well, I thought you said she was a friend of yours. I didn't happen to know her name. It didn't seem important to ask it last night. I just don't understand. I can tell you one thing. I might have saved her life if I'd asked her name. And some other things. Uh, yes, sir. Sure. Expense account item seven, three dollars, three drinks. I sat there for almost an hour talking to the bartender. Once, when he stepped out to the kitchen, I went over to the booth where I'd sat the night before with the unidentified dead girl. I searched down in the cushions, behind the table, under the chairs, hoping the missing purse might still be around. I found nothing. Then I had another idea. I left, went out to the parking lot where I'd first seen her. Got your car, mister? No, I don't have one. Oh. Well? Hey, look, uh, last night I was out here with a lady. I, I met her and a man here in the parking lot, uh, about over there where that Chevy is. Uh-huh. So what? Well, the lady lost her purse last night. I just wondered if it, it might have been lost out here someplace. Well, it might have been. Nobody turned anything into me. Want to take a look? Sure, good. All right. About what time last night? All around 10, maybe a few minutes after. Uh-huh. A lot of cars in and around that time of night. Did you look last night? No, I didn't know it was missing until this morning. Oh. About here, you say, huh? Here's the Chevy. Yeah. Well, let's take a look. Yeah, make it a good look. Yeah. Well, hey! I think you're in luck. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, here's a purse. Hey, <laughs> you're in real luck. Is that hers? It was hers, all right. A green suede purse, the same color as the green suit she'd been wearing. It still carried the faint sweet odor of her perfume as I remembered it. I looked inside, but there was nothing to tell me her name. Lipstick, calm, a $10 bill, and some small change. And one other item. A thirty-two automatic, recently fired. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... A dead girl's 38 automatic comes to life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the hotel operator. Ready with your call, Mr. Dollar. Oh, good. Police Department, Sergeant Peters. I want to talk to somebody in the personnel division. Uh, sorry, I haven't got one. What can I do for you? I want to get some information about a gun. Find out who it was licensed to and so on. 
Uh, come down to licensing division. I think we can help you there. Where's that? Uh, 220 City Hall. Do you have the weapon? Uh, yes. Be sure and bring it along with you. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Special Investigator Johnny Dollar for personal reasons. Location, Vicksburg, Virginia. Purpose... Well, it all started as an investigation of a burglary at the Plantagen Hotel. Once that was out of the way, I happened to run across a girl having an argument with a man in the hotel parking lot. She asked me to help her. I did. The girl suddenly gets sick and dies. Poison. I stay around to help find out who she is. I don't know that. But I do know that she had a thirty-eight in her purse. Three bullets recently fired. Expense account item eight. Two dollars. Cab fare. From the Plantagen Hotel, the two miles into Vicksburg City Hall and room 220, as per instructions of Sergeant Peters. I felt more than a little guilty bypassing Lieutenant Jim Akins, who had questioned me earlier about the case. Yes? Sergeant Peters? That's right. Can I help you, sir? I hope so. I'd like to know if this gun's been registered with you people. Let's have a look. Hmm. You just buy it? Uh, yeah. Got your bill of sale with you? Well, do you have to have one? You should. Who'd you buy it from? Oh, a fellow I met in a bar. Have you a permit to carry this weapon? Well, no, I haven't. Are you going to carry it? Oh, no, no, no. Then why'd you buy it? Oh, I just wanted it, that's all. Is there a law against that? No, no. But there's a law against practically every other thing about a gun. You want to read those numbers off to me? Sure. JJJ-4769. Nine, nine, two. And then there's an X. Okay. Make, Colt, caliber, 38, automatic, seven shot. Yeah. Here, you'll have to fill this out. Pencil's over there. This will take a minute for me to check. It took 15 minutes. In the meantime, I filled out the form, which notified the Vicksburg police that I was in possession of the above-described weapon that I did not wish to apply for a permit to carry it, and so forth and so forth. After that, I stood around and smoked a cigarette and wondered if I should step downstairs and tell Lieutenant Jim Akins that I had found Jane Doe's purse and the gun. But before I had time to make up my mind... Here we go. The gun was purchased in 1950 by the Piedmont Banking Service. That's a local armored truck outfit over on Maple Street. The gun was permitted for carrying to Raymond W. O'Connell... 232 Polk Street, this city. Thanks. Raymond O'Connell. Yeah. Anything else? Well, that's all. Thanks. That was when I could have, but didn't, walk downstairs to Lieutenant Aiken's office. Instead, I walked outside with a gun in my pocket and the slip of paper containing the name and address of the man who had carried it, Raymond O'Connell. Expense account item 9, $25. Deposit on a rented car to get me to 232 Polk Street. Oh, Paul, darling, you're early. I'm hardly ready. Hello. Oh. I was expecting someone else. I'm so sorry. You're not Paul, are you? No, I'm afraid not. My name's Johnny Dollar. Oh. Mr. Dollar? That's right. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Dollar? I'm looking for Raymond O'Connell. Ray? Yes. Come inside, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. I really didn't mean to throw myself at you at the door. I thought you were someone else I'm expecting. Uh, I'm Terry. Terry? Teresa. Terry O'Connell, Mr. Dollar. Oh, his wife? I'm Ray's widow. What? Ray's dead, Mr. Dollar. He passed away over a year ago. It was pneumonia. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. O'Connell. Please call me Terry. 
You had no way of knowing about him, I'm sure. And please don't be uncomfortable. A great many of Ray's friends from the service come by who have no idea that he's dead. Were you in his company, too? Oh, just a minute, Mrs. O'Connell. I he think you're... He had so many friends and met so many people while he was in the service, and really there was no way for you to you know... You don't understand, Mrs. O'Connell. I never knew... I'll get knew. you a drink and we'll talk. Where did you serve with Ray? You know, he finally became a pilot. What do you like to drink? She was young and dark and very pretty. And as the widow of a man who died rather suddenly, she was doing her best to put me at my ease. I would have told her I was there checking out the registration on a 38 that had been used by her dead husband. I would have told her I found the gun in the purse of an unidentified dead girl I'd met the night before. But she was trying to be polite, mistaking me for a friend of her dead husband. And then I saw the picture in the frame on the mantel. A broad, smiling face that belonged to a man I'd met in the parking lot of the Plantagen Hotel. An unidentified man who had been arguing with the dead girl. The words on the picture said, To Terry, all my love. You know him? Paul? Paul? Yes, Paul Dameron. I think I met him once. I really didn't know his name. Was he a friend of your husband, of Ray's? Oh, no. No, he never knew Ray. He's a darling, Mr. Dollar. Paul is. A real darling. After Ray died, I tried something very foolish. I tried to end my life. And then Paul came into it. He's been very lovely to me. We're... Well, I don't know why I shouldn't tell you. We're going to be married. I think that's fine, Terry. Do you really? Sure. I'm glad you say that. I'm not the most courageous person in the world. I suppose Ray mentioned our lives together. It was perfect with Ray, Mr. Dollar. Perfect. But now Ray's gone. And I've been able to face that. I think I'm going to find a new life with Paul. You must meet him. He'll be here soon. We're dining out tonight. Well, perhaps you'll join us. Well, thank you, Mrs. O'Connell, but I, I can't make it tonight. How long will you be in Vicksburg? I don't know exactly. Where are you staying? The Plantagen Hotel. Well, perhaps I could give you a ring and we could make it another night. I know you want to talk about Ray. Of course, Paul understands. I'm sure he does. He's truly a wonderful person. He hadn't looked very wonderful the night before, standing in the parking lot arguing with a girl who had died. But then that was my side of the picture, and it wasn't complete. And somebody still had to explain the thirty-eight with the three bullets missing. I left Terry O'Connell, went outside and bought an evening paper, and then sat in my rented car reading it. The photographer at the morgue had done a good job. The unidentified girl's picture was on page one. I was reading the story over a second time when a dark business coupe pulled up behind me and Paul Dameron got out, heading for Terry O'Connell's doorway. Just a minute. What? Just a minute. Hello, Paul. What? You. Yeah, me. Now look, Dameron. What are you doing here? How'd you know my name? Or are you some professional gunsel coming around to sock me again? I still oh, don't... stop th- it, will you, Dameron? My name's Johnny Dollar. I want you to tell me who that girl was last night in the parking lot. The one you had the big argument with. Huh? Oh. Well, you were the big hero there, butting in where it was none of your business. I didn't like it then, and I... All right, simmer down, will you? Who was she? Come on, what's her name? What's it to you? Walk Dameron. Okay, okay. It's Amy. Amy Duran. Amy Duran. Yeah. We work at the same office. Now, look, Buster, I'm not afraid of you, but I... I don't want any trouble, see? So if you'll just go somewhere else and... Wait a minute, will you? How does Amy Duran tie in with Teresa O'Connell? Look, I don't know who you are or what you're after, but you've certainly got your nerve about... Answer me, Paul. Okay, okay. Terry is Amy's sister. Satisfied? I don't know. Who are you, anyhow? A policeman or something? My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm here because Because of Because if you aren't, I want to know what right you have to ask me all these questions. Cool off, will you? I've been trying to find out who she is. Because last night, after you went off, we had a drink together. Then she got sick and I took her to a hospital. She died there. What? She died. She's lying in the morgue right now, unidentified. It was some kind of poison that killed her. Amy... Dead? No, I don't believe it. Here. 
what's in the paper tonight. The police are trying to identify her right now. I... I can't believe it. Poison. Oh, Dollar, I, I didn't think Amy was that desperate. There was a way out. She could have solved it without this. Way out of what? It... There was no need for her to do this. I told her I'd help her. I had no idea she... Poison. Does Terry know? Not yet. I, I've got to tell her before she sees it like this in the newspaper. It'll be awful for a dollar awful. Look, I apologize for the way I've acted. The way I was last night, I... I was upset. I can see now you're trying to help. Now, let me go in and break this to Terry. Call me later. Here. My card. Call me. I had to admit that Paul Dameron's concern seemed as genuine as his surprise. He rushed up to be admitted to the O'Connell house. After he was inside the door, I went back to my car and took out the thirty-eight automatic that had led me to the sister of Amy O'Connell. Three bullets still missing. I drove downtown to the Vicksburg police station to turn the gun into Lieutenant Akins and tell him the whole story as I knew it. How I'd found the gun in the dead girl's purse. How I'd managed to find out her name. The three missing bullets and other unanswered questions were up to the police. Lieutenant Akins. Yeah, yeah well, I, I... Oh, hi, Dollar. Thought you'd left town. Joe? All right, Joe. As soon as they clear that place up, you notify the lab. Hi, Lieutenant. Hi. I'm trying to get to you. I think I have something that better be looked into. Oh, really? Oh, excuse me. Lieutenant Akins. Yeah. On the south side of the town. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, well, in about 15 minutes. Right. I'm sorry, Della. What was it you were saying? Why all the hustle? Something big? Oh, homicide. Happened yesterday sometime. Yeah? Who got it? Guy named Belden. Somebody shot him three times with a 38. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, information about the gun that blows the whole case sky high. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mr. Oldfield calling, sir. You left word at my office, Mr. Dollar. That's right, Mr. Oldfield. I think I'm going to need an attorney. Divorce? Civil suit? What, Mr. Dollar? Withholding evidence. Murder. Let's take the murder first. Who did it? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure I have the murder weapon in my possession right now. Who was killed? A man named Belden, I think. What do you want me to do, sir? Take my statement, notarize it, give me some legal advice. Where are you? Police station in the pay booth down the hall from Homicide. I'll meet you there in five minutes.
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Vicksburg, Virginia. To Special Investigator Johnny Dollar for personal reasons. Attention, Chief Accountant, Eastern Seaboard Casualty Insurance Corporation, Providence, Rhode Island. Dear Jim, I'm attaching my own expense sheet to your bill for clarification purposes. Expense account item 10, 10 cents. One cup of coffee at the counter in the lobby of the Vicksburg Police Station while I waited for Samuel W. Oldfield, attorney at law, to appear. He was there in exactly five minutes. Mr. Dollar? That's right. Sam Oldfield, sir. You're the only one here in the lobby, so I figured you were the right man. Yeah. Cup of coffee, Mr. Oldfield? No, thanks. Gives me heartburn. But now sit down, will you? That was a pretty interesting phone call. Tell me, who are you, sir? Johnny Dollar. I'm a private insurance investigator. Mm Mm-hmm. How'd you get my name? I looked it up in the yellow pages of the telephone directory. You don't live here in Vicksburg? No, I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. All right, sir. Now, tell me about the murder and the withholding of information. Maybe I better start from the top. Go right ahead, any way you like. Well, two days ago, I flew down here to investigate a small burglary at the Plantagen Hotel. It was already solved by the time my plane got in. Police? Yeah. I had nothing better to do, so I waited around the hotel bar for my return reservation back to Hartford. Then I happened to walk outside to the parking lot for a breath of fresh air. I saw a woman and a man standing there arguing... When I got close to them, the woman asked me to help her. I did. How do you mean? Well, the, the man she was with started to act like a kid. He got rough. So I shoved him away. Go on. Well, the woman was upset. So I took her inside the hotel and bought her a drink. After that, I put her in a cab and started to send her on her way. She started to act sick about that. Wait. Is this the woman whose picture was in the paper tonight? The one who died of poisoning and the police don't know who she is? Yeah. I don't know who she is, Mr. Oldfield, except that her name's Amy Duran. I found out her name because I found her purse and there was a gun in it. A thirty-eight Colt registered to a man named O'Connell. I checked on the gun here at headquarters, went out to the address and found out O'Connell was a bank guard and had died about a year ago. I talked to his wife, Teresa O'Connell. While I was there, the man I'd seen the night before showed up. His name's Paul Dameron. Now, I didn't tell him or Mrs. O'Connell about the gun. I came down here to give it to the police and tell them. But when I got here, Lieutenant Akins was pretty busy trying to solve the murder of a man named Belden, who had been shot with a thirty-eight, three times. There are three slugs missing from the gun I found. You got a light, sir? Yeah. Here you go. When you uh, found Amy Duran's purse, why didn't you turn it over to the police? Oh, I thought I... Well, somehow I thought maybe I could help the girl. I mean, her last words before she died were, help me. And for some reason or other, I I thought maybe I could. Do you have any cards or letters, anything like that? Something that says you're what you say you are, sir? Yeah, sure. Let's see. Okay, daughter. Now, as I see it, you probably hooked up with someone who did some shooting. And that's what worries you. I want you to take my statement and notarize it before I turn the gun in. That'll protect you some. If they want to get nasty, they can, though. You know that. Yeah, I know. Well, as I see it, the main job here is to try to keep you out of trouble. And the statement explaining your motive for participation in the whole affair might help. That's why I called you. All right, then. Now, Dollar. Yeah? You didn't shoot anybody, did you? No. Okay, then, sir. Let's go over to my office. We did, and I made the necessary statement, and Mr. Oldfield notarized it. After that, I went back to the Vicksburg police station to talk to Lieutenant Akins. The thirty-eight I'd found in Amy Duran's purse was still in my pocket, and her words were still in my mind. Help me. Please help me. Thought you was going back to Hartford, Dollar. Oh, I uh, decided to hang around and see what came up. Mm-hmm. Well, nothing so far on the girl. No one's recognized a picture in the paper. Had to turn that over to missing persons. 
This murder case going to eat up all my time. What happened, Lieutenant? Oh, made at the apartment house where this man Belden was staying found him late this afternoon. He'd been dead about 24 hours, shot with a thirty-eight. You sure? I'm sure. We did a post-mortem right away. It's a pretty sad case. You, uh, you know who shot him? <laughs> Have a pretty good idea. See, this Belden, he was an auditor working on some books at a firm of textile wholesalers here. Richmond Limited. The papers scattered around his apartment show he'd found a $10,000 shortage going over their books. And the chief accountant for this Richmond company is missing. Yeah, well, that does make it seem pretty clean. Yeah, but... all we have to do is find that accountant. Had an APB out for half an hour now. I think we'll pick her up pretty soon. Her? Who? Well, her, Dollar. The chief accountant for Richmond Limited. She's a woman. Name of, uh, Amy Duran. To all appearances, Amy Duran had been guilty of embezzling money and murdering the auditor Belden who had discovered the shortages in her books. I didn't tell Higgins that his suspect was the girl lying in the morgue at the moment unidentified. I knew that it was only a matter of minutes before her sister or Paul Dameron would be down to identify her. And for the third time, I didn't tell Lieutenant Higgins about the gun. I knew if I turned that over to him, it would be a closed case all around. And somehow I didn't want it closed on Amy Duran. Not that way. For that reason, I went back to my hotel room for a couple of hours, and then about nine o'clock that night, I found myself over on Polk Street at Teresa O'Connell's house once more. Oh. Hello, Mrs. O'Connell. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar, isn't it? Yes. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I, I had the most awful news tonight. My sister Amy, she's dead. You'll have to excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. May I come in? I'd like to talk to you about your sister, Mrs. O'Connell. Well, I... I... Paul came in with tonight's paper and showed me Amy's picture. He went down the morgue to identify her. I couldn't bear to. Sure. I feel somehow, in some way, that... Your friend, Mr. Dollar. Mrs. O'Connell, I am a friend in a way. But mostly I'm an insurance investigator. What? You thought I was a friend of your dead husband when I came here earlier. I'm not. I never even knew him. But, Mr. Dollar, I don't understand. I met your sister, Amy, last night. I was the last one to speak to her before she died. I took her to the emergency hospital last night. Well, wait, wait. This is all very confusing. You say you're insurance investigator? Yes. Now, when... Well, I got your address from a gun I found in your sister's purse... I traced it through the license to carry. This gun, Mrs. O'Connell. Your husband was licensed to carry it when he worked for a banking firm. Do you recognize it? Oh, yes, I suppose I do. I think it's one of Ray's guns. Now, please, but... please, let me find something out first. Believe me, I do want to help. Did you know your sister had this gun? Oh, no. I... What would Amy want with a gun? I mean, well, she could have picked it up here any time she came over and probably did. But why would Amy have a gun in her purse? Sit down, please. Now, Mrs. O'Connell, you better listen to me carefully. Sometime late yesterday afternoon or early evening, a man named Belden was shot and killed. Clarence Belden? Yes. Well, he worked with an auditing firm. Amy spoke of him. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Wait now, wait. Listen to the rest of this. Belden had been working on books for Richmond Limited. As I understand it, your sister Amy was responsible for those books. Right now, the police have enough evidence to figure that your sister stole $10,000 from Richmond Limited. Amy? Well, no, now, no. Now, hear me out, Mrs. Not... O'Connell. They have that evidence in bulk form. They certainly have reason to assume, and they are assuming, that your sister shot Belden to keep him quiet about the shortage. How can you say those things about Amy when she's not here to defend herself? Please, please, I'm just telling you what's going on downtown, what they've found. This gun they don't have yet. I've withheld it. It has been fired three times recently. Belden was shot three times. By now, your sister's body has no doubt been identified. They've already established that she died of poisoning. And they halfway have the idea that she committed suicide. No. Oh, don't you see? They'll say she shot Belden to cover up and keep it quiet. And then saw how useless it was. Took poison and killed herself to escape punishment. You're horrible. Horrible. Go away. Go away from me. I'm sorry, but in the face of all this, I want to help her if I can. If it isn't too late. I want to help you. 
But, Mrs. O'Connell, you'll have to help me. Now, why? Why would your sister steal? Why? I don't know. I think you do know. Tell me, please, for her sake, Mrs. O'Connell. Why? What have you got to do with her? I met her only for a few minutes, but in that few minutes, I got the idea that she was a pretty nice person. She didn't strike me as a thief. She didn't look like a killer. And most of all, she didn't look like a woman who'd take the suicide way out of things. Now, that's all I have, except that she asked me to help her. And I'm trying to do that now. Believe me, I want to help her if I can. I've always been an awful child, Mr. Dollar. When Ray died, I tried to kill myself. Amy saved me. I remember then, at the hospital. She was beside my bed, and she said to me, I'll make you want to live again. I'll make you. Amy was always like that, kind and decent. You weren't wrong about her. She was decent, thoughtful, good. She she did everything for me. She gave me these clothes and a car, introduced me to nice people from her office like Paul, Paul Dameron. Yes. That must be where all the money went to. Not on herself, but on me, for me. I'm the only reason I can think of that she'd take money from the firm. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know she was stealing from me. I didn't know. I wouldn't have let her do it. She didn't have to pamper me that much. I'm not that much of a child. She didn't have to do it. She didn't have to do it. Wait. Wait a minute. She didn't kill herself. She didn't steal. She didn't murder that man. I did all those things because it was all for me. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, all the evidence comes true. A helpless dead girl gets her help. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Deller, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Deller. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Paul Dameron, Mr. Dollar. I was afraid you left town and I wanted to talk to you. Mm Mm-hmm. I wanted to thank you for your kindness about Amy and the way you handled Terry. It was darn decent of you. Of course, I want to apologize for my attitude again. How's Mrs. O'Connell? Terrible. I mean, the papers this morning connected her sister Amy with murdering Belden and committing suicide. I'm curious. How did you get to her? I found Amy's purse and there was a gun in it. I looked up the registration. Oh, the murder gun. I don't know. I haven't turned it over to the police yet. Why? Because I still can't believe Amy Duran was the kind of girl who'd shoot a man and then take poison. Tonight and every weekday night, 
Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Vicksburg, Virginia. To Special Investigator Johnny Dollar for personal reasons in connection with the plant agent matter. Expense account item 11, $15, legal fees, for services rented by lawyer Sam Oldfield. No sign here, Dollar. And here, sir. Okay, I guess that's it. What now, Mr. Oldfield? This statement you've made to me clearly states your intentions in this matter, your motives. You attempted to help a girl who died in your company. You had no idea she might have committed a murder or embezzled $10,000. You withheld evidence, the gun you found in her purse, in the hope of identifying her and saving her family some grief. I hope you don't have to use this stuff. We'll see. I'm going to turn the gun in now, and you're coming with me. It's about time. Hmm? Nothing personal, son. I think you did a lot of dumb things for her. From what they're saying in the papers about her, I don't think she deserved it. But then we all make wrong guesses sometimes, I suppose. Ah, let's get this over with. Lawyer Sam Oldfield accompanied me downtown to police headquarters where we sought out Lieutenant Akins and turned over the thirty-eight automatic. Oldfield handed the statement over to him and he read it through. Then he called in his ballistics man to make an immediate check of the gun. When he'd done that, Akins asked Oldfield and myself to wait. He left. An hour later, he came back. You are a lucky boy, Dollar. First off, I'm going to tell you, that gun you've been withholding, that's the same weapon that killed the auditor, Clarence Belden. Okay, now, you played it as safe as you could, and you hired this lawyer to protect you when it came to turning it in. Well, you didn't need him. Huh? Any other time, I'd have put you in the poker so fast you'd have thought you was born there. This time, I'm feeling generous. You can go, Mr. Oldfield. Me? You. No charges against Mr. Dollar of withholding information? No, not this time. I got my Jane Doe identified. I know her motive for killing the auditor. I know why she took the poison. You generally don't get everything in a neat package like that, so I feel generous. Then let's get out here, Dollar. You get out. I won't talk to Dollar. Then I'll stay and listen. It's okay, Mr. Oldfield. I'm going to get a lecture is all. Are you sure? Yeah. Call me later, then. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Yeah. One thing more, Dollar. We found an empty bottle of paramythol in Amy Duran's medicine cabinet, and that cinches that suicide part, in case you had any doubts. It's a closed case. Uh Uh-huh. But you didn't help me close it, Dollar, and you could have. You worked with the police for years. You were an officer yourself once. What makes you think you can come down here and run around doing all these things you've done and get away with them? Why didn't you turn that gun in with the purse as soon as you found it? All right, I'll tell you, because I... Oh, it doesn't make any difference now, Lieutenant. You've got your case. And you're lucky, darn lucky boy. I don't have you, too. Because you know just well as I do that... Lieutenant Akins. Okay, right away. Dollar, I got business to take care of. Next time you're in my town, (laughs) you take it easy. I will. But I don't think I'll ever come to your town again. On general principles. Well, I guess I know how you felt about that girl. I'm not going to make any fuss about what you did. But I don't think I'd let it pass a second time. She sure didn't look the part, did she? No. She didn't. Well, happens that way sometimes. What you told me about that kid's sister of hers trying suicide and so forth after she lost her husband... Well, Amy Duran had a good motive for stealing that money. If motive can ever be good. Dollar, Lieutenant? Huh? I, uh, I was just on my way to see you, Lieutenant. I'll be back in my office in a couple of minutes. You can go on in and wait, Mr. Dameron. Glad I saw you, Mr. Dollar. I think there's something I should explain to you. You'd be interested in this, too, Lieutenant. Mr. Dollar saw me arguing with Amy Duran in a parking lot at the Plant Agent Hotel last night. She just told me about the shortage in accounts. She hadn't told me about killing the auditor. 
I want you to know that I was racking my brain trying to find a way to get hold of some money to make up the shortage. I was always very fond of Amy. I, uh, wonder, Mr. Deller, if I could give you a check. Huh? Something for your kindness. Nothing, thanks. Well, I... I'd like to. You did something very decent. No. Oh. Well, I suppose you'll be leaving soon. Goodbye, and thanks again. I'll, uh, be in your office, Lieutenant. Right. <laughs> Got to him, too, if it's any comfort. What was that business in the parking lot? Oh, well, I, I hit him. He was arguing with her, that's all. No. You weren't the only one trying to help a dollar. Him. And then there was somebody else. Huh? A bank. We found a certified check for $10,000 in Amy Duran's apartment. What? National Trust in New York, issued three days ago. I wired the head cashier in New York. He said Amy Duran phoned him long distance, requested the loan. Seems her folks, when they were alive, had a good pull. Wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it. And this isn't right. She could have covered that shortage. Well, I figure she intended to do that, but the auditor found out too quick. He called her on it, and she shot him. With a $10,000 check in her hand? Well... There isn't an auditor or a bonding company going that wouldn't prefer to turn up the cash and the person who took it. They'd listen to any reasonable story. You know that. Well, the auditor must have scared her, Dollar. She shot him, didn't she? She committed suicide, didn't she? You make a lot of noise, Higgins, but you aren't any happier about this than I am, are you? No. Why let the papers have it the way it is? Well, so that whoever knows answer will get careless. Sure, it burns me. Somebody thinking the police are as dumb as this. Burns me. Oh, well, what are you going to do? Wait. Just wait. I found that pretty hard to do. And the more I waited and the more I thought about the matter, the more restless I felt. So I didn't wait. I got out and started interviewing people who had known the murdered auditor. The consensus was that he knew his business. That if he'd found a shortage and someone offered to reimburse the company, he had been the kind of old hand who would have listened to them. Why, I asked myself, if Amy Duran had a $10,000 check to cover her shortages, why did she shoot the auditor and then commit suicide? Why? It didn't make sense. Oh, Dollar. Hello, Dameron. Come in, Dollar. I'm uh, glad you dropped by. I thought you'd left town, gone back to Hartford. Well, I've stayed over so long waiting for all this to get cleared up, I thought I might as well stick around a while longer. Sure. Can I get you a drink? No, thanks. It uh, is finished, isn't it? Not yet. I don't understand. I talked with Lieutenant Aikens today after I saw you with him. He said it was all over as far as he was concerned. You're talking to me now, Dameron. I'm the guy who went out on the limb. And I appreciate that a great deal. A question I want to ask you. You knew Amy Duran. Worked with her at Richmond Limited. You're engaged to marry her sister. Did you know Amy had a $10,000 check in her hand the day she died? Really? That was enough money to cover the shortages in her accounts. Well, I'll be darned. Or do you suppose she shot him? Did what she did then? I've been thinking about that, Dameron. There's only one reason I can think of. Because Amy Duran didn't steal any money, because she didn't shoot any auditor, she didn't commit suicide. I think she borrowed that $10,000 from New York to cover up for somebody else. Somebody else? Who? You. Maybe you better leave here. You're upset. That auditor was a smart guy. He'd been in the business a long time. He found out who'd been taking the money. He called you over to ask you about it, ask you if you could repay it. You lost your head and you shot him with a thirty-eight you picked up over at Teresa O'Connell's one day. Now, look. Then you fixed up all the reports to make it look like Amy Duran did the job. You're crazy. That's fantastic. If you think I'm Amy going Durand to... Amy Duran borrowed money to cover for you. She did it not because you were worth it, but because you meant something to her kid sister. You meant something to Teresa O'Connell, who'd lost one husband and tried suicide because of it. A Teresa O'Connell who couldn't afford another major tragedy. A Teresa O'Connell who might try suicide again if the man she was going to marry turned out to be a thief. You counted on that, Dameron. I don't know what you're talking about. One now, you thing listen... you hadn't counted on was the auditor picking it up so fast. And when he called you, you had to kill him to keep him quiet. Then you made a date with Amy out at the plant agent hotel. You slipped poison in her drink and planted the gun in her purse. This is all talk. Just talk. You have nothing to prove. She a had single... one drink with you before you argued with her out in the parking lot. She told me. And the bartender later verified it. Then I came along. Now, look. 
You're a big guy, Dameron. You could have hit me back in that parking lot, but you didn't have time. You still had to get over to Amy's apartment and plant an empty poison box. You're crazy. You have no proof of this. No proof at all. No, I haven't. But I've been thinking about it all day. And there'll be proof. You had to buy that poison someplace. Lieutenant Akins is a pretty good police officer. He and his men will cover every drugstore in this town and ask questions everywhere. Now, listen, I'm going to tell him what I think, and he'll dust off that box of poison. Maybe your prince will turn up on it. Sooner or later, guys like you make mistakes, and Akins finds them. Get out of here, Dollar. Get out of here. Now, listen, you. A girl, a fine, decent girl, asked me for help. This is the quickest way I know to give her the help. I'll kill you, Dollar. I'll kill you. No, you won't. You're not going to kill me. Okay. Okay, come on, come on, get up, get up. Get up. I, I've had enough, I've had enough. I want you to tell it now, right now. Over there. Pick it up. Go on, pick it up. Okay, here. And you know who to call. Hello. Hello. Give me the police. Expense account item 12, $55, room and board. Item 13, $55 airfare and miscellaneous getting me back to Hartford. Total expense account, $702.13. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, beginning next Monday night. Next week, a whole city is aroused by one of the dirtiest rackets of modern times. And I end up right in the middle of things. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Michael Ann Barrett, Gene Bates, Marvin Miller, Frank Gerstle, Lawrence Dobkin, Jack Crucian, Ken Peters, and Herb Butterfield. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, investigators stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Lady with No Name. Next time you're out for a drive, pick up Olive Street along about the 700 block. You can't miss it. It's a big building made out of white granite. The Cosmopolitan Building. The man who built it is doing a long run up at San Quentin for draft. Anthony J. Lyon, the guy I work for, rents an office in that building. International Detective Bureau, Suite 308. A couple of rooms with a connecting wastebasket. The lion has the only desk in the office and a typewriter that Remington dropped from their catalog back in 1915. Well, I walked in last Tuesday at 10 a.m. The office was 
full of taboo. She was a tall girl, very pretty, wearing slacks and a coat that must have set the mink population back 20 years. But she still looked cold, like she'd never get warm again. The lion had one arm around her shoulders. He knew by this time that coat was the real article. There wasn't any music, but he didn't seem to mind. Come in. Not much room to dance. We got trouble. She's your date. This is one of my operators, Mr. Regan. How do you do, Mr. Regan? Now, tell him exactly what you just told me. Yes. It's all right. May I sit down? I feel strange. Of course. Come here. Thank you. Get this, Regan. I don't know where I live. I don't know my name. Yeah? I want you to find out who I am. You heard that, Regan? Heard what? It's a verbal contract. You just hired us. Oh, you're out of your mind. And you're a witness in case anything comes up. Please. Please, I, I don't feel well. I, I'm perfectly willing to pay you. You'll just find out who I am. Well, look, lady, there's a cop on every corner. I couldn't go to the police. You got here. Quit pushing her. This is our case. I was afraid. I found this in my purse. Mm-hmm. 32 caliber, Smith & Wesson. Been fired. There's three gone. What are you doing with that, miss? I don't know. It's just been used by you. I don't know. Well, where'd you get it? I just found it in my purse. Remind you of anything? No. You take it. Now, look, miss, I know you don't feel well, but there are certain questions you'll have to answer. I just want you to find out who I am. It's terrible this way. It's... Painted. Yeah, you always had a way with women. Help me bring her around so she can sign that contract. She hasn't got a name, remember? We'll give her a name. Jane Doe's good enough. I guess so. What do you mean? She's dead. The lion just stood there. He looked sad, like a water buffalo caught in a drought. Well, when she rolled onto the floor, her purse went with her. It cracked open, and the stuff inside spilled out on the rug. There wasn't anything to tell us who she was. No comb, no makeup. Nothing but a house key and a receipt for a cab ride dated that day. There wasn't even a label in that mink coat. Nothing to go on. I might as well have tried to walk to Catalina. I told the lion to phone the coroner's office, and I hopped over to the cab company. They told me that the receipt came from meter 212, driven by a man named Servi. He worked the call box at Hollywood and Western. He was a little guy. I figured he got the job because they ran out of big uniforms. They double-crossed him on that cap. If it wasn't for his ears, he'd have been wearing a snood. Uh, uh, sorry, bud. I got a fare. Where is he? Under the floorboards? I got a fare. Yeah, you said that. Where? Uh, in there, eating. Your flag's up. I'll pull it down. Happy? You Johnny Serby? Whose nose are you? They told me I'd find Serby in this hack. Who told you that? Cab company. They don't know any more than you do. Now look, I, never mind the Nick, jokes. Just give me the straight out. lines. Nix, will you? Cut out this company uniform. Well, they're going to get it back if you don't open up. Get it out. All right. Louise pulled out three weeks ago. She took all the furniture with her. You can collect from her. I'm not the finance company. No? Here. Oh, private paper, huh? Well, who's getting con? Did you carry a brunette in a mink coat sometime this morning? Maybe. Where'd you drop her? Downtown, six and grand. Where'd she live? Ask her. I'm cruising in from the fair. Where'd you pick her up? In Burbank, Hollywood Way, and Kensington. The fair's in Pomona. You took the long way. I like to drive. It's company gas. Yeah. She was nice, real nice. You know what I mean? Real class. Okay. Ah, oh, wait a minute, will you? Yeah? We didn't go anywhere, but time's up. That's five even. Fast meter. Hey, you want me to tell you about the guy? What guy? Tall, dark head, uh, brown sport coat, movie type. Go on. He was chasing her when she caught my cab. He looked like a match. Was it? Ask him. Is that all? She got in, we drove away. Right here. Thanks. No tip? Like you said, we didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Ever have somebody drop a key in your lap and say, go find a door? Well, I drove out to Burbank and I began looking around for a good lock near Hollywood Way in Kensington. I figured that key I'd found in Jane Doe's purse would have to fix something. I made my letter on the 10th house. There was a for sale sign on it. I didn't see anybody around, so I unlocked the door and it went in. 
Outside of something that smelled like tar and kerosene, the place was empty. I was just about to turn around and leave when a brown sport coat slid into the room. Movie type. When he walked over to me, I knew he drank the right kind of scotch. Gonna use your GI loan? Just looking. Gotta buy it. It's a steal. No, the lady won't like it. Your wife? Girl in a mink coat. You make that kind of dough? She got it from somebody else. Uh, you Hollywood guys. Where'd you get the key? I borrowed it. She won't need it. What's your name? I didn't have a chance to ask her. Oh, you're kind of slow, aren't you? Sometimes. We'll see how fast you can hit the door. No, I just got here. Yeah, now you're leaving. Cab driver says he knows you. I'm friendly. I talk to everybody. Said you were doing a chase scene. Could be. She was pretty. They all look good in mink. It's not the house. What do you want? Well, we could start with a name. It's Dameron. Not enough. That's all you get, wise punk. Now beat it. You'll give more at homicide. I don't see any bad. Now look, we can play games some other time. A cab driver put the finger on you as the last man to see that girl in mink. You talk like she's dead. You call it. Too bad. There's a lot of fur coats in L.A. and a lot of guys chasing them. You got nothing. That's what they always say downtown, but you'll talk. I don't figure on leaving, but you're going on your way right now. Better open a window, Dameron. You're sweating. Keep talking, sunshine, or we'll make one in that far wall. You got help in the back room? Quit scratching around. It doesn't mean anything to you. It didn't before she pulled a fade in my office, but it does now. Out by a new carpet. I don't know who let you out, but it's bedtime. You've been talking about a dead girl who doesn't even know her name. Now go back and finish your dream. You got all the questions. Now let's fill in the answers. I'm fresh out of box taps. There's a door used. No, not yet. I'm going to get what I came for. Little man, that's a promise. You're out of condition, Dameron. You're in a great position to throw that line. Oh, you got talent, mister, but it's still raw. Come here. Come here. Now, come on, get up. I'm not through. That's where you're wrong. It's a big luger. Makes the same size hole. All right, punk, you got a name? A lot of them for you. Oh! School isn't out yet. Just answer. It's Regan. Okay, Regan, let this sink in. Forget you ever saw any dame in a mink coat. Forget you ever saw me. That won't be hard. Look, Junior, you just lost the round. Now, remember what I told you. Have a memory lapse. Is that clear? You made your point. Now, blow. You always use a luger? Close work. Well, then that 32 doesn't fit. What 32? The one that the girl was carrying. You got it? No, I gave it a homicide. Good, good. It saves me a trip downtown. You're not worried? No, I'm very happy. Huh? Today's my birthday. That's the reason you're walking out of here. <laughs> The whole thing looked as phony as an undertaker in a white derby. Well, I went back to the office, and the lion was sitting there with a bottle of beer and a sandwich that looked like a couple of end tables. He stopped chewing when I came in. What's her name? It's still Jane Doe. You've been gone four hours. Movie? They don't open till noon. All right, where you been? A vacant house in Burbank. I trailed it up from that cab receipt. What'd you find? A guy named Dameron. What'd he say? Nothing. Shy? Tough. That way you got the egg on your chin? I was nervous. When you gonna learn to be nice to people? He had a gun, too. Tell me more. That's all. Yeah, I like this. It's got possibility. All right, take off your saddle. The race is over. When the coroner's boys showed up, they told me why she dropped. That's easy. She died. It's poison. Without an autopsy? Something about her color. It isn't official, but we can work on it. Suicide? Murder. Why murder? They feed themselves iodine and sleeping pills, but they don't take aliceine. What's that? A hot drug with a petrol base. It burns. Homicidal handler. Sure, homicidal handler. Only we got things to do. We got a stake in this. You made her the client. We're going to give her service, dead or alive. What does Wendetti say? I don't pay Wendetti. We find out who she is. All right, you try. Her picture shows up in the paper. She drops dead in our office. How's it make us look? They sent in the first string when she died. You'll clear this up before homicide does. They'll lift your license. We won't need it. What do you mean? I still got exhibit A. What? Smith and Wesson, 32 caliber. You're withholding evidence. I forgot to give it to him. All right, now give him a call and tell him. That was five hours ago. You make the call. All right, I'll tell Homicide. They'll give me a break. That's what Dillinger thought. Give me the gun. They've got Jane Doe's prints on the wire. They'll have the answer in ten hours. Cut that in half, Regan, and we've won the championship. You'll have to give the cup back. You cheated. When I left the lion, he looked happy like a guy who just figured the mystery melody. 
I had the gun with three bullets gone that Jane Doe had been carrying in her purse, the lion in back of me, the police department in front. That left me about as much chance as a blue peanut on a wedding cake. I knew that if I walked into homicide with that thirty-two, they'd hold on to me like a season pass. I had to find out who it was registered to, so I gambled and I went down to the city hall. I went in the Temple Street entrance, room 11, personnel division. If I pegged it right, I could get the dope on that gun without getting involved. I figured wrong. Can I help you? You in charge here? Lunchtime, yeah. All right, whose name matches these numbers? Small arms? Yeah. What authority? I just bought it. Want to know if it's clean? Yeah. Caliber and make? It's a 32, Smith & Wesson. Okay. Smith & Wesson, huh? 32, 32, 32. Yeah, right here. Got the weapon with you? No, why? No roll. No gun, no vitals. I got it. Here. Okay. Purchased August 1929. Factory re job 1931. Owned by American Trust and Loan. Permitted to Dale W. Curtis. Thanks. I'll have to ask you to wait. Why? No roll. Got to run them all through ballistics. Anything special? Maybe. Found a guy floating around Silver Lake this morning, full of 32s. Who? Working on it. Have to ask you to wait. No, I can't. I haven't had lunch yet. Stick around. We may invite you. I don't like your food. Oh, don't worry. You can have anything you want the last day. You are listening to the story of the lady with no name. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. If you are a graduate registered nurse, please listen carefully to this important message. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to the story of the lady with no name and Jeff Regan, investigator. There it was. The clerk took Jane Doe's gun and closed the door marked ballistic. I figured he couldn't be too sure about whether that thirty-two would match up, but I didn't want to wait around to find out. He left the vitals card on the counter. I spun it around and I got the address of Dale W. Curtis. It turned out to be a one-story frame that stood in the way of the new freeway they're building. The movers were just jacking it up and I caught the last carload of people leaving. They told me that Curtis hadn't lived there for seven years. They did give a number over on Manzanita off Fountain, where I might be able to find him. It was an apartment on the second floor. From the looks of the place, it figured that the OPA had a fight on their hands. I rang the bell and waited. I don't know whether it was the lighting effect in that dim hallway, but when she opened that door, I expected to see those thousand ships slide down the ways again. She was a... Wearing some kind of a filmy thing that made a spider's web look like burlap. She had a voice that stole over you like a pint of Irish ale. I didn't expect you until tonight. I broke my watch. Come on in. I'll see if I can fix it. I'm great for the swift movement. Yeah, it shows. My name's Marlo Curtis. I want to see your husband. He's not here. Do you expect him? No. Where is he? Up north. Business trip? Yeah. He sold out. Oh, what kind of business? Ask the warden. Huh? The El Curtis is in the prison cemetery. Been there five years. Sorry. Don't say. You deserve it. You're going to drown in those tears. I'm still burning back. The right color, wrong occasion. Soda? What? Just think. How do you want it? Well, you're mixing. Now, isn't that better? I don't know. It's my first drink. You'll get another. The weather's changed. No, nothing here. You're quick. Must have a good straight man. Yeah, you. You get top billing. What's your name? Regan. Detective. Maybe. Arrest me. Hmm. Sergeant? I'm due for a promotion. You'd make a better lieutenant. Come here. 
I had anything to do with you, the captain. Yeah, sure, until you snag your colonel. You're nasty, too. Did I pay for my drink? Get out. Tell me about this nail file. You got that out of my purse. I had one hand free. You two-bit shadow artist. Now get out. Hello? Yes, he's here. Yeah? Uh, this you, Regan? Uh, you don't know me. I've been lucky so far. They should never have taken that gun down to the city hall. You get around. You shouldn't be up there in Marlowe's apartment. You gonna run my life? Now I told you what you shouldn't do. Here's what you're gonna do. Look, Buster, don't crowd me. You're gonna forget all about today. The girl forgot a lot of things today and she dropped dead. Got the idea? Suppose I don't buy it. You want a partner for that gun. Dameron give you the nickel? You gave me a dime. I got one more call to make to the city hall. All right. Suppose I lay off. I got something for my piggy bank. You're no petty girl. Hang it up and get out. You know, Regan, I could have really liked you. Yeah, Marlo, that's why I'm scared. Well, you can see how things were. I felt like a short girl with a new look. No matter how I tried to break it down, I figured to cop the leading role. A Jane Doe walks in her office and drops dead. She has a gun that probably talked to a couple of people. A cab ride receipt takes me to Bill Dameron, a guy with a talkative gun. I end up in Marlowe Curtis' apartment for a lot of punctuation marks. Everybody talks but the people. Well, I knew I'd have to begin to move before homicide tagged me, so I hopped down to the Times and I checked the morgue file. I pulled the clips on Dale W. Curtis. Marlowe didn't lie. He was dead. The old papers didn't mean anything, but the banner headline on the night final put one piece of the jigsaw in position. Told about a treasury department agent named Shields. I found him in Silver Lake. He'd been shot three times with a thirty-two. Now I knew where Marlowe's nail file fit. I started to leave when I caught the last paragraph. It said, Unidentified man turns in the murder weapon. Police are seeking his whereabouts. Yeah. This is Lane. I've been calling your place for two hours. I just got home. Gonna give yourself up? It was your idea. Who's Jane Doe? I don't know. Why? You got a badge, you try. Look, Regan. You're hot. Every prowl car in town's looking for you. Yeah. Better start filling this in or they're gonna get you. Now listen, big shot, you're in this too. <laughs> Not from where I sit. I gave you the gun. Now send me some dough over here. I don't have enough for your pay. I need some money for cab fare. No petty cash in the office. Don't lie to me. What about that money you got out of Jane Doe's purse? What do you mean? She could have never got up there without cab money. Well, she must have lost it in the elevator. Look, I haven't got time to play games. Now send it over. How much do you need? Ten bucks won't break you. Where are you going, to Yuma? I'll expect it in an hour. Goodbye. Hello. Hello, Dameron. Always lock your door. I wouldn't stop you. You'd crawl under. Come on in, fellas. It's drafty out there in the hall. You got a parade permit? Rodney, say hello to Regan. I already did on the phone. What about Slim? Hi, you broken. His name's Regan, isn't it, Big Mouth? Oh. Sitting right next to Rodney when he made that call to you, it was perfectly clear to me. It wasn't it clear to you, Big Mouth? Oh. Rodney told you to lay out, but you just had to get down to that newspaper, didn't you, Big Mouth? Yeah. Rodney, Slim. Slim on the bed. All right, my go. Now, Regan, once more, they got a gun downtown. They got a dame and her prints are going to fit it. They got a stiff and that gun's going to fit him, okay? I'll lay you off. Uh, you said that before. Rodney Slim, hold his hands. <laughs> now, Regan, I know you understand me. I said all the right words. Maybe my punctuation's bad. Lay off. <laughs> Period. Lay off. <laughs> Period. All right, leave him in the bed. on the floor. That's fine. Now he won't have to change his bedding. Dameron was good. When I got up, my face looked like a relief map of Death Valley. He was wearing a signet ring. He left out all the water holes, but the mountain ranges were rising fast. I figured I was safe now. That guy in the personnel office had never recognized me. Well, I was standing in the kitchen giving myself the cold water treatment when somebody knocked. I figured that was a switch, so I opened the door. It was that hacky, Johnny Servey. He had an envelope in his hand. Yeah? Hi. Remember me? You give up cab work? Oh, I found this under your door here. Thanks. Football? What do you want? Well, you asked me about a dame in a mink coat today. Now, I'm asking you. I don't run a meter. Well, I figure all this might help. 
All of what? Well, I get to thinking about it, see, and then I think some more. Right, come on, get to the point, will you? Uh, you played a hand, now I'm playing a hand. Go on. Well, dames mean trouble, and mink coats, they mean double trouble. Yeah. Is it worth five if I remember another guy? Maybe. Well, he's all over the papers now. I've seen him. Who? Shields, the guy they fished out of Silver Lake. Where? He was out in Burbank this morning, early. Thought you were at Pomona. I was, I was, but... Well, I guess I wasn't exactly cruising. I, I got a friend who's out that way. Know what I mean? When was this? An hour before I pick her up. This guy they find in Silver Lake is walking around that house. I'm looking for a store for oh, breakfast. All right, you eat. Well, that's it. After breakfast, I hop in my cab, and that's when I pick up the Damon Mink. Why'd you bring me all this? Oh, I figured we got somewhere this time. Now do I get my tip? I gave him his five bucks and he left. And then I opened the envelope he'd handed me. It was the money that I'd asked the lion to send over. Two five-dollar bills. Well, I looked at it, put it back in the envelope, stuck it in my pocket. So far, all I could see that I got out of this thing was a good beating from Dameron. The question still stood, who was Jane Doe? Well, I knew my next move. I wanted to hop over to the Treasury Department and see if my two matched their two, and maybe between us we could come up with four. I didn't have much to go on. It was just a hunch. I took Marlowe's nail file with me, and I walked in the front door of the federal building. I showed my license to the chief agent. That's right, one of our agents, Shields. They have the murder weapon down at Homicide. I know. All we want is the man that pulled the trigger. Well, I got an idea. I'll listen. What's wrong with these five-dollar bills? You can't spend them. I figured that. Where'd you get them? How bad are they? Lousy paper, rotten ink, terrible engraving job. You could do better with a rubber stamp outfit. Where'd you get them? Any of these been floated? We picked up a few. Were Shields working on it? That's as much as I can give you. Well, where'd you get them? Well, the girl faded out in our office this morning. She was carrying them? Yeah. What's her name? That's what I gotta find out. Uh, Jane Doe, huh? Well, that's what we called her. So there's a paper, hmm? Same girl? Yeah, that's her. Any identification? Not yet. They've been running a picture for hours. I'm short on time. You're the guy. Wait a minute before you hit that button. Yeah? Your addition's good, but you haven't got all the figures. Don't make book on that. You're the number one boy with me. You think I'd solo in here? You might. No, no. I got an ace. All right, so you keep your nails clean. Now look at it. It's a nail file. They cut dum-dums out of shields. Who told you? A second story apartment with a deep voice. How did you know? You're holding the file that cut the grooves. You use it. I can give you the guy who did. Dum Dum makes a big hole. Half shields. Move the tip of a thirty-two slug. It'll spread from here to Kansas when it hits. You can do it with a nail file. Maybe. Where's that apartment? No, I'm too close to quit now. I can't let you go alone. I got a big car. Well, before we go, mister, if no one belongs to that file, you belong to the gun. In that case, I'll have a lot of time to do my nails. It was a long shot, but that's all I had. The agent just sat there on the way over. He didn't say a word. Well, I figured he didn't believe me, but it was a short drive to find out. We hit Manzanita Street just after the dinner time rush. It was quiet, and everybody was eating, or they'd gone out for the evening. We climbed the stairs to Marlo Curtis' apartment. I told the agent I wanted to go in alone. He didn't like the idea, but I explained to him that I expected friends and somebody should cover me from the outside. Oh, she looked even prettier than I remembered her. One tear was just about ready to take that last plunge across her cheek. What do you want? I brought you a paper. I've seen it. You know the girl? Yes. What's her name? Too late. For you, maybe. I gotta know. You wouldn't understand. Try me. You're still looking for things. No, not this trip. You didn't think I could cry, did you? No. I learned. Weeping over a nail file? I said you wouldn't understand. It split a slug in a treasury agent. I don't know. Well, I do, sis. You filed the grooves. Shows you how many times you can be wrong in one day, Regan. Kind of cramped behind that screen, Dameron? Small apartment. Yeah. Always wanted to get the girls a bigger one, but Marlowe's getting tried. You're wrong, Dameron. Not anymore. You've been around Regan too long, Marlowe. Now you got a mouth just like his. Big. I just figured out what he's been trying to do. You putting brains on the market, too? Jane Doe, you've been looking for with Evelyn. Your sister could have been a rich woman. Not with the kind of money you printed. What are you playing this scene for? I didn't count on murder. Evelyn forgot things. You killed her. It was no good. She couldn't tell the fives from the tens. I'm going to identify her. 
You know where that leaves me. Sure I do. And I'm going now. You'll have to walk through this Luger. Is that the same gun he used on the Treasury agent? You and Regan hardly got acquainted, didn't he tell you? Your sister did that for me. You lied. Ask Regan. The nail file. That's right. Dumb dumbs. Haven't been one to be sure. You're rotten. Now get out of my way. Milo, don't try it. I'm going out that door. Not standing up. It was a real photo finish. Just as Dameron pulled the trigger, the agent kicked the door open and threw a couple of fast ones into him. I'd call it a dead heat, but you'd have to give the agent the edge. His first slug cut Dameron down like a blade of grass. I figured the second was for Shields. Marlowe wasn't in a hurry anymore. Bacon. I'll call the doctor. No, father. My phone comes. Too big now. They're hurt, baby. Yeah. I got a bigger. Well, made it. it. Was a good try. No, damn it. He's all used up. Good. Regan. You could have gotten as bad as him. No, baby. You just played on the wrong team. He was... Let's go. Yeah. From here on, it's a monologue. Well, it was hard to figure. It was like trying to throw a saddle on a porpoise. I gave what I had to homicide, and it unbuttoned something like this. The girl who pulled a quick exit in the office, Jane Doe, was Marlowe's sister, Evelyn. She was front man for Dameron's bad money. She helped him pass it. The treasury agent, Shields, got a little too close, so Evelyn pumped a couple of dum-dums into him. She did it for Dameron, and then he slipped her the poison. He figured this stuff would work best, but she lived long enough to take that taxi ride to the office. Well, it didn't begin to make sense until I got down to personnel. I didn't think to check it before, but when I handed the clerk that gun, I noticed the tip of the slugs were grooved. Then over at Marlowe's, I picked up that nail file. It was full of lead filings. From there on, it was a fast reel. Dameron filled in the rest in the fight with Marlowe. Yeah, well, too bad about Marlowe. We might have had something. That's what I don't like about this business. You can't build friendships. <laughs> Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan, with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Sterling Tracy. The role of Bill Dameron was played by Charles McGraw. Yvonne Patey was Marlowe Curtis. Marvin Miller was the Treasury agent. David Ellis, Stacey Harris, Lou Krugman, and Bernice Barrett supported. Original music for this program is by Dick Arant. Bob Stevenson speaking. Jeff Regan Investigator is heard every Saturday over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It's the case of the dictaphone murder. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick should be here any minute, Mr. Buckley told me on the phone that he'd be here at 9 o'clock. That's why I came so early. Well, it's only a few minutes after 9. Now it won't be long. You see, I've got a great... Oh. Good morning, Patsy. Hello, Nick. And he's... Fa- oh, good morning, Mr. Buckley, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Carter. When I met you after your lecture at the club the other evening, I said to myself, that's the man I'll go to when I need help. <laughs> and you need it now? Very much. I want you to thoroughly investigate Roger Denham, the man who's going to marry my daughter. Well, what's he done? I don't know that he's done anything. I simply want to be sure that he's the right kind of man to be my son-in-law. Well, really, Mr. Buckley, I don't go in for that sort of thing at all. Oh, that's not the only reason. The Buckley Corporation is going to build a large new office building, and Roger Denham has been awarded the contract for the work. I want to know that he can carry it out successfully. Mr. Buckley, I deal for the most part in crime. It interests me, and I've made it my life work. What you're asking me to do does not interest me. Furthermore, I don't have the time for it. I see. Well, perhaps this will interest you. 
It's an anonymous letter I received in the mail this morning. I don't put much stock in such things, but, well, here it is. Roger Denham is married, has been for six years. His wife is now on her way to the Royal Arms Hotel. Better warn your daughter. Does that interest you, Mr. Carter? Not very much. Information like that can be checked too easily to offer any problem as far as I'm concerned. Nothing very mysterious about this note. It's typed on a decent grade of paper by a fairly good typewriter. Half of the letter L is missing because of a defective type bar, and there's no threat in it, except one fact. I'm sorry you won't act for me, Mr. Carter, but I suppose you have your reason. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Oh, morning, Clancy. Nick there? Oh, yes, he is. Just a minute. You, Nick, Sergeant Matheson. What got you down to your office early, Matty? What do you mean, office? I've been there, and now I'm up here at the Royal Arms. If you're not busy, you might take a run over here. What's up? Murder. Guy named Roger Denham. You say Roger Denham? I did. Why? Friend of yours? No, just a coincidence, that's all. What about Denham, Mr. Carter? What's the story, Matty? He's been strangled to death. If uh, you're not busy... I'll be right over. What room? 312. I'll wait for you, Nick, but make it snappy. I will. So long. Mr. Carter, has something happened to Denham? Buckley, when did you see him last? Mm, Yesterday evening. I called on him at the hotel to see if I could find out something about him personally. Why? He's just been murdered. Murdered? Denham? Yes. Police are there in his room now. Let me have that letter again. Yes, of course. Here. Thanks. Uh, top of the morning to you, Patsy. Nick. Hello, Walter. Don't bother to sit down, Walter. You and I are going out immediately. We're going to look into a murder. Hi, Matty. Well, Nick, you made good time. It's only 9.30. Uh, yep. Oh, hello, Buffalo Bill. Well, if it ain't the terror of the police force himself. Uh, stuck, are you? No, I'm not stuck. Just thought Nick might like to have a look-see. Right, Matty. What have you found so far? Well, there's the body, Nick, right on the floor where we found it. He was strangled by some guy with an enormous pair of hands. You can still see the marks on his throat. Mm. Must have been a struggle the way the room was upset, but it wasn't robbery. Nothing is missing, as far as we can tell. Any fingerprints? No, nope, not a one. The maid found the body when she came in to clean about 9 o'clock. Coroner says death occurred about 8.30 this morning. All night party or an early morning blowout? I checked with a room clerk and he says he saw no visitors this morning. But the telephone operator says a guy named Johnny Casper called about 7.45 this morning. She said she knew his voice because he'd called so often before. He came here. He'd know the way without asking at the desk. Yeah. Said she wasn't listening, but she uh, (laughs) gathered from what she just happened to hear that Casper wanted to see Denham right away. Well, we can look into that when we... All right. Room 312. Is Mr. Denham there? Who's calling? Mr. Allen of the Buckley Corporation. I'd like to talk to Mr. Denham. What do you want to talk to Denham about? Uh, who are you, This Aunt? is Nick Carter. I'm sorry to say you can't talk to Denham. He's just been murdered. Uh, Denham? Murdered? Did you say murdered? I did. What do you want to talk to him about? Why, I'm the chairman of the board for the Buckley Corporation. We've just awarded a contract to Mr. Denham for the construction of the Buckley Building, and I wanted to make an appointment with him to settle a number of details. Uh, and you say he's... Unfortunately, yes, Mr. Allen. It's terribly unfortunate. Uh, well, goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, some friend of Denham's, Nick? Business acquaintance, apparently. Wanted to make a date with him. Uh, it's a little late for that, I'm thinking. Hey, Nick, here's something... Yes, what is it, Matty? It's a piece of silk. Pocket off a shirt, I'd say. Found it clenched in Denham's fist. Ah. Must have been ripped off in the struggle. A clue, by golly. Now we can start investigating, Nick. Looks like it. Matty, will you let me have this? Oh, now, look, Nick. That's the only real piece of evidence we got. I know it. I'll take care of it. Just want to find out what Mills made it and what they did with it. Oh, but, Nick, look, why can't... Now, look, I can do it faster than you can, Matty. You know that? Oh, I suppose so, but I still... Thanks. Waldo, suppose you dig around and find out what mills this piece of silk came from. Shouldn't be difficult because there's a flaw here in the weave. Should make identification easy. You better get going. Legwork. Always legwork for Waldo. A good detective like me, and I ain't allowed to detect. A good detective follows orders, too. Don't forget that. Oh, sure, Nick, sure. I was just... So long, Waldo. I'll see you at the office later. Okay, Nick, okay. Well, Nick, I guess there isn't much else here we can see. I'll just take a look around while I'm here. Yeah. Huh? The room looks as if somebody'd been through it, looking for something. The way it's all upside down. Yeah, that's what I thought. What do you suppose he was looking for? I wouldn't know, Matty. I. Ah. 
You see this? Huh? This piece of wire sticking out under the closet door? No, what is it? Well, let's see. Hey, it goes up the closet wall and through the ceiling. The maid's still here? Yeah, right outside. Hey, maid! Yes, sir? Who lives in the room over this? Nobody, sir. It's empty. Or it was yesterday afternoon when I cleaned it up about half past four. That sounds suspicious in itself, an empty hotel room these days. Roy along. Desk clerk, please. Desk clerk. This is Nick Carter on the murder of Denham. Who has room 412? Uh, Mrs. Denham has it now, sir. Mrs. Denham? Yes, sir. When did she come in? Uh, just a few minutes ago. Denham reserved the room yesterday for friends, he said. When Mrs. Denham came in, I supposed he meant it for her, so I gave it to her. I called Denham to check, but got no answer. What time was that? Uh, about five minutes to nine. You know anything about a wire in the closet of 312? <laughs> a wire? No, Mr. Carter, I don't. That's all, thanks. Matty, I believe this wire is a part of the answer to this murder. Yeah? Let's go up and have a... Hey, that came from upstairs, Matty. Mrs. Denham, come on, Matty, hurry. No good, Nick. He disappeared somewhere. Went down the fire escape and either got to the bottom or slipped into a room on the way down. Mm, too bad. Now, Mrs. Denham, suppose you tell me the whole story right from the beginning. Well, I got here this morning just before 9 o'clock. The clerk said Roger had engaged this room for me, so I came up. I was too tired to unpack, so I just lay down on the bed for a few minutes. I didn't sleep because I had a queer feeling someone was watching me. Then about 15 minutes ago, I got up, washed, and started down to get some breakfast. But after I'd gone a few steps, I found I'd forgotten my lipstick, so I came back for it. As I opened the door, I saw a man in the room, just starting to climb out the window. I screamed, and he, he disappeared. Did you get a good look at him? No, I didn't. But he looked like a large man with, with big hands. I saw those. Mrs. Denham, how does it happen you arrived here just this time? Why, I got an anonymous letter yesterday. Here it is. Thank you. Your husband has been out of the army for six weeks. He is staying here at the Royal Arms. Pretends he's not married and is making big play for daughter of head of Buckley Corporation. Enclose this ticket from your town here. Better come if you want to avoid trouble. And the letter L on behalf of Prince. Same typewriter on both notes. What was that, Mr. Carter? Oh, uh, nothing. Go on with your story, please. I didn't even know Roger was out of the army. The last I heard was two months ago... When he wrote that he and his buddy, Johnny Casper... Nick, Johnny Casper again. Yes. Go ahead, Mrs. Denham. He said they were getting out any minute, and he let me know as soon as they did. But when this letter came, I thought I... Yes, well... I know. And that's all? Why, well, yes, I think so. You mind if I have a look in your closet? My closet? Why, no, not at all. Anything here, Nick? There certainly is. A dictaphone machine. What? Uh... There's the wire that comes up from downstairs. This is what I rather expected, Matty. Denham was making a record of an interview we had with someone, but the record is gone. Uh -huh. That's what the guy Mrs. Denham saw was after. Maybe he got it, Nick. Mrs. Denham, how long were you out of this room? Just a few seconds, no longer. I went out and then came back almost at once. Then the man didn't get it, Matty. Wouldn't have had time. But someone got it. That's the clue we ought to have, Nick. I bet it would tell the whole story. Yes, there must have been something pretty incriminating on it to make him kill Denham. Kill? Did you say kill Denham? Oh, no. I'm sorry, Mrs. Denham. I didn't realize you heard me. I'm very sorry, but it's true. Oh. Your husband was killed about an hour ago. Roger, dead. Matty, better take this machine to headquarters. See if there are any prints on it. It'll help. Okay, you can get Mrs. Denham's, too, just in case. Well, Nick, you don't have I don't know. Better take no chances. Let me get the serial number on the machine so I can have Patsy check on it, and I'll be on my way. Get on your way where, Nick? To see Johnny Casper. He looks like a good starting point. You see, Mr. Carter, we were buddies in the service. I liked Roger, so when we got out, I brought him back here with me. He'd been a contractor in a small town about a hundred miles north of here, and I thought perhaps we could go in business together. I'm a contractor, too, you know. No, I didn't. Oh, yes, I've... Done some pretty big things for a young fellow. Well, anyway, I introduced Roger to Mr. Allen, the chairman of the board of the Buckley Corporation, and to Buckley himself. Then I took him up to Olive's house one night. She's Buckley's daughter. I was engaged to her at the time. Well, I introduced him to her. 
What a heel that guy turned out to be. Just how do you mean, Casper? Well, instead of bidding on the Buckley building with me as partners, he submitted a separate bid of his own. And he entertained Alan and every member of the board at parties. And he made a big play for my girl behind my back. Knifed me every way he could. My pal. You say you were engaged to Miss Buckley. You're not now? Oh, I'll say I'm not. Two days ago, when I called her to make a date, she told me we were through. She was now engaged to Denham. So you have little reason to like Denham. I've never hated anybody in my life the way I hated that man. Where were you this morning about 8 o'clock? Morning? My... Why, I was right here in bed. You're sure? You weren't at the Royal Arms talking to Denham. What in heaven's name makes you think Answer my question, I... Casper. Were you at the Royal Arms? I know I... Well, yes, I was, too. Why should I deny it? I went down to tell Roger to lay off my girl. I'd tell his wife what was going on. And what did he say to that? He told me to go as far as I liked. He was on top and he was going to stay there in spite of the devil and me. Did you two have a fight? With words, yes, but that's all. Got so mad I left him and came back here to think. I see you have a typewriter. You mind if I try it? Why, no, go right ahead. Thanks. Ah. So it was you who wrote those anonymous letters to Buckley and to Mrs. Denham? Yes, I did. I'm not ashamed of doing it. I hated Denham. Enough to kill him? Yes, but I didn't. I saw too much killing in the war. Funny, isn't it? I bring my buddy back here to help him out, and he cheats me out of everything I want. Underbids me on the Buckley job and even steals my girl. <laughs> what a laugh. No, I didn't kill him, but I wish I had long ago. referred to you, And am I glad you were. We don't get many in here like you, baby. I, I want to find out something about... I'm the boy that can tell you, baby. Anything you want to know. I have here the serial number. Now, a... look, let's not talk about numbers. Let's talk about you. You're the number I'm interested in right now. Well, look, will you please listen? Am I listening to every word you say, gorgeous? Go ahead, talk. I want to find out about dictaphone machine number 248749AY. Hey, look. What are you doing tonight, Slick Chick? Working. Number 248749AY, please. I bet you do a mean rumba. How's about giving me a whirl tonight, hmm? Oh, look. I want to find out about this... Yeah, baby, I'm trying to find out, too. How late are you working tonight? Huh? Uh, I don't know. No, I bet you're not working at all. Just stalling me along to see how far I'll go. Well, I'll go a long way for you, good looking. Oh, will you please? Listen, Reb, how's about letting me call you when I get through the night? Maybe I can get together. I know just the place. Come on, what do you say? All right, you win. Call me at Pennsylvania 68601. Ask for Patsy. a baby, now you're cooking on all four. Now, what do you want to know? Where this machine, 248749AY, has been for the last 48 hours. Well, leave me look. <laughs> 248749AY. Leased to a guy named Roger Denham yesterday afternoon. Not back yet. That make you happy, baby? Getting the information does. Thank you. Uh, hey, you can't go like this. It's almost my lunch hour. I was about putting on a pair of bibs together down at my place, hmm? You've got my phone number and my name, and that's all you're going to get from me. Goodbye. Oh, don't be like that, gorgeous. I just want... Oh, there you are, Patsy. We've been waiting for you. Find anything? Nick, do I look fascinating to you? Hey, Patsy, this is police headquarters, remember? Other men find me irresistible. Do you? Snap out of it, Patsy. Did you find out about the dictaphone? Huh? Oh, yes. Um, at least to Roger Denon yesterday afternoon for 48 hours. That checks, Matty. Huh? He expected a visitor and one of the interview recorded. Oh, I wish I knew what was on that record. Oh, I was starting to tell you when Patsy came in, Nick. There were two sets of fingerprints on that dictaphone. Denon's and somebody else's. The others don't check with any we got. They must be the murderers when he got the record. Are they extra large? Uh, hey, they aren't, Nick. They're they're small. So they couldn't have been his. Maybe they don't mean anything. Could have been on the machine when Denham got it. 
Anyway, we... uh, oh, Waldo, uh, how'd you make out? Uh, you asked me to find out about that there piece of silk now, didn't you? I did. Well, when you give old Dead Eye McGlynn a job, he does it. Yes, sir. And I had some job, too, believe me. But I came through. For the love of Mike, Waldo, stop talking and say something. I'm trying to, but you keep interrupting me. Waldo, what did you find out? Well, the silk was woven by the season mills. Now, they made up about a dozen shirts out of it, and then they discovered there was a flaw in the stuff. So they junked the rest, and they sold them shirts to the Lionel Men's Shop right here in town. Did you go there? No, I didn't. I thought maybe you would like to do some of the detecting yourself. Okay, okay. That's my next visit. The Lionel Men's Shop. Come on, Patsy. Come on. This is Buckley speaking. This is Nick Carter, Mr. Buckley. I find that you bought a dozen white silk shirts from the Lionel Shop a few months ago. Yes, I did. They offered me a special price, I recall. Why? Did you keep them all yourself? Why, no, I didn't. I got them just before Christmas, and I gave several of them away as presents. Could you tell me to whom you gave them? Well, now, uh, let me see. Uh, I remember giving Alan three of them, and I kept five for myself, I think. And the others... Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, my daughter, Olive, gave the rest to Johnny Casper so he'd have some when he got out of the Army. Uh, they were going around together at that time. Nobody else got any? I believe not. Couldn't swear to it, of course. All right, thanks. Sorry to bother you. Goodbye. What do you say, Nick? He kept some, gave some to Alan, and some to Casper. Casper? We keep coming back to him, don't we? Seems so. He certainly had a motive. But if he did it, where does the dictaphone come in? Yes, I, I see what you mean. But who else is there? Alan? Well, I suppose you better check on his whereabouts at the time of the killing this morning. Mustn't leave any stone unturned. Come on. No, Mr. Allen isn't at home just now, Mr. Carter. Can I do anything for you? Perhaps. What time did Mr. Allen get up this morning? At his usual hour, sir. About 9.30. Are you sure of that? Oh, absolutely, sir. He came downstairs in his pajamas and dressing gown to ask me about a suit he couldn't find. It was at the cleaners. What time were you up this morning? I start work at 8 o'clock regularly, sir. It's my habit. And you didn't see Mr. Allen until 9.30? Why, no, sir. Uh, may I inquire why you're asking all these questions? You may, but I'm not going to answer just now. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Come on, Patsy. Let's try something else. Maybe we'll have more luck there. <laughs> Nick, you going to check up on Mr. Buckley? Buckley? Well, yes. You've investigated two of the three men who got the silk shirts. You can't omit Buckley, can you? I suppose you're right, Patsy. We can't afford to... Oh, I wish I had that record Denna made. Mm. That would probably tell us the motive. And just now, we are completely missing a motive. Well, Casper had one. But as you've said, that doesn't account for the record. No, it doesn't. I wonder... Huh? What is it, Nick? Wait. I want to call Maddie. I'm going in the drugstore here. Okay. I'll be right back. All right. <clears throat> Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Oh, Maddie, Nick, tell me. When you examined the prints and the dictaphone, did you find any of the smaller prints lapping over Denham's prints? Uh, why, come to think of it, yeah, Nick. Some of the little prints were on top of Denham's. Why? Thanks. I'll see you later. Bye. What's going on, Nick? I think I know now where the missing dictaphone record is, Patsy, and when I get that, I should have the motive. And the murderer. Let's go, Nick. <laughs> For goodness sake, why did you ask to speak to the chambermaid? Because I think she has the answer. Well, what answer could she have? You'll see. You're the chambermaid who found Mr. Denham's body this morning in room 312? Yes, sir. I found him when I went in to clean the room. Did you go to room 412 this morning? Well, I did and I didn't. Just how do you mean? Well, you see, I clean the rooms that's vacant in the afternoon. The deadline's 5 o'clock, so i got to get them cleaned before then. So I cleaned up 412 yesterday, like always. That's a transient room. So this morning I opened 412 to see if somebody's been in. 
But when I seen it like I left it, I didn't go in. I see. You went to the room at all this morning. Like I told you. I just looked in and see nobody's been in, so I locked it up again. You won't mind letting me take your fingerprints, will you? Fingerprints? What do you want them for? Just for the record. You're not scared, are you? Scared? Why should I be scared? Then you won't mind if I take your prints? No, I... I don't guess so. How, uh... How do you do it? Just press your fingers on this little ink pad. Like this. Yeah? Then press them on this pad. Like this. Yeah. Yeah. Do they match, Nick? Match? Match what? So you didn't go in room 412 this morning. I told you, I... I I know what you told me. Now tell me the truth. You went to the door and you went in. And you took a record off a dictaphone machine you found in the closet. Why? Golly, mister. Can you tell all that from my fingerprints? I can. So you better tell me the truth. All right. Well, here's what happened, and it's the gospel truth. I opened the door like I said. Then, just as I started to close it again, I heard a funny noise. I listened, and it came from the closet. I looked, and there was a funny machine there with one of them trick kind of records on it. And you took it? Yeah. I didn't think it was stealing. I just wanted to see what was on it. So I, I brought it down here, and when I got a chance, I was going to play it on one of the machines in the office. But I, I've been too busy. Do you know that Denham was killed for that record? Honest, mister. And if the murderer finds you've got it now, you're next. Gee, I wouldn't like that. I don't want to be killed. Then you better get me the record right now. Sure. Sure, mister. I, I got it hidden in one of the cleaning closets. I, I'll get it for you, honest. You wait right here. We'll wait. And then we'll play the record, Patsy. I've got to know what's on it. Buckley, Nick. Sorry to be late, Mr. Carter, but I got held up in traffic. It's quite all right, Mr. Buckley. Now that you're all here, Buckley, Alan Casper, and Sergeant Matheson, I'll tell you why I called you together. As you know, Roger Denham was murdered this morning in his hotel room, strangled. The only real clues we had were the prints of an unusually large hand on Denham's throat and a silk shirt pocket, evidently torn off during the struggle. We traced the shirts and found that each of you three men had one or more of those shirts. Casper has no alibi for the time of the killing. Alan, according to his butler, has. And Buckley, we don't know about. If you'd asked me, I could have told you where I was. I'm sure you could, Mr. Buckley, right to the very minute, no doubt. So any one of you might have owned the shirt with a torn pocket. We had to get at it another way. Motive. Which of you had the strongest motive to kill Denham? Buckley and Allen don't seem to have any reason. But Casper did. Now look here, Carter. Are you trying to pin this on me? Sit told... down, Casper, and wait until I finish. I won't pin murder on anyone unless it belongs there. As I said, we needed a motive. But it was only late this afternoon that chance plus the rational and logical elimination of other possibilities gave me the answer. I now have the motive, and with it, the murderer. And what is it, Mr. Carter? Yes, don't keep us waiting this way. Here it is. Listen. All right, Patsy. Right. Hello, Alan. What brings you out so early in the morning? I think you know, Denham. You stop that machine. Give me that record. What's the trouble, Mr. Well, Allen? I said stop that machine. Why do you Take that record and now. I want these gentlemen to hear what it says. Confound you, Carter. I'll put a bullet right here. Don't don't put a bullet nowhere, murderer. Give me that gun. Come on. Give it to me. That's better. All right, gentlemen. Now that Mr. Allen is quiet again, I'd like you to hear the rest of this record. Start it again, Patsy. All right. Hello, Allen. What brings you out so early in the morning? I think you know, Denham. Little matter of money. Money? What money? Do I owe you some? Hey, what is this? You trying to kid me? No, no, indeed. I uh, just don't understand. You know? You bid on the contract for the construction of the new Buckley building, remember? That's right. You were not the low bidder. You came in second. You were over $50,000 higher than the low bid. Right again. I reported to the board that I was convinced that the low bidder was not equipped to do this job and recommended giving it to you in spite of your price. That's very decent of you, Al. Decent? You promised me $10,000 if I got you that contract. That's why I'm here. I want half of that $10,000 now before the contract is signed. Why, Alan, I never promised to pay you to get me that contract. I don't do business that way. Why, you 
double-crossing gip artist. You'll pay me what you promised, or that contract will never be signed, I promise you. But the board awarded it to me. On my recommendation, and they'll award it to someone else if I don't get what's coming to me. I boss that board, and don't forget it. They do what I say. And you're going to do what you said you would, or else. That's the end, Nick. That's the most incredible thing I ever heard. So Alan killed him. Mr. Allen, would you care to tell us what happened after the record was shut off? Nothing. I left at once. May I see your shirt? No. Yes. Here, open your vest. <coughs> That's a good boy. Dickie hasn't changed his shirt. His pocket's missing. Very probably. Didn't even know it was gone in all the excitement of the murder. And if further proof is needed, I believe his hands will correspond to the marks on Denham's throat. I see you have unusually large hands, Mr. Allen. Denham was a louse. He shut the machine off and told me he'd been making a record of our conversation. Said if I tried to collect what he'd promised me, he'd take the record to Buckley. I knew that would ruin me, and so I... You killed him so you could find the record, so you could destroy it. I wouldn't have believed it possible. Well, you're right about one thing. You're through, finished, as far as I'm concerned. And as far as the state is concerned, too. The chair will finish him. That's the case, gentlemen. Oh, that's for me, Nick. For you, Patsy. Who is it, do you know? Oh, I'll say I do. Wait till he hears what I'm going to tell him. Oh, but I do wish somebody else would talk to me that way. Just once in a while. Hello! Well, Nick, isn't it about time for you to give us a glimpse into next week's story? Why, I shouldn't be surprised if you were right, Ken. Well, suppose you take over, then. Right. The ingredients of my story next week are, first, a man who died of heart failure, but who was really murdered. A will which was the will the old man wrote, but which proved to be not the will he wrote. And a signature which was forced by a person who wanted it known it had been forged. Sounds like a fine collection of contradictions to me. What do you call it, Nick? I call it the case of the clumsy forgeries. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In the broadcasts of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick... Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Waldo by Humphrey Davis. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor and Peggy Mayer. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak. For hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. You don't get in the blue book that way, but you don't embarrass your friends either. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, they don't separate the good and the bad. They let them run together. And before long, you got a caste system. You're either alive or dead. If you're on top, you keep fading the crowd and trying for sevens until you lose the dice. It's about the only way to play it, unless you like worms. I rent boats and do anything else that'll put a fast handle on a buck. 
but it doesn't always work out because down here all your luck is junior grade and trouble is trumps. I found that out Tuesday night. It was the first time I ever saw Reuben Calloway and the last time, too, if you like to keep a tidy record. It was about seven o'clock and I'd just started back across the bay from Sausalito. You could still see Mount Tamalpais squatting on the Marin shore. Light brown near the top, but dark and black farther down. Like a cupcake that's been in the oven a little too long. A low fog was beginning to squeeze in on the far side, so I kicked in the searchlight, and that's when I picked him up. He was struggling feebly with his face near the water, and he was almost bald, so that when the light hit him, he looked like a cantaloupe that somebody got tired of. I pulled alongside and started to haul him aboard. He brought most of the bay with him. Help me. Please help me. Yeah, well, wait till I get a hold of you, will you? Come on. There. Sit down. No, here. Lean against the gunnel. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Is the water red or you've been shot a little? Do you have to know everything? No, it's your load. Carry it, mister. Yeah. Move your feet. I got to get us ashore. If you like it, go ahead. But don't hurry for me. Well, if you feel that way about it, pick another spot to die and go back in the bay where you'll have company. You've got to help me. I want you to get in touch with a girl named Alma Biggs. Yeah? You'll find her at the Empire Club out on Geary Street. My name's Reuben Calloway. Tell her about me. She'll pay you for it. What she do, collect bodies? Just give her this key. It's for a locker down in the bus station. Now, look, Pop, you don't know me. Suppose I use the key. You can't spend it. You better take the money. All right. Just see Alma and tell her it didn't work out. It didn't work out for me at all. I guess that's right. Huh? On the big things, you're 100%. I don't need a check. Oh. Here, set up. I told you I don't want you dying in here. Stop beefing, fella. You don't have all the bad luck. They must have sent a fast chariot Because when I leaned over, the guy was dead And he was working hard at it, too He was a skinny little guy All bent up and twisted in the bottom of the boat Like an old paper clip It wouldn't do any good to straighten him out Because he wasn't going to sleep easy his eyes were open and rolling around at the sky as if he was on the make for a star. And the skin hung loose around his face so that when you touched it, it felt like an empty baked potato. I pushed him into a corner and started for Pier 19. When I got there, I hauled him on the dock and went down to call homicide. Must have been about 8.30 when I took a cab out to the Empire Club. It was a gambling joint out on Geary Street where they cut their whiskey and cards in different rooms. I asked a guy at the window if he knew Alma Biggs, and he pointed her out by the roulette table. She was wearing a white satin evening gown. And as I walked up behind her, I noticed she moved in rhythm with the roulette wheel. It was interesting. If it had been a merry-go-round, they'd have pinched her. I squeezed in next to her at the table, and I was thinking of trying it again when she started to talk. It's a tight fit. Are you sure you like it? I'm not going to stay long. That's what Rudolph Hess said. Make your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Gamblers, make your bets. Stake me, Alma. I can't afford you, darling. Well, go broke for Reuben Calloway, then. Four on the red. Mmm, I ought to keep you for luck, darling. Will you comb your hair? I'll take the chips. They'd look bad on Calloway. Oh. It's too crowded here. Let's find a closet. All right. Did he look pretty? For a fish, he was all right. How are you? Pat Novak. I picked him up in the bay. He said to look you up and tell you it didn't work out. Hmm. That would please Turk. Yeah? Who's Turk? The reason it didn't work out. Is that all, Mr. Novak? Except for a key. It fits a bus station locker here. You keep it, Mr. Novak. It won't buy anything. Now, look, sweetheart. I picked up your boy and dried him out, but that's all. We were small friends at best, so the services stopped. You can come to a slow stop for $200. Just take the key and pick up what's in that locker. I'll get it from you later. Yeah. I'll meet you in an hour. Where's a good place? Your apartment? Well, it's a place. I'll find it in a book. I hope you don't mind. No, the thin walls will save me. What's in the locker? What would it prove? Proves you got a small mouth, Angel. Unless you're going to kiss it, don't worry. 
9.30, then? All right. I'll bring the 200 with me. Don't worry about the dough. Oh? Because I scooped your chips off the table. See you later. She stood there watching me as I walked over to the cashier's window. Oh, she gave you a nice warm feeling like a Bunsen burner in the middle of your back. And as she stood there in the center of the floor smiling, you knew she could turn a glacier into a steam bath at 400 yards. A nice little mouse that made you want to go home and test all the old traps. Well, I cashed in her chips and the boy at the window shoved out 200 rocks and a pained look as if he'd just handed over his right lung. I got a cab and rode down to the bus station at 7th and Market. There were a few people sitting at the counter and a couple of old men on the benches waiting for somebody to get up and leave the funny papers. I went over near the wall and opened up the locker. It was a long trip for a small package. It was a square manila envelope and there was an address up in the corner. Reuben Calloway, photographer. I squeezed the envelope and it felt like photographs, but I wasn't sure. I started to close the locker when I turned and then I tumbled for the first time. It's like getting a drop of rain on your hand before you ever look up at the sky. The two of them were standing over by the cigar counter watching me. A guy with a heavy overcoat and a little small guy about the size of a hangnail. It wouldn't do any good to sit down because I knew they'd stay until somebody condemned the building, so I walked past them out onto the street. There was a cab standing right in front. Cab, mister? Yeah. Swing up toward the St. Francis, will you? Yeah. Now, look, you're going to be tailed, so brush up on your alleys. If you like it that way. Hey, you were supposed to take a left there on mission. I got a license. Where's yours? I told you to double back over market. Look, get out and walk if you don't like it. I've been bought, mister. Oh, my two friends. That's right. You should have come first. I ought to part your hair. You got more chance with them. Here we are. Where are you going? You like alleys. That's what you're going to get. Yeah. Take it easy, fella. You're not going anywhere. You were nice while you lasted. Take it easy. You better walk up a wall. They'll block the alley. See? Crowded alley, huh? Yeah. Give me the envelope so we can all get out. Can Junior help you? Give me the envelope. There. Now let's see it. Yeah, it's still sealed. You all through? I don't know. I'll see. You like him, Joe? No. That's the way it is, mister. He don't like you. <coughs> slid down like an old sock on a bony leg. I rolled over a couple of times and tried to stand up, but it wasn't easy. You might as well try to find a hair in a bowl of chopped suey. Well, it began to rain, and I figured it'd be easier to float out to the street, so I went to sleep. When I woke up, the rain hadn't helped the alley much. It's like washing your kid's face and finding out he was ugly to start with. The mud had washed up against the walls, and there was a thick, sour smell, and down the alley across the street there was a part of a sign sticking out that said eats. And that isn't what you felt like at all. I started groping around to get up and my hand hit the pictures. They were scattered all over like clothes in a boarding school. I picked them up and started for the street. On the way up in the cab, I got a chance to look at them and they didn't make sense. There were six of them and they were all just about the same. A bunch of mob scenes of that fire over in Oakland. I didn't have time to figure it out because the cab pulled up in front of the St. Francis and I went in to call Alma Biggs and tell her the party was off. Part of that alley must have come with me because when I walked into the lobby, the doorman looked at me as if I'd just blown up a nunnery. I tried the number once, but nobody answered. I decided to wait 20 minutes and call again. That was a mistake because I just got in the booth and started to dial and somebody started rapping on the door with a nickel. It was Hellman from Homicide. Hello, Novak. Come on out. You can't get a date in that suit. What do you want, Hellman? Come on out. Oh, you're a hard man to find. Well, you don't look in the right places. I'm a family man. Tell me about the dead guy. I don't know, Hellman. He died in my boat. That's all I know. He didn't say anything? Just sentimental stuff. His name's Reuben Calloway. Somebody threw him in the bay without instructions. I don't know a thing about him except he takes pictures. 
Yeah? I'll wipe off the drool. They're not your kind. Who are his friends? He's got new ones by now. I don't know, Hellman. How about that guy up in your couch? Huh? I just left your place. How about that guy on the couch? There's a gal up there, but that's all. Does she wear suspenders? Huh? Then take my word, it's a man. And you're going to tell me he's dead, Hellman? No, I'm not going to tell you he's dead, Novak. He may be a soft breather. <laughs> When Hellman mentioned the stiff up at my place, I knew we were going to be in low gear the rest of the night because Hellman isn't an easy guy. He wouldn't give his wife an aspirin if she had concussion of the brain. He took me out the side door and we rode up to my apartment. The dead guy was lying on the couch with his arms across his chest as if he wanted somebody to give him a lily or a way out of this. The lamp was shining down in his face and the light was distorted, but when you stood over him, you could see his face with the color of pressed seaweed. If he had anything to be happy about, you couldn't tell. Because his mouth was open and hung over to one side like a loose change purse filled with old teeth. His clothes were rumpled and his shirt was open at his neck. You could see a chain around his neck and a silver medal in the dull light against his chest. It looked out of place and made you feel funny, like seeing a picture of a Madonna in a bowling alley. I watched him while Hellman made noise. He still looks like a man. Yeah? Who is he? George Leggett. What does that prove? Who his mother was? We're checking for a record. The gun, too. What gun? One was lying here on the floor. I want to know if it's the same gun that killed Reuben Calloway. Well, you'll need some prints. Anybody can buy a handkerchief. Where were you tonight? In an alley down near Mission Street. You like it down there? It's all right. You'd like it. I got shoved in and pushed around for these pictures. They don't look like the right kind of pictures. Well, I can't explain that, Hellman. Maybe they took the good ones. How do you fit in? Calloway gave me a key to a locker down on the bus station. It was for a girl named Alma Biggs. And the girl sent you down? That's right, with 200 bucks running money. If you want to know about Calloway, look up a guy named Turk. Turk what? I don't know, Hellman. Maybe he's only got one name. Maybe the other was Stinker. You got a police file? Look him up. The girl mentioned him. That's all I know. We'll look him up. But I'm not going to forget you. One guy's dead on Pier 19. Another up here in your apartment. You mixed up, Novak. There's a connection. I'll shop around till I strike it. You couldn't strike oil on a filling station. You got a double murder. Shop for a pair of people. I'll shop far enough to get you, big shot. Far enough to see you fry. Well, you got the lard for it, Hellman. <laughs> if you keep your mouth shut now, you can hold in the blood. Oh, Hellman talking. Yeah? Where'd you find out? <laughs> That'd make it easier. You sure the same gun killed them both? Yeah. Yeah, I'll be in. Well? Huh? Oh. Wrong number, Novak. They didn't give Hellman a sense of humor. They gave him a loud laugh instead. When he walked out of my place, he was smiling like a funny man who's just exposed Santa Claus. I didn't feel very funny myself. I took another look at those pictures, and I was as mixed up as a guy with a Mexican divorce. They were just ordinary pictures of a fire in Oakland. What made them so important? I was sure that Gunsel had taken some pictures, but... Well, were they any different than those? And why was Alma Biggs afraid to pick them up? And who was a guy named Turk? I was full of questions, but no answers, like some guy at a peace conference. If I went over it anymore, I'd be counting my toes. So I got out of there and looked up Jocko Madigan. Oh, he's a good guy, and he was a smart one, too, until he decided the only way you can get a good trade-in on hard luck is with a bottle of whiskey. I found him at Emilio's bar, patting Bill, the bartender, on the back with one hand and pouring jiggers of gin with the other. At the chambers down at Murray's in the place where Louis dwells. Jocko. Ba, ba, ba. Gentlemen, songsters of fun and spree, doom from here to its end. Jocko, I want to talk to you. Shh, Patsy, I'm driving a Harvard man crazy. He's at the end of the bar. Well, stop drinking and listen to me. I've got to keep on drinking, Patsy, if I want to preserve any continuity in my life, because I don't drink to forget, but rather to remember. To remember all the pleasant events of my life. Uh, there were two of them, I think. All right, Jocko. The first was a girl. I met many twilights ago, and the second was a summer night in St. Louis when a bartender felt crazed with the heat and set him up on the house. Will you stop it? I'm in trouble. Memory is a blessed toy, Patsy. 
But you have to be careful because it can be dangerous, like uh, giving a rifle to a small child for Christmas. It's true he can get some temporary pleasure out of it by shooting various neighbors, but sooner or later he's going to kill the only rich relative in the family. Jocko, I'm tired. And memory is the same way. So you're entitled to collect the few good ones you have. You're allowed to straighten them out and put them in order. After all, an old pool ball gets racked now and then. You all through? Yes. I, I've run out of memories. Hellman thinks I killed two guys ten miles apart. Wasn't it difficult? The same murder gun. The whole thing is tied up with some pictures. In uh, color? A guy by the name of Reuben Calloway died in my boat. He gave me a key to a locker downtown. The pictures were there. Is that one of them? Yeah. Take a look. Oh, uh, if it's a group picture, they were a very unruly family. It's the Oakland Fire. Two Gunsels followed me and took some of the pictures. In the meantime, some guy got shot in my place. Everybody's after the pictures. Why? Have you seen the other pictures? No, I took an intermission. That's why you got to help. Now, you'll find Reuben Calloway's address in the phone booth. Get up there and go through his stuff, will you? Well, it doesn't sound legal. Neither's a bum murder rap. Get up there and go through his pictures. Try to find anything that'll fit in with his set. Where are you going besides jail? I got to find a gal named Alma Biggs. Oh, you'll have trouble with a name like that. She's probably changed it. The locker key was tabbed for her, but she hired me to run her errands. Is she pretty? Yes, if you like a fast track. Now get up there, Jocko. Why can't I see her? Will you stop it, Jocko? Just get up there. Forget about her. She'd scare you to death. Yes. Well, at least I'd die hopeful. Good night, lover. <laughs> Finding Alma Biggs was quite a job. I knew she was around, but I couldn't get to her. It was like trying to get a peanut shell out of a back tooth. I called the Empire Club, but they didn't know anything about her. I went through all the phone books and the city directories, and I didn't get anything but a sore thumb. And I didn't do any better with the hotels. I sat in lupos and called them all one by one, and by one o'clock I knew more desk clerks than a vice squad cop, but no Alma Biggs. Finally, I went out to the Empire Club and started talking to the cabbies. About 15 minutes later, one pulled up and remembered taking a girl in a satin evening gown up to an apartment on the hill. I called Hellman and rode up there to check the names. Alma Biggs had an apartment on the second floor. I knocked on the door and she didn't answer, so I tried it. The lights were out, so I closed the door and groped over to the desk. I should have noticed the draperies as I passed because they were full of people. <laughs> Wait a minute. All right, now. Wait a minute, Mr. Nilfax. Stop breaking things. Someday you may want to mend me. Uh, do you always sleep in the curtains? Do you always talk this long in the dark? Turn on the light. Yeah. I wanted to see who you were. George Leggett, maybe. Oh, do you know him? We're roommates. He died on my couch tonight. Anything serious or just humdrum death? He's satisfied. What do you know about him? Well, I never heard anybody say a bad thing about him. Of course, I never heard anybody mention him. Now, look, Angel, it's late. Who's George Leggett? Why do you care? Because homicide cares. They got Calloway and Leggett back to back, and they want my skin. Mm, it's a nice skin, darling. Where are the pictures? Unless you're a social worker, you're not going to like them here. Let me see. They're not all here. Yeah, I figured that. Where are the other pictures, Patsy? In some Gonoff's album. Two of them jumped me down near Mission Street. Who are they? We never got that friendly. Well, there couldn't have been two of them. Well, maybe the little guy was just window dressing, but he gave the right answers. Patsy, I think you're a liar. You're nicer than homicide. I want those pictures. You do. Well, I'm going to take them away from you. Well, if I had them, that's a big enough gun to do it. Get the pictures, Patsy. It's a bad time for murder, Angel. Homicide's working this week. I haven't time, Patsy. I'll push you down like a blade of grass. Get the pictures. Now, look, sweetheart. I took a job for 200 bucks. It covers a tandem murder rap and a sapping down on Mission Street, but it won't cover big talk from you. Now, put the gun away or I'll bend you hard. Don't move up when you talk. You're around behind. Come on, give it to me. Stop it, Patsy. Feels good. Let it go or take the pain. Drop it. You don't have to hang on. I'm not a barbell. You're handy now. Who's Turk? Stop it. You're hurting my arm. There's a guy named Turk. I want to know who he is. You're late for that. Who is he? Go ahead, tear it off, and you'll die ignorant. Yeah. You sound blue, Novak. Oh, what do you want, Hellman? I want to give you a reason. We got the coroner's report on George Leggett. Yeah? He died in your apartment. The blood off your carpet looks good on these slides. All right, so the murderer sold me the rug. So what, Hellman? So we ran down George Leggett's record. 
A Detroit gunman who got out here six weeks ago. Yeah? He traveled for years with a guy named Turk Spaniel. Now, that's your boy. You better find him. We already have. Don't tell me he's up on the couch. He was born too soon for you. We checked with the Detroit police. What'd they say? They know all about Turk Spaniel. He was killed nine years ago in West Detroit. But they found the guy that did it and sent him up to Lansing for life. Yeah? Yeah. He was a guy named Joe Biggs. Say hello to your girlfriend. <laughs> Well, I didn't talk to the girl because I knew she'd close up faster than a Dublin meat market on Friday. I left her and went down to the Chronicle morgue to find out what I could about Turk Spaniel. Hellman had covered it. Spaniel talked too much and Joe Biggs killed him and left him growing out of a ditch like an old weed. I didn't know where to turn now. With Turk gone, who was after those pictures besides Alma Biggs and what did they prove? I knew the answer was there. Probably in plain sight, like a blimp on a football field, but I couldn't get near it. It was past two when I got back to my apartment and the phone was screaming for help. Yeah. Hello, Patsy. This is Jocko. What'd you find out? That Callaway was quite a photographer. Yeah? You should see some of the pictures. Ooh, I'm in love with you. All right, Jocko. Did you find anything? There's a check for a thousand dollars from Alma Biggs. Yeah, what else? Some more pictures of the Oakland Fire. One of them looks good. Yeah? It's just like the rest, except in the background, something is circled with a red pencil. That'll do it, Jocko. And there's a clipping here with another picture. I can't tell, but I think they match. What's it say? Well, it's all about... Jocko, what's the matter? Are you all right, Jocko? Jocko, you all right? He says to tell you no. After Jocko's call, I grabbed a cab and rode up to Calloway's apartment. When I got there, Jocko was sitting in the middle of the floor as sad as a steer on a sheep ranch. He hadn't seen who hit him, and the picture was gone, so was the clipping. I asked him if there were any negatives around. He said no. That meant that somebody was still on the prowl for those negatives. So I called Hellman and briefed him. He said he'd meet us at Reuben Calloway's studio in ten minutes. When we got there, it was dark, but I sensed Hellman in the back room... Turned out to be a couple of pans of acid, but Hellman was there going over the negatives. All this guy did was take pictures. Let me take a look, will you, Hellman? Can you spot the right one here, Jocko? Hold them up to the light. All right. Here are the fire pictures. Uh, how about this one? No, no, I had that one. Yeah, that's it. And, and this fellow back here is the one that was circled. Hold it up so I can see. Hello, Turk. You waited too long. Give me the picture, mister. All that gun will do is make noise, Spaniel. It won't make enough to keep a secret. Just hand me the picture. Somebody knows you're alive now. The picture's for laughs. It's your word against mine. And I'll be so far away I can't hear the argument. Let's have it. Don't give it to him, Novak. Yeah, I'll give it to him. You take it away, Hellman. Thanks, Novak. That alley taught you manners. Just stand over there. I want to remember the way you looked. Don't worry. I'll tell you about them, Turk. Uh. Keep backing into this gun. It's going to show around your breastbone. Well, guns are getting cheap. You better drop yours, Spaniel. Over there. Hmm. You look the same, Turk, or almost the same. You got this all wrong, Alma. Joe doesn't look the same. Nine years in the cooler and you lose your personality. Please, Alma, don't do anything crazy. After nine years, you lose almost everything. Joe's lost everything but me. Down on the floor, Spaniel. I want you on your knees. Please. Alma, you got it wrong. I got it all right, Turk, because Joe wouldn't lie to me. When he said he didn't kill you, I knew you were alive. Please, Alma. Down on the floor beside the table. Go easy, baby. You got a copper here. I can't hurt him, Novak. Turk Spaniel's legally dead. All you can do to a dead man is kick up the dust. Please, Alma. You're not seeing this right. I'm going to have a better chance than you. You couldn't see, Spaniel. You couldn't see your way back to help Joe out. You look good on your knees. Over by the table. Leave that asshole alone, sweetheart. I'm going to help him see. With a whole panful of it. I'm going to help you see, Spaniel. Please. Please, Alma, you wouldn't do that. You got the short end of the bed. You better look at him, Jocko. Don't bother, unless you're a baby doctor. We may need you, lady. Not for this copper. Remember, Turk Spaniel's dead. Detroit says so. He looks live now. He can't be dead there and live here. I like your climate, but it's not that good. 
You can't see me, Turk. But I'll bet you can hear me walk out of here. Goodbye, Turk. I'll send you a cane. Hellman managed to get most of the story out of Turk Spaniel. Reuben Calloway stumbled into the whole thing and he didn't know what hit him. He went over to Oakland to take some pictures of the fire and he got a picture of Spaniel in the crowd. Spaniel saw him and trailed him over to this side. He had to get the pictures because back in Detroit he'd framed Joe Biggs with a riddled up body and skipped out of the country. He'd been away until a few weeks ago and Now he was waiting for a boat out of San Francisco, so he had to stay dead. He sent George Leggett after the pictures, but Leggett figured it was a good way to double-cross him and stay in the clear, so he tipped off Alma Biggs, who'd come out here on a lead a few weeks before. Turk finally tumbled. With a local gunsel, he killed Calloway and left Leggett in my apartment where he trailed him. (laughs) It almost worked out, but he didn't get to that shop in time. Well, Hellman asked only one question. When I first met her, did I know that Alma Biggs was that hard? No. In that satin evening gown, I didn't think so. The American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the fifth of a new series, Fat Novak, For Hire, starring Jack Webb. Fat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Rousseau. Jack O'Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. In our cast were Yvonne Fady, Charles McGraw, Herb Butterfield, and Herb Ellis. This program is being released to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations, we will bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. Now, a brief reminder. There is no mystery to this statement. Wherever they serve, at home or abroad, the men who wear the uniform of the United States are men of whom we can be proud. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. All of them serve our country and us with pride and honor. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>